Is there sound now? You got sound now? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Testing, testing, you fucking psychos. Are you typing to them? Are they asking, did, did they say, can, can you hear us? Mike's working on this end. <laughs> yes, they can hear us. Stop clapping at the mic. <laughs> this is a copywritten song <laughs> I'm about to sing. It's called Fuck Your Ears, pow. No. <laughs> did it hurt your ears when I'm clapping? No, no, they said it's not clapping. Oh, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. Okay, I will. Okay, okay. I forgot. Everyone's got head earbuds on. It's like, oops. Ooh, ooh I'm, now I know. If I ever get angry in a stream, I'm just going to go. Just start clapping. Everyone, cl mic. close your eyes for a second. I want to show you something. Fucking <laughs> clapping, Mike. Oh, How about letting so the whoopee cushion go? Oh, my gosh. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, fuck you. This is a live stream. I don't think you're going to love me after this any more than you love me today. I don't think you're going to like me. Bugaboo! I guess the question is, do I care? You know, not much. Not much. Less every I need day. A sandwich. This might we'll be get some this might be the last day I ever care in my life, actually. Lies. Lies. Lies and intrigue. <clears throat> How's my hair? Is this thing on? That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what? That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what? that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what... ...that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what... ...that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what... that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what... that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another tape while I work? I want to tape a little show start. Um, 
Hello. We are on the air. <laughs> um, you know, I want to start this. This is heavy. A lot there. And I'm going to have to film this intro in little bits while I'm working and walking and thinking about things. Because it's not easy to do off the cuff as I normally do. You know, I'll start by apologizing for my ignorance. You know, I'm... And it's hard to do that right now. It's hard. It's not hard, and it is, because it's like you want to explain the context, the cultural context of 20 years ago. I want to sit there and explain myself. But rather than do that, because, you know, it's just the idea that I, there's, there's lessons to be learned throughout life. One thing I learn, one, one thing I think about when, with this 24 hour radio show from 20 years ago. is that within Satanism, it's okay to hurt people. But it's, it's, it's meant to hurt people that you don't like, that you know. It's personal. Saying some of the things I said on that show, these general names, these derogatory terms, you know, it hurts to such a large swath of people. So it just doesn't make sense as far as a Satanist does. It goes, it's not doesn't make reasonable sense to do those things. You know, but, you know, and I can sit here and explain myself all day long, and I will. But I just want to make that clear. Like, and I'm glad, I'm actually glad, everyone, that this is this has grown into such a big thing. It, you, 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 you're calling it out, and, and that's important. A lot of people out there are upset by it. I've got a lot to say about this, obviously, and I will go on, I'll talk about more, like I said, I'm going to put this together as I go walk around and do my thing, and like I'm do my, put my grommets on my gear and shit like that, so we've got a lot of time here, we've got 24 hours to spend, right? I'm going to hang out, Avi's going to be here with me after this beginning of the show, Avi's here now actually. You know, as this is pre-recorded and playing, though, we're both here hanging out, waiting for this to get done. But I think uh, maybe I should tell you a little bit. Like here, you know, this the idea that 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 radio show grew into the Satanic Temple is wrong. That radio show grew into a book and movie that my partner, Amy, and I did. It was called uh, Suffering Celebration of Life in America. That's where, where I... You know, the Suffering Celebration of Life in America and the project A Year at the Wheel that me and my partner went on was the extension of the Might is Right 24-hour radio show and those Radio Free Satan shows. Those shows... The extension of those shows became that book and movie, Suffering and Celebration of Life in America. Now, all that stuff is up on archive.org, and you can go find it. But that's where I was like, we're going to go test our philosophy. You know, much like I had the idea for the Might is Right show. Like, this is the production, I put it together and we do it. But that doesn't mean all three of us didn't do it. It's just, I'm saying, I'm just letting you know how it went. It's not even like I'm taking, I'm taking my credit, because that's how it goes. But I was a publisher producer back then, I still am, and I put the show together. You know, I was like, yeah, let's do this to promote this book I'm putting out. You know, Might is Right with Anton LaVey. Let's do this. Let's do this 24-hour show. It's 9-11. Let's, let's fuck around with controversy, heavy subjects. This was three years after 9-11. The buildings came down 9-11. So this was three years after. So it's, or two years after, something like that. So it was fresh. It was heavy when we did the show. People were, you know, angry, as angry, they were as angry then for that show being on 9-11 without hearing any of the show as they are today for other things. So, but I like doing it on 9-11. I still like doing it on 9-11. What a great holiday. 
um, digest. I, I don't, I w violent, horrible deaths are not cool. You know, I don't want one. No one wants one. So as much as, you know, the younger me might laugh at that stuff, you know, I think we do that because we're afraid. You know, anyway, getting back to this radio show that we did 20 some years ago. Um, it's something, ain't it? That's something else. There's something else how that survived. There's something else how that radio show survived. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what... I guess... You know, one of the things that bothers me the most, eh, there's no most in this, but just having to admit that you were ignorant and, that having, and having to admit to an ignorance on that level is to admit that you're poor, most likely. And to admit that you're poor in this country is to admit that you're food in this country put you in a really a real fucked up situation so I think a lot of times with that hate and that atlas stuff it's an effort to sound I don't know, tough, strong it doesn't work, you know, it's ignorant it sounds stupid, repulsive, but something about it that attracts maybe it's the fear that it invokes in people all I know is that I was ignorant and I spent a lot of time educating myself about things and I do apologize about that stuff I was also thinking you know the idea of free speech was created so long ago it's a great concept and I don't think we realize the concept yet actually or the idea that free speech exists and there shouldn't be consequences to the speech not a punch not an illegal punch not an illegal not assaulting someone you beat awful speech with better speech anything else devolves the civility that we have but there's also the, the important lesson that, under, that I've learned is that words have a lot of power and when using them to upset people and to hurt people you can do it it's easy it's the easy way to do it but it does hurt people. And you know, my privilege didn't understand the layers of trauma some folks carry. Well, you know, I carry a lot of trauma and stuff from being poor. But not as much as, let's say, my poor mother did. Or the poor Hispanics next door to me did. You know, there's, there's layers of privilege and then there's, I have no fucking privilege at all, I'm fucked. And when you're using derogatory things in jest, in hate, it triggers out a whole group of folks that didn't do a fucking thing to you. And as much as I was happy to create all that hate and anger and get my feelings heard and to hurt yours like mine were you know the concept hurt people hurt people I think that seems to be somewhat true 
in the whys of all this kind of garbage. <sighs> yeah, you know, I used to be a be person, you, ah, free speech, free speech, free speech. And I wonder what that even is anymore. You know, or how can we even expect to have stuff like that without some sort of education system, you know, educating people. You know, I can hold the educated to a higher level than poor people because they're educated. I think that's a good idea. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what... I was also thinking, you know, the idea of free speech was created so long ago. It's a great concept. And I don't think we realize the concept yet, actually. Or the idea that free speech exists and there shouldn't be consequences to the speech. Not a punch, not an illegal punch, not an illegal, not assault. Hello. I suppose I should start this with a, both an apology and a thank you. You don't apologize for hurting people's feelings that I didn't mean to hurt. I think that's the biggest problem with within Satanism generalizing any group and, and and terrorizing them with a word because that's what that does it terrorizes people when you use these words that have terrorized them their whole fucking life that was 20 years ago as of today you learn a lot in 20 years but you don't always learn enough so I thank the people that had constantly come at me over the last, let's say, decade, something around that time. We're going to go over all this in detail in the 24-hour show, but enough people came at me where I would just defend this thing, you know, like, I, and, I, and I can, and I, but that's not what this is about, this intro. That's not what this is about. So you come to me and, and challenge me and talk to me about this and harangue me and I thank most of those people I think most of them uh, the, it was wild because the ones who helped me the ones I, I mean I, I thank y'all I thank most of you I mean the, there, there's a few few out there that are using what I created with ill intent and, and I'm going to get into that too in the 24-hour show but I want to thank the witches that surrounded me when I started to break away from things. And this started 2015, 2014, 2016. It started after my road trip, a year at the wheel road trip, and when I landed on a beach and I didn't talk for a year. But I'm gonna get into all this on the 24 hour show too. The witches surrounded me, witches came to me, and they weren't necessarily looking to protect me. They were looking to understand what the fuck was on my mind. And throughout that process, in 2019, I left everything I love, which was one-third of that 24-hour radio show. And when I did that, I was totally out of my fucking... I, I'm not going to say I was totally out of my mind, but I was in a lot of emotional stress, straits, a lot of problems, a lot of, lot of stuff. And I'm going to explain that on this show, too. Best I can. The idea is these witches surrounded me in a time where I was very, I was on my fucking knees, I was broken, and I didn't know what to do. I was lost for the first time in my life, and I hadn't any will, and these witches surrounded me. But they didn't necessarily surround me to 
help me or to hurt me. They surrounded me because what witches do is they collect the information. And they wanted to know what I knew, why I was doing what I did, and all this stuff. One of the witches that came to me was a witch called Nanaro. And it was interesting when Nanaro, we eventually did a podcast called Speak of the Devil together that she encouraged me to do. But she came to me and started talking to me when I was at my worst, in my worst state of mind. And she came to me and talked to me about music. And as our relationship grew, she thought it was funny that everyone was so afraid of me or would talk about me or have all these things to say about me, but had never approached me. She was asked, me, she says, has anyone ever come to you and asked you why you did this or what was your motivation behind that or anything? I'm like, no. None of these say that they, they don't talk. No, no. I, I wonder that myself. These media people go on and on about this stuff and they're not coming to the source. They're going to one of my lackeys or whatever. And so she just started, Nana started talking to me about stuff. And then she's like, you know, Shane, I think you should get your side of the story down on this podcast. And so she was instrumental in bringing that out of me and having me talk about this stuff. But during our exchanges... Nanaro helped me understand how this, the, 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 the 20, 20 year old Might is Right show had survived, how much it has a life. And she explained to me how it was being interpreted by so many people. And again, I'm going to explain to you how I didn't even know this. I, did, I, I didn't know any, I didn't really understand the, how big everything had gotten. There's a lot of reasons for that, but it mainly is like survival. You know, you're, you're trying to survive a moment in your family life, and you're just paying attention to love and life. So I didn't really understand how this stuff had been, had gone crazy and out of control. Out of control. It's totally out of control right now. And that's what this is the idea here is to bring things back into context, into my into context like it, the, the idea of this is not even to bring in the context what is your context I don't fucking know but this is about regaining my narrative the guy who started the 24 hour show the guy who was the, the one person who published Might Is Right back then the person who went to LeVay and said I want you to fucking write this forward for me or I'm going to tell the world that Nazis influenced your book bro I'm going to tell them you took all that right you know you, you, that's me so this is my fucking narrative. It's not Doug's or Amy's. They have their own. They were part of this. But this isn't theirs. This is mine. I directed this. And I'm going to direct it now. But I can tell you, there's a lot, a lot to this story. A lot of it I'm going to let go here. But there's some pretty saucy parts that I'm going to let go in a book or later on. Y'all should know out there though, like, squirrels above me. You know, I did, I do, I do, you know, I'm working with people. I'm working with people help me write a book and stuff like that. So, hopefully that all happens and, and you get this stuff. I made sure all, any evidence I have is in secure hands in case something happens to me. You can only hope that gets out that then, after. So, but until, anyway. My point, you're like, yeah, I got less fucking hair than I did 20 fucking years ago. You gonna give me grief for that? You wanna make fun of that shit? What the fuck are you gonna say to me? But, I just wanna thank the people that came and asked questions. That's what I'm saying here were inquisitive and wondered the nuance of a moment, a static moment in my life. That is, my life is not static, but that moment is. And I appreciate the interest, and I appreciate how, how things have grown a bit. You know, I, I appreciate as much interest as there is in Satanism, which I consider just philosophy or thought or 
you know, the idea that we're going to think, think, be reasonable and talk about things and think things through. And, and those are the people who came to me, I believe, are the, like the real Satanists, the ones I would believe are like, like I, what I understand. I know what a Satanist is because I, I don't know, knew Anton LaVey and I knew all the people he was making priests back in the day. So it was like, this is how it would go. We might say something that offended one of us, but we'd have a reasonable exchange behind it. You know, what's going on here? Try to understand, oh, this guy's drunk or this guy's got this problem or this it, they come from this background or it's of course they're going to talk like that they're ignorant you know and, and so when those i just thank those people because they brought me back to a reasonable exchange or someone trying to understand or hear what i had to say i do thank joseph the gentleman behind satanic delco and the hell satan podcast i think is the deal with him um, he's the first person within that satanic community that was like inquisitive and tried to do a journalistic endeavor and talk to me, you know, like ask me questions. And it's a shame he was attacked afterwards because he's gained my trust. I'll talk to him more. He can get more answers for you. And see, as Satanists, we want those answers. We want that information. I don't See, that's where I'm suspecting. We're going to go through all of this. All of this. I'll get in detail. But that's where I think... How's my hair? I know. It's, it's, it looks better when I got the Botin, and Botin spray. It's fluffy. Anyway. I think that's where you should... You might want to be skeptical is when people are like, don't read that. Don't talk to that person. Shun that person. Those are, those are Christian things. Anyway. I appreciate Joseph from... Satanic Delco. And two people that are really fucking sparks. You want to talk about the prairie fire. These two are two of the sparks that are going to... Claudia and David from the Infernal Church, which is basically a study group on Satanism, at least what they sold me on. And I really appreciate these youngsters. They come to me and they redid a 24-hour radio show like I did. And they, they're, they're like, oh, this, and they have me on at the end to talk to me. And they're really nice and very, they're very cool. And, but they were smart. They were reasonable. They went for it. They asked those questions. It was a good time. So, so I really appreciate the youngsters from the Infernal Church. And uh, I, yeah, I really appreciate because those two youngsters, Claudia and David, really sparked. Like they're like this 20th, 20th anniversary, and like I didn't know. I'm 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 so busy trying to get my life back together. And I was like 20th anniversary. Hmm. And as they're talking to me about it, I'm like, and I hear what they understand about it, and how this is being interpreted, and how other people are looking at it, and how other people are listening to this. I'm like, this really needs to have this. People are wrong. You're wrong about the evolution of that that. That project, you're wrong about where that project went. What, what my conclusions were to it, are very different than what Doug's conclusions were to it. Like I said, there's someone creeping around. I don't know what the fucking deal is. I'm gonna stop. Okay, I'm back. But I just want, you know, I I thought it was important for me to start this show with this. And it's pre-recorded. There might be some other clips. I'll pre-record this fucking thing five different times probably. You know, so it might be have some edits. But I thought it was important for me to start that. Start this with the idea that I, I do apologize. You know, had I know then, what I know now, you know, it's just one of those things. But the idea is that everyone should try to do what I did. That's the crazy part about what I'm going to say here. I think you should all try to do exactly what I did and make fucking huge mistakes. 
try to make something happen. But making mistakes isn't a big deal. It's how you deal with them. That's the big deal. And when you're younger, you shouldn't be afraid of saying something that's going to upset people or saying something that might carry with you 20 fucking years and you're going to have to explain it then. That shouldn't stop you. Express yourself as whole. There's a lot to expression. And it's, it docu basically, artists, we document what's going on around us. So we tell the real history versus the history that's written in, by rich men. So when, you know, and I do see what I do as art. I, if you look at the three of us, there's the artist, there's the whore, and there's the politician. The whore is generous. The artist is an ima it, it has an imagination. And the politician is greedy and manipulative, a liar. I am not the politician nor the whore. The whore is generous. The artist is, has an imagination. The heart. I, you know, and uh, the politician's a fucking liar. Okay? You should know that. I want to sign out now. Spend almost 10 minutes. I'm sitting here with you. We got 24 fucking hours to spend, huh? What else should I sit there and go on about with you? I don't know. But I guess we're going to find out. Aren't we? I'm thankful that you're watching this, though. I'm thankful that you paid attention to the first one so much. I am. And I'm thankful you cared enough to communicate about it. That's what art does too. And I know there's a lot of early work about me, interviews and stuff, where I talk about I wanted to I wanted to create the worst fucking things. I wanted to create things where people's beer would be taken away from them. Their drugs would be taken away from them. Their TVs would be taken away from them. I wanted every fucking thing to be taken from you motherfuckers until you did something about poor people and how we live. And so back then I did want to cause a lot of hate, pain, anger, all of it. And it's just not hate to one person. Hate. Fucking hate of everything. Okay? I wasn't limited. I'm going to talk more about this in the podcast but all that stuff was purposeful. We were part of the aesthetic terrorism movement. We were looking to terrorize people aesthetically. And I think as a young artist, when you're 20-something, 30-something, you're making artwork, you lie about your intentions maybe. Or your intentions look different because you're part of this cool group. We're all part of this woke group or whatever you want. I love woke, by the way. It's garbage, you know, a conversation about that is garbage too, but, you know, whatever you're part of these communities and y'all think you're thinking the same or y'all like, yeah, we're cool. And then you see as people get older, like, you know, I'm in my 50s now. There's no artists left. They all went on to become dentists or fucking whatever they went on to be. They didn't take the vow of poverty and pain to be an artist and go through life not wondering where you're going to get your fucking mail, you know, uh, that, to make their own way. And so they went somewhere else. But you're there at this age and you're able to see what was your real intent? What was your real intent when you went and did that art project when you were 20 or 30? And you see it here. You see it with anyone, like, you hear like, I don't know, I hear a basketball player, they make a lot of money. And one of them, I think, I don't know his name, but he started making schools, opening schools and shit. Like, boom, dropping that shit down. Some guy, like, yeah, I'm going to retire, I got all these, I got hundred million dollars from basketball I'm just gonna quit and, and start a farm and start making mutton raising food to give it to poor people I'm like that's what you fucking do yo like you, that or, or, well that it shows your intent you know when you see the people with all this money and they talk about like like Jay-Z I think he talks about he's not a capitalist he's talking all his shit look at all the fucking shit that guy has okay he just spends all his money on crazy shit like that guy will go out and spend a hundred thousand dollars in a night the fuck how do you do that without feeling bad? Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. And I think as far as I go and the person who did all of this shit, if you look at my career, 
before the mind game started, before the process church style mind game started, if you look at my career, it doesn't have a lot of hate in it like, like uh, I'm positioned and like most will see me now because of a static moment in my life that has been weaponized. So now when I walk in the room, all people do is hear that word and hear these words and hear that. Who's that hurt? You have to think about that. Whose feelings does that hurt? I mean, and as far as that goes, it also opens up the idea that I'm going to be praised by those people that are haters in that way. You know, so it's like, how does that serve? How does that serve? You know, weaponizing that stuff. Anyway, thank you for joining us. Okay? I appreciate you're here. We're going to start streaming live now. And when we do, we may have hiccups. We may go off the air, we may go on the air, we may fly all around the internet. We may be on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We don't know how this is going to go. But when we get going on this, when we start, you can keep track of everything and we will record all of this and we will put it up on archive.org. Okay, we'll take care, you know, we'll make sure that this is archived so you don't have to stay 24 hours. But you know it's a lot fun if you stay the whole 24 hours, right? You know it's a lot more fun, right? Right? Stick around. And um, we're going to do a raffle. We're going to raise, you know, we're, 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 we're going to, um, we're going to uh, raffle off thousands of dollars in occult items, you know, try to pay for, Avi's got to come down, you know, gas money, shit like that to do these things isn't cheap. And we're artists, so, you know, we're always looking to make some money to pay a light bill or something. So, just stay tuned. We'll have some fun shit happening. I suppose not all of it's going to be archived. So stay tuned. ...that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what... No. About my partners on this the last the 20 year old recording. About my actual partner, you know, it's hard for me to. Yeah. She may have sacrificed more than any of us not that there was an us that sacrificed well my partner and I did but it was willingly it was joyous and it was to change the world or perhaps just take it out on the world the pains of growing up poor and wanting more and and, and, can't, and, and that's it, you know. But I do... Uh... Hello. I do um... have a... I love my partner. And I'll probably always have a love for her. I'm very angry about a lot of stuff between us personally. But our creative output, individually, as well as together, should talk more about our intent than this one static moment in our life. I know when everything was going down and me and my wife hit the road, she wanted to deal with issues of global catastrophe, global warming, mountaintop removal. She was into the dirt. She was into saving the planet, the environment. Me, I was looking at human rights. My rights, my freedoms, the humanity's freedom. So I was looking into shit like that. You know, and that's, that's where the trip went. The road trip that we went on after a year at the wheel. 
we had some bumps in between there. The 666 Eve. Pleasures of the flesh, baby. All this good stuff. Horns, all that good shit, but make no mistake. Me and my ex-partner had a good time in our suffering. For a good chunk of that time. Probably half of our time together. But again, I don't know if anyone has sacrificed as much, I should say. I don't know if we suffered, but we sacrificed. ...that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what... My other partner on the event, Doug Doogie, his intent is shown in his world too. I think if people follow his work from that Might Is Right special to his, to his, his today um, as a tourist guide for Salem, Massachusetts, probably will officially be employed by the Chamber of Commerce of Salem, Massachusetts soon, running the annual holiday parade. Okay? But I want you to look at his art output versus mine or my or Amy's. You should judge us on our art and our complete catalog. But you'll notice after the 24-hour radio show my partner and I went on to 20 years of making artwork. Doug went on to learn how to be a politician and how to take ideas, culture vulture, how to change ideas so they're palatable to his Ivy League friends. Basically, he's learned how to be a lawyer. And lawyers how to know how to play with words. They, they, they don't lie, but they ain't telling the truth. Doug is also a fan of control, fascism, the Roman Empire, shit like that. We're definitely not the same in our political belief. ...that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what... You know, there might be one person that sacrificed, my ex-partner, she may have sacrificed the most out of all of us. I think history will might be saying that, but who knows? I just know that my partner did sacrifice a lot to bring forward ideas that she thought could bring more freedom to humanity. But when we went on our year at the wheel road trip, her interest was mountaintop removal, dirt, environment, and cool shit like that. Mine was on human rights and the freedoms that we have, and the, what, the suffering that cause, is caused by lack of freedom. So my, my, my goal was more human rights, stuff like that. And that's where the project sl slanted because it's my project. But no, our intent in life shows in our work, shows in a lot of our work. And the sacrifices that we both made and endured also show in how we carry ourselves today and any of the mental illnesses we may have picked up along the way. Because those sacrifices were not easy, but they were fun. Don't get me wrong. Me and my, my ex had a lot of good a lot of good times. She's fun. And she's serious about her politics and where she wants to see the world go. And I appreciate that about her. I don't, of course, appreciate the war we have between us. And that's a whole different concept. I'm going to segregate that those attitudes uh, that feeling and go and talk to you about the artist I know, the person I know and the person that I helped fruit into an artist, the person I got from my plastic factory 
and saw potential in and, and nurtured it. I don't know where her politics lie today. And I don't even think we agree on things politically. I just know that our intent back then was environmental and human. It wasn't political. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what that marries art with fashion? But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what that marries art with fashion? But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what Whoa, I look too big there. Let's go. We're live. Hey, this is Hurley. Reverend Avi. We're sorry, live. Reverend Avi. I call him Avi most of the time. <laughs> you know, I know that was a lot of redundant stuff, but this is the way it is. It's a live stream. I got to take up some time, you know. Um, but no, I wanted it to be nuanced, and uh, I don't want to talk. That stuff is important. Thank you. And I don't want to talk about it too much. I, I'm going to talk to Avi about it, but it's, it, um, it was a very traumatic experience. Let's just uh, say, hmm. it hasn't been easy for the older Satanists in the world. I don't know how it is for the younger ones. But you can look at the West Memphis Three documentary, for instance, and see how people were treated awfully back then. I don't know if it's changed too much. It hasn't for us. And we take quite a beating public Satanists sometimes, or artists that are controversial. So, communicating about that past for me is, um, I want it to be over with. Is a lot of hard things. This is Reverend Avi, a gentleman I met on a fluke, and met him through all of these weird things that are coming together in such weird ways. And Avi does not believe in luck. <laughs> I think that there's no such thing as, as coincidence. Coincidence. I believe in luck. You believe in luck? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yes, okay. I'm a luck yeah. man myself. Um, yeah. And so we met through, I was doing this thing called the Witch's Sabbath. And I had Stanton LeVay who was going to be a part of it with me. And we did a satanic almanac. You can read it on free for an archive.org. And he did some stuff that was racist. And Avi called him out on it. And Stanton decided to argue with Avi, and Avi basically, but one of the, I didn't mean to chuckle, but it was the way, it, this is the way it goes, I'm going to chuckle. It was just funny, because Avi's like, you can't tell me what, because Stanton's like, that's not racist, and Avi's like, I'm, I'm a black man, you can't really tell me what racist is. <laughs> you know, like, so I sort of chuckled at that moment, like, but Stan kept going digging in, and I was like, Stanton, you know, you, you, we can't work together, you know, I don't know why this is happening, I don't know why you're doing this, because... Like I said, we take quite a beating, Stanton, and, and he, I think he would admit it himself. We, we've got a lot of issues to overcome. We're very angry and, and can be very, we're very dangerous people, actually. And so, Stanton, I don't know, I, I don't want to give him any dispen, you know, he's fucked up. And that came out there. And I started talking to Avi, and I think we talked about this on your thing. Avi, we first started challenging, like, he's like, fuck. And it just turned out that we became friends in a reasonable conversation. We start. I don't know. You tell so him how it's it is. Weird, it's weird. So I met Avi. I, I, wanna, I, I didn't want to overtalk you. you know? And I'm thankful that Avi would take so. my to the, listen to me. I'm thankful that Avi paid attention and and he 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 took time to understand. And Avi's gone to the length that he introduced to introduce me to his family and his children. And I don't get to get introduced to children too much. So we'll 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 get to that. Okay. But let's 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 start with the thing with Stanton because uh, it was so weird to that, that the way we met. I it was like my body language. Dude, it was so weird the way we fucking met. It was like I called him out like, yo, this is racism. He was like, No, it's not. Stanton. Uh, yeah, we're talking about Stanton. We're talking about Stanton. You know, I called Stanton out, I'm like, you know, this is racist and he was like, No, it's not. You know, this is not racist. I'm like I'm, I'm a black dude. If I if I tell you that this is racist to black people, you can't rebuttal. Like, you just have to understand that this is fucking racist to us. You know, and that was a weird fucking thing. But it was from that, it was like from the turmoil 
is is where you know it, it's from the chaos that the phoenix was born right and here we are it's this weird it's this weird fucking thing you know I love you brought the phoenix so it, it's the way that 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 it works it's like um only through fire can we can we through the destruction can we have some a chance to rebuild right yeah i, I I, I'm so, I'm so awful. It's a photo. I, I don't look good, you know. <laughs> Fix your hair. It's a little fluffy. I know. My hair needs to be fluffed out. I need to. You know what? Everything looks fucking bad when you're sitting down. You know, if you notice, the last 24 hour radio is the thing. I did not sit. I wasn't standing for 24 hours, you know. And I'm, 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 I basically sit all the time now. At 50, you fucking sit. But so, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I know, but you're right, man. You know, um, it, it's this thing where we have to tear it down. And so um, I think that that's what this is about, you know. Um, we got to go back to the roots, right? Um, if we're talking about roots, you know, because we like we're gonna talk about a lot, right? The atheism versus the theism, and the, we're gonna talk about our opinions. All this, all this we're stuff, get the opinions, it, right? I don't think and, Avi uh, and I agree on a lot. I, I, we yeah. we agree on a lot, but we don't agree on a lot. It's good. It's it seems to, it's gonna be a good conversation. That's the that's kind of the satanic way, right? Is to be able to sit down and have disagreements, but we can still have a, a logical conversation see one of the satanic things that's bothering me right now is aesthetics like i gotta look okay here oh man here we go we here go. he goes let me fix my hair yeah my hair okay? how are you looking baby so yeah i mean and that's that's what we're here to do we're here to you know sh to take to rip the negativity out you know um you know i didn't even know this at first but I just had the Satanic Bible. I found that, you know, found the book when I was a teenager. Like, I think most people find it when they're a teenager, you know. But um, I found it when I was a teenager. And I had no idea it was attached to the Midas right. You know, you don't even know about that stuff. You know, uh, how could you? It's not written in there. That's you know? how, I, you know, it's funny. That's that's exactly how my relationship with LeVay came about, though. I he wrote him and said, you know, um, you could. I, I want to give you the chance to write a forward for this because this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to market this book to the Goths and let them know this is the original Satanic Bible, in which he argued with me is it not the original? You know, he's, I took only small chunks out of it. So he explained that to me, you know, before he made me a priest, a high priest, reverend, whatever, however you want to call it. And so he explained that he took what he found extremely blasphemous, but he took a lot of the. I don't want to say hate, because blasphemy is hate. He took a lot of the unreasonable thing, like the, the thing that didn't represent the Church of Satan, which is this is where it comes into bothers bothers me, where people put on Levay that he's a racist. It's like in the in the rules, and it, he doesn't have rules, but but in the fucking whatever you call him, I I'm fuck off. I'm old. Sacraments, fucking tenants, what, tenants, tenants yeah. rules, the laws, whatever. How you do you like it. this for for one of Levay's representatives? I don't fucking know, and I don't care. The idea is the, the rules. Yeah, the idea in this philosophy, though, it uh, talks about that, that uh, there's no hate of anyone but stupid people, and he also defines stupidity as basically willfully stupid. He, it, it, Levey gives disclaimer, a, a, a dispensation for ignorance, because everyone is ignorant of something, and you can fix ignorant, but stupidity is is not being fixed, which is he basically says uh, in in to sum it up, stupidity is willful ignorance. You know better. And you still fucking do it. That's right. not allowed. Ignorance is you don't know. You don't know and you ignorant. You you have no knowledge of it. Stupidity is when you have knowledge and you keep doing the stupid shit anyway. You know, and you do know. That's the that's the total difference right there. You know? What would I do for twenty four hours like this? I'm gonna be exhausted. <laughs> but we got it. We got it. We're gonna move around. We're not gonna stay right here, right? We got it move the camera around and do some other stuff, have some fun, eat some food and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but so Avi, you know, when I asked him to do this, we, you know, it was, I'll tell you, when I, I first approached Avi, I said, hey, you want to do this show? I was so excited when um, Satanic, uh, inf this is, this is fucking total uh, PTSD issues that I'm having communicating right now just to let you fucking know okay i don't really like that my mind's been fucked up because it's the best thing about me um so i'm not really happy about this kind of shit what the fuck are we talking about i'm totally having like a total memory fucking shit sorry take a minute yeah so we fucking talking about. so what we were no you fucked me up now though no, good you have ptsd too <laughs> 
uh, anxiety, but okay. who doesn't? You know? Well, that's a P- like PTSD <laughs> knocks the fucking shit out of you sometimes where you're like, oh, I don't know what the fuck it was happening. So we were talking about stripping out the, the negative aspects of it, right? So we were talking about how, you know, well, basically I wanted to go back into how Anton, you know, one thing that he, like, I assumed that he wanted to do with that book because the book is pretty much built around hate. You know, for the most part, it, it can it can might is right. Hate. Right, we're talking about might is right. The the might is right kind of is it has a lot of hate. It misses the aspect of care. It misses that, and I think that um, what Anton tried to do was add the positive elements in that he felt felt like was missing. Well, how I interpreted might is right is very much from a fry cook perspective like Anton LaVey. So I've always seen the Satanic Bible and even might is right as a warning of what was around me. Because I, I understand I have a certain amount of privilege, but as a poor person, we don't have any power, not even barely collectively. That's why we, we, we have to have a union to have a small smidgen of power. And so might is right was something when I read it, it was like I was listening to a banker or everyone that's ever told me to do wrong when it says the downtrodden are there by their own accord. Well, that's everything every abusive person has ever said to me. So I just saw it as another asshole that I'm going to fucking destroy. So when I, and I think I, this is what I think I was going before. I think in the 24 hour radio show, so, okay. Oh, this is where I was going. This is why it was so hard. So I'm going to go back. Um, the idea is that I didn't, I didn't know, and I know this is weird, even obvious, like, how did you not? Every people like, how? I didn't really understand. Okay, three or four weeks ago was the first time I looked back on Might Is Right, that radio show, and read the transcript. and Because re- I've heard those little clips that are weaponized, like the N-word and the J, the, you know, all this. I've heard those and seen those, and I, I can, in that, in their context, I can go, you know, this is out of context, I can explain that. But when I looked over it as a whole... Like, I was like, oh, wow. And I started looking through it, and I'm like, and I, and then I pressed play on a button, and I was like, yeah, I can't even hear this. And I read through it, and I was like, wow, we really got off the fucking rails. And it's uncomfortable for me to read. It's embarrassing for me to hear a lot of that. But that's much like a lot of older artwork of mine. Okay? Um, you grow up and you learn. I think in that original one, though, I know, I think me, me, me and my partner... Now recording. What the fuck? Me and my partner... Um, oh, see, this is going to fuck... No, that'll kill me. Like, eh. There we go. We went for Slurpees. What was... I don't know what I'm saying, <laughs> saying there. I'm just you were gonna, talking I'm just, about how... Uh, you know they used to have sugar-free missing, Slurpees? They don't anymore? It was misinterpreted. Oh, yeah, we were talking about Palestine in there. We were like, we, I remember, I think at some point, one of these 24-hour radio shows, we're like, we saw, I, I, I think I was like, I want to print 100,000 copies of Might as Right as a newspaper and hand them out to everyone in Palestine. So I, that was the concept of, like, I wanted to empower poor people with this concept of, you know, it's misguided, you know, young and dumb and, and ignorant, not having, you know, I'm, I'm self-taught, so this is <coughs> the way it is. Anyway. And I'm the only one that studied Might as Right as much as any, I, I've studied it more than LeVay. So I, I, I went up to the LeBeau department up in Michigan um, and talked to a professor up there that studied it. I went to the U- University of Chicago and pulled out all the Lion's Paw archives and found that when people would discount Ragnar Redbeard as some drunken thing, the idea, the, the, here's the thing about Ragnar. Ragnar wrote with Upton Sinclair. Ragnar R- Redbeard wrote with some of the greatest authors of our time. And he wrote it, and, and Might is Right came out of Chicago out of the Lion's Paw newspaper, out of the university. So it came out of Chicago. Like legitimately, Ragnar Redbeard was here writing with Upton Sinclair about the jungle and all this shit. So they were activists writing again. They were activists. So this one I would talk about earlier, like cultural context. When we take that book out of that moment and bring it all the way here, it's a different thing. But in that moment, it was, it was, it was working at the system. It was, a, it was something that was a counterculture product. Much that's the history I'm from. So it was looking to chip away at things, and then those intentions become something else, as we can see with Satanism. Levey's intent is growing into all these perverse little weird things that have nothing to do with Satanism. And Carla Levey is going to be on her a little later to explain to you why you've done bad and wrong. <laughs> so I think it's I think it's safe to say, you know, in, in so many words, like. 
it's, it's been taken way out of context and it's grown into this beast that it's almost like impossible to tame. You know, it's, it's like almost like the, the, impossible to tame. You know, it seems like right. it's like everyone comes to it and they're like, oh, this is the perfect excuse for me to be the worst person possible. I, yeah, well, that, that, that Satanism attracts that. I don't know, for, for my, I don't understand. This whole thing blows my mind because I, I'm always blown away by how stupid fucking stupid people can be and I mean willfully ignorant the motherfuckers between be, that weaponize that shit are the total willfully ignorant about what they're doing they know that they're hurt they, they know that like weaponizing um, words like that doesn't bother a lot of Satanists actually like it might even attract Satanists to me and go they'll be like why'd you say those words like they'll want to know more they don't just like hear the word and go oh. it doesn't happen that way in Satanism it doesn't. It doesn't happen that way for the most part. They try to understand things. At this juncture in the world, we are definitely uh, concerned about every word that's being said, and we should be. I, I. I mean, I don't even. I don't think that word would exist in the satanic conversation. Okay, so I'm a 50 year old man. This is a. This is a whole history of the use of profanities that are upsetting to the public, and it's also half of my life. 25 of those years was pre-internet, and that does matter. They don't fucking say it doesn't, because it does. It does. Yeah, when you open up the world to all of this education. You know, oh, I'll tell you, this was interesting. I, I wanted to make sure. Like, okay, so I'm one of these, almost like an alt-right person. I'm not. But when I look at the alt-right today, I'm like, oh, my God, that was us, wasn't it? That was sort of us being these idiots on the Internet saying these stupid things, getting attention, and going, well, I'll say more of those stupid things to get more attention. So it was like we were sort of involved in that. Fucking A. Well, right, when I look back on it, but but we weren't. Like, all my friends here that are liberal artists, I'm like, did you take me as a fucking alt-right person? And they're like, no. Like, it does never... seem like... But they would have never worked with me. Like, all, yeah. all of my artists, we're all liberals. So they're like, but I'm like, but look, when we look back on it, they're like, yeah. And my one friend, I did this Angry White Male tour poster. Angry White Male, it has a rebel flag, and we're out there. And he's like, yeah, I, I remember printing that poster for me, but I would have never printed it if I thought you were racist. And I'm like, yeah, but would you ever print that poster now because it has a rebel flag? And he's like, no. And I go, right, but we printed them back then because it, because that, so that was the deal. It, but none of these, okay, so what I was trying to explain is I'm on Facebook, and it's a long time ago, but it was when the rebel flag controversy was happening in the South, a, 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 the recent one. And it was really going, they have to take these flags. And I'm like arguing on the side of just, it's no big deal, all these things. And, oh, Bree, Bree Newsom, a great activist, she climbed up, a f artist, climbed up a pole and took the flag down in front of the government office got arrested on the shit and i was like that is bold what the fuck wow so that bold artistic moment put me on pause and i'm like i gotta hear this so i got in an exchange on there i'm like yeah and i'm i'm basically like free speech or you know what and what happened no one started calling me fucking names what happened was a lot of intelligent people engaged me and started to communicate to me where i could understand them they took the time to understand me and go, okay, we want to talk. And they brought me along. And within five days in that conversation, in that thread, I had changed my mind. But I can guarantee you that someone started calling me names, I would have started like, oh, I'm going to start. I'm, here's, here, how, about, how about I post a rebel flag right under your asshole? So, well, that's what starts happening when you're, you have this, these issues that are unresolved. Trauma, mm -hmm. anger, you know, you... I, explode, yeah. Yeah, and I have a lot of, you know, poor people have a lot of issues. So this isn't exclusive to white people. It's, it's it's Poor people have a lot of issues because we have no tools to deal with them. People just have a lot of But no, issues. poor people. But poor people. We don't have the tools. You know more, what? Yeah. You know what really incited me, a riot in my head that it really humbled me and has brought the life out of me? Like, I'm just floored. I want to lay on the ground and die almost. Is when I got therapy... And I started going to therapy, and I and I, things started clearing up in my head. I started feeling better, and I'm like, you mean that's all it took? You mean if you had this in grade school, if every grade school had this, if everyone had access to this, people yeah. would make better decisions in their life? So see the you hold these from us? So that little bit changed my life so much, I was like, oh, poor people, I get it, we're fucked. You fuck us over poor for- Poor people can't afford therapy. That's and exactly, they, and the reason that they, exactly what but, it is. but they fill prisons with us, from, with me, with with Stanton, with our kind. We're we're in, we're awful. We can be awful people, 
Right. And poor people, we know, we know some, you know, you, you can be very awful. And, and I know a lot of people that have been in prison, and they're not awful people. They did an awful thing because they were in awful circumstances. But most of those motherfuckers got the biggest heart. 90% of convicts are poor. They just poor without the tools so, to deal with things. Yeah, it's a weird thing to be in a place where it's like, you know, you, you get back, your back is against the wall. You know, if we're talking about real shit, let's talk about real shit. I mean, it, you don't know what it's like until you, your kids ain't got nothing to eat, until you're fucking starving. You don't know where your next meal is coming from. Then you start to think of, then the world becomes fucking real. You yeah, know, yeah. for people that are, the Ivy League school motherfuckers that, you know, people that got the shit handed to them, they can't, they have no concept. What's the worst you ever had it? You ever have a salad dressing sandwich? Uh, I've had a fucking air, I've had a piece of well, a sandwich, sandwich that a course. motherfucker handed me out the window when I was juggling clubs on the street out here in Chicago. Nice. The bucket boys beat on the buckets. I knew how to juggle clubs, so I had a one up on them. And I was getting fucking sandwiches handed out the window. I remember having so hard. I, we, we, we were able to get a loaf of bread, and we would go to the some McDonald's or wherever they, Wendy's, they have the packages of Thousand Island dressing, and we'd stuff them in our pockets. And that was our sandwich. We yeah. had Thousand Island dressings and toast because that had calories and, and you know, fat carbs. So it was, that's all we fucking had. It was, yeah. So when, when you're coming from that, and see, I've been able to elevate myself a bit out of that environment. And when I, like I spoke at Harvard twice, okay? When you're able to see behind that curtain and you see how rich people live and how they're like, yeah, everything's chill. Like, they're just chill. And they, like, if I have a disagreement, I just talk about it. Just, I don't throw a cup against the fucking wall, you know, break hold. I don't, I'll smash the place to the ground. You know, this is, I know it's not the best life. It's not the best to deal with like that. But that's, when you're raised that way, that's what happens. You know. We call that bougie, right? That's when you get bougie. You, oh, what? Well, I'll slap you with my napkin instead uh, of actually yeah, I'm fighting all... with you. You know, oh no! <laughs> and then you come to Chicago and we bust your motherfucking head off the curb. I'm you know, all bougie. I like a nice, go. I like a nice truffle salt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I just feel like uh, it's a weird fucking divide, dude. It's a, uh, it's it's a classism thing, right? It's a classism thing, right? It's oh, like absolutely, absolutely, we're fucked. It's a fucking classism thing, dude. I was trying to stand those fucking things up beforehand. You notice he laid my books down. I like that's no, why I love. That's why I love Hurley. No, Hurley knows. Avi knows. Avi not. Avi's like, let's put these down and put these up. But well, that I appreciate you about too, though. So I, you can't say that. Um, I appreciate that though. I appreciate. I tried to stand them. They were they were paperbacks. Uh, there we go. Use the thick one to stand up the paperbacks. That's the way you do that. Uh, whatever. There we go. Booyah. Okay. Hold the hold the other one up. <laughs> no, we're good. All right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, um, it's a classism thing, bro. It's almost it, it's almost safe to say that you know most people get into Satanism because it's it's non judgmental, whereas uh, it seems like everything else is is more judgmental. Like, do you think I, I kinda, Satanism is non judgmental? I think it's, it can be a lot. A lot. Uh, it's, it offers the space of non-judgmental. Satan doesn't care if you're a drug addict. He don't care if you fucking smoke weed. He don't care if you smoke cigarettes. He don't care if you're fat. It's sort of skinny, a nuanced whatever. judgment, though. It's you sort know? of like, well, it's it is. We are judgmental, but it's nuanced. Like, well, I, how's that going to affect me? You know, you start you start pondering it. Like, I don't know if I want to smoke during my house. <laughs> they fucking leave tobacco stains. You know, you, so you start to become judgmental. You know, but, but you're right. I mean, you don't, we're you, talking about the door. When you first come, let's say we fresh out, you, you figure out religion is bullshit. And then you, you see the satanic Bible, you pick it up, you go, oh. The first thing out the door, you're like, oh, finally, somebody that won't fucking judge me. Finally, somebody that's not pushing me away and telling me I'm the wrong thing. Everybody been telling me a sinner, and this book says sinners are winners. Finally, it's a, it's a place where I can fit in, and everybody's not shoving my ass out the door. I think that's why people, some people land here. Early, I got to ask you, as a Satanist, how did you land in this living room? Especially now, I come up from that Miners Right show. I don't fucking know what's going on in that show as much as I thought I did. And I asked Colonel uh, Avi, "Hey, you want to do the show with you know it's, these kids? Talk to me. It was a fun time the interview." And then I started looking it over, and I'm like, "Huh, fuck." And then I'm like, "Oh, I'm gonna lose Avi as a friend now." Oh, there that goes. And uh, then I just have to start. 
calling all the people of color that I'm friends with, going, you know, there's this audio floating around. I didn't realize it was so awful, and I want to apologize if you know about it. And if you don't know about it, please do not look at it or read it or think about it or listen. You know, so I had to do that for a week after I started, when we started getting into the show, I started making all these calls. I was, you know, I didn't realize. And, it, and I sheltered and all that, but I just wonder so, at that moment, how did you, because so, I know you were like, hey, dude, I did lose. I said, please listen to the podcast. So go ahead. So it, it was this, first of all, that was one of the hardest fucking things I've ever done. What? Listen to that fucking podcast all the way through. I'm yeah. sorry, dude. Um, I apologize. That was one of the hardest things I ever fucking did. Um, mainly because, I mean, of what it is. You know, it's just so fucking, some of the stuff is so fucking racist. It's just like, ugh, you know. And then I have kids, so I was, like, struggling to figure out how to fucking listen to it. But, um, but seeing the, the way that I can be here and sit with you and do this, even after that, even after all of that, is because I can understand the concept of, like you mentioned, that being a static moment. This country, was, the entire country was racist at one point. The, having right. slaves was le a legal fucking thing to do. So the entire country was disgusting. So for me to single you out and go, oh, this 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 poor kid that, that's been abused or whatever, and here he goes, an artist trying to express himself, I'm supposed to single you out for one fucking moment and you were also miseducated by the same fucking system. That's right. just a stupid fucking thing to do. That's me also not being a human being. And if I'm gonna be an intelligent human being, then the least I can do is realize that there's space for people to change. Or to make mistakes. There's space for people to make yeah. mistakes. There's space for people to fuck up. You know, and it's tremendous. Because I think you fucked up big. And most people don't fuck up that big. You see what I'm saying? You fucked up. So I did good doing you that. You fucked up a big enough to As where. As said, if you're gonna be the big, you're gonna be the center on the block. Be the be biggest. Be the biggest center. So I was the biggest. Dude, okay. you got. If you're gonna fuck up, you might as well fuck up big because at least that way people will see who the fuck you are. You can try. You can try to pick up the pieces of the explosion afterwards. Yeah. But if you don't make no explosion, then you're you're not even a star in the sky. And All I, the stars come from explosions. You know, and I, I don't want to stop you from communicating, but I, I want to—I want to make something really fucking clear. I'm not afraid of fucking shit, and I'm not doing this out of fucking fear. You got that? I fucking do what I want when I want. If you were afraid, you wouldn't be here. I'm not. Yeah, that's fucking right. And I tell you, I, the other day in the grocery store, this motherfucker cuts in line, cuts in fucking line in Chicago. Okay, that could be a death sentence. And I'm just like, okay, I have my basket on the floor. I pick it up. And he goes, oh, were you here? And I go, yeah, you're a fucking asshole. And he goes, you should watch your mouth. And I go, motherfucker, I'm not going to watch my mouth for shit. I'm going to say exactly what I want when I fucking want. You're going to do something? He's a young guy, too, but he knows. He I go, yeah, you're from Schaumburg, right? And he goes, right away. Anyway, my point is, I'm doing this because I struggled with these ideas. I struggled with might is right. I struggled with what happened. I sat on a fucking beach for fucking two years. I sat at the end of the earth and sat and looked at waves and thought about what was going on. And at that time, the internet was popping and people were talking. And you fucking look back on a year at the wheel and they're calling me the Johnny Appleseed of podcasting. And what am I doing in that fucking thing? What am I saying in that fucking book after might is right? I go, I'm going around the country spreading the idea of podcasting to the ghettos of the world so we can finally film the atrocities in our fucking cities. And so when that's bubbling, as I go around the country and do that, and I'm watching all these atrocities on the internet going, my God, this is real. This is real. We can see this now. Everyone is filming it. There's no denying that black folks are fucking hunted in America, okay? That's what it looks like to me at this point after 10 years of watching horrible police videos all fucking day, all night, on the line. It's like, that's not fucking cool. So you can see this with your own two eyes. You can just see it. So I came to those conclusions like that. And if you think, if anyone in Portland or in Chicago think you're intimidating me or anything, you're not. And hell will fucking be the best thing to happen to you. Mother, mm. 
I'm a lot, speak on that too. No, a lot of people have fucked with me because uh, weaponized things against me and fucked with me in ways that they're going to sit there and try to take credit for something. Or, oh, look, I broke that motherfucker. No one broke me. This is from my heart. And if anyone thinks I'm doing this to uh, uh, whatever the fuck you want to say, you're wrong. And you can say it to my face. Go ahead. Uh, you, you nailed it. I, you ain't got nothing else to say. That's, not, that's me hitting the, the nail with the hammer. <laughs> okay. I, I, know, I don't mean to get all angry, but that, <laughs> that upsets me because people, so, people have really... It's so fucking weird, it's, dude. Then almost, it's almost like, the, like I said, when people are going to poke me at it or dude. do things against me, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go the exact opposite route then. Oh, you want me to be woke? Oh, yeah. you want it? You yeah. know, I'm that, I'm that idiot. I'm an it's, idiot. It's like weird. I'm, I'm trying to, like, tell people about the shit. You know, I'm like, you know, you don't understand what it's like, the struggle of, you can't really understand being black if you're not black. And motherfuckers right. can't get that through their head. And I'm like, look, you see, I live in white water. You know, Whitewater, Wisconsin. White, Whitewater, Wisconsin, and that's like a little small ass sundown town, believe it or not. Mm. And so it's like me being a black man out there. I was telling you when we were going to get your tacos and shit. I'm like, I can't even speak loud. If I if I speak too loud, I'm going to jail. You know, it's just that <laughs> it's that fuck simple. I could be just driving down the street. And it was like, oh, black man driving. Let's fucking fuck with him because he's driving down the street. It's that simple. After a certain time, I got to be in the house. I can't and, be wandering around outside. And, and Avi tells me that as we, we go to get a little something to eat before the show, and we're walking down the block, and he's telling me that. And I know that that ain't going to happen to me. That's the truth. I, I can. And you know what? I can yell at a police officer, and they will back away. And I do see the difference, and it is a reality. Any of you people that are from the community that I understand as... Um, racialists or anything like that you're full of shit I know what the fuck is going on I fucking traveled the world I seen it I fucking studied it everything we were saying or doing in that show like that was, or, or you're saying is wrong it just is wrong pay attention to what's going on look at the facts and fucking then reapproach your hate sell it a different way but there is obvious proof that this is happening so you have to now up your game you can't use those excuses. You, you, it's visible. I don't feel like it was ever invisible, but that could just be because I'm black. <laughs> well, for me, you got to understand. Also, for me, I was shit. going through my own traumas and barely yeah. surviving. I've lived in a car, so I don't give a fuck. So, like when I'm doing, I'm like, I'm only dealing with this in front of me. Poor, I get you know, that. E eviction, I get that. I get like this. Shit. So it's like when I finally got therapy and I was calmed down. I'm like, oh yeah, okay. I oh, get that shit. Oh, dude. oh, and then so, the meat. Yeah, anyway. No, I get it because with with therapy, dude, and that's funny, dude, because I'm I'm so interested in in therapy, and 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 trying to help people. People think therapy heals. We kind of were talking about this. People think therapy can heal you. Therapy doesn't heal you. Therapy teaches you how to deal with your fucking bullshit because bullshit doesn't go away. Life right. has bullshit. You just have to learn how to deal with that. It helps bullshit. to. It, I have noticed that by that learning you can rewire your brain exactly. how your brain reacts to things if you uh, exactly i was put through some shit and i'll tell you almost basically like cult shit okay cult just think of any person who survived the cult and had to that is basically what some of the therapy i had to go through when i first left everything i loved i was in therapy for a year and four months almost four times a week four times a week for over a year I saw a therapist three times and a psychiatrist once a week for over a year. A psychiatrist and a therapist, that, that was my I, full time. I could barely walk across the street. That's how fucked I was. And so I'm, I'm happy to regain a little bit of my mind back. And I'm going to use every bit of that, as uh, most of it, on, on revenge. I'm going to use the other part on uh, pussy eating, which is sex. <laughs> Was that misogynistic? It's not. It's not misogynistic. It's just a love. Love and pussy is not misogynistic. Okay, that's so all I'm know. saying. It's love, and I. It's all, pretty much all shapes and sizes. Because so. even, 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 uh, I don't know if I should say female. Is that misogynistic? Fuck. I don't know. But we well, can't we say anything. Well, you can educate us. Any, oh, any, young, no. any gender can love pussy. Yeah, there I, we I go. think <laughs> you can. But the youngsters are out there to educate us. I'm listening. I love. Yeah. I love a lot of what's happening in the conversation today, though. I see a lot of hypocrisy, like any generation. Oh my God! But but I, I love where everything's going, man. I would, 
I think the kids got it. I wish I wish we had a twenty fucking year old president. And for and for the record, anybody that doesn't know what a fucking cult is, because he was like trying to explain a cult a little bit there, just look at Christianity. That's a fucking cult. Right oh well, there. just look at the Satanic Temple. That's another fucking cult. And you yeah. it, you know it sounds abstract, you motherfuckers. Because I guess, I, I forget how long it's been around. I'm talking to people that are 16. They've been, like, fucking reading about the Satanic Temple for a decade. Trust me, I was there. We studied cults and all this stupid shit to fucking toy with your fucking emotions. And when we were younger, that's what you do. You fucking play with people's emotions and play with their heads. But, uh, and you're going to, just stay tuned. You're going to hear Carla LeVay talk about this stuff. And it's really cool. And I love Carla. And she's daddy's little girl. And she's been shunned and fucking disrespected for far too long from too many people. And how could you Satanists that talk about all this shit let this woman, leader, sit there and not go to get answers from her? She was there holding her fucking dad's hand. Her dad was Tony, and she watched him grow into Anton LaVey, holding his hand, looking up, watching every flinch of that motherfucker, every little thing. She knows everything. She has every answer about satanic world, but you're going to go to the satanic temple from some idiot. Like, that guy's a security guard at bookstores. That's what Doogie is qualified as, okay? And when he was at Harvard, he was working at some books, book company, a big Simon & Schuster, investigating book, small bookstores for theft uh, from a publisher. Like, if they didn't return enough books. That's what kind of cunt this is. Ooh. And I say cunt not in, in an abstract way, not in a, a mouse of size. I got a library book I didn't return. Yeah, and, and Doobie's coming after you. See, I don't like this chair because it makes me look... I'm not so round when I stand, you motherfuckers. Uh. <laughs> That's funny, dude. You're a funny guy. Uh, I remember I, I met this porn shoot once, and the guy's trying to get me... You know, I'm, I'm, listen. I love grabbing that camera. <laughs> But no, I'm at this porn shoot once. The guy goes, sit down like this and do like this. And I'm like, I look like a ball. He's like, no, sit. I'm like, yeah, I'm never doing that, dude. Like, you know, so. <laughs> I look like a ball. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm concerned. One guy said, I want to take a picture of it for this newspaper cover. He's like, lay on your back and we're going to put the books around your head. I'm like, I'm never doing that. So he's like, no. like the ball look. Right, he's like, he's like, come on, just lay down. I'm like, dude, I'm never laying on my back and having a photo taken like that. It never fucking happened, bro. <laughs> Take a photo like this. Believe me, I was, I was glad I was so, at that moment for that show, I was glad I was toxic. He's okay. like, how do you want it? I go, with a big knife in my hand, stabbing a Bible. And that was the photo. Oh, man, that's so funny. That's hilarious. That's I'll, I'll, funny. Ah, whatever, I'm I yammer. It's like Uncle Shane is here. Uncle, Uncle Shane. Call me uncle. Call me uncle. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, okay, okay. Let's get back to the heavy. Uh, let's get back to the heavy. So with that show, man, um, and the stuff you did after it, you know, after the after the podcast, you know, the the podcast happened. Where was the first place you went? Because you were telling me about this, but I want you to bring it up. What do you let's mean? Talk about. It. So you said that. Do you that, mean my my career? Right. No. No. Right after the podcast, you said that that it started at ground zero. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Okay, so you're talking, yeah, you're talking about my artistic vision or my career. Okay, so I get that. So, okay, as quick as I can. So we did that Might Is Right podcast. And so, you know, to promote books and stuff like that. And then we had, a, what I remember, it was fun. And what I remember, we all loved each other and we were friends. I don't really understand how it could be so different, but that's how memories are. After that, we were run out of that town, me and my wife, because we decided to do an event with the kids from A Christmas Story, the movie. And we decided to do that because we were living in Hammond, Indiana. And it was a, a shithole, or whatever you want to call it. I lived it. there also. So I, I know that you shithole. Know, you know that shithole. So Hammond was really fucking bad. Cancer clinics on every corner. Refinery oil, the squirrels are black because of the oil. So. I bought a house there for 20 grand and fixed it up. Okay. We find out that the author of A Christmas Story, Gene Shepard, lived there. You shoot your eye out, kid. And this guy, Gene Shepard, is a fucking Satanist. And he's great. Look into his older work if you like. You know, he's real intellectual, great guy. Writes great stories, tells great stories. He could tell a fucking great story about a garbage 
rapper on the ground blowing around. He could talk about it for 72 hours and it sounds great. So we find this out and we start talking to people. Hey, the cab driver, whatever. Do you know that Chris, the author? Like, what's an author? What are you talking about? And I can relate to this kind of ignorance because like a lot of you out there, you might have, uh, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. Well, me, I'm the first person to willfully buy books in my family and enjoy them, okay? So when I hear Gene Shepard, this, this, this lot of my kin, my ignorant kin in Hammond doesn't know what a fucking book is or an author, I'm like, we're gonna bring, the, the, we're gonna bring literacy to these motherfuckers. We're gonna bring the kids from the movie out there and make a spectacle and show them, hey, this is a book that was written in your town. You all can write books too. You can do the same thing as this guy, and he's all over Hollywood and everything. So we're there and trying to encourage this. Well, of course, what happens? Someone weaponizes some bullshit against us about, and this is the racism stuff uh, no one cared about until recently, until the old internet opened up. No, we were wep- the shit that was weaponized against us then was Satanism. So it was like, Satan's doing this event with Christmas Story. The town of Hammond, Indiana made me and my wife sign papers, and it literally said this on the contract, that we will not endorse or summon Satan or have any Satan products in the building while the kids from A Christmas Story were there. And I'm like meeting with the mayor and everyone. I'm like, why would we do that, though? It's Who would buy it at the Christmas? We, I don't understand what... But they made us sign these really weird papers. So we do that event, and we get run out of that town. What happens there? I own the house. So after that event happens, I got the key to the city, got in a fight with the mayor's assistant upstairs. There was a big window open, and we were three floors up, and I said, dude, you're about to go out that fucking window. So maybe I got run out of town for that too, but you never know. But they come over there, and they said there's a water leak or something by your house, and it's going to cost a hundred grand to fix, so you got to move. They... They do all these cities do anything they can. They, they get you out if they want. You don't have any rights, especially if you don't have money to fight. So they push us out of there. And at that same time, I'm getting offers from a pornographer in New York. Come to New York and work for me, Shane. You are the, you are the P.T. Barnum of porn. Please come here. You can sell porn. You can do this. You deserve a, three, uh, you deserve a six-figure salary. You are that good at marketing. My wife's father has a stroke. I decide to... I don't want to say it's the worst decision of my life, kids. I made a decision of the heart and not the pocketbook. But in this world, that's not the best decision. I go up to Ely, Minnesota to help my, my wife's father. And I go up there, no one's going to buy skull stuff, whatever, Satan stuff. I'm so, I start a soda pop company, and it's very successful. It's so successful, the Minnesota Vikings say, we want to put it in our stadium, which means I'm going to be a millionaire. And that's not a joke. And which means all of a sudden these people from the pop companies like, hey, you know, this is your check. You know what's going to happen next? I'm like, what? The Minnesota Vikings are going to sell my soda. Like, no, no. You know what happens? Once that happens, I go, what? And they go, Pepsi just comes in and buys it. And then they shelf it. Pepsi controls shelf space and everything. They don't let it go. So what Pepsi will do when you're threatening those shelves is they'll come in and say, what number do you want to put on that check? And they give you that number. So I'm right there. I'm right there. I'm like, yeah, I'm accepting this. Satan was weaponized against me again. And we were run out of Ely, Minnesota in the middle of the night, threatened with our lives and left most of my stuff behind. So that was, the, I think, the third or fourth time I lost stuff. At that point, I was like, we have nothing. We have nothing to lose. Why don't we take this new invention the cell phone that flipped open and had a small little camera on there, and I was big into the internet then. And I realized we would all have our channel someday. I mean, I know, I know this is y'all, but, but it, back in the day, no one understood this. They had phones and they had these little cameras. I knew those would eventually become, everyone would have their own TV station, their own ability to do what we're doing here. But I said, this is the last chance in American history to take advantage of being a filmmaker and an author and a big deal because everyone's going to be a filmmaker and an author in another six minutes. So why don't we take all these cool t- internet tools and travel the country and get the story of voters because I hated voters then. I was like, if you participate in the system, I hate you. If you're not participating in pulling this system down somehow, I hate you. I vote now. So we went on this road trip. 
and it was called the year at the wheel and all this and, and it, it, we spent over a year and a, a year and a half on that road when Obama was running for president the first time and we were in Washington DC when he won the night he won in Washington DC and we were there because people said it was going to be dangerous and it was going to be burned down in riots and I was like let's go um, one of the best parties ever anyway we do this book and the start of the book is in Chicago because that's where me and my wife are from that's where Mighty's Right is from that's where Anton LaVey was born Chicago's a big fucking deal this is where anarchists fought for the weekends. The reason you have weekends is because of the fight that Chicagoans have. And so we start here. And before I did Might is Right, before Anton LaVey knew me, I was hanging out with people like John Sinclair from the White Panthers. That was an offshoot of the Black Panthers. And he was a real hippie. I was hanging out with Bob Rudnick, Righteous Rudnick. And Rudnick did the radio station back then. He knew Janis Joplin, and he knew Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn, and he would tell me all these great stories about them planting bombs in the Pentagon. Or the real story of Hustle in a pornography magazine and how they stole that from Chicagoans, Bob Rudnick and Skip Williamson, and they came in, took a phone book to Bob's, the side of Bob's head. We had big phone books that were like trees. And Bob would say, they just keep smashing me in the head until blood came out of my ears and nose, and then we gave him the magazine. Anyway, these were old hippies, and they were very leftist hippies. And they, they're the ones who jumped me into what I do, which is the counterculture at that time. And they, they brought in this thing. They, they told me about Fred Hampton. Now everyone knows about Fred Hampton now because of the Internet. But back then, that was mouth-to-ear history. And when they talk about critical race theory and black history, it truly was never taught in school then. And we didn't, no one knew about the Fred Hampton. No one knew about this shit. It was underground. And so these underground hippies were telling me about this shit. And they say, the cops came and killed Fred Hampton. I'm like, that's never going to happen. They'll be in jail. No, they wouldn't do that. They're going to be in jail. I'm arguing with them. Okay, I'm 21 years old. They go, next weekend they bring in all this stuff. They bring in a guy who the Black Panthers let in to shoot the scene, like shoot all the photos of the death scenes. He lays all these photos on the fucking table. They bring in people to talk to me about it. Oh my God, at the end of the fucking shift, I'm crying. They totally broke me. And these motherfuckers did it again and again. I love what happened at Waco. I remember that. And they're, I'm like, I love it. I love these fucking Christians burning. And these hippies yelled at me. How could you say that? The government is doing that. And, they, and I, by the end of that conversation, I'm crying again. Oh, man, these motherfuckers were great. So they're the, they're the heart of what I do, these leftists. They understood. They understood all the race, and they understood this stuff. So they brought me into that. That's, that, that's where I was. And whatever happened in there with my meeting my partner, all that stuff, whatever was going on in there, that was a moment. But when I did this road trip, we started at Fred Hampton's house. What well, was no longer there, and I remember going there once and when it was there. I remember walking through the place, and they still had a door with bullets in it, and I know someone who took that as a souvenir. Anyway, we go there, and I'm like, this is the most important spot to start our trip at. And my wife, my partner, whatever you want to call her, my partner at the time was like, why? I go, this is the ground zero. And at the time, she's like, I thought that was 9-11. I go, no, this is ground zero of the American Revolution, baby. This is where it started. This, when Fred Hampton was killed, that's when Bernadine Dorn and said, that's it. She loved Fred Hampton. She loved the Black Panther. They wa worked with them like this. That was a t Fred Hampton created the fucking food programs that every kid has today in school in the, the mornings. That's what they, he created. That's what the guy was. Like, he had a heart yeah, to, feed, Chicago. to feed poor people. Okay, so when he did this, when this, when this all happened, that was ground zero to me. So I went back there to try to just sort of, I don't know, just whatever path I'm on, this is, this is where it led. I have not made too many choices in my fucking life. It just pulls me. So I'm there. And I'm in a, Fred Hampton's neighborhood at that time was okay enough for me to get into. But back in the day, no. Had I drawn in there, you're going to get pulled. The best thing could have happened to me is running out of there humiliated naked. That would be the best fucking thing. The best scenario would be that. 
okay? I walk in there anyway thinking that, but I'm like, okay, it's, it's a little, you know, I'm getting, and I'm filming naively, and I turn the camera like this, and there's a gentleman barbecue, grilling barbecue chicken. Well, this is a joke, often. So I'm there, and I'm nervous, because I'm like, oh, I'm a white guy filming this, this issue that I understand we all, there's an elephant in the room there. Uh, and, I, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm wondering, and he's like, you here for Fred Hampton's house? And I go, yes. And he goes, you want to talk to my mom and dad? They were here when it happened. I go, yes. He goes, come on over. And I go in. You probably felt the weight go up your shoulders. Oh, yeah. Well, I just, well, I, I walk into a lot of situations <laughs> right, yeah. like that. And, I, and they say I lack in, uh, I forget what it is, uh, pretense. I don't have this pretense. I'm there to get answers. So, like, even when I, heart word shows up in the native land, like people are like, I'm like, yeah, Heart Worry wants to talk. Heart Worry doesn't talk to anyone. I go, she requested to go talk to me because however it was. And I went and hung out and they're like, what happened? I'm like, I'm not going back for dinner tomorrow. And they're like, you're going to go have dinner with Heart Worry? I'm like, yeah. So me and Heart Worry became thick friends. But she, she was like, people were afraid of her. But for whatever reason, she liked me. You know, that's just how it works. So there I am. And this, this young man goes and gets his mom and dad. Like, I'm freaking out because, you know, the... I live in Chicago. I know what's going on. This is just the deal. I know it might sound weird to you, and it's it's not actually racist what I'm saying. I, I and this is just the situation. Maybe it is. I don't know, but this is what I'm dealing with. So I go up in the house, and his mother and her brother come out, and they're elders. So one it's a two flat that built. They own the build, father owned, bought the building, and gave it to the children. One family downstairs, one family upstairs. So they come down. And they're going. It's one of the best videos I've ever fucking filmed in my fucking life. And it's on archive.org. And this yellow background, I remember the gentleman's like this. And he's got a, there's a flag in the background and a picture of kittens up here on the wall. I've edited thousands of stuff. I really remember this shot. I was like, oh, my God. They're telling me it. They're giving me their soul. And I don't mean that literally, but this is what you're, you're, you're they're giving me gold. And they're, then they're like, you know, no one has ever from the media asked us any questions about this. And I'm like, whenever Fred Hampton, 68, 78, 88, 98, it's like 30 years ago he was killed. This happened. No one had ever asked him. I'm the first person to film them. When I did that interview, okay, we had lost everything. We had about $60 in our fucking pocket. I didn't have any fucking money for food. And we're about to die or give up on everything, okay, and I'm like, we can do this. I don't know why, but we can do this. And I'm about to just give up. And I have, I'm a pretty tenacious motherfucker. And I'm determined. And I'm about to break. That interview right there is the reason we have a book and movie and we made it to the West Coast. Because every time we were about to give up on that road trip and we only had 120 bucks. And I mean, literally for over a year and a half, I had not more than $8 in my pocket at any one time. It was a real wild time, surreal. But there was times when it was really dark, and one of us would say to the other, remember, the, remember that interview? Remember the Fred Hampton interview? Fred Hampton's neighbors. And it drove us through the whole trip. But that doesn't matter neither here nor there. How, that, I don't know why I started there, and it wasn't some sort of grandiose oh. statement either. It was just because it was part of my fucking history, and I'm trying to figure out what these elders are giving me to interpret. Same as when I was handed might is right. I'm trying to figure these things out. This is what I do as an artist. And as an artist, you tell the people's history. So you have to tell things that are ugly. You have to look around and go, it's like I've heard recently kids are like, yeah, we don't talk about NWA, the band. NWA. They're ugly. What they put out is ugly. And I said, kids, that's what they saw out their window. That's a history lesson. That is critical. That is is it critical race theory. Is that what they call it in school? That's what you have. We have critical race theory. It's called, you listen to some artwork and music. They'll tell you what happened out the window. When they're talking about killing prostitutes, all this shit, that's what's fucking going down. So when I present ugly stuff, it's as an artist, and it's sort of, with that show, it's sort of how, how, how would I tell the truth about what I'm looking at in my world if I don't put a rebel flag out there? Because I see that on every truck that drives by. I know everyone has it around me. It's almost like a sign to go, hey, friend, we're in the same zip code. You know, and it, I understand what it means now. I understand how it hurts people's feelings, but in that moment, that's what you're seeing around you. I'm a young kid, that's what you see. So you just, 
That's what it is. It's part of your colors. It's part of your fucking deal. You, you go through an unlearning, I think people talk about now. And that's, that's how this trip, that's how my whole, you know, my whole life has been this unlearning from ignorance where I was born, horrible abuse, alcoholism. I've survived all that kind of stuff. And I plan on surviving this. And that, and that over there. And you too, you bitch. So it's, it's pretty much safe to say, uh, I mean, would you, would you agree that it's pretty much safe to say that, like, you can't even really, like, a lot of people think Satanism is sort of like just sunshine's rainbow, rainbow-colored fucking Baphomets, maybe? They do. They think it's that, you know? And it's like, the truth is, is it's not all fucking sunshine and rainbows. Well, it, because, like you said, it's weird to hear you say the words... Satanism or Satan weaponized against me. That's triggering me because I'm like, bro, that's my life. You know, yeah. I, I feel like you're not even, that's like, you know, you join a gang, you got to get jumped in, right? That's the jump in right it's there. True. Because true. you ain't even a Satanist until it's weaponized against you. And motherfuckers go, we don't want to, we don't want you well, around. Well, we don't want to do business with you long because of Satan. Well, when it's weaponized against you, then you can consider yourself a Satanist because you got to fight that current. We definitely survive some shit. And Satanists are survivors, and we're really cool people. But we can be really dangerous. We're nerds that studied how to fucking hurt people. This acknowledges power, and I think that the funny thing is, is Satanists read. We yeah. read, and so we. When it comes to knowledge, you can't beat the people. Oh, a that lot of people read. A lot of people like this guy. I walk through sometimes. You know, one of Levay's good things is play dumb. Like this guy lacked common sense, or I, you know, I, I do that. I get the trick, because what are you gonna do in a situation where you can't do anything about it? You're gonna act smart. You're gonna you're gonna act saucy. You're gonna go, yeah, I'm gonna just dumb shit and get the fuck out of there, and then keep track of those motherfuckers. One, I'm gonna get you back when I got got you, and then you get them back on the, when you can. You don't get in a fight when you can't, you know. So that's sort of how I see a lot of my navigation with some of that shit. But you were, what were you saying about what, saying this being weaponized? You, I was saying like you, it's it's like that initiation. That's the true initiation. What? It's like when you finally go, damn. When I tried it, like if you have an idea that that goes from the core, because this is about individuality. So the minute you say I'm gonna be myself, and I don't give a fuck what y'all say, yeah. that's when they start to weaponize. I want to tell you something though. I want to say something. That also, I don't think it's true that Satanism is weaponized against people. It's weaponized against poor people. Ooh. So middle class people can walk around with rainbow bathmates, but middle class people that are walking around with rainbow bathmates aren't really living their best life. They're buying their best life. Living your best life in, in, is what I do, which is like I live by impulse. And next thing I know, I'm in front of Fred Hampton's house and my life is in danger. And any Chicagoan would say that in that fucking moment. I know a person grilling chicken is not necessarily dangerous, but with the nuance of that street corner in that moment where I was, it was motherfucking absolutely dangerous. dangerous. The mayor of fucking Chicago will tell you that I'm saying the truth. So, that's it. In so many words, and I'm going to say it in plain English, there ain't no way in hell there should have been a white person in that neighborhood with a camera shooting that black man cooking chicken in front of Fred Hampton's house because if you watch the fucking movie that's what happened you know so you that shouldn't have been that shouldn't have been fucking going down like that dude 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 was like laughing with the when I when I was leaving he goes you want some chicken I go yeah <laughs> I'm fucking starving dude he gives me a chicken leg he goes you know back in the day and I'm like I wouldn't have made it out of here with the camera he goes yeah that's right <laughs> it was true I'm sorry I'm clapping I'm so sorry yo I'll, I'll stop I'm sorry but it's, fu it's true. It's true, man. So, it's funny. And, and now, we, since we're talking about racism, I want to bring up a reverse, the sort of reverse side of this. Because it's a weird thing when people say, like, I've been called a racist. I'm like, hold on, I'm black. That's not even, do you know what the definition of racism is? You know, and then. Tell us. Preju tell prejudice, us what the definition of racism is. You know, so is. We, can look up, we can look up the dictionary definition. But there's a difference between racism and prejudice. And I don't think people really understand. That's I've that. never heard that. People don't really understand. This is I would invite you to look at look it up. Well, no, you just tell this us. This is a no, huge fucking no, thing. We got twenty four hours. 
Go ahead, spill, but, spill the but tea. When so, with somebody with somebody that's racist, in order to be racist, you have to have had privilege. You have to have committed genocide. Be over. You have to have had the privilege over other people. You have to have had that privilege in order to be racist. So when people look at a black person or, or a Mexican or anybody and they say, oh, oh, you are racist, that's not possible because oh, they've I never get been in So that's the concept, like situation. my counselor keeps trying. He was like, like when I first started going to see my buddy Stephen, uh, my counselor Stephen, I should say, he was like, there's this concept that all white people are racist. Well, let me, let me tell you. And all men are sexist. And he's like, when he first heard it, he's like, because he's a black man, he's like, I'm not sexist. But he had to have it explained as... Avi is explaining here, and it's a hard concept still for me to get around, but I get it. But it's also like, as a what at me, and I'm progressive. I all, I, I, hey, no, 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 dude, that's. Not, but I get what he's saying. You have to, you earn. We earned our status. We earned our status as racist, we, and, and as long as that power is, am I right? Right. You as got long it. as we hold that power and we continue to control or try to control things based on. You look like me. You got a job. Come on over here. Racism is built on privilege. Right, and and also that yeah. that kind of I've I've heard in robots like they they're trying to get robots to do interviews because even the most liberal person has a is going to hire someone that looks like them, a man or a woman or what. They're, that's what they're going to do on by default. That's how our heads work. I guess that's what I've heard. So it's a it's a scientific thing. People yeah. like people like themselves, right, and this right. is a psychological thing. Right, right, right. But so let's get back to the, the racism and, and prejudice. So with racism, like I said, you got to have that privilege in order to be a racist. You know, you got to be able to domineer over other people. Whereas prejudice is something different. Prejudice is I don't like you because of something that you did or because of a, this characteristic. Now that's prejudice. So black people, Mexican, whoever, the minorities can be prejudiced, but it's not even possible for them to be racist because racism is something that's done by people that have the privilege, that are in power. And so that's a great thing. And here's something I disagree with when I hear people say, well, it's not my job to educate you. Uh, any any minor, uh, so any group on the margins. They'll say that, and I'm like, no, it sort of is. It actually yeah. is. If you want, if you want me to respect boundaries, you sort of got to explain them to me. And I'm, you know, there, we do live in a world of diff various educations and ignorances. So mm -hmm. if you're expecting me to know everything you know, who's the asshole there? Right. You know, and so, like I said with that conversation on Facebook, whenever that happened, I, Bree Newsom's great though. You should look her up on Twitter. Bree Newsom, the woman that ran up that flagpole and took that rubber flag. She, that, that'll, that'll steer you away from her maybe, but I'll tell you, follow her Twitter. She's one of the best activists, and she's not just, she's not, trust me, go read her shit. So, it's brutal. It's like, you want a might is right? You want a might is right person that is going to hurt your feelings with brutal facts? Bree Newsome, I would suggest that. And the other might is right thing I would say also is uh, Body Keeps the Score. Those books will hurt your feelings. Anyway. I think you mentioned the Body Keeps the Score to me. I did, so, I did. We should bring that up again later. So uh, I want to finish this before I lose my train of thought. So um, with the prejudice thing, I was bringing it up for a reason. And the reason I was bringing it up is because it seems like, um, and, and we're talking, we're talking, you know, uh, Satanism here, from people that like to call themselves Satanists. I see prejudice from the reverse end of Satanism too. So people get, they come from, like they come from religious people whatever their religion is christianity is just the one i hate the most but they come from whatever their religion uh, is and then they become a, they say oh i'm a satanist but then they immediately start with the prejudice now it's like i'm a satanist i hate everything that's really i hate everybody you see and that's where it starts you start you become a satanist it's like oh get those crosses away from me oh i can't i can't deal i don't want to deal with anybody and i don't want to you know i've seen people take it and take that that uh that prejudice and build cults on it but you know they build a whole cult on that we love hate <laughs> we hate love we you know and so we i think satanists are able to explore hate i think the concept of love says if you have to understand hate to understand love so i think I think that is sort of like a ch like a lot of younger Satanists. They're they're breaking free of 
whatever their parents brought, you know, the, the indoctrination of that. So they're going to test hate. They're going to test these things. That, they should. They should go out there and test it without hurting, physically hurting someone. And you also have to be understanding of, like, if, if you're hurting someone based on calling them names and you're getting off on that, and you're like, a, you're having a sadistic moment, you really got to be reasonable and understand your, your feelings and understand that probably that is not appropriate to do to someone who's not consensual. And so that is where, you, you know, that's why you, you're not a sadist and hurt people's feelings just to hurt them because it's not consensual to spit on a bum or call someone, you know, it's just, it's not consensual when you're, when you're enjoying it. And I get, I get enjoying hurting or I get, I get sadism. I get mad. I get all that. I get the, I get it. I've studied it forever. So I'm just saying like, it's it just, yeah, it has to be consensual. And when you notice that if you're a young one, young person, you notice like, yeah, I'm really getting off hurting people. It's not, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying everyone should be consensual. You know, this is so funny. I guess I, we're just going to do this now because we I brought up, we were almost talking about the BDSM. You were like, let's do it on live. So I brought up how I see this um, a sort of uh, a spirituality that exists within BDSM. And you were like, oh, I, I don't like it. And I know everybody can have their, their, their own opinions. But the thing that I see is that um, inherently all relationships are a form of BDSM. And we're well, talking about not not even oh. not even like uh, like love. I'm in love yeah. with you type. I'm talking. Let's just look at a business relationship. Okay, well, even that is a form of BDSM because the boss controls the worker. So you got the serve the not, You know, the, that's not really. But yeah, I, I understand. All life, all of our society exists on dominance and submission. Right. And that's something you would learn in in, in the, in the right. Satanic Bible or Mighty's Right. Mighty's Right talks about do, that that specific thing in in in, in detail. And so I get that everything is about dominance and submission. But in this relationship, if that were the case, we wouldn't be able to do this. Exactly. Because, and we're both, we, we, have, we, we can see we are both, in our conversations before this, we're, we're, do, we're dominant. And we're, we're having to, it's like, hey, we have to draw some boundaries or understand how we can pull this off. We got the talking stick on standby. Yeah, we had to, we had to figure out how can we pull this off where we're not, Competing like in a normal right. conversation, we'll start talking over each other, getting loud, you know. And so, yeah, you have to have some reason with that stuff, though, you, or or it's just all yelling into the. I don't know. So I mean, but I'm bringing it up because, like I said, it, it sort of becomes that thing where people can take that that prejudice and turn it into like a cult like thing, you know. It's like oh, and I mean, you experienced this firsthand. I mean, that's why I'm bringing this up. You experience this firsthand where people can take something and take an idea and then it becomes the bandwagon. Everybody jump on the bandwagon. We gonna hate it oh together. God. We fuck? gonna hate these motherfuckers oh together. Oh God, the thing about the satanic temple though is so sad to me is that it's like typical political manipulation. It was just a cool piece of artwork and some funny words. Like Obama, when he won the election, he had a cool piece of street art and it said hope. That's how the motherfucker got the eyes. Plain and simple. Shepherd Fairy's poster and the big word hope. That's what you motherfuckers go for. Symbols, the cross, the baphomet. That's really what you're... T and so we, when you study that psychology, you know how easy it is to dupe someone with colors, shit like that. Yeah. Study that psychology. <laughs> Learn how they're manipulating you. Yeah. Or, Ooh. and I would also shed, uh, Edward Bernays is a great read yeah. as well. And, and <laughs> Freud, so the, the Freud, Freud is a great read. He'll explain to you. And, and Avi's a great studied man and a great teacher as well i i'm not saying i would definitely float over his facebook thing and and take in some of his chats and his he's very generous and he's a free usually weekly yeah, online, i go live usually uh, i don't want to call it sermon i don't know what you, you i just i like to call them magic chats we just chat about anything that's uh under wraps uh the occult stuff stuff that's hidden i talk about stuff that people don't like to talk about the hidden shit the occult. Well, I like to call it the dark arts, what people call magic, but it has older la older names. They used to call it kanja, root work, voodoo, hoodoo. It's all the same shit. You know, I just keep renaming it. Black magic, you know, witchcraft. They Can you do anything for it. my hair? <laughs> uh, you, you need a little moisturizer, a little conditioner, leave-in, leave-in conditioner. Leave-in condition. I mean, but magic. <laughs> I want some magic. 
<laughs> it is magic. It's made from herbs that come okay, from the earth, okay, brother. Okay, okay. That's the old root work is working with the herbs. I love it. What were we talking about before this? So we were talking about how people weaponize that shit and make them cults. And that's how the Satanic Temple got oh, right. there. Right. And okay. that's how so, all these so motherfuckers the, do Right, it. so they the just, Satanic Temple is simply just art. Like art and, and then a bunch of, you know, Ivy League guys throwing a bunch of fun words at, at, you know, like making something that sounded like it makes sense. But when I read a lot of it, now I've been, now I, like I said, I haven't paid attention to any of this stuff. But I read a lot of, I've been reading the Satanic Temple stuff for a couple of weeks now. First time in ten, you know, since we did this. Same as the Might is Right show. And I'm blown away at hmm, how fucking ignorant you motherfuckers are that follow that shit. Uh, it doesn't make any fucking sense. I don't know how you can make sense of it. You're really fucking ill. That's all I can tell you. If, you. if you're paying any kind of attention, and I get we're overworked and underpaid. Poor people are taking advantage because they don't have time. You're just doing the logo. But just look. I, got, I grabbed some tweets of that dude, Doug. They literally, he's literally talking like a politician where it, there's a lot of words. It doesn't really make any sense. You what know? baffled me? But, but you can win an election that way. <laughs> Watch the Taxi Driver movie with uh, Robert De Niro. The great scene in there where the politician's in going and he's talking. Robert De Niro's talking about basically killing this politician. Really? Taxi Driver? It's fitting this scenario so well. I'm Travis Bickle. Um, but he goes in there and the politician goes on this rant and you're listening to him and he's saying all these great things, but it makes no fucking sense. And the movie's so great because when, you, you know, Travis Bickle's listening to it and he's going crazy. And I'm like, I can see why that would make you crazy, man. He's not saying anything. You know, there's nothing there. But it sounds, we got to have hope for tomorrow. What the it's fuck a, is that? It's a poem. It's a, it's a beautiful poem about oh. fucking nothing. I like to think poems make sense. The beautiful poems do make sense. <laughs> beautiful poem, real beautiful poems do make sense. Right up until you deliver one that's just about, like, you can, for instance, you can try to write poetry and then never deliver the punchline. Poetry is nothing without the punchline. The joke is only good with the punchline. You know what? We're only two hours in. <laughs> really? Yeah. I wasn't paying attention until you said that. So I want to talk about that. You brought up the symbolism. That's what draws them in, right? The symbolism. And I could talk a little bit about that. I was that. scratching my nose and not picking it. Please talk yeah. about that, <laughs> So the symbolism was what draws people here, you know, that is what brings people in. You were talking about, the, oh, they see that goat, they see that cross. The reason that works so good is because that's the language that the subconscious mind speaks. That's the language that your inner self speaks. It doesn't speak English, it doesn't speak Spanish, it doesn't speak French, it doesn't speak anything. It speaks in symbols. It speaks in colors. Well, I, okay. I, it, mine does. I don't think any, you see, when we have, when, when there's a conversation now, presently, where it's zero one, this is how the mind thinks, I'm like, yeah, probably not. I have, like, some weird mind. It doesn't fit any fucking holes. So I'm put on a spectrum or something because I've done this forever. Like, for, I mean, I'm just saying I've been, I, I, it just doesn't fit. Like, they keep trying, like, oh, you, I, I'm dyslexic. I, all these kind of things. And so I'm like, please quit applying psychology to me like you know what the fuck I'm thinking because as far as I know, you don't. Everyone is baffled by, by Asperger's people still and stuff. So it's like some of this stuff just doesn't make sense to me and the way my mind works. And some of it makes perfect sense. So I don't, I think we're reaching a nuanced state in our world. Like even with medicine, they're going to start prescribing medicine based on your DNA. You know, you'll be very specific medicine based on what you need versus this general heart, you know, blood pressure pill for everyone. You know, it's so so that's what I'm saying. Like our psychiatry or any of our so occult workings have to be more specific with the. I, I agree with what you're like, saying. Like, OK, where are you from? Oh, you got that zip code on you? You think this way? Oh, you got dyslexia? Now we start now we start leveling the playing field is how to have so, a free society. So or, what you're saying is. See, I like don't have. Hold on. Let me say this. I'm having an anxiety attack almost. For me, when I go through, like, now I have to deal with government, lawyers, all this kind of shit, and I used to have a partner, my partner's job, would, she would do that, and I would do something else. So now I'm trying to deal with that stuff. This system's not made for me. Like, it's insane. Like, I literally talk to my counsel. I'm like, I it's like, oh, it's just a button there. I'm like, 
how am I missing it? And he's just, you don't, it doesn't. So the system that people like myself or people with Asperger's or these issues, there's no system for us. Some of us can't fill out paperwork. You know what I'm saying? So, so there's I think no. That you're trying to say there's no way to label it. And I wasn't attempt to label anything. Oh, what no, I'm, I'm just saying, saying is that if we're talking. I'm just saying talking, you can't apply one thing to everyone. You know, like all minds work this way because. Well, all brains are the same thing. It's a left right brain, center cortex connect to the. Yeah, but our, but our wiring core. is different. We do think differently. Yeah. So people with Asperger's, there are people who are slower than others. There are people who have yeah. damage. From, and so for yeah. my, 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 my rewiring or Asperger's or whatever. Probably isn't genetic. It's from childhood of traumas, but you pick those up from that where your mind is rewired, so and you're not able to communicate or understand things the way other people do based so on those. You're filters. talking. You're talking conscious mind. You're yeah. talking the thoughts you're thinking that that you're understanding. This is all, this is right. all conscious. The, the, stuff. What makes you the, your character? Your We're person, talk, you're right. talking conscious stuff. I'm right. talking about subconscious. Your subconscious is what kicks in when you get an itch. You reach over and scratch it. You yeah, don't have to think. You do it. You, you, your eyes get I would watery, say even, blank, I would say even you know? that impulsive nature, that snake brain, is going to be unique with each reptile. So, so you know, but with, it doesn't change the fact that, our species, that that reptile learns with symbolism. It doesn't change the fact that if we, if I hold a candle here and it's got the fire, and you put your hand over, it's going to burn. Every single person is going to burn. Well, I would say I would, that's why I say I say in general you're probably right, but I say I don't think it, every single person will burn because I've seen, I never see the person hold their hand over that flame long and well, not burn through their skin. I have. I you see the person not burn from fire. Um, I saw. I worked in a home for what we called them back then, and on my check was the home for Ray Graham's home for retarded adults, and that's what it said on the fucking We're check. We physically, not. I, no, no, I'm, I'm just gonna, not feeling the fire. I'm going to. I'm trying to. Let yeah. me finish my sentence now. Talking stick. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen, yeah, dudes do that. Oh, Rip yeah. a piece of, and, and they have no, nothing yeah. is happening there. They're not hurt. They, they hurt. hurt, they're just ignoring them. No, hurt. no, you don't know that. I'm telling you, we don't know. That's like when people say, dogs don't know they're going to die. Well, yeah, they do. No, they don't. How would you know? We don't even know the root structure of a tree. Now you're going to tell me what a dog fucking thinks. And actually, a dog fights for their life, so they obviously know they're going to die. Because they're fighting for their life. So when people like put that as like, yeah, you could never know what a dog thinks. We just don't. That's where my agnostic thing comes in. It's like I'm an agnostic in the Carl Sagan sense of the world of how much we really don't know. But what we know is applied to everything. Like the I don't know comes in. So all I'm saying with you is there's a nuance to some people. And some people just don't think that way. For me, when you're saying that with that, with that I've been able to get away with or get through the system or be able to figure out how to get out of this this way based on people treating me in a normal way. Where, okay, you're going to punish me that way. It doesn't even affect me. I'm, you know, so there's, I have had nothing affect me in my past. I have been severely abused. I have been, so I have every single really thing. About, this is not really so about the, the conscious stuff. This is about the unconscious, what I was talking about with the symbolism. You said what draws people is the symbol is the goat, the cross, the things. And, and I'm trying to tell you that the subconscious will attach to those things. It will cling to those things. You don't need to, you don't have to physically, consciously be aware of thinking anything. So, for instance, you could have stuff that just triggers you and you don't know why. You know, and, and there's been tests and, and, and studies done on this, proven. So, um, for interesting, I'll bring up this one artist that I know that did this. So, one thing he did, he's a UK um, demonstrator and what he did was he went to a mall and he repeated the same message on the intercom in the mall you know oh we're having a sale da 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 and when you do this you know your hands gonna go up now this is the weirdest thing he played it for like maybe 10 minutes and then he comes on the live microphone says the the trigger and people raise their hands okay and we're talking about a hundred or five hundred yeah. people not everybody did right but, but that's most all of the saying. people did that's all i'm here's, saying now here's the thing what I'm saying is, is that doesn't mean that doesn't it, just because it doesn't apply to everybody doesn't mean that we can't understand a working system. There oh, can be. We're a saying the same system. thing. We're saying different. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm just saying. I, I, I just saying when the phrasing is everyone thinks this way. I, I am. All, I'm going to say you mean most people think that way. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah. Because I, I mean it doesn't. That's not true. Yeah. Not every yeah. person. We don't respond all the same. We're not all yeah, the same. No, I, but no. we are. We are snowflakes. Actually, I am an iron snowflake. That's what a Satanist is. 
the, not the Iron Cross, we are the Iron Snowflake. <laughs> like, so, so we are all different, we are so unique. You want to go into the, I'll go, I'll explain a snowflake uh, theology for the people that don't know. The I don't know what explain. So the snowflake, what makes it so important, what he's talking about, is no snowflake is exactly the same. Right. Every time a snowflake gets created, they're all a unique shape. Right, that's why when when uh, when when this whole debate came up, I don't know when Dickhead was running for office in 2016, and they were like, Lib "Liberals are snowflakes." I'm like, "Yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. I, I'm a, I'm original. Yeah, I'm one of a kind. I'm my You know, I, I didn't understand how that was a slag, and then people would start. I'm not a snowflake. I'm like, why wouldn't you want to be a snowflake? Mm -hmm. Like that's original. But everyone looked at it weak, or so mm -hmm. I'm like. Well, why don't you just be an iron snowflake? That's like a Chinese fucking star. Like a sharpened... <laughs> ninja, ninja yeah, so now I'm, now I'm like a sharpened iron snowflake. Fuck with me. <laughs> so technically we're a ninja star, not a snowflake. A what? A ninja star, not a snowflake. This motherfucker is, is very... I love... Me and Avi are nerds, but Avi's fucking straight up... Sci-fi, motherfucking well-read nerd. Like, I'm a book nerd. I For am sure. as well. We just read different things. Yeah. We, yeah. we you know, I read all day every day. Uh, so Ditto. So yeah, right. So <laughs> and it was great talking to Carla LeVay. And she's like, Oh, basically saying, My dad would and you'll hear it, just go to the bookstore, get stacks of books, just read them all day. That's what he did. Go back to the bookstore. For, you know, that's just like that's now we're getting into what is a real Satanist. That is something I've seen throughout my life as when I run into people who are genuine Satanists. What is a genuine Satanist? Someone who's trying to understand life, the life around them and the life they want to build and what they're studying. They're just really into studying and figuring out what's going on around them and where they're going and, and, and whatever. Or, or even understanding Avi. Like, it. Avi's going to say some shit and I'm like, I'm going to have to get some books on that. I'm going to have to get some books on that. And so if you meet a Satanist and they're not like, like always in the books and reading ops they're the ops I, I, I don't know if I'm using that word right but I think, I think you got so. it you got it it's the ops they're, they're <laughs> you the can't ops. trust them you got to you I walk into the house I'm looking for two things if I walk into someone's house and I don't see a bookshelf or a book or anywhere inside I immediately lower my oh. expectations oh this motherfucking bitch comes to my fucking house first fucking time I can't believe the fucking nuts on this guy. I swear, fucking 10 minutes in, he looks up at my bookshelf and goes, you going to read any of them? Because they're all new. I'm like, oh, okay, motherfucker. Like, that's 10 minutes of knowing me. Like, you're feeling real comfortable in my fucking place. And I have to go, yeah, you know, it's called divorce, and I'm, I, I, I thought I'd rebuy some of my books. You know, so I, I wasn't could... trying to be an asshole. No, but, but it's that's cool. Me, and that's what I do. But I, I loved it. No, he... I look for books. No, you were, but I liked that, too, because it was like sus. Like, am I in the ops? Am I fucking in the ops? All these books are new. Nothing's being read. What's going on here? Where am I? I'm going back and out the fuck. That's, so, that's Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, these books ain't read. What the fuck? I'm getting the fuck out of here. <laughs> There's a sign. Uh, so I thought I thought it was good, but I had my answer's true. Like, you know, I, I had to rebuy some of my shit so I could look up and go, yeah, I remember that knowledge. Like, you know. Dude, let, I'll take you back. I'll tell you a story from when I first got my satanic, my first satanic Bible. How old? So I was How old? I was 12. I about love 12, this. I was I about love 12, 13 years so old. So many motherfuckers tell me they read the satanic Bible 10, 12, 14. Yeah. And this Jeez. really happened because, you know, it was weird. It was, uh, my mom lives in Cal City. And so, um, you know, there was this little comic book store. You know, Cal City is where, that's literally where every person that has ever been born in Cal City is really like a motherfucker. There's some of the worst motherfuckers come out of Calumet City. Oh, my wife you. was my wife, my ex-wife. Thank you. My my ex-wife was born there. That's what thank I'm you. Saying. I like to call that the gates of hell because right next well, to there is, is actual hell, which is Hammond, well, which leads to the underworld, right, which the is Gary. You know what the tomatoes <laughs> taste like in Hammond or in uh, Cal City? They taste like brick or chemicals or bleach because it's so polluted there. Yeah. Dude, that's it. but so anyway, there's this bookstore out there, and it was like a little comic book store. In the back, they had porn. In the front, they had comic books, you know, and, like, some little knickknacks and toys and shit. But anyway, they wouldn't let me go in there. They're like, you can't come in here, kid. You got to be 18 and shit. We killed so, another one. So, hold on. The funny thing is, is they're like, you can't come in here, kid. It wasn't until I had cut grass enough to have a 20 in my pocket. And I was at the door like, I got a 20. The, the manager was like, come on in here, kid. You know, you got money? Sure, I'll take your fucking money. You know? And uh, so I go in there. And I'm looking around. And uh, I see two books on the shelf. I see Green Witchcraft 3 from Lelwyn. And I was like, oh, witches. 
witchcraft, witches. I look at the back of it and it's like, witches are real. Do you want to be, are you a witch? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't think so, you know. And I look over and there it is. The Satanic Bible. I grab it. I go up to the front counter. I'm like, give me this. Dude's like, nope. You can't buy that. I'm like, why? He's like, your mama, you know, it gives me a bunch of fucking excuses. Eventually, he lets me buy the fucking book. But it wasn't with money. I bought it with my under the, the coat technique. You know, I bought something else. I got you. But I took that motherfucker anyway. Oh, dude, I was so talented where... back then with stealing. I could be talking to that motherfucker. I'm, I'm, I, I swear, my toes must have been working because I get out of the place. I'm like, how in the fuck did I get all this shit in my so... pants while I'm talking to that dude? People thought that being goth was just wearing a long trench coat just because it was stylish. My whole inside of my trench coat was a pocket. I was throwing <laughs> shit in that mug, CDs and everything. But anyway, you know, I mean, we were kids, right? But, dude, it happened. That's why I was more goth, you know, to have big-ass pockets, trench coats, pockets. I was, you know, I got pulled the one time I wore a trench coat, and uh, we were walking down State Street in Wisconsin. Now, uh Main Street, in Main Street, where the capital is, in uh, Madison. And I'm walking down State Street in this trench coat, and the cops pulled me over, said I had a fucking shotgun in there, right? They searched me. No gun. But if they would have shook that coat, it was fueled. Oh, God, that's yes. hilarious. I'm trying to find a good... <laughs> they, searched, they were like, oh, you got a gun. They were looking for the black kid with the gun. And I was like, I did not have a gun, but man, was I red hot. I was like, damn. Now, I walked away clean, though, but that was so funny. I, yeah, so funny. I, I love this. I, I'm sorry. I get caught up in this fucking shot. And, and once I start looking, I'm like, fuck, how did Avi get the best shot? I got the I, best shot. I, well, I'm side. I'm like this. I'm looking like this. Side, I, that's my, you know, I, I'm like, I got to be like this. And I can't, I got to, if I look at you, I got, what? What's going on? Sure. <laughs> How's this? Oh, here we go. Shoot that porn again. <laughs> let's let's edit that. I don't need that out there. <laughs> <laughs> we start over. Oh, man, this is such great stuff. So, you know, that's yeah, when I got it. When I was like 12 or 13. And then, you know, I was introduced to the concept of everything's not fucking. My, <laughs> dude, my family was so religious. I just can't. They still religious. I think that um, it might almost be a cultural thing for black people at this point. It's just they can't let go of religion. You know, it's so ingrained in them. Uh, well, I don't, I don't, I would say, like, for me, I, I, I don't think, I think it's a poor thing. It's the same thing I say about Satanism. Satanism is a poor person's thing. It's not for educated people. Here's how I see Satanism in my studies, okay? There's a lot of men in Satanism that are, the women are really smart in Satanism. And I think it shows, the, it shows like the smart, the, the upper class women that are attracted to Satanism come in because they want a bulldog. They want a dude, a murderer. They want someone who's going to fucking defend them. And they want someone who's going to fuck them hard and all that shit. So they come in, but they're smart. They come in for that. Whereas a lot of the men are afraid. We put on the Baphomet to scare people. So that's what is starting to attract us to it. When it becomes an educational thing, that's where the nerds are like, yeah, you know, I've been picked on all this fucking time. Now I can fucking put this shit on, scare motherfuckers and still read books. Yeah, motherfucker, that's right. You know, and so I like sitting like this on my couch. I think it looks okay. If I put a papaya here, it would look better. <laughs> oh, man. That's so funny. Oh, we're going to be giving away one coffee stained copy of... Uh, oh, shit. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm in the air in a minute here. Well, look at this. You want to know something? You want to know how lucky I am, kids? Well, I better not spill this on the fucking coffee. Oh, the computer. We'll be, we'll be going off real fast. You see, this, right you see this cup? That's the anarchist. Okay? I got that from Bill Ayers, Bernadine Dorn's house. Emma Goldman, sooner or later, the American people are going to wake up. When you're going to wake up, it's not happened yet. It's not happened yet. I would like to see you wake up in our lifetime. You want a line? I'm joking. I would not give Avi a line, but I will take one later, probably. I only do math. <laughs> It's because of the class. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to betray my, my people. I had to do only meth. No, I'm joking. I don't do meth. But yeah, meth does me. 
it's funny though. But no, meth puts me to sleep. I I, I take uh, ADHD pills, and it's funny. So many people take them. They're like, I'm up all night, and I take one of those pills. I'm like, oh. I'm like, wow, you really do have whatever it is that they're like. That only happens with. Oh, my psychiatrist says, you know that happens with children with ADHD. And I go, adults, and she goes, no, pretty much no. She goes, you drop every time. I'm like, yeah, I take my Ritalin, and all of a sudden, I'm like, yeah. Sugar. Sugar makes me a monster. Like, right now, I'm having some sugar. I'm like, woo! <laughs> I'm thinking about, because um, I was talking about the symbolism, and you said that you really couldn't be a flat you, and I'm thinking about the way that you create art. I'm looking at your sculptures over here, and I wish I could turn this camera around and show them how fucking really. fabulous they are. Actually, you can. Let's do this. Why don't you take that camera? This one? Walk it on over there, and I'll walk with the computer with you. Let's go slow, though, so we make sure we're all good. So you guys got to see this. So Shane makes some insane sculptures. And you can see right there. You can see the view if you want. Ah, there we go. And we can see right here, bro. He makes some insane sculptures. Let me, let me pull one up. And when I talk about well, inside, we'll talk the inside. That's a picture of me as a baby, and in the back, there's a bunch of hair that fell out, and that's that's and it's a flower. See, that's a flower. Let's bring it in front of the light so they can really see it. We're gonna show my art. They got to fucking see it, the real deal. You got the camera, bro? You're gonna film this, though, right? Okay. Oh, okay. There we go. Hop in. You film. Hop in. Here's the, here's the, oh, look, that's a good shot of me. Don't get the bald head. Don't get the bald head. Please, please, please. <laughs> don't do the top of the head. Everyone seems to want to do that. I don't like it. All right, I'll shrink it down, so there you go. No, no, no. Got, watch the shot. Let's, let's, there we go. Not me. So this is a, f I'm going to shoot this. Yeah, you do My it. My artwork. Do it. You do it. I'm getting finicky now. See, it's a, it's an actual flower. See? And there's me as a little baby. explain a piece i want to ask so, you how did it come to be oh these are good okay so let's let's sit back down and hang okay, let me i want to ask you how it came to be such a thing i want to ask you you know what i think i'm gonna be doing later i'll be renting space um how did that one come to be my, my shit goes over there Oh, like, copy? No, my shit to wipe my forehead. Oh. I don't know. With all these nice napkins you're on and I don't have earrings. <laughs> so that sculpture was the first thing, you know, I got to Chicago and I'm totally broken. And I, I, I end up at a flop house. Not a flop house, but just above a transmission shop, artist studio, um, you know, bathroom in the hallway. So I just go. To, I just rent the art studio and put a couch in there and a fridge, and just make artwork every day, all day, and go to therapy for four days a week and just sit there and try to make artwork if I could get off the couch. And so I made a bunch of carpets. And um, I couldn't sculpt anymore. And I didn't think I'd ever sculpt again. And so those sculptures are the first thing I tried to sculpt when I got here and tried to build another studio. Building a studio for an artist is a big deal. And it's almost like a religious experience. You build a studio and it has a lot of feeling. It takes a time to build. So when I left Portland, I had just built this really beautiful studio. Really comfortable. I started producing. You got to be comfortable in that studio. So I had to build this one and I couldn't feel it. And I couldn't make this fucking thing. And I'm struggling through there. And I keep all my hair. It's been falling out for years. And I keep it in this big jar with a seal on it and stuff like that. And... The, the, there was no idea there. I just started sculpting. I was like, I got to make, what did I make, three, six? I had to make nine of them. I have to make nine of these things, whatever they are. And all it was was a jar with a rubber wing with my hair stuffed in it in the photo. And so it just started building. But when I look at it now, I, it's basically a, a, this flower trying to grow out of this ugly monster. And it's basically what happened. That's what I feel like in my life. Like there was, there the, it is. Right. The subconscious mind speaking through with the symbols. Yeah. Uh, well, 
Yes and no. I, I, I feel you on that. I'm not arguing with you on that. It's a religious experience. It, it's like more than said. that, though. I don't think things are so simple. As, as like, I think, for me, as an artist, there's emotions there. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, it becomes something that you can't put a word to. It's the heart-mind balance. Well, yeah, but I, I wish it were that easy for me to put into words. Yeah, but it's, it's bigger than words. I, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Even that doesn't say it to me. Yeah. Even that, I'm going to say... I'm going to try to put it in words, but I want you to say what you got to say. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying, even when anyone tries to tell me that stuff, I'm not disagreeing with it, but I'm like, yeah, it's more. It's different. It's more. And then some people say, well, the muse is you. If you have a muse, it's you. Uh -huh. And I'm like, but that's not true. Not for me. I know who I am. I can't help but be me. That's the problem. Okay, I'm a fucking heretic because of who I, I live my life as I am an impulse. I don't fucking stop. So I became this heretic because I just do me. And everyone, you know, like it freaks people out for some reason. I'm not even trying, okay? So it's like ever since I was in, in grade school, it's always been this, this like problem child or trouble or whatever. You ever see the movie Problem Child? Oh, yeah, that's my, one of my oh favorites. Oh, my God. Nanarol, one of the witches that came to me, she's like, Shane, can we... Can we do movie reviews? And I'm like, sure. And she goes, okay. And we start doing it. She goes, you know the reason I did this? And I go, why? And I wanted to review Problem Child with you. And I go, what? And she goes, I was telling my sister about you. And she goes, what is he, the kid from Problem Child? And we laughed and laughed and laughed. And we watched that movie together. And I'm like, yeah, that's basically me. That's basically me. That was me when I was a kid. And it's like, that's it. You're just doing these things and you're like yourself. And it's funny. I went to meet Bill, you know, I went to meet these politicals, these radicals. And at this meeting, one was like, where are you from? What are you, you know, like trying to, in Chicago, what neighborhood are you from? Where do you stay? Where do your grandma stay? This is what you get in Chicago. So they said, where are you from? What do you do? I said, I'm from nowhere and I cause problems. And they looked at me and I knew I was okay with these people because they said, Problems can be a good thing sometimes. <laughs> Depends on where you place them. And I go, yeah, that's what I think. So It's interesting that you brought up Problem Child. That's one of my favorite movies, dude. Do you relate to The Problem Child? Dude. Do you? If you, you would have to have been there. See? To see. That's great. I, we have some weird, weird... I tried to burn down the middle school during the, during the uh, Problem <laughs> Child. Bro, I shit you not. Get out of here. I, I love you, your problem so, child. Like, I uh, got in a fucking talent show in middle school, and then, you know, I had a super unusual talent, of course. A juggler and carny, so fucking super unusual talent. Nobody could do it. I get in the talent show, and then it was favoritism. It was fucking favoritism. It was the football players and their friends, and then, and then as soon as they get up there, oh! And then it was a person that was in like three different fucking acts. Went up there, danced, came back up, flipped, was in a different act, and I was like, oh, this is all fucking rigged. There's no chance at me of winning to actually win this talent show. And I worked my ass off on that fucking routine. So I got on the stage. You know, I had a girl that volunteered to be my little assistant and stuff. We got up there and do the thing. And when I realized I wasn't gonna win, I tried to set the whole fucking uh, <laughs> curtains on fire. I literally, I took fire to the fucking curtains, dude. When and they, I were, realized, they were fireproof, so it didn't catch. Literally, but I sure as shit this tried. fucking hater. When I realized I wasn't gonna win, the fucking place was getting burned down. I kill everyone in fucking sight. Everyone, they, I'm locking the doors. Me, they dude. are all gonna die. They oh, tried Lord. to cheat me. They tried to cheat me. It was not fair. And I was like, this is bullshit. If they can cheat, I'm gonna fucking cheat. I, I would, would burn over. everyone alive. I don't mind. Dude, I'm not it, losing. Dude. I'm not losing. <laughs> everyone dies, but I'm winning. I was fucking over it. Oh, dude. king of the mountain. <laughs> but, um, I mean, so that happened. You know, that happened, dude. And so I understand that completely. You know, I understand that shit completely. That's so funny. The problem child was like my motif, dude. It really was. I got in so much fucking trouble. Well, Nanaro played that film for me, and I just loved it. And I, I love Nanaro, and I hope she joins us. I really do hope she joins us. I hope you get to meet her. That would be awesome. Yeah. I'm hoping we get some other people that tune in and stuff, and I don't even know if they're asking questions when you checked in. Well, I, I, feel, I feel like... What, what are you going to ask questions about that you oh, can't right, ask yeah. later, like at 6 p.m. or like. We'll do it later. We'll get to the end, maybe. Yeah, as we get up towards the, you know, like the last half of the part, the last third of the show, we'll do that. But I, I mean, this is what it's a. As far as I'm concerned, seeing as I saw the last 24 hour show last, and it's like a fucking book, an encyclopedia, and it's ripped apart, I would imagine the words matter, not us dancing and entertaining you, but something we're saying here might catch. Yeah. Maybe, that's the whole maybe, thing. uh, 
maybe something will happen. Who knows? So, with the with the but idea but ultimately of it's nice to put a cap on this might is right. And this whole I'll tell you the plan of this might is right special right here. This is the twentieth year. Next September 9th is the actual twentieth anniversary. So this entire year I'm going to celebrate this this last show. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to interview people all the time. And the next one will probably be all pre-recorded, really great interviews with really fucking stellar people, like high-end intellectuals talking about this, the might is right, Satanism, and what happened here. And, and, and so we'll do this throughout the year. We'll do these little interviews, clicks. I know Carl LeVay is going to join in on some of that. You know, we'll, we'll, what we're going to do is um, we're going to modernize might is right. We're going to bring it up to speed. Like, it doesn't apply today anymore. A lot of that does not apply. So we're going to sort of pull that apart and, and talk about the psychology behind some of that stuff. That sounds like burning it versus modernizing it. Yeah. I feel like basically. LeVay tried to modernize it. Now it's just time to torch it. They've already turned it Well, that's it basically we're just going to pull it apart. Now. You're right. We're shredding yeah. it. But but that's yeah. you got to leave some mysticism in there. You know, the idea is we're going to modernize it. People tune in. They'll think about it. They're like, they're shredding it. But if we tell them we're shredding it up close at first, they'll, oh, this is on. <laughs> Hey, is there anything we could play real quick? You know what? I'm going to play this little thing that I made. It's so stupid, but I want to play it for some reason. Maybe yeah. it's... Is this stupid commercial time? We've been talking for like two hours now. <clears throat> yeah, I would uh, like... Yeah. I'd like to take a throw, break. Throw Let's... in some of those funny commercials. Let's see, what can we... <laughs> let me... I have Avi. I have... Okay. So here's me. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait. Before you do this, though, before you go to commercial, I wanted to talk about the symbolism. And how you created the art, and how that you said you mentioned that it was a religious experience, and that's what I wanted. What to I said to, it was a re- I do. You said, I said it's religion. like a religious experience creating the art, you know, because you sit down, you don't know what the thing is going to become, and I was talking about the symbolism, and how that's what it is. That's the magic, the art, the creation of that thing is the spiritual experience. Now you can see this the same thing with music and stuff like that. You know, but the idea is you get into this this trance state, okay? Something can trigger it, but you get there. Eventually, the conscious brain shuts off, and then the subconscious speaks. And when it speaks, it's in symbols, and that's why you create art. That's why it comes out as art, you know? And um, that's, the, that's what I wanted to tell you. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? Oops. Yeah, <laughs> but Oops. That's, that's what I wanted to touch on Oops. before we go to commercial. Now we Oops. can Oops. rock and roll. Wait, let's let's keep talking. No, you, I was good. I was trying. I was, almost had this. I almost had it, kids. Kids! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I wanted to, to, to finish that thought because we kind of went on a tangent in the middle of it. But the symbolism and... Um, the way that the, the subconscious mind can bring out the art is, is where you experience the, that spiritual connection. Because it's funny, you would think that, like I'm telling you, the subconscious speaks in symbols and it's hard to understand. You don't, dream interpretation is a thing that's, that's been around forever because we're trying to understand that other mind, what it's trying this to This motherfucker sneaks this in when I want to take a leak. You know? This is where spirituality comes in. You notice he snuck that word in real quiet? Because he knows I want to argue with him. But oh, he's, yeah. do, he's doing it just so I, I have a, a not enjoyable leak. But, but I'm that's gonna good. T- we'll go to some commercial. We'll get back to this later. Yeah, baby. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what... That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what... I know what you want. Oh, sure, they may have tried to separate us, but what we have is too strong, it's too powerful. I mean, after all, we shared everything, you and I. I told you my deepest, darkest secrets. I showed you exactly what people are capable of. I shocked you with my honesty, but mostly I challenged you and made you think. And you trusted me, even though you knew you shouldn't. So we're not done, no matter what anyone says. And besides, I know what you want. You want me back. 
Of course, some believed everything and had just been waiting with bated breath to hear me confess it all. They're just dying to have me declare that everything said is true and that I got what I deserved. Wouldn't that be easy if it was all so simple? Only you and I both know it's never that simple, not in politics and not in life. But you wouldn't believe the worst without evidence, would you? You wouldn't rush to judgments without facts, would you? Did you? No, not you. You're smarter than that. Anyway, all this presumption made for such an unsatisfying ending. And to think it could have been such a memorable send-off. I mean, if you and I have learned nothing else these past years, it's that in life and art, nothing should be off the table. We weren't afraid, not of what we said, and not of what we did, and we're still not afraid. Because I can promise you this. If I didn't pay the price for the things we both know I did do, I'm certainly not going to pay the price for the things I didn't do. Oh, of course, they're going to say I'm being disrespectful, not playing by the rules like I ever played by anyone's rules before. I never did, and you loved it. Anyhow, despite all the poppycock, the animosity, the headlines, the impeachment without a trial, despite everything, despite even my own death, I feel surprisingly good. And my confidence grows each day that soon enough you will know the full truth. Wait a minute. Now that I think of it, you never actually saw me die, did you? Conclusions can be so deceiving. Miss me? Satanism is blessed and free will. It's a duality to be good or evil. It's an ugly beauty. It's a baphomet. It's duality in its simplest form. It's... It's me. It's time to forget the spirit and embrace the flesh. As we enter the age of undoing, I'm here to undo the idea that Satanism is a religion. It is not. It is a philosophy. Religion is where thought goes to die. Religion and its rules are dead, and Satanism is alive and well. Satanism is a fluid thought that erodes constructs. Satanism, much like the Satanist, cannot be nailed to the wall. It is not a team sport. It is not. And if you've joined something in the name of Satan, you've been tricked. Undo that shit. You can expect an undoing of years of, of doing of shit that shouldn't have been done. We're gonna curse the fuck out some shit. We're gonna spread some blood across the stage. I'm gonna be performing my fucking soul out. <laughs> Everybody has a misconception that it's about, oh, this evil, theistic fucking being that's going to harm you and hurt you, and it's about evil energy. No, it's about the it's pure self-love and being able to love yourself and being okay with yourself and, and being able to persevere through your life without having the restrictions that man is indoctrinated into you in your mind as you've grown up. We've all been indoctrinated from the time we're born to the time we die. We're indoctrinated. We're taught a certain type of way to think. That is the way to break free of that thought and be 
the adversary, be the one, you're, you're the opposition at that point because you're going against everything you've been taught to teach yourself something, break free from that. Now, as we enter the age of undoing, what are you going to undo? Think it right now as we gather on this wall purchase and harvest the energy that we are all sharing. Undo that shit. Whatever it is that you need to undo, undo that shit. Sabbath, an event put on by Shane Bugby. Uh, it's a uh, sa satanic event. There's going to be a black mass. I mean, uh, some of you who don't understand Satanism, maybe like Shane Bugby. Uh, it's a uh, sa satanic event. There's going to be a black mass. I mean, uh, some of you who don't. For me, artwork is a way to communicate. It's the way I communicate the best. The installation is a document of two years of my time sitting on a recliner gaining almost 100 pounds and taking photos of people between my feet. Is a couch, a recliner, Cheyenne's mat, big golden frame around Cheyenne, and framed up photos of all these folks. The impetus was the spark that would really devastate me was Cheyenne passing away. All Cheyenne. Shine was my good friend, and, and I miss her all the time. Okay. She was the first animal I'd let, in, let into my life. My wife taking a career and being gone after close to 20 years of working side by side, that left me alone at the house and <laughs> to do nothing more than think. I smoked about $5,000 in weed but I kept every canister I would smoke of this recreational weed. So that box represents wasted numbers, wasted time. I don't get the time back in my life. Overeating and overdoing drugs is a slow trickle of suicide. After a couple of years, I started to come out of what I now know was a depression. I got a little bit of care and I was able to realize what I was going through a depression. I thought it was just me and I documented this whole process almost subconsciously. I didn't know I was making an art project at the time. Not one person knew I was taking these photos. I can look at videos of Cheyenne and smile and start not cry so much. I want to cry now saying that, but I can digest it a lot better than I was. I have more compassion. I have more thoughtfulness. She helped heal me in a lot of ways, tell me what was important in life. I've always tried to make things that would swing the pendulum my way, the way I think things should be. This installation it's me just trying to communicate what was going through my mind or what I felt or what I went through. And I don't know if that can happen unless you sit in that recliner for two years. <laughs> that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what...
we are. I'm still getting used to this system. Boy, seeing Cheyenne almost makes me teary. It does make me teary. What the fuck am I kidding? My little baby. All right, Avi, we'd get. I don't know what to. I gotta. I gotta fucking. Gee, I'm, we can I'm talk loved. about it. I I got a lot. I gotta tell you, youngsters. Uh, this is one of the first times I am like, like gonna say we had it hard, streaming. Okay, you guys got it fucking made. This is great setup. This, how easy this shit is. <laughs> He's still like, blown away by how easy yeah, this streaming shit nuts. is. You gotta think twenty years ago when they did that fucking live stream that a lot of you guys are studying. They were plugging wires and flipping oh, buttons dude. and fucking going like ape shit trying to fucking have people call in. You probably had the speaker next to the fucking microphone. Oh, yeah. And then the was that? Oh, shit, turn it down. I can just imagine, I built dude. I built a special table, and it was like uh, like eight. It was like 12 feet long, 12 feet. It was a real long table, which was so specially made, and I had the mics big. You know, it was big. That was a... That was, uh, you didn't, you know, you really, you really, I under, I, I, I have a vision for the future, but no one understood that the internet would become what it is. They would, they made fun of it as a hobby, like, you know, we're wasting our time. And I'll tell you, I remember, I remember calling Doug Doogie up there and saying, hey, you know, I've, I've got this opportunity to be on Radio Free Satan and all this stuff, and I want to kick it off with this 24-hour radio show. And you know, Doug, I think if we do this right... And we could present something really cool. We can have a futurist doing this ra- online radio thing, you know. And um, so we all, I, I remember us getting involved in that, thinking, boy, we're going to have a career, as people do now, on the Internet. We're going to make this a career, you know. And You were trying to influence before influence. Well, we, 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 well <laughs> uh, it seems like I, 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 pretty, what I'm saying? I did a pretty good job. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I did a pretty good job influencing. But, it, you know, let me tell you, the influence of the day, 20 minutes. Um, yeah, so it was like, we, but we weren't even trying. It was just we were having fun with this new shit. Like, like hipsters, the original term of hipsters is those people that are right there. And they're making things cool, things like jazz, or they're making something that's never been made before. And so that's what we were doing. We were making something that's never been done before. And it's just neat to see it, how it fruited. I had a lot of envy um, after we did that road trip, that a year at the wheel road trip, because we did this, and we had this great idea, and all these rich kids stole it. And today it's called van life or whatever. There's a whole category based on Something, and I'm not saying what me and my wife did was originally. We were, you know, I mean, uh, who's the uh, great on the road? There's a great uh, Jack, uh, Jack Kerouac wrote a great book about being on the road. So it was just, uh, it, again, another counterculture thing. You travel the country, no money, backpack, writing poetry, you know, having sex for fucking beer, or something like that. You know, you're just going. You're, you're, you know, you're just going and doing it. And that, that was the fun part of that trip. You know, it was, it was a good time. You keep using the term counterculture. Yeah. And I want I want you to define it for those people that may not know exactly what that means. Well, I'll, I'll give you what what a lot of people do is uh, you want examples. But each generation's counterculture is going to be different and experienced differently. So I would give you the counterculture that affected me, which Black Panthers, White Panthers, and I, I bring them up because it's a, it's a big name now. People understand that uh, more so than they, when I was younger, it, what we would say the yippies, which were friends of the Black Panthers. There were all these little groups as we're breaking off into today. And it was it's the same kind of revolutionary moment sort of brewing right now where people are breaking off into their groups and looking to change the world, change the world for the better of the flesh. Remember, when LeVay created the, Satanism, that was the year that the flesh became law. That's what we're fighting for. It's not the corporations. It's not the dollar. It's not the gold. It's the flesh. We care about the flesh. And I think if you're, if you're a Satanist and you, you're only conter- concerned about material items for your flesh only, you're really doing yourself a, you're doing your environment a harm. And, 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 and environment is part of yourself. So you have to consider the flesh first. And that would be with voting, with buying, with shopping, with consumption, with overconsumption. We have to think about all of the flesh. <laughs> all of the flesh. 
you know, we are water, right? We have to think about the entire environment. We can't just think about ourselves. But we can. It's, it's not, that's what the problem with people who want to interpret Satanism three days into it, four days into it, one year into it, they all fucking know. They don't fucking know shit. And Carla's going to confirm this in a little bit. She's going to confirm you don't know shit. But the idea is like, there's all these nuances to it. So there's no bumper sticker statement. There's no, what does do what thou wilt mean? I mean, I get that's Crowley, but it's similar. What does that mean? You know, to you, what, there, there's, it, it's, it, it's, it's such an interp individual interpretation. It's so private. It's, it's, uh, Satanism's, the only thing you can nail to the wall about it is that book, or the books LeVay put out. But it's like, after that, it becomes so personal and, and, and becomes beyond words because it becomes momentary. Trust, love, hate, all of these things, all that is is you're just appreciating right our, who we are. So I think this ties into what I was talking about before we went to the commercial where it's like the art that gets created by the symbology and, and the emotion and the things that you're going through, that expression of the raw spirit. You know, and I'm going I'm to use that because you said uh, you're attacking that term spirituality, but I think spirituality is that. It is that manifest. You're talking about the subconscious. Of, yes, of the, okay. of the subconscious. So, so, so yeah. I would like to get into that word and how, you know, I, this is why words are so hard. We're better with symbols, right? Mm -hmm. We're better with, we're better with colors, <laughs> right? So some people talk to me about, about magic or occult, some people. I'll be some people because I, yeah. um, I love it. Yeah. So, so. For me, someone will say something about Satanism. I say I use it basically. I express Satanism in, 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 uh, in most of the time in my house, but it's through artwork or cook passionate things. You know, sex, art, food making, passion. But I use it to talk to my subconscious, and you can't talk to your subconscious directly. I can't talk to my subconscious directly. I have to ask it questions and I have to cry or I have to get in there and sometimes I'll be in the studio sculpting and I'm going down like you know I used to have to take drugs all this stuff no I can get down there I can get into a subconscious mind and this is where we talk about let's say uh, levitating almost I'm not saying I actually levitate but when you're getting down into that when you're feeling like this third eye concept or the subconscious, the trance, the what, trance, whatever yeah. you want to call it, I don't, I, I don't have a fucking rule for it. Okay, there's, no, I'm not going to put words to these well, things. We need terminology. I'm not going to. No, explain. it's a feeling to me. No, I'm not, because I don't know what it is, and I don't know what trance means to you or that guy or that guy. So I'm going to tell you how I tell it. And it's a dream state. That's what I put to it. It's like, it's like, it's something else. It's something that I can't put a word to. But you get down there, and and, and there's no words to it. I don't even know if there's feelings. But that happens. And then I look and I'm like, it's a flower. I'm doing this right now. Like I'm dealing with my inner child. Oh my God, that's the inner child. I didn't think of any of that when I did this. So I'm like, oh wow, this is crazy. And, and, and so then I was able to look at this and stare at this for a long time and try to figure out what it meant to me. That doesn't mean anything. Oh, it's, you're a child, it's a flower, you're growing. No fucking shit. You know, I don't give a, I, you know, I'm gonna throw, that's what I thought of when I first held this. I'm like thinking that, I'm like, no fucking shit. I'm gonna throw it against a wall. What does it mean? What is my subconscious telling me? <laughs> you know, and it changes all the time when I look at this thing. You know, when I first made it and I sat there and struggled with what was I doing? What did I do this for? It was like, I survived. I survived. And all I have in my life is that wonder of this child, like that's, what I live for is wonder. There you go. I was waiting for that. And I live for wonder. And and through wonder, maybe I grow. I don't know if that's the answer to this artwork, but that's what I saw when I looked at this was just this, did wonder cause my problems? Did curiosity kill the, not that I have all these problems, I have enough, but did, did curiosity kill the cat? Did wonder, was wonder what it was? And then I started going, wow, that's all I've done through life is just wandered, wa wandered through it. I just go and ask questions and do interviews. The next thing I know, I'm doing a zine. I'm making books. I'm, I'm doing more interviews. I'm traveling the country doing more interviews, asking people.
people, what does this mean? What is art? What is this? And I'm talking to some, like, so I saw it sometimes, I look at the Forrest Gump thing, and I feel similar to Forrest Gump, just not that outrageous, but I just wandered through, and I'm all of a sudden in a historic moment, asking, so, Mr. LeVay, tell me about Satanism. You know, it's just, I'm sitting in fucking LeVay's house, and I, I don't think a thing of it, but, you know, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. You know, I've hung out with the American Indian Movement. I've, hung out with, I've, I've, I've been able to ask the questions of many road sage. And, and what is a road sage? I'll tell you, when you meet one, you like to think because it's someone sexy, maybe, or someone sits like this, they might have the answers. No, road sages, when you find them, when you find the sage, they have the answers before you ask the questions. They're like, they start telling you, like, man, I was just about to ask that question. And they'll be like, almost basically, like, yeah, no. And they just go. And it's not that they have mystical powers. They've just lived, like, I'm, I'm 54 years old, so I meet 20 year olds, and they're going to try to hustle me on some shit. And I'm like, yeah, I've done that like 30 times. So please don't lie to me like that. It's insulting. I'm not your fucking parents. I'm not going to play around. That's a lie. I can see it. I know what you're fucking doing. I've done it. I do it. I'm, I'm doing it right now. I'm lying to you. Whatever. But you know, it's like they think it's something new because it's new to them. Anyway, I'm rambling. I'm coffeeed up. So. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Look at myself. <laughs> It was inevitable, okay? Uh, <laughs> Dick jokes. So, I mean, dude, it it's weird for... I can see... I think that people have a different way of perceiving things. Yeah, right. And one of the key things... They see it with traumas, being, with all that, right? To be, and I'm holding the woke... Here we go, with the woke face. So, one of the key things to being woke is supposedly opening your third eye and we were talking about this and people think that the third eye is something that is just theory that is just talk it's not it's a literal thing it's an actual organ in your body in your brain that's an eye and this eye doesn't look out to see light in the world like the two that are in front of your face this eye only sees inside okay so you can actually only see with this eye predominantly when your eyes are shut okay and this is where the meditation the dreaming and all of that stuff comes into play for some reason the universe decided you know what we're gonna give these motherfuckers three eyes but only two that they can see and this is and that that third one is the subconscious eye and and that's where the art comes from the minute the subconscious say i got something i want your ass to see that's when it comes out you may not even understand it you, you might come back I, I, like your, I like your theories, but that's exactly what they are. You know, and I, I think they're cool, but I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think my, my artwork comes from so many places, and it's informed by a lot of my beyond that third eye. I get what you're saying, but it, it's just, um, and it's all different. There's not one set of rules. Some of my shit's just a trick. I'm just tricking you. I'm just making it to fool you. I've seen, I've seen some of that. I'm just toying with your fucking emotions. I'm just playing around. I just know I'm using my power for no good. Just to, just to masturbate. Boom. I'm going to drop something down just to fucking have you talk to me. Oh. Oh. That girl won't talk to me? Here you go. I'll make you something. Now you talk. So a lot. sometimes the artwork's a trick. It's not all spiritual. I, the word spiritual is... Is, is very disturbing to me. I don't, and, 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 and I spent my childhood in a funeral home at the summers. So, so it's a trigger for you? Well, no, 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 no. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm just saying I'm thick in study with this in a, in a field research way. Okay. And like, you know, I'm not, I'm not just, I didn't just see, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, go pick up bodies with Uncle Jim, talk about this kind of stuff. Uncle Jim's mom lives upstairs. She's writing the diary. She's like 97 fucking million years old. I'm not joking. Like, not, look, the elder, 110. She's writing all the fucking books. You know, she's downstairs. And I remember one time she said, oh, you're a seer, aren't you? She said something to me. Because something was going on in the coffin. Something was going on around there. And there was some weirdness. And she said that to me. I don't know. You know, I just, again, I just, I don't know and I don't not know. I like the Charles Manson quote. Charles Manson, I don't know. I don't not know. I love but that's how I feel about it. I don't, but she said that to me. And then I forget the moment. It was something weird, but 
But it was, it was a moment that was weird. There was a weird moment. And no doubt about that, but I almost think, you know, some of those moments, it's, it, it, now we're starting to understand telepathy. Exactly. And animals hooked up. And it's not necessarily a spirit. I'm not saying they don't exist. But I'm saying more times than not, I think it comes back to that. It's the, 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 the what is that, Alchem's razor, is it? Or, or what is the concept? Like the, e, the, the first answer, or the common sense answer is usually the right answer. And so I would think like, it's almost like, you know, there's a trigger going on between people in the room, people who care. Something's going on where you're, like she, she's saying that to me. And I just think we were feeling each other in some almost telepathic way. Whether I was afraid, my shock, my whatever was going on in my body that sent out something, she, whatever happened, that weirdness, I don't see a spirit there. So let me, let me, let me jump in here. I think that what we need to do is define spirit. When usually when you talk about a spirit or spirits, people go ghost. They start thinking like a ghost or like something like that. So the the weird thing is, is the shamanistic understanding, the the way the the ancients understood this, the the way the indigenous people. You notice understood I'm folding it. my arms when you talk about spirit. So we're gonna talk about see? indigenous. The way I'm the just indigenous. Like, you know, you see my body language. You got it. Listen. I'm open and closed. So, How do you like that? It's a confusion. <laughs> so, when we talk about spirit, it's not ghosts. It's not something that's out there waiting to come, Casper the Friendly Ghost type shit. We're talking about the manifestation of life within you and within each person. So, for instance, if someone say, oh, like, like, if we're talking about somebody you love or, or something like that, you say, oh, well, their spirit's going to live on. How does their spirit live on? In you. It doesn't live on outside somewhere. This spirit lives on inside you. So this is the, the manifestation of Why spirit. Why doesn't the that, spirit that, ever take over when I got Alzheimer's? That I don't have a memory for any of it. So I'm just talking, I've seen Alzheimer's victims, patients, I should say. And I'm just saying, when you know, like if I were to have Alzheimer's, all of that goes away. My, my wife works with old people every day who that have it. Okay, so so so, so well, then explain uh, so what you here's the here's How's the thing work? with with the context of that you're losing your mind. Your mind is literally diseased. Right, you're, you're, de you're degenerating. That's what I'm saying. There's okay. no spirit. If there were a, if there was a supernatural spirit or anything like that that was so powerful, you would be able to. You're 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 talking in the terms of like a. A spirit that can control everything, and we're talking. No, about I'm just saying, spirits exist in the mind, and when the mind deteriorates, the spirits go away. That's what I'm saying. That's I what I'm saying. I think the spirits can live on in every mind because the spirit is they one can. thing. Until it's the one, mind, right? It's I would spirit agree. is one thing. It's not separate. It's I would a agree. oneness. I would agree. Spirits can live on in every mind until the mind deteriorates, and then the spirit all of a sudden goes away with the mind. That's what I'm saying. If that we was create the case, religion, if that was the case, spiritual? if that was the case, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be able to talk about greats like homer we wouldn't be able to Ooh, go back to what? history like the like the homer you don't know homer i don't know what you're saying okay so we're talking if we're talking about uh memories that that died spirits can't live on we wouldn't have any history there wouldn't be any ancient history we wouldn't have those stories because the spirit would have died we wouldn't be able to tell the history of anybody that passed because the spirit wouldn't be alive no, it's, just, to tell a, the story. it's just a it's just a, again the mind is retaining knowledge and we pass it from mouth to ear until that mind deteriorates and like yeah like mine is I'm getting older, and I'm like, well, hold on, I want to, do, I should do this. And when the young, you know, when uh, Claudia and, and David came and said, hey, let's do this, I'm like, yeah, this is important. They're doing a study group. It's important to say this stuff, and it is important to put a cap on this while I have a mind. That spirit, when my mind is deteriorating, it goes. It's going away. You said, when, our mind when I also first rebuilds got here, memories, and they they, they free. You so said I don't when like I first got go here that you were you were like passing this thing on. It's the spirit of what you've created. It's the spirit well, no, of what no, you've done. No, it's that no, no, spirit. No, 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 no. Yeah. That's how you see it. What I see it is you're stepping into a historic moment, and I won't be around in another twenty years, probably. So you're 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 actively participating in something, and that's how you're taking it. Like your his, it, history it, it, is his story. I know. You always need somebody to tell his story. You don't tell his. Well, you I don't tell it, your own story. Somebody else does. I, well, that's I, what I, makes it great. I, I you get know, that. When other people talk about you, that's what makes it great. That's but, when the spirit lives on. But I said that already. But we said that. We agree on that. It goes right. from mouth to ear. But when the mind deteriorates, that goes. So you can say, but like... all is the mind. It cannot possibly. What? All is the mind. Everything is mind. Everything no, is mind. ask the Alzheimer's patient that can't remember his wife and is crying. 
that's because I'm gonna tell you, that's pretty out. fucking. Bad. He's right. heading out of this universe. Well, that's what we're talking about. Let's not. Let, you can, you can, you can try to run this around in circles all you want, but we're talking about an individual that has a spirit. You know, we're talking about this, and I'm saying, I okay, I, I'll give you that. It's in their mind. Just hold on. Now, now don't, don't interrupt I was me now. Interrupt. I was about to drink give my me that coffee. That motherfucking stick. I was about to drink my coffee. Yeah, this is the motherfucking talking. This is the conch. This Let's the, get it. You got that? Bring That's out the, the conch. Talking stick. The conch. Hey, he's still going. I got the conch. You see the rules? Out the window. I'm not putting this conch down. So all I'm saying is that yeah, I'm fine with that. But every single thing exists in the mind, and if the mind, the mind's going to deteriorate, those things go away. So they never really existed in anything but that mind. That's what I'm. That that's the point. That's it. They 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 only exist in your mind. When that t- your spirit, whatever you want to call it, your character, your being, it disappears when your mind disappears. All right. So, all is the mind. That's the first law of magic. The fuck does that all, mean? All is the mind. I'm gonna explain it. So all is the mind. That means everything is mind stuff. The trees are intelligent. The air is intelligent. The water is intelligent. We're all water. So mind cannot possibly deteriorate. It will only change forms. Energy can never be destroyed. It only changes form. That's a scientific law. So it does not go into nothing. It has to go somewhere. And the place that it goes is into other people, into nature. And so we can tap into the minds that you seem to have, that, that seem to disintegrate. We can still tap into that. And, and channel that information back into this. And that's where that comes from. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think you're saying a lot of word jazz there. You know, it's like, we're the all. Well, that answers everything. You know, it's like, we're the all. Everything's connected. Those are hippie statements. And I don't disagree with them. Okay? But that is, has nothing to do with the mind. What we're talking about, like, religion is created by the human mind. It's not created by a god or a spirit coming out of the fucking Agreed. sky. Agreed. So we are creating all of this. And and so th- I, I get what you're saying. And so I can use the word spirit as, yeah, there's the spirit of, you are not, you, you cannot play revolutionary. The spirit of revolution has to touch you. And that comes through mouth to ear. And you hear these stories, and you're right. They're being carried by these people telling me them. And it is, I'll use the word spirit. It's being, I'm, I'm, They've given me the spirit, they, the words, the words, their essence. They were there telling me with their eyes. I didn't just read it in a book. They were handing it to me just like now. You're not reading, you're, you're, boom, it's going. And so I can feel that. I, I get you. But if I don't give, it doesn't go anywhere. That dies with my mind. It deteriorates. Also, like when people, you did ask me, how the fuck don't you know about, you know, this is the first time in 20 years you look back on these things. Like people are, you're amazed, this other guy, a few other people are amazed. Well, there's one thing I think of, and I forget who I hear it from, but I took this on as a belief. It's like how memory, memory works is it rebuilds each time. So you don't have the same memory each time. Every time you remember something, it's a different memory. It degrades. So I don't like looking back because I'm sort of holding those memories in my head for the right moment. And then I go backwards and it's only rebuilding. You know, I've only rebuilt that memory so many times. I don't go back and think about it all the times because I feel like if I, it's almost like looking at an old photo. It degenerates in the sun or something and I, I quit, I'm going to lose my memories. So I, 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 I don't go back. I don't, I, don't, I don't revel in the past. I'm always going forward. I'm, you know, I'm using that mind power that subconscious that spirit to collect and do and I save it all and I'm here to give it now it's my time to give that back so when I go back in memory it's a little crisper than it may have been if I just sat there and thought about whatever it was you know just sat there and thought about my past I just don't I'm swinging at the future baby oh you forgot this about that fucking day. thing. You forgot about it. Look at you gonna sit there just hold it. Oh uh, shit! Why why Avi ain't say nothing the whole fucking twenty four hours? You let's put a clock conch, on this. We'll, right? we'll just put a you clock on the it. Conch. I got the conch eighteen hours now, baby. <laughs> so, uh, but you're comparing, like when you say the spirit, like you said, the spirit of the revolution. That's a you're talking like a movement. That's not what we're no, talking. No, I'm not. About. I'm we, talking I mean, about someone telling me a story, just like you did. Oh yeah. 
All right, let's put that away then. This is bullshit. You tell me something that's not true. It's not bullshit when you, when you hold it and talk over me, Go ahead, go ahead. Let's get rid of it after so, this. Go ahead. Get the fucking thing out so of here. So, it's, it's this thing where when, when I say spirit and when you say spirit, you start to compare it to like a uh, an idea. Spirit is not an idea. Spirit is literally the electric force that keeps your ass alive. It's the thing when when you start out as goo. That's just an electric force, though. Exactly, it is an electric, literal electric energy. That's what I'm explaining. Yeah. It's a literal. It's the literal spark of life, and I think that it's a like water. It's like water, and just like electricity is all technically still one spark of electricity. It's not separate. We don't say, oh, this is electricity is separate from the electricity in China. It's all just electricity. That right. is how spirit works. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I, I just don't, um, I don't need to use the word spirit because spirits used to sell shit to people. I don't use it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, that and is. So, so, yeah, so, so that jive word doesn't work for me. I like what you're saying is a hippie concept. And, you know, you're all fucking stoned. So you're smoking weed. Okay, you weed head? I didn't get to smoke weed right now. I can't smoke weed because if I do, you'll have a whole different person here. So I can't, I'm not all hippie, but I do love the all one concept. I do think we are all one. I think when we step on a piece of grass, we step on ourselves. I love all that shit. Uh, we are mostly water. We, people say, oh, look at that. It's just going to get all, oh God, it's going to get great, baby. You're going to see some shit. I just think like, you know, like, um, I forget what I was saying. It matters. Get back on track. Oh, wait, we're, we're on the talk about out. I'm, I'm lost. You can't even stay on track. Come on, no, you were talking about how um, it was it's hippie jive. Remember I didn't say said? lost. I just said I don't agree with that. I don't I don't like the word spirit and it's just like but I like the idea of being so one. You could oh, say, I was talking about water. And huh. I, and when we talk about when I was thinking about like people can never unify. I don't believe in unity, but for moments. I think we can unify in moments. The and and, and when, when when we're thinking about the Midas Right show a lot. I thought about how ridiculous it is of, because I've dealt with a lot of um, separatists of all colors, but mostly white. And then the idea comes up that we're 80% water, so of course we're all unified. We all rain down on each other. When we die, we drink each other. It's, we're sort of all together in on, on this. We're all, we're all in on this. And so I, like, I had wrote this story once that we're basically parasitic water creatures that get stuck in chunks of ice and float to another fucking continent or another planet or another universe and just look for a planet to destroy just like we're doing today. Like we're just this creature and then we will, you know, burn up the planet, chunks of ice will float away, we'll be, we'll still be, you know, this is... So we talked about uh, tenets at the beginning a little bit. We mentioned that. One of my tenets, one of my laws that I live by is this one. Test everything believe nothing and so before i even engaged the idea of spirit i went through a strong period while i was atheist i didn't believe oh, a fucking too. thing how old were you i didn't believe how in old anything you? i think 20s. i turned atheist at about 17. yeah so say, i got that i was eight I, I, yeah i was eight i was well i'm a i was militant against religion so that was yeah. period so yeah i'm definitely and i'm not atheist. i'm not still atheist so i want to clear i want to clarify i'm not still atheist otherwise we wouldn't be talking about this but um that's what I went through a strong period of like, I don't believe in anything. I don't believe in anything. It depends and, um, on who I'm talking to. Yeah. If I'm talking to well, a Christian, the, I'm a satanic rule. Yeah, I'm that's a satanic rule. Yeah. That's the, that's the carny rule, baby. Yeah, that's you know, right. Wherever I am, I fucking, you know, when Sorry, in Rome, like do what the fucking French do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> when in when when Rome, do what the French do. That's but, right. um, you know, it's like, it's this thing where. I thought I was eight. I was like, "Fuck it, fuck it." We're just fucking uh, speck of dust swirling through space. Fuck it all. Who cares? We're just a speck in time. And I had this experience that changed my fucking dynamic on life. You know, changed it. And the weird thing was, is you would think like, "Oh, well, maybe this motherfucker was stoned. Maybe it was drugs. Maybe it was something. Maybe it was this." It, it was not. It was none of those things. I wasn't on drugs. I didn't do some weird fucking juju ritual, and that's what fucking made it happen. What really made it happen was I had got a tooth pull. Okay, I got a tooth pull, and um, I was in fucking agonizing pain. So um, after I got the tooth pull, it turned out that my mom couldn't come pick me up from the dentist's office, so I had to walk like fucking five miles to the house. During that five-mile walk in agonizing pain after having that tooth pull, 
because they wouldn't give me any of the real drugs unless my mom signed that paper, you know. Yeah. So after I walk at home with agonizing pain after getting that tooth pulled because she couldn't sign for the narcs. I'm fucking looking up there to this guy. I'm like, please, just make this fucking pain go away. You know, and then I'm like, oh, well, God ain't gonna listen. Let's try this to the devil. Hey, Satan, you mind sucking away this fucking pain? You know, of course, no answer. You know, so that's when I reached the point when I was like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. I don't know if there's a God, a devil, a fucking shit-filled canister. I don't give a fuck. Just anything. Get, if, is there anything out here that cares about people being alive? Anything. Is there any connection I can make to anything? And then the weirdest thing happened. It wasn't even the same day. A couple days later, I went to sleep. Like in the middle of the day. It was a weird nap. And I had this dream that I was sucked out of the world. Okay, into a different world. And I get there. And it's a demon. I shit you not. It's a demon. He about nine feet tall. Blue skin and shit. Starts talking to me. He's like, oh. You know, like he's teaching me this valuable lesson. And that wasn't the only person there. There was like a line of people. Like we were showing up for the army or some shit. And he's like, oh, you know, y'all getting tested and shit. And whoever the fuck find the key is the one that's going to get the power. <laughs> Shame. Whoever find the key is the one that's going to get the power. So I'm like, I'm going to rip apart every motherfucker in this line. Because <laughs> one of them got the key. I'm like, if I can't find it, I'm going to kill every motherfucker because nobody's getting this key, right? I'm like, I'm in hell. I ain't finna let nobody get away with this motherfucker case. So I murdered everybody in the line. I shit you not. In my dream, I was like, yeah, ugh, killing everybody. Yeah. And then when they, when none of them had the key, I was like, oh, shit. You know, so I start searching around hell, looking in the toilets and shit. Finally, I find this box, and it's like a gift wrap box. I'm like, oh, fuck. All I had to do was open the box the whole time, you know. So open the box. There's another fucking box, a smaller one. I'm like, oh, it's a Russian game. So I keep opening the box. It's smaller, smaller, smaller. I get to this box about this big. I'm like, the key is in here. Finally, I got it. I open it. It's empty. Demon looks over at me. He goes, how do you feel tearing the whole fucking, killing all the people, tearing the world apart and all of that shit? I was like, I feel guilty for killing those people. He was like, that's because the key is inside of you. And that's when I woke up. And I was in my bed, and I understood one one thing from that experience that I had to stop looking around everywhere else for answers. There was no God. There was no devil that was going to come in. There wasn't no spirits out there. The key was in me. My subconscious mind showed me where the key was. Oh, I that uh, the the end of that story though, I had to quit looking around for answers. Is a nightmare for me. That's all I do. That's what I do to this day. I just ask my friends that questions all day, and I read books. So I'm like. Well, what are you doing? I just, I'm, I'm, that's, I want to stick with that. I want to look around for answers for the rest of my fucking life. I always want to look around for answers. I don't really want to be the, the, you know, master. Let's, I, I can be in many things. I know a lot. I, I, I'm studying it. Well, well, I'm studying a few, a few things really well. But it's still, I just want to keep studying them. Like if I had all the money, and, you know, like I had a bunch of, if I was a, well, I'd be a professional student. I'd just go to fucking school. i just just, like, they'd be like, this fucking dude's in class, how old is he? Listen, I'm 70, I'm having a beer kegger party. That's what's happening. Like, you know, <laughs> I would just, just constantly fucking study, man. I just it's love it. Becoming the eternal student is what I like to call it. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, I just love it. I just but love it. it. It's this weird fucking thing where. It's you not even escapism. You, I think that some people with that experience that I talked about with the dream that I had and stuff, they would have been like, oh, the demons came, and they would start looking for the demons. You know, but I understood it because of the, the books I had read, of dream interpretations. I'm like, what the fuck is my mind trying to, you know, what is this? And then I understood, you know, with the, with the key being inside you, I understood. What I learned from the dream was that my subconscious showed me that this is what you gonna do. You think that out there somewhere is the demon is the god is the thing that's gonna go oh finally you found me here you go here's money here's what here's everything you ever dreamed of because you figured it out you came through the magic portal you know the savior right and 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 that was the point my subconscious was like nah fool the only way you're gonna save anything is if you save your damn self you I got to save yourself i think that's a garbage statement myself I, and i don't mean i don't put you down. you're right you're right but when i hear that from people I'm like, no, stop it. Stop that nonsense. We save each other. 
It's nonsense. Teamwork. This, the, the, oh, yeah, no, it's garbage that. talk. And I'm fucking sick of hearing it. You want to know something? I want a savior and I want a mother. And I want her to fuck me good. Okay, I want all of that. And so does she. We all do want that. We want someone to hold us. We want a savior. We want love. We want someone to fucking care. There's nothing wrong with, you know, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm just branching off what you said. I'm not arguing no, with you at you all. Got, no, I agree with you. I get you. But it's like, I you know, some of the, what do you, you know, I, I've heard, I heard someone, a friend of mine, like, well, he's got to act, he doesn't, he's got to act like a man or something like that, or something, some shit like that. He, 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 don't, he doesn't need me as a mother. It's like, what the fuck is conversation? Why am I hearing this nonsense? Like, first of all, there's no definition of a man, asshole. And then secondly, why can't he look for a mother in you? What is wrong with, like, saying, yeah, I, I, I want someone to love me like a mother. I w- and a fucking whore, okay? I want both. That's the classic story. Yeah, I think so. Like, big fucking deal. Like, why does that make me anything but myself? Like, saying, yeah, that's exactly what I, I want. I love how everything about those people are contradictory. It's like, oh, I love the Christians. I love, I love Jesus. And how she, I mean, Jesus, but his mom's a whore. That, that is his mother. Oh, son of a bitch. You mean he wants somebody to Listen, fuck him good? I'll tell you like right now. Some if, bitch. If you're not. You're right, dude. You, I, if, when you write, you write. I'll tell you right now. If you are not a whore, I cannot have you in my house, basically. Practically. I, I, I'm not just being, I'm just saying if you're not honest. You know, because we're all whores. And we all like to fuck. It's people are like playing around with that shit. You know, I don't like it. Like, now I've entered dating world and stuff. I just want people to be up front. Like, you, you know. Yeah, this is what I want. I'm coming over. I want to throw down. Like I don't want to. I. I don't know why the fuck you're here. You know, like someone comes over to make artwork with me. I'm like, yeah, it's cool. I don't. I don't expect them to fuck me, right? You know what I'm saying? But it's it's like th- some people. There's a mystery to it. I don't know. I'm, talk, I'm going. I'm tired. Probably. <laughs> going on a tangent. It's, it's ranting time. So what? But dude, you know, I, I have to agree with that. Where it's like. You know the savior complex. You know, but when I think about it, I'll tell you something that's really strange. From a uh, person that studies studies and loves psychology, is most people end up with somebody that's like that fucking mom. Oh, that well, that's what that's when you don't have the psychology, the, the, the therapy. Right now, now I got therapy. I got these boundaries. They call boundaries. I never knew about them, and so I have these boundaries. So I can. So I would never. Oh. I'll never be able to tell it's my mother until she has a knife at my throat. Yes. And she's murdering me like my mother would. Okay? I won't know. I'm in love. I Oh, everything. All of it's working. But now you have these boundaries, so the minute someone does something or ignore you, like, um, hey, excuse me, you're interrupting me. And when you're able to say those things, you're able to resolve conflict, or you, re- you don't get into conflicts. You're able to resolve things. If the person respects boundaries, goes, oh, let me pay attention. It's it's really cool actually thing I've been doing at least recently and you know it, it works out really well. Before it used to be I was <laughs> I I would have a, so I had this what I would mask when you heard the radio for Satan shows. So now I can tell people well you know I have an issue communicating if if you're not paying attention to me and you start moving around I lose my train of thought and I almost start to stutter and when I you know I have issues I have triggers on that stuff so I don't like to stutter. So when people start not, they do something, they're, they're doing multitasking while I'm talking, it throws me off. And I, I, I almost have to look at the ceiling to talk to them. I have to go like this. And so when that used to happen, I'd be like, hey, hey, you going to listen? So that was a mask. But that doesn't work real well in, in life. You know, like you're in the fucking hardware store and you do that. Oh, I get the screws. I they get handy me and they, they don't even charge me sometimes because I'm yelling. So it's like, it, but it's a weird thing because people are afraid of me. <laughs> and I don't want them to be. I'm like, and then I was confused for so long. I'm like, why is everyone so afraid of me? You know, you know, I'm trying to get my needs met and I just don't have the tools to do it. I'm right. just trying to get you to pay attention, man. I feel like I can't, you know. <laughs> and so I'm. I get it. I yeah, get yeah, it, yeah. Dude. Yeah, so you go to therapy, you learn these things. It's it, whatever. Dude, uh, speaking of therapy, and I, I brought up the fact that, you know, most people end up marrying somebody like their mom. And nobody is immune to this. Nobody's immune. Not not me. Check it out. Let me tell you about my wife. I'm so the, I am so guilty of this that 
My wife's birthday is a day before my mom's in February, one day before my mom. They're both Aquariuses, okay? They're both married to the same exact zodiac sign that I am. They're both married to an no. Aries. I, mean, I shit you not, okay? And it's the weirdest thing. When I, I, when I realized that she was like my mom is when I was like, oh, fuck, I have serious fucking issues. Like, there's some serious gunk I have to work through. I went to therapy, okay, because we had to go through marital therapy to, to keep my marriage together because I was an angry rager. You know, everybody's an angry rager. So I went to therapy, and we learned how to communicate. And, and I'm going to share this with everybody. Um, and if you want to help restructure, rebuild your relationships, this is an important tool you can use to communicate. When you're talking to somebody and you're having really bad arguments, because, I mean, we were fighting to the point where the fucking police was at my house, like, almost two, three times a week. So when you get to the point where you can't communicate, like, communication is cut off, you're arguing with somebody, uh, someone, the best thing you can do is don't use statements about them. You have to use I feel Oh, that's statements. hilarious. That's, that's nonviolent communication. That's Marshall Rosenberg invented... You, you have to use I feel statements. You have to say, I feel like this. You cannot talk about the other person. You cannot say anything about anything that they do. The whole conversation has to change to both of you agreeing to say statements that start with, I feel like this. Okay, and that's one way you can start to rebuild communication. With you. That's what saved my marriage. And that's I, a, I do, I mean, therapy is a huge thing that people yeah, need to go. You know? the, the, the concept that Marshall Rosenberg co came up with, nonviolent communication. Did I tell you the story on air earlier, or was that at the no, restaurant? No, I think it was at the restaurant, yeah. Okay, or before the show. Oh, before okay, maybe. so I'll tell you the story. There, well, I'll tell you some of it. But nonviolent communication is the thing where you state your feelings. And I was reading this book and watching this Marshall Rosenberg, and I feel like it's as strong as a book of, as, as Might is Right. Like, it's really strong and, and, and harsh lessons in the, like, wow, heavy stuff. Say the title one more time. Uh, Nonviolent Communication. It was invented by Marshall Rosenberg. And if you look that up on YouTube and his stuff, it's really great. But one of his first stories, he's, like, talking about going into prison. He's trying to, he would resolve conflicts in the Middle East. He would resolve any kind of really bad war conflicts he would resolve. And he would go in there and tell people how he felt. Like, he, w he went to a prison once, and they started making fun of him yeah, in a way. They were just that. harassing him like, I guess, they would anyone. And, you know, and he would, he, then he was like, they're sitting at the table, and he's like, I feel afraid. And you're scaring me with that. And, and, and he, he, he would talk about how they pulled back, and they're like, oh, I didn't mean to do that, you know. Because, and he says, basically, it's a, you, you go back to when you were a child. You think about, oh, oh, this person's having anxiety. Oh, I don't like to feel bad. I remember the first time I felt scared. I don't want to, I don't so they're not, and so he says that breaks down things. So I'm in L.A. It's a weird situation. I'm at Cantor's Deli. And I'm after this, it was a great moment, too. Steve Aoki, fucking hanging out with this guy. I don't even know who he is, but he's a big deal. And I get to hang out with him, so everyone thinks I'm a big deal. I don't give a fuck. I go to the Cantor's Deli to get a knish. And there's a big fucking, now, someone, like, like I would say one of my cousins, let's say, from the world I'm from. Total white fucking trash. Was you, it vermicious? I'm sorry. What? <laughs> Never mind. Keep What'd you on. say? Vermicious. The canid. No, I'm sorry. What is it's vermicious? Willy Wonka. Willy Wonka. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So, so this guy's huge. Like 400, 500 pounds. Just big, fucking horrible tattoos. Yelling in the restaurant. I fucking got you. No one waited on me. You know, total moment. Breaks something. Leaves. Comes back in. Bumps into a woman at, in the front. She is a black woman. And this is matters. Because she, he bumps into her and she goes, "Hey, why don't you get the fuck out of here?" He goes, "Hey, f you," and he used the N word. And she goes and goes after him. It's a huge guy, she's a small woman. Rips his shirt. Well, this guy punches her in the face. Oh, so when he when he when she said when he said the N word, the whole restaurant goes, "Oh," and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm not in Chicago anymore. Like, I'm not in Kansas anymore. You know, this isn't Chicago. They're just going, oh, like it's a movie. I'm in L.A." And so the guy punches a woman in the face, and I'm like, "Holy fuck!" And I jump up, and I run out there. And now all of a sudden, I take my jacket off, and I'm face to face with this guy, and I'm fucking small old man. He's fucking huge. And and he's like, you want some of this? And I'm like, nobody wants some of this, dude. You're scaring everyone around. You're scaring me. 
okay, and, and I watched his face go with this, and I go, no one wants some of this, man, but I'm going to have to take some of it. I can't let you beat up a woman like this. And he's like, I go, what is your morning going to be? You beat up an old man and a woman? What is that, dude? You're scaring everyone around you. And he kept deflating, and he, he like, oh, and he walked off, stormed off. The woman next to me, I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I said, I'm sorry. And she goes, you didn't do anything. I said, I tried to do as much as I could. And she goes, no, you didn't do anything. And then she ran after him. She wanted his ass. She wanted smoke. And she went. And, and I did not change because there are security guards out there. And this security guard starts holding the woman back. And I go, let your hands off her, motherfucker. Oh, this is, this, this is why the guy's come yelling at me. So he goes, he grabs a woman. I go, get your hands off her. She didn't do nothing. Do with him. But the guy's huge. So, of course... Everyone's going to fucking do nothing but me, an idiot, standing in front of a huge guy. And, and so I go, I'll do this. So the guy's holding her. I go, fucking do something, dude. And the, guy's, the guy's just like sort of smiling, pushing her back. And I go, hey, dude, you want to punch someone? Punch this fucking guard in the back of the head. He's not looking. Punch him. Punch this motherfucker. And the guy turns around. Then he lets a girl go. And he lets her go. I go, yeah, motherfucker, do something, dude. You got a gun. You know? But that's what had. That, that, anyway, I don't. I'm having trauma about the event now. I go back in that fucking restaurant, and these motherfuckers are sitting there, and I'm like, you motherfucking bitches, man. This would have never happened in Chicago. I said, that person would have been hurt. You know, there would have been consequences right there. And, and I think there might have been consequences for the people who did not get up out of their chair and defend that person. Because you got to think, whose mom is that? Whose sister is that? You got to fucking, you got to say no. In Chicago, or you take the other side, you know. I can't even fathom that. I don't think I spent enough time over there. I can't imagine a place where people don't respond. To well, something. I talk to so I I hang out with I hang out with criminals often. You know, I hang out with people that deal with the streets a lot. Streets. So I hanging out in L.A. with some people, and, and I ask them about this. Shocked, saying the same thing, and they're like, "You know what it is? It's the culture." And I go, "What? What culture?" He goes, "Well, you were in a." In that neighborhood, it's also we, everyone films here. So all we do all day long is drive around the streets and see fake gun shooting, fake fights. So we just sort of watch these things because it's what we see, you know, and I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah, I think that's what it was. And I'm like, really? I go, would that have happened here? And I'm in East L.A. now. You know, I'm in, I'm in, the, I'm, I'm in a working class area. And I'm like, yeah, no. And I'm like, see, that's what I mean. It wouldn't have happened here. He's like, yeah, but you're in Hollywood, you're in that area, they're just going to... And I said, no, I think it was because they're, like, rich people, and they got too much to lose. We're in that real rich area, right? He goes, yeah, you were in a tourist area. And I said, that's what I think it is. They're like, yeah, I'm not... You know, and they looked at me like I was a stone-cold idiot. You know what out there? Oh, it was weird. It was almost like a movie. No, because these guys come out of the kitchen. Three black guys come out of the kitchen. Where? Who? I asked the waitress. Look at that guy. That guy? And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. And they're like, hey, dude, thanks, dude. And they walk back in the kitchen. Then. But I don't know what, you know, this is all what happens in that moment. And um, there you go. That's the story. I don't know how I got in that story because it was pretty. I, I mean, was, I guess I can't imagine. I was trying Demo to. sitting there not doing nothing. But I don't think I could have sat there and not did nothing. Well, see, I don't know why I got. And then, like you said, being from Chicago, I feel like. I would also want to fight the people that didn't do nothing. I think you were absolutely. That's what I'm I think you were absolutely right. I would have been pissed off at everybody in the whole fucking situation, well, especially if that was my mama or my sister. Or well, something. yeah, that's I'd what I'm saying. Beat up everybody in that restaurant. I'm mad at everybody. Man, I just saw a woman getting punched by a huge guy. Like it wasn't like, you know, I can. I'm not going to sit there and get involved in every fucking thing. Okay. You know, I've seen boyfriend girlfriends get fight. You know, it's. I'm not getting involved. That was, like, it's a huge man against a small... How do people not... Like, that's what I'm saying. It's so unjust. There's no... There's no, like, well, I wonder what she did. Right, There's yeah. nothing there. <laughs> Fuck it, hey, dude. It's crazy. Yeah. Anyway. All right, so let's change the beat. We, we've, uh, we've, ramb we've rambled about a lot, of, a lot of things, but this thing I also wanted to, to jump on. I guess it kind of ties into it a little bit, a little bit. But... Um, so, I was reading the uh, Static Almanac, and there it is. And in there, there's a little part where you sort of do this thing where you're like, okay, I'm gonna redefine or, or sort of lay out this uh, like a like an understanding 
He was like, okay, we're going to make the new understanding. And I wish I, I might have to flip to it to remember so everything can, it says. Well, do that but, I wanna, I, but I don't want to, but I want to like, I want to make sure I, I don't, I say the right things. I don't want to state you're good, it wrong. You're good so far. But, um, and I want to get you to speak on it and say what it says, because it says something along the lines like, oh, I want to lay the new foundation for basically like the satanic thought. Like, don't think about it in this way. And then you give kind of like a set of tenets in there. Well, those are, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. And that was just uh, Stan and I, hang, you know, just shooting the shit and um, talking about things. So that is a transcript of us, like, hanging out on wall purchase, getting high and talking about stuff, you know, and, and those tenants and all that stuff were just ideas that we were throwing around. Um, I don't, I, I, they, I, um, part of it was like, like, uh, I, like it was like the, one of them was like empathy or something like that. And it was like, that's something like Doug ripped off from me, like when we were talking about Might is Right and redoing Might is Right, doing a part two, and all this stuff. And that's when I really broke off of them. I, I don't know if you've seen these emails. Have you seen the emails where he talks about the part two of Might is Right? Mm -mm. Oh, baby. This is the good shit. So we're going back and forth, and I'm like, in these emails, I'm like, you know, we've got to add compassion or empathy to this. It doesn't make sense. And he's like, why? And I'm like, well, I'm sitting here on the beach watching animals basically for two years and not talking. And I'm watching wildlife. Like, I'm not in fucking Chicago. I'm on the beach. I'm watching, like, sea lions and, and shit get eaten and thrown around by fucking whales or whatever the fuck's going on. I'm watching it all. Eagles swoop down and eat salmon. It's a symbiotic relationship, man. Right, They're yeah. not perverse. They're not just killing everything. It's, it's like they have a friendship, and then they eat. The, you know, it's weird. I, there's, there's, a, there's a feeling. Or You watch these animals. They... You can see, even though they're predatory to the other one, they have a feeling for them. They're not just like, they're not enemies. Mm -hmm. they're, it's just the way it is. There's not an enemy thing. So when you create these, these enemies or these perversions or these battles or something like that, that's like, that's, like the, that's like a perversion we have for some, like the dominance and submission, it's like that, that we have to, that we deal with day in, day out from our, anyone that's oppressing us. We need to enact that on something. It's like, have you ever heard the concept of captain's dog? Mm -mm. Ship's captain. Okay. Ship's captain. You're the ship's captain. You're a pirate ship. Guess what you can't do? You can't treat your fucking crew like shit or they're going to fucking kill you. So the captain, when he gets pissed off, he goes downstairs and kicks the fucking shit out of a dog. He beats the shit out of the fucking dog. Captain's dog. Or it would also be the peg boy. You know? Mm. <laughs> and that's a different thing. But you, you, those are the two reliefs for a pirate's captain. He couldn't go, you fucking asshole, you didn't. He's like, yeah, okay, I got you. Okay, okay, get the. Go down there and beat the dog. But that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. almost like I, 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 when, I, when I get involved in this, I'm like, yeah, I'm not the captain's dog, bro. Like, shit doesn't roll downhill this way. You know, stop that. I don't. I, I've been picked on enough in my life. I fight back, and, and, and it's never going to stop. You know, and I'm, you know, so just. I, and I, I, I don't fight back for survival almost. I fight back purely to fucking hurt predators or people coming at me. Like, if you're going to come at me, expect my friends to hack into your shit. Expect, expect consequences that you never expected. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm, I'm, of, a, I'm of a satanic network now. I'm so you don't, you don't think that those, the, the ideas that you shared in there, like a, the tenets that you mentioned in the book, or anything relevant, they're just kind of shooting the shit. Well, I thought I, they were kind of cool. I wouldn't say they're they're not relevant, I but I would they say cool. they're just to be. What I'm saying is they're modern as today. Like all these Satanists are getting together, hanging out, making their little cliques, making their tenants. We're basically doing the same thing y'all are doing right now. But because it comes from Stanton Levay and myself, it's like, is this official? Are you guys, I've been asked that. Like, are you guys making a new religion or something? We're just doing exactly what everyone else is doing right now. Just talking about what our version of that would be. But basically. It's, it doesn't go beyond Anton LaVey. And it always bounces back to LaVey. And as a, an actual authority or a person who was given a license by the person who created Satanism and wrote the Satanic Bible, when he gave you a priesthood, from him physically, from himself, not from Peter or anyone else, that means I can talk about that religion because that's what he said. That's what that is. So, when we express it, it becomes bigger. But we're no, nah, I, I don't. I, I'm I, and I can interpret his stuff. And I can say I can see this. I can I can talk about these things. Like might is right. Like I, when I talk about might is right, it was funny. When I was talking about I think in that thing, 
talking to Stan about it. I'm like, yeah, we wanted to do this with Mind's Red. He goes, basically the Satanic Bible. I'm like, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> you know, we want to take out all the hate parts of the Mind is Right. We want to rewrite it this way. And he's like, yeah, you mean the Satanic Bible. And the LeVays, the family of the LeVays, well, I wouldn't say Stan. Stan's a scumbag, often. You know, he, he really did, does degrade that name. But Carla LeVay, especially, and the LeVay family from Zena, Carla, and Anton are some people who have had such an amazing influence in the world. Yet, do any of you give a fuck? You just take it. They're so fucking generous, and you don't even send them a fucking Christmas card. I mean, you motherfuckers are giving money to some culture vulture from the Satanic Temple. Over women, you, you profess to be these left-wing ideologues, or people that are like, you know, into the, into the woke. And I'm into the woke, okay? I'm woke, bro. But <laughs> did you miss this part? Like, there, there's these women that are surviving, that are, were there for the birth of Satanism, that you ignore. And that you follow people who actually blaspheme them and ignore them. You follow sources like the Church of Satan and the Satanic Temple that actually say, we don't want that information. We don't, shh, don't tell anyone what you just said because that would confirm that we're fools or we're, we're charlatans or hucksters. You know what I can't swallow? And I said this to somebody. I was like, I can't get over the fact that he's like, oh, the Satanic Temple supposedly defending all these women's rights but it's run by guys yeah i never see them post any pictures of some women in their organization or anything that's like oh this is the i never see any of that but then and then it's like they're they're fighting for women's rights but then it was that thing that you just mentioned where it's like oh if you cared about women in such a way there's one that has authority over this whole fucking thing that you talk about and you're ignoring her. And why not? And, it's, and she's right there. And even, and she doesn't agree with the satanic temple. She thinks they're a joke. But, but the idea is that's, that's exactly why they shun her because she's going to tell you the truth. It's not even for her own good. Like, what is she getting out of it? She's, she's being generous just like her father was, just like the LeVays are. So when she would say, these people are not that, you're going to be like, oh, yes, they are. We don't want to hear that. That's what's going on right now. It's incredible, and you don't realize like it's a cult. Like you, you people are like in a cult, and 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 so us coming up with tenants would not matter. It's it was a fun exercise, but it, this conversation for thirty years, no matter how many splinter groups come about, like the Satanic Temple, there's many. It always comes back to Levee. There's just no way around it. You know, it's it's a it's a simple enough concept, but it doesn't seem like many people get it. It seems like, and 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 Carla speaks on this really wonderfully, and I can't wait to play that for you. Are you gonna play it? You want to? I mean, that I, I it's it's like wait. six hours. Oh, okay, well then. It's a chunk. Oh, we can sleep. <laughs> You tired? <laughs> no, I was just talking shit. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to push it and try to get to six in the morning at least. But, you know what? Carla speaks on a lot of that stuff. And Dad and I just want to see what Carla says. <laughs> uh, well, then you ain't going to sleep. That's for sure. You give that to me. I'll go sleep through it anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a book on tape. <laughs> yeah, it's just basically like talking about how you, you just, you're not getting it. You're not understanding what's going on. And... It's almost like you would you use some word, and I was sort of laughing inside, thinking, "This is what basically is going on." You know, different than my generation, where where people are taking these words, and they just use them for whatever they want. Like hipster, the word hipster, it irritates me that that's been turned into something else, because hipster was such a heroic name. If you were a hipster, that means you created the culture for the world. Jazz artists were hipsters, and they were beaten in the streets for it. What? Right. When you were a hipster, you became a heretic to the world. You know, you were Satan. <laughs> Jazz artists were Satan. They were bringing drugs, smoking, you know, they were, <laughs> they didn't give a fuck. They're fucking everyone. They're doing drugs. They're playing the music the way they want. 
and they got hurt and killed for that. You know, blues artists, hippies, you know, black metal artists. I, so when you're when you're in the front and you're a hipster, you, you really take a beating to blaze trails for people to walk along. And then when you turn around and you see that, and they're using it to buy and sell water bottles. It's it's really something that I don't know. I'd like to hang myself because of it. I don't really want to hang myself because I enjoy life, but I look at that and go, oh God, I wish I were hanging right now and dying and shitting all over you fucks. I don't like it. I mean, that's all that's used for is to sell something to, to middle class people. And when I say Satanism is a poor person's religion, I mean that because poor people need these totems or things to scare people away, to alienate them. But that's what we're using it for. It's not about fashion. So tattoos, we're going to find something else, though. Tattoos were months meant to be, you know, you fear me. These tattoos mean go on the other side of the street. Now it's like they attract. And, 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 and that's all due to capitalism. It's all due to sales and money and weird perversions. It just really take the life out of a culture or an idea. I think so. It's like graffiti used to be used to scare people out of neighborhoods. Graffiti was used to protect rents. Graffiti was the original rent control. And somehow it's become the gentrifier. How do you like that? Are you motherfuckers going to goddamn fuck? I'm sorry, I'm yelling at you. I'm so I know you like, are. You are all good folks hanging out. The it's, three of you. It's 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 like. Um, I guess I guess you could think of it like. For instance, it's really about like you talk about the like the anti. I'm back to this the 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 anti the anti culture or uh, what was the word counterculture like counterculture. I'm sorry. Let me let me say it correct. The counterculture. It seems like, for me, and, and it's so weird because um, I had mentioned how like black people, like Christianity is just like a part of them. They just won't let it go. It seems like it's weird because if, if we go back, and if we could go back in time, it's like jazz music, because you mentioned jazz and, and blues and, and all those forms of music actually come from people that didn't want to do the normal shit that other people were doing. Right. Like, for instance, blues was invented by Robert Johnson in the South. You know, he's a black slave, and that motherfucker didn't want to go pick cotton. So you know what he did? He sat on that motherfucker going and played that damn guitar so well that everybody loved him playing the guitar so much they forgot about him picking that fucking cotton. <laughs> and that's what gave birth to the fucking blues. He's like, look, I'm not doing this no more. And then even the white people was like, damn, he's pretty good with that guitar. You know what? Let's just let this mother play the guitar. Oh, that, that, that's what you know? I'm saying, though. Then they, they turn all of us artists into clowns or some shit. And it's just, I respect, Robert Johnson's God. Yeah. He's God. I, I'm not, but that's what I'm saying. That's the capitalism. Oh, yeah. we'll give you money to. to right, yeah. Oh, you got to be fucking shitting me, man. You know, I want, I want, I want dangerous art. I want shit that shakes people up. I don't want people that shakes people's ass. I like ass shaking, too. But it's like, like, I, I, like. I want people to be encouraged, like I said, make something that they might regret. Like, you might, you should push it. You should be so sad. I wonder if people, no, fucking push that shit. Just be able to come back and, it's how you deal with your mistakes, as I said in the intro. It's just how you deal with it. But don't be afraid to make the mistake. It's, 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 it's what an artist's job we're, is. We're back to what LeVay wrote, where he said, you're born a Satanist. Yeah. You're born a Satanist. You know? It's just that's what it, you you get here and you go no nope, uh, I don't like this I can't do it I need to be myself and and the more people try to push you to be in something else the more you fight back with and I'm still here you, you know, know when we when we're able to take a break and get a, maybe a, a nap in I want to come when we when we come back fresh I want to talk a lot about the stuff that you you, you you that you communicate online and I want to remember that but I can't I can't give you my best right now okay you know but i want to i want to talk about the stuff you we're talking a lot about me is what i'm trying to communicate to y'all or that history and i'm looking forward to talking more about obvious history in, 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 you know so for, we'll get for, into that yeah part of the show we're only it's only oh jesus christ we're still in the beginning we got 20 fucking hours 
Yeah, we're still in the beginning. Oh, my God. So You know what? What did I say what I was going to hang myself for? <laughs> please, can you please show me some bottles of rainbow-colored fucking whatever? Not rainbow. I love the rainbow. I mean, some stupid fucking water bottle but with stupid bath maze on it. I might, you know, I'm so tired. Uh, I'm joking. So, I mean, dude, we'll get into that. because we hanging out with you, Avi, man. Bro, I'm not tired. First of all, it's love. Okay, I, I'm love loving you. hearing everything love. you're talking about. I'm loving learning your history, the history of all no, this stuff. You know what, I love wait, history. Wait, wait, wait. I'm just happy that you, you know, came here and did this. You know, it was, hard, you, know, we, you know. This wasn't easy, you motherfuckers yeah, out there. Yeah, you just, just, this, this was not easy. You know, it's really not. Dealing with racism, talking about these hard fucking subjects. Shane, revealing his fucking personal no, life. No, no, it's not that me. shit. All uh, of this shit is I'm, hard. I'm, All I'm, of it is it's very hard. Yeah, not me. It's you know, you, you. It's hard. You were the person know? that was kind to to give me an opportunity to to, to explain myself, or to, to even come down. You, you were you you took that, and you know like or not even explain myself. You took a chance to listen to me or understand me or you rolled the dice to come down here and do this live. That's a lot. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. You didn't know how it would turn out. We didn't know, you know. And I'm just saying. I want to thank. I'm just thanking you again. I appreciate. Thanks for the opportunity, man. No, man, no. That too. No, 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 man. You know, there's that part too. It's a two-way street. One hand washes the other, bro. You know, but Bobby, um, I'm, 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 told, I'm, 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 I'm trying to say something. I'm really, go ahead. Say I'm, what you I'm, got to say. I'm happy and I'm humbled and I, I just, I just appreciate, appreciate that that you, you know, can see humanity in me, versus. What, what? Like I say, that this specific thing, I can escape at any time, uh, you know. And, and and it's true. Most of the white world is going to shine on anything I did on this show. Me reaching out and trying to figure out how to repair this that right is right radio show that has a life of its own. It it doesn't. It's not me. It takes Avi to say I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to hear you. I'm willing to consider this, and that's the biggest. That's the, that that is something that um, I'm thankful. For. That's it, because most people just see this thing. My child, you know, and I get. I, I'm not. I'm not. It, it, it's. It, it, you know, it's. It's. It's my history. But that's all they ever see, and it, 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 that's a hard part about being an artist. All, all around is. No matter what I do, people only see that, whatever it is. Maybe they only see Satanism. Maybe they only see this racism. Maybe they only see this. They only see this. They only see these things. They never see the humanity in a person anymore. And for me, you know, I sort of like my life right now. Like, I like being by myself here. I like calling my friends and hanging out with them when I want. Or I like everything. But there's a loneliness when people don't see you anymore. When you go to the coffee shop and they search your name online and they're afraid of you because you're a Satanist or something and, and for weeks the people at the coffee shop were nice to you. They treated you like human being. It was like, wow, I'm being treated cool. And then all of a sudden, wham. And it's, you know, so these moments are rare. When you brought your kids over, no one shows me their kids anymore. I can imagine why. I went to a huge part, why? Uh, a huge chunk of But they my... all have different reasons. Yeah, they all got different reasons. But Satanism, pornography, whatever it is. There's yeah. never one. There, yeah. It's not one It's not one reason, but everyone will think, well, everyone hates this guy because he did serial killers. Yeah, but then everybody will everyone fucking get on guy. there and watch porn, and they go watch the fucking serial killer documentary and be complete fucking hypocrites. I think I used to say back in the day with the Mighty's Right show, I think I used to say some shit like this, and I remember some of these things. Like, I don't know if I said that, but in that period... I was like, I come from Chicago. Everyone's racist here. It just depends on who cuts you off in traffic. It depends. The motherfucker cuts you off in traffic. You're going to hear 17 words about whatever that person is when they cut you off in traffic. And it's all derogatory. From my generation, you got to, you got, that's a long time ago. I, I don't hear, Chicago's not the same world that I grew up in. It was a lot different. And, and that was, you would hear these things all the time. Yeah, I think Chicago might be one of the most segregated cities in the country. Right, I remember going to a meeting when I first came here, and I said, and I said something, and, and the people that were afraid of me, and I, I didn't, like, they looked at me, and they were like, what the fuck's wrong with you? But I said, 
But wasn't there, I, they were talking about that, and I go, yeah, but isn't it, but it, wasn't it sort of like, I mean, as a cultural thing, Bronzeville's pretty beautiful. What would have happened if it wasn't segregated? Would we have a Bronzeville? Would you have lost that culture? And they're looking at me like, what in the fuck's wrong with you? But I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I'm dead serious. What we have in Chicago, I'm not saying segregation's cool. But certainly, when I go to Bronzeville and I see this, when I, when I lived over there, and you go from Canaryville to Bronzeville, and there was, a, there was this different cult. And I always liked Chicago. I, we have a Puerto Rican flag that takes up a fucking goddamn city block, practically. And, and, and back in the day, it was full of, there was Puerto Ricans in that neighborhood. Now it's all rich people. But you can go there, and it was like going into Puerto Rico. It was like you had to respect that culture, and you, had, you got to eat that food. You got to hear that. You got to smell Puerto Rico. So Chicago was, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not, but it was cool. That, that, those segregated things were cool. I'm not saying segregation is cool, please. But there's something, and I said that at, at this meeting, and everyone looked at me like I was weird. I, think, I couldn't communicate I this what, idea properly. I think properly. that what, you're, what you were trying to say, it's cool because all those cultures were sort of together and once able to exist. They were able to retain area. their culture. Right, and, and able to be in one spot. That's what's cool. It's like, oh, all these different cultures are in one space coexisting. Oh, that's kind of cool. Now, that I can see cool, but the idea of it being segregated is just ridiculous. It's like it's 2022. Why is Chicago still the most segregated city in the fucking country. You see, but I'm looking at it from the perspective of um, I have full, like, a segregated white area would be by choice, where I think every, anyone else is looking at it, segregation was forced. It wasn't by choice. Where for me, yeah, we're going to have this gated community. It's by choice. And see, I think that's what I walked away eventually understanding from that meeting when I was saying that, they, that I wasn't understanding that privilege that we talked about, that, that is, is something that is hard to understand when... I don't know why. You know, for me, just coming from low and ignorant people, it's just hard to understand because you suffer as a poor person. So you're like, I'm suffering too. But that was one of those moments where you sort of, I caught him like, oh yeah, I guess I can choose my segregation. They, oh, okay. I can, I can see why you looked at me like I was an idiot. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but it, it took me a year to figure that one out. But, you know, I'm listening. I try. <laughs> But, I mean, it's just crazy. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about, too. So, because this is something that keeps popping up, and I feel like we need to, we, we got to say something about this. So, when I first met you, remember, you were like, oh, yeah, I wrote this book, The Joys of Satanism, this one right here. And I brought up immediately the fact that what I knew about, um, because the title is similar to a group that existed that was very, very, they were straight up Nazis. Okay, they were straight up Nazi, fascist, separatism, super duper racist, and they called themselves uh, Joy of Satan. And this was like a website, <sighs> Nazi group, Joy of Satan. And it was almost the same as the title of your book. And so when we first met, I was like, bro, you know that this is some Nazi shit. Yeah. You remember that? I and was like, this is some Nazi shit. And yeah. a handful of people would tell me, but I'd never heard of it. But of course, because of my association with Levain, all that, I'm supposed to know every fucking thing about Satanism under the sun. Every fucking group. It's like, oh, you got to be kidding me, yo. I'm not, I don't, I don't care. And that is why probably Levain gave me that fucking shit. Because this is the way we're supposed to go. But I, oh, I love this. You know, we don't, I, I care about my life. Like, when people are like, how could you not know about this historic satanic thing that went on for 20 years? I'm like, up to my elbow and vagina. I don't know, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, I was stoned out of my mind. I was on a beach no, right. trying to figure out life, you know, and how not to participate in this awful, sadistic system, you know? And, 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 and this is what else I would advise anyone younger. You know, there's moments and you get the percentages. Look at things like that. And if you can get a percentage of your life where you turn your back on society and don't participate, like you're living on a beach with barely anything, and like I was, like working at this organic farm for your food and shit like that, like, you know, spending a day there and getting a box of food, and then all, and I remember going there, and the, you know, I'm getting on food stamps, all this shit, and the lady's like, I'm like, yeah, I don't know what the fuck's going on. She's like, you never did this before? I'm like, no. She's like, how'd you get shit before? I go, I just took it. I'm trying not to take shit. I'm here. Damn. 
Well, I'm just, it's the way, you know, I mean, well, I mean, like, as an artist, you just, you do, you the know. The fact like, that you can be that raw and honest with people is incredible. Because I would have just lied, like, oh, you know. Oh, it's a mistake. Saying. It's not, yeah, dude, <laughs> like, it's not, know? it's not the best. No. I blurt my shit out <laughs> without holding it back. I'll say shit. Oh, man, in a small town, they would, like, call Shane up. Ask him. Because everyone would be like, oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Like, someone's like, my ass look big in that? Oh, fucking right. Your ass is big. It's always going to look big. Don't worry about that. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, it's a big, fat fucking ass. It's beautiful. Those are in now, by the way. Yeah, but I, I'm okay with that. I'm, not, I'm loving that big ass, but you asked. You asked me if it's big. It is big, beautiful, bouncy. <laughs> but but I'm just, I, I blurt those things out. It's just. I wish, you know, I, I admire that because I am exactly the opposite. I was, as a kid, as a little kid, I was so fucking shy that I used to hide behind my mom. Couldn't talk, you know. She had to force me out from her, like, say hi. And I'm like, eat, eat, eat. Like, hide behind. I was the shyest fucking kid, dude. So, like, as an adult now, I don't, I still have that shy kid inside me that won't speak out every fucking thing. How's my hair? You know? Oh, here we go again with the How's fucking my, hair. Don't lie to me. Get you know my hair. Hey, if I ask you how my hair is, right. and if I ask you if my ass is big, you always lie. You say, oh, it's good. The hairdresser. Your ass is tight. <laughs> you know, just lie to me. I want you to lie. But, uh, yeah, dude, so, I mean, it's still in me, that fucking shy kid where it's like, oh, I won't say what I'm thinking, but inside of my mind, I'm fucking setting you on fire with gasoline, bitch. Oh, you know? I didn't see you. Wow, that's funny you say that, because like I said, when we met, you weren't shy at all. You were aggressive. You were firm. You were ready to fight. You you threatening. You threatened me. And I was like, yeah, dude, let's not, let's, let's try to, let's try to negotiate before we start assigning body counts, you know, <laughs> you know. But that was, that was also racist shit. Yeah, was, absolutely. I'll fight, I'll fight anybody over some but, but it was Stanton did something, and I was trying to, you know, like, you know. Yeah, that's just, when it was that racist shit, my guard, I was up. Like, it was okay, not let's, me. Let's get it, you know. That's where it was with me. So anybody that's racist, I'm ready to box. It's just it, you know. You got a problem, come right on over, you know. Yeah. And that's just where my mind was when it happened. I was ready to fight, you know. Yeah, I wish, I wish I wishes wish, worked. Yeah. But, but one thing I wish is like, 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 oh, we got to plug my baby in. Give me that. Give me that. I wish, I just wish we could hold poor and rich people to a bigger standard than we do ourselves. We eat our own poor people. We're fighting amongst each other about stupid shit we do. But we don't ever hold the judge accountable. We don't ever hold the man accountable because it's easier to pick on our friends. It's easy to beat up on our friends cause for our problems instead of cutting a cop's fucking tire. Mm. Tire. Cutting his tire. Mm. Or, you know. I mean, the real. You know, the, you know, doing something to the food. Judge. I mean, I mean. But quit picking on your friends and put that energy towards a revolutionary mind. Put that energy into fucking up the system, man. I just think it's crazy that we can live here in a place like America where they go and dig up. They they take the poor guy and dig up some shit from from 50 years ago and then throw him in a throw him under a fucking jail. And then we got a fucking pope raping 10,000 <laughs> fucking kids. But they won't dig them motherfuckers up and throw them under well, the Well, here, here, and here's here's what a lot of people... Would, here, now, here's where we go, go get into the concept of might is right. This is the concept of might is right. That you're talking about the Pope. He has power. He has might. Therefore... He can rape little kids and nobody do a fucking he, damn thing about it? Because that, that's what I'm saying. There's the, Here's the concept of this might is right. It does not, but it doesn't make it right, but he's getting away with it. It's right for him. Get what I'm saying? Like, there, you can't stop him. I think it's right to somebody to chop his fucking well, head Well, I get, I get what you're saying, but you can't stop him. You can't do a fucking thing about their power. The Catholic Church has an immense power. And that's all I'm saying. Like, they have an immense power. So, it's, it's like they do have different rules. We know this. You know this. White people have different rules. And rich people have different rules. That, so that's what I see. Rich people have different rules. You're like, white people have different rules. And I can see that now. So I guess might ain't right. Then. But no, you're, but no, they get away with it. Rich people have that might. I'm not saying you know, that's, the, that's the poetic part of the might is right. You know what I'm saying? It's like they have this power. Anything they do is right because they have power. And so the idea I hear is when I hear Teamsters unions, here's how I saw might is right a lot of times. When Teamsters wanted a raise when I was a kid, 
what Teamsters would do is they would surround grocery stores with ball bats. And they said, if you go and get your groceries, we're going to beat the shit out of you until we get a dollar raise. And so no one would get groceries. And the pizza shops and all the fast food shops were slammed because that's how everyone was eating their meals because no one could get groceries. And in about two or three days, everyone got raises because they assert, they put, they might. And that became right. For, so there's a, this, that's some of the concept of this where, where some people would argue like, what you just said was might is right. When you read the whole book, you see a lot of the screed or racism or prejudice. You see that in there, but there's a concept of might is right. Is the gun right? Is the laws made by powerful rich people right? Fuck no. You say they're not, but they are for them. You see what I'm saying? And because they have the power, we can't. You, you, there's, it, it becomes the law. It becomes the fucking law, and you have to su- you have to submit. There's the dominance and submit. You can't you can't be dominant to that. And so when you can't be dominant to the powers that be, what do you do? You kick the, kick the dog. You pick on the person that you think is lower than you. You beat your children, wife, neighbor. You pick this. That's why I don't have a job. You know, that's where we're going. But, and we, we just have chaos, but there's that might is right again. And that's, what the, that's where we have to break this apart and go, is wealth success? Is more of that have, is that might? Might is right in this country right now is money. So I guess in so many words... The real followers of Midas Right is the fucking church and the government. Well, the real followers of Midas Right is anyone. The war system. Oh, no. I would say Cardi B is a member of Midas Right right now. She's flexed. She fled like right. She's she's got power. She's got a ton of money right now. She's like, she can. She That's might. In our society right now, might is money. And you see it. And you see people you, grabbing the money. Look at our might. I don't think might is money. Tell that to R. Kelly. They just sucked all his away instantly. So might ain't definitely ain't money. It's something. Now else. you're applying uh, this weird thing because I'm not applying a weird thing. I'm, I'm, this is literally the same thing. We're talking Wait, about the no. Pope and raping kids. Now we yeah. talking about another motherfucker that yeah. just threw him in jail. You're, right. He had money that didn't save his ass. Well, you you can throw an exception to the rule all day long, and I would say when that exception to the rule is a black man, probably there's probably some prejudice there that happened to him. But the rule is rich I got people. A you on that yeah, one. rich people get away with it most of the time. Unfortunately, hey, O.J. Simpson. All, hold on, you're wait, right. He wait, got away with no, it for no, no. a long time. No, so dude, he did, no, he didn't. He didn't get away with it. He's in prison. So right. O.J. Simpson, right, didn't get away with it really. You know, he, right. he 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 what? This guy. But we can apply so many examples of like, yeah, this white guy got yeah. three months for doing the same thing O.J. did. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I don't. And he was rich, but like for me, okay, I remember one time. Here's a, here's a situation, and there's a situation brewing. How do I say this? Intelligently. Yeah. There's a situation brewing. And something's got to be done. And this person standing, you know, right there, you know, I'm like, okay. And my wife reminds me, whispers in my ear, Shane, no matter what happens in this moment, the rich man wins. And I look at her and go, oh, yeah, you're right. You beat a rich man, you go to prison. The rich man gets away with it. The rich man beats me, he gets away with it. There's no winning when you go up against someone with extreme wealth. You're going to submit. And if you don't submit in that moment, I guarantee you're going to submit. You can try to think up all the exceptions to the rules you want. But an old man... If you can be stubborn, I can be more stubborn. Yeah, I'm a pretty stubborn person. I feel person. like there's been great nations that have fallen repeatedly. I'm not Power, saying that... But yeah. we're not saying the same thing. I'm saying capitalism and money is might in this society. Mm, yeah, and it is just proven. You it, can't it, argue with that right now. That's all I'm not. saying. And it's crippling poor people. We don't have an education. We enter into the world ignorant. We Then look at my mind. is right, show. There's a lot of ignorant stuff that happened there. As I was educated, it changed. My opinions changed, or my expression changed. I didn't even have opinions necessarily like that. So these things change when you get an education. So that's that's what's happening here. They keep us. The poor people are always at strains because we don't have the tools to fight back. And it's like it's like now I look at society like how how sadistic this situation is, where these people, we we, we say they have might or this power, but it's like. They hunt deer. 
like when you see people hunting deer with these huge guns and trucks and they can go up in the mountains with all these tools and kill these deers. Even though the deer could probably beat the human being all the time, we would barely ever eat deer. We would have to hide and stick them with knives like, you know, the natives would do. Like, yeah, yeah. that would be a harder thing. But now we get all this machinery and stuff. It's just not a fair fight hunting. It's just not a fair fight when you go bear hunting, elephant hunting, anything. It's not fair. There's nothing fair about this. And that's how it is in our society right now. It's just not a fair fight between poor people and what's going on uneducated poor people. If you don't have education or health care, you're fucked. And, and, and then we fight against each other because that's what we know. We, we're, that's all we know. We're afraid of this education, this money, and we should be because with their education and money, they'll destroy us. <laughs> they will just fucking destroy us. And, and you get an exception to the rule. Yeah, you maybe get away with it. But it's just like, man, that, that power is extreme. And if we don't start talking in this fucking subculture or counterculture about how we can change things from the ground up or not even change this system not even fix this system how do we reimagine something new that's never been done before this isn't working none of it so so let's talk about it. yeah because we kind of we kind of uh, i gotta get a good angle you got the better angle we kind of touch it. that's always a good angle i'm like <laughs> this i'm like this i'm crunched over it's looking awful come on now i've lost a lot of weight kids <laughs> So, oh, um, damn, you're going to lose my train of thought. Mother. Oh, I apologize. Did you um, have the conch? No. <laughs> uh, damn it. It was a good one, too, man. Um, what the fuck was I was about to talk about? Oh. Damn you, Shane, for sticking your ass in the camera when I was about to come on a deep Can we thought. take a break so I can take a break? I'll go to the yeah. bathroom. You could just talk if you want. No, we'll just take a break. We'll take a break. We'll come back. Yeah, yeah well, what are we going to play? Oh, I got something. Oh, I did that one already. Let's see, what will I play? Oh, I've got a whole bunch here. Since it's getting deep and emotional, watch play, uh, watch my call. <laughs> Where is it? Um, yeah, if you line up like 10 people here, you know, and, and ask for a definition of what art is, you're gonna probably get 10 different definitions. A show that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what's more, this art is washable. Uh, so it's probably definable, you know, but um, I just know that I'm dealing with art on an everyday basis and the stuff that, that, that I create, it's, it's, I consider it art. Uh, but uh, if you ask me, just give me definition, and to be honest, I'm like, fuck definitions, you know, let's just... Let's just stop analyzing every, everything, or trying to put everything in words and definitions and labels. You know? I mean, to be honest, I'm like so bored with that kind of stuff. You know? like, art is there in the street. Go out and see. <laughs> You'll see your definition. You know what? Probably to most of questions, or like, I, I'm more and more like that, you know, like the more you ask, the more I'll be like, you know what, just experience what I do on stage, read the lyrics, just make up your mind, just I, because I don't know. You know, the McDonald's culture here and stuff, you know, I, 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 I mock that officially and I have no respect to that whatsoever. But uh, that is, uh, that is one thing that you see in the street. It's like the first thing you see in the street is a big fucking, it's, oh, it's, it's, I mean, it's this plastic culture, but there is a deeper meaning there, you know, and there's people who are super creative, who, who, who actually go very much against that current, you know what I mean? Then there's a lot of rebels in America, you know? And uh, I'll, I dare to say that heavy metal is part of, of this tendency or a trend, or I don't know how to call it, but it actually encouraged people to to rebel against uh, the plastic culture. So there's a huge space, you know, to be fulfilled with some something very creative and something some some intelligent substance. You know what I mean? Maybe art, but maybe some other stuff. I don't know. I'm trying to put my. I'm trying to 
again, you know, we come back to this defini what's definition to define my artistic spirit. Fucking damn it, you know. I mean, I was like, I, I, I don't even know how to buy it, you know, from which side, you know, how to put it all together. I just don't know it, you know. But I know how to do it. I mean, like to how to express it, you know, without words, just on a carnal and spiritual level, you know, without using words, because I just feel very limited by by this, you know what I mean? So I'm pretty much becoming more and more like him, you know, it's like, this is it, just, it's, here's my piece, here's my record, you know, here's my show, just enjoy it as much as you can, and if you, if you don't, you know, I don't care, you know, but this is it. <laughs> he once said that, uh, someone said that the, the, the most perfect copy of Mona Lisa is, is, is not as perfect as, you know, a child's, you know, crippled, you know, drawing, you know, and there's more art um, and more creativity in this primitive drawing of a, you know, a toddler than in a perfect copy of a Mona Lisa painting, and I somehow I like that, you know what I mean? I heard it like a few years ago. But, Somehow I got to this point where life is not, to me, life is not about what was in the past and what's coming tomorrow. It's about what's happening today. So this here and now philosophy I brought to the stage and where I perform, when I'm in the studio, where I'm whatever, you know what I mean? Dealing with art. And, uh, and this is it. That's, that's the, this is crucial to me when it comes to, to you know, to what behemoth means to me. I'm on stage and I'm into the music. I'm there. ...that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what... All right, Chris. So... I'm here 20 years after the last time I've seen Shane, uh, when we first met, maybe 21 years. And uh, we're talking about uh, our old times, uh, we're talking about our new times, what we've been involved in together and how we projected hate onto other people and maybe put that out into the world and, and maybe how we can remedy a little bit of that. Yeah, so might is right. I think might is knowledge, uh, but knowledge about yourself so that you don't fear other people and use it to hurt them uh, because that's really ignorance that's not might I think might is kindness uh, and not weakness and I think might is understanding yourself and putting yourself in other people's shoes uh, because really it's hard to love because you risk losing something hate is easy that marries art with fashion but is it really art or is it just another fashion fad and what Yeah, I love art talk. I've interviewed so many people about art. What is art? I love it. It's just what I love. So you, you know, as balding goes, you know, I got to check it out, see how it's falling. You know, it's just the way it goes. Just fucking shave it off. Get like me. No, get rid I, of no, it. No, I'm gonna get a wig. Fucking let it go. Fuck shaving it off. I got a wig. I'm gonna get a nice a ass luscious a wig. wig. Man, I'm still bald under that motherfucker. I gotta have my long bitch hair. Shine it up. That's right. I'm gonna so have check it out. Um, I'm checking it out. Check it out. You got all fucking check, stone. Check, Wait, is this going? Out. Are we still going? First of all, you can talk about how I got stone. I'm a weed witch. That's how I. That's how my magic work. Okay, I'm a weed witch. That's how I function. All right, all right. Yeah, I know. I'm jealous. I'm envious <laughs> because I want to get stoned. I'm like, oh, that's how I fucking function. We wouldn't even be doing this if it wasn't for the fucking the weed making the witchery happen. But I wanted to talk about that because I think you, you playing those art talks was, was spot on. Because we were talking about, well, how can we start to try to fix a fucking broken system where it seems Imagination. like... Imagination. You know, we have to imagine a new one. We don't fix this one. Exactly. So one idea I had, and we kind of talked on this a little bit, what we could do differently is start the underground fucking school. 
because it seems like they're in and you go and not to say that like ivy like school is is bad school is okay but from what they've made it now it's to the point where they're trying to literally take black history out of school and so we're not even learning history oh my good my, my goodness they never had it in there so that's another thing when i talk bit, that's on the little bit that's there they want to take it out yeah when so, we when we when we when we talk about my this might is right show and the 20th anniversary and what happened you know we talk about that old show that is something that you could definitely understand you should be able to think clearly about in that moment is that there, what was taught in our school system for us or anyone who absorbs it that way or communicates that what what were we taught and when you think about, you know, like the only thing I ever learned was from about black culture was from music. Mm. Like Public Enemy came into a into a, a suburban. What you don't like them? I'm just no, saying. No, I, I saw a video. About, it ain't about the band. Oh. I, it's I ain't worried about Public Enemy. What I'm saying is the fact that you saying that that's the only knowledge you had of black culture, and I know a lot of people that. Well, like be, that. before that, it was like the head. Cosby's or so. You, well, I'm just saying. T, that's, yeah. I'm come from a trash culture, so my education was TV, and we didn't have the internet. You know, and, and if a person had an encyclopedia set, they were rich. So my parents would borrow a neighbor's encyclopedia set sometimes. So it was just like that, and I grew up in a community that didn't have a library yet. It was a new suburban, awful community. So we had TV, and that's how we got our education. I'm glad. You know, people are like, "How did you get empathy?" Or you know, for me. And because my parents were awful. And I'm like, uh, PBS, Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, stuff like that. And, um, but we also understood TV, you know, like, we did, there, was, there was all, everything was white on TV, so that's the world you saw. You just, that's what was on TV. That's what, that's what, what you thought it was, you know? Oh, and I'll tell you, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, and also you go to shows when I was younger and, there would never be any people of color at a metal show or a goth show or anything like that. You just It was very rare. Now today, when I go, I'm like, oh, this is fucking fun. This is great because the place is filled up with everyone. Like a goth show or anything. You know, like it's just full up. Like young, old, tall, short, everything's go going on. I'm like, this is great. You know, I really have a good time. But, but it, it strikes me, my memory, I'm like, it wasn't like this. So and it wasn't my weird. fault. I it, didn't create that. It's weird because it, it's great to have. It's not even weird. It's great. It's great that we have so many generations of Satanists that can come together to do this this 24-hour thing. That's why it's important me, for me to c try to communicate to the younger people. That's why, when, like doing the event we did, that's why I reached out to younger people too. It's to try to hear them you know, understand so, them to take that forward and also give them something that I had, from, you know, that they might not have. So it's about this trying to build a... So the underground school and the fact that we have so many generations of, of people that were counterculture, that were the real grinding Satanists that, that, that started the movement, I think that it's important that we try to, to, real, to realize that we have to educate people. They're not going to teach them the history in school. And this is where our path has to go. I think this is what it was well, trying to be path. the whole. You're uh, a good well, teacher. All of us. All of us. I'm not. I'm teaching your story. I'm teaching Carlos' story. I'm teaching right. Anton's right, story. Right, but that's I'm what I'm saying. That, that, what you're saying is, is a great thing and a great idea. It's not for me. Yeah. I, I do this. What I do here is what I do. If you catch it, you catch it. But you're a good teacher. I would not Thank be. Thank you. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not. I, I'm. I, I'm not. Like, you know, like, I'll be like my father at some point. I'll be like, I fucking told you! Throw something against the wall. You know, so I just am not a good teacher. I don't mean to yell. I'm sorry if I We've didn't. been there. <laughs> we fucking been there, okay? Yeah. So it's like, I, I don't, I, I'm not the best. So it's just like, I'm, <laughs> you are a good teacher and you're very smart. You're very, you're very. Thank you. You know, you, as a teacher, smart. You know, you, you, you call, I don't know how to explain it. But you would be a good teacher, and I think that what you're saying is good, and it's a passion for you, and you should follow that, man, because you'd be good at that. I mean, I think I'm. It's you're forced a good on me. Leader. Like, you're like a leader. the way you you speak about how you synced up and things. I believe in synchronicity. How things synced up without you even trying. It's like you were just there. You were there. Your in, your internal compass took you there. That's what's happened to me. I didn't sit around and go, you know what? I want to be a history teacher. I love teaching shit. You know, it just happened that way. People are like, you know what? Oh God damn it! That's why it's so fucking hot here. Uh oh. <laughs> but yeah, you know, for me, it's like, it's like, I didn't plan it to become a teacher. You know, people were just like, yo, 
this, when you when you explain it, it makes a lot of fucking sense. And so that's, you know, that's how I got into this thing, dude. When it came to, like, like I read the Goetia, you know, and I read a lot of old fucking magic spell books and shit. And, you know, people would be like, this doesn't make any fucking sense to me. And then I would explain to them what was in the book, and they were like, what you said made perfect sense. I didn't, that's not what I read, you know. And that's how I figured out, okay, maybe I need to be a teacher. And it's now recently where everyone is, like, is doing the same thing that you did, where it's like, oh, you're a teacher. You're a really good teacher. You should be a teacher. And I'm like, oh, I didn't plan this. I would, I would, yeah. I have no desire to go to a college to be. You know what Hart Worry would you, <laughs> used to say to me? Hart Worry Chosa, uh, Ojibwe, uh, up in Upper Minnesota, Ely, near there. Um, she would say, "There's something in your history. Someone in your family did this before. Whatever I do, you know, like my graphic, what I was doing. She's watching me do it. She goes." You know, editing video, whatever. She's like, "Yeah, this is you. You did this before." And I go, "No, it's that spirit. You no, know, no, it's somewhere else in the life. It's someone in your family, in your DNA, it's that embedded." That spirit. In. She's like, ah, <laughs> "Take that word and shove it." <laughs> that spirit coming back up again. Oh yeah, it's in there. I know. That's what I was talking about. That's the juju, man. Yeah. Can't well, do that's it. what she would talk all that shit about. Someone in your family did that, and so when I see you coming with these big, look at fucking. Oh, I didn't mean to make a teacher. I didn't mean to be a teacher. I don't know what I. I didn't just fucking happen. I didn't mean to be a fucking teacher. Motherfucker brings a hundred pounds of books in here. <laughs> that bag was so heavy. My kids were like, what's in this fucking thing? <laughs> Just push it to the door. And I'm like, oh, oh man. Uh, but, dude, that's funny. You know, it's, it's a weird fucking thing where you sync up and shit happens. And it's like, oh, magic, perfect. I didn't plan this. For us, it was. And here's the thing. It was almost like, like, here's the thing. Now, now. I'm just going to talk openly, like, this is the way it goes, what happened in my head. This was all happening, and, and I'm like, there's this moment of hesitation, like, oh, he should just take stand this thing. He's, you know, I hear you talk, you're smart, you're not going to embarrass me. I don't, what, I'm, you know, before I say, you want to take Stan's part? I'm about to say it, I'm like, yeah, better not. There's probably, like, some something wrong with doing that. And, but I'm not being, a, I'm not like, I'm not going, well, I need a black person to fill this slot. I was not well looking for, you know, like, you, you know, weren't looking for it. it just but that, and I don't right. want it to seem that way. Right. Like, you know, so I'm like, oh, this is a weird predicament. Do I ask, is it, is it going to, am I going to look like that? Because that's not what this is. It was a mistake, actually. This is all happening on some, this is just happening. And I had already told you that it was magic. So and when I, I was like, Shane, it's magic. And it was <laughs> also, but it was also the part was like, when I heard you talk and I'm like, oh, this, it, there was a political element to it. It was like, oh. Stanton wanted to be public about this. We're going to teach a public lesson, aren't we? Aren't we? You know, as you're yelling at me, ah, uh, okay, Avi, we're gonna. Okay, I can see. So it grew in it. It wasn't, you know, it was that, but it was just a weird moment, and it, it, there was a hesitation there because of how it might be looked at. I looked at it like that all the way until I was at the witch's Sabbath. I didn't calm down until I was at the witch's Sabbath. I didn't trust you. You know, we're talking honestly. I didn't trust you. Oh, yes, I we was, should. I was, I was like, I'm walking to a dangerous situation. I'm not going to take any drinks from them. I'm not going to take any food from them. I didn't know if somebody was going to try to dose me. I was ready for all that shit. I'm from how about the, that? I'm from no, the hood. I'll tell you how it goes here. You get dosed by people you do shit for. Well, I'm just, I'm from the hood, so I was ready for all that shit. Yeah, right. You know, I'm like, you're not going to dose me. I'm not going to do. I'm not going to go on none of that shit. And I was just trying to fill you out. Especially after that that racist shit, I was trying to fill you from out from someone else. From somebody else, not from you. He not hadn't heard from, from he somebody had, else. This, this he was, hadn't he hadn't heard my else. racist shit yet. <laughs> okay, right. that took a little while. <laughs> this was from somebody else, and I was like, "All right, you're walking in here to work with this guy. First of all, he paying me, and I got kids to feed, so I ain't turning down number my damn collar. So let's let's get it. And um and so I came in and felt you out. And the moment I stepped into the room with you and we looked in each other's eyes, I actually had to piss really bad. I was like, I gotta piss. You know, because I had just drove fucking two and a half hours. But anyway, I'm like, I got a piss. And we looked in each other's eyes, and I felt you out instantly. Because that's how my psychic shit works. When I get around somebody, I either know within three seconds, I know I'm either going to like you, hate you, or you need to stay the fuck Oh, that sounds there, like, or you can, I, you know. I hear that from girls out women all the time. They're like, I know if I'm going to fuck that motherfucker that quick. Like, yeah, you know, exactly. Boom. It's exactly that shit. I'm just like that. And so when I get around people, I'm like, I can either fucking work with them or not. And the minute I met you, I was like... Oh, we're exactly alike. 
And now we're getting now you're pouring it out like, oh man, we got all this shit coming. You know, we got so much in common. You know what's funny like, about that? We got a lot of common. You know, you know what's funny about that in common stuff? I felt so I've been feeling so bad about myself. You know, divorce, all that kind of shit. Typical, typical weird shit when you get breaks up, breakups from a divorce and stuff. So I'm feeling weird about myself, like you know, not liking myself here and there, feeling weird. And when you say that, like we're just like each other, I'm starting to when I see, I was seeing a like. That's, I remember, I, man, you just like me, thinking that in my head, the way you study or the nerd part, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and I was like, oh, when I say that, I'm like, I felt good about things, about my, it made me feel good, because I'm like, yeah, I, I'm a book lord nerd like that, you know, so I was just like, it was good to see or hang out with someone that I have similarities with, so... Those similarities weren't, yeah, we're both fucking in the gutter dying of drugs. Yeah. It was like yeah. all redeeming quality. So I'm like, I got that too. Oh, yeah, I do. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm good like that. So it was good. It was, that was, that was, it was a... It was the positive aspects like, oh, we have the same I keep, aspirations. I keep looking for that in people I'm trying to hang out with, trying to see something, trying to find myself again and trying to figure things out. You know, and this is how I do. Like when you said that the other day, I'm, I'm going to quit looking around and asking people for answers. I'm never going to stop. I just, I'm wondrous. I love it. I think you misunderstood the context of the story. I want to add a little more context to it. Well, yeah, understanding the way we use words. You you use spirit like like water. Fucking spirit. Spirit is water. <laughs> it's all. <laughs> it is water. Uh, water is alive. So, um, but in, in relation to, like, you know, what we were talking about, man, you know, it's, it's super deep, dude, with the making of school. With the with the having, you know, you and you were like, oh, I, I don't think I could educate people. I think that there's good and bad teachers, oh, and no. sometimes you need the stern. Oh teacher. no no no, I I do educate people. Exactly. I don't think I could be a teacher, but I do teach. This is what I'm doing. I don't think I could be a teacher either. No no, but this is what I'm doing. No, I I, I have no interest. I don't give a fuck. I don't want to do that. I, I what I do is what I do. Mm -hmm. I look for certain people to hang out with and give them like, let's hang out, and make artwork, and talk to them, and learn, and, and, and trade off, and that's what I do. I do this. I'm hanging out with you. I hung out with Doug, you know, I mentored Doug. So, and and I don't even like those words, but that's what what it is. When you're like, you have your, I have more education, I have more experience here. I'm gonna, I want to hand this to you, and you enter into a, a predatory relationship, and it's not the mentor, that's the predator, it's the parasitic protege that comes to suck everything from you, and that's okay, that's okay, that's the relationship. And I say it jokingly, like, because yeah, I'm thinking yeah, yeah. of Doug, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> but it's like, ah. But, you know, they, you're there to give and they're there to take. That's the relationship. It, it's, it's, it's not, and yes, I get something out of it, but let's be real. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah it's just, <laughs> I'm getting good feelings. I'm getting warm feelings about it or, or, or irritation. So, <laughs> it, I think that maybe it's the way that I'm describing it. Because you are like, oh, you know, with the mentor and the whatever. The way that you said it, like, oh, these people come around and, and they, they parasitic. I don't think you can ever stop people from trying to show up and suck the knowledge out of your brain. Well, I love when anyone wants to come and suck the knowledge out of my brain. I'm going to tell you that. Please suck my lower you want head. You know something? Tonight, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> that's not a <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> oh, funny. All right, sorry. Oh, God, I ran into some weird film the other day. Oh, I can't even talk about it. I'm sorry. I'm not going to talk yeah, about it. Um, but it was basically about, you know, good or will destroy you. That's it. Basically, if you find... I, I can say from... I can speak from experience. Good or will keep you fucking... You won't understand. <laughs> You'd be like, what? This whole fucking show's been going for 20 years? It grew out of nowhere? How didn't you know? Oh, if I told you... <laughs> Why'd you crash the car? My dick was in your mouth. You know? yeah, I mean, <laughs> how did you not know See, what was going on in the world for 10 years? Well, <laughs> gosh. Uh, so, but I think that the way that I'm describing, like, a school, the teacher, the mentor thing is, like, you're like, oh, I have no interest in teaching. But just being around someone is a lesson. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm and just saying, so, I don't. Detect, I, I get that, but I'm I'm I, I'm just not into what you do. You're no. patient. I don't have patience. Oh yeah, I don't have a choice but to be patient. And I got have, four kids. And then I have, I have all these issues. So like, if I'm, I'll be like, 
Oh, did I interrupt you? Oh, I didn't mean that. Oh, I, I shouldn't interrupt you. That, oh, my God, I'm bothering you now. I interrupted you. You know, I'll just, I'll spiral out of control. I, I got to get the fuck out of here. I'm, I'm interrupting you, and now I'm hurting you. I got to get out of here. So <laughs> I got too many issues for any of that shit, man. No one needs that. Like, I would talk with my, you know, like, you know, sometimes talk about having kids. And we had many kids. We had many children. We just ground them up in the chili and ate them. Oh, bad joke. But <laughs> um, we talked about that. And I'm like, you know, if we ever had children when we first get married, I'm like, I'd have to live in a whole separate house. I wouldn't want them to see me like the angry asshole. I just want to see like the cool guy. Like, hey, kids, what's happening, yo? Like, oh, I'm, ca I'm catching the attitude. I got to get the fuck out of here and smash it. And I'm throwing chairs against walls like, in another house. The kids can never come over to my house. Why? It's destroyed. I broke all the walls open. <laughs> Total idiot. <laughs> so, I mean, I get that. I get that. I think I just, I, I didn't choose to be patient. I was, I landed here. So, <laughs> with being a teacher, you know, um, and that type of shit, I think that one of my strong points is simplifying shit. I take really complex shit and I go, oh yeah, it's just one plus one. And that takes two. genius. You know. That takes genius. To simplify shit to small, Twitter, that, that's what LeVay did. That's exactly what LeVay did. I see. He synthesized things down to this where any motherfucker could understand it. And that's the problem that Peter Gilmore, he's an asshole. He makes his shit um, exclusive or, I mean, no... Elite. He tries to be elitist because he used these big words that you got to go, what the fuck does that mean? What's going on? And LeVay was like, yeah, it's like this. It's like a fucking cheeseburger. You know, he was able to communicate to everyone. And that makes a good communicator. And that's a genius, I think. When you can synthesize stuff to small, simple things and, and tell the world, if you can communicate to everyone, that's, that's, that's genius. That's something Peter Gilmore can't do. I, I'm not that arrogant yet, but I mean, I have oh, managed to. I good. have managed you're, you're to okay communicate people across the globe. I mean, you're, I, you're okay with arrogance. Okay, I would tell you, not you're, you're, I, not you're anymore. Good. I used to be, but with my kids, I'm not okay with it because I have one, and she's just, and I have to like, I always want to put my foot on her and step on her and shrink her back down to size, you know. And I'm like, mm. I feel like some, I needed somebody to do that along, you know, throughout my life to me. To, so, because I was super arrogant, that's where the, the angry shit came from, you know. And it wasn't until I got arrogant and then I started to reconsider that shit that I was Defi able to become a smart person. Define arrogance. I think because it sounds like self confidence to me. No, that's a difference. That's different. Well, tell, self -con self hear. confidence is the the belief that you can do a thing that seems as though it's unachievable. That's self-confidence. Okay, I have the confidence I can do this even though it seems unachievable. That's self-confidence. Whereas, you know, if we're talking about like arrogance, arrogance is you obviously don't have the skill to do it, but you're going to stick your fucking chest out and act like you're the fucking authority in that situation anyway. Yeah. That's arrogance. That's like you you are fucking, but for instance, and not to talk about anybody, let's say you're just like you're fucking wee person, 90 pounds, you know, you're, you're not going to go be a firefighter because you have to pick well, up people and run them out of the building and all. There's all this physical stuff. You, you. kind of need to be stronger. You How know? I see arrogance is earned. So if I have to apply arrogance to someone, I'm going to do it in a harsh way. Like, why in the fuck are you talking to me? Who the fuck are you? I would be totally brutal to someone if they're an asshole. Okay? I can apply my I arrogance. I put arrogant and asshole in the same category. You can do that. You're goddamn right. I'm gonna definitely be arrogant and let you know I'm better than you. I have more than you. I have. I'm, I'm a. I am a study. So, I am a professor. What do you think a professor's doing when he's talking to a student? What the fuck are you? I'm a professor. Get the fuck out of here. That's not arrogance. No, that's it earned. is. That's, earned that's what authority. I'm saying. Arrogance is earned. And when I have to say, if I have to apply my shit to be treated like a human being, okay, I'm gonna be arrogant about it. I shouldn't have to to be treated like a human being. I'm just a human being. That's authoritarian. That's not arrogant. Arrogant is when you don't like you know you like you have no What's ability to do the thing. Authoritarian is you may have you may have that's when you just tell people what to do. You're like I'm on this is the way it I is. I didn't say this no, but you no, you're taking things and twisting them. I just said this is who I am. Okay, I'm asserting my 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 accomplishments. 
What I have tangible accomplishment. Who the fuck are you to tell me anything? You don't have any accomplishments. So I'm not taking right. advice from the. I'm not talking about Avi directly. I'm talking about the peanut gallery. Right. Everyone has a fucking opinion, and then when you ask, well, what do you do? I don't do anything. Why are you talking to me? Like, why am I talking to you, motherfucker? Who are you? You never made a piece of artwork, but you're gonna tell me about artwork and how artists should talk and how we, I should how I should answer and how I should explain myself. Who the fuck are you? That's not arrogance. You've earned that. Authority. Well, that's what I'm saying. You just said. Versus, but yeah, arrogance just would be toy. arrogance would be yeah. the other way around. If you were the person that didn't make any art, that's how you. Instance, I'm just saying. You like, but then you 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 come in and you're like, but you, I'm an artist. Are you talking about the technical definition of the word or how you understand it? I was talking about the technical definition. Yeah, I don't give a fuck about that. I'm just telling okay. you how I understand it. Like I'll apply my arrogance. I'm gonna be arrogant. I'm, you're gonna feel like 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 I had people like don't talk down to me. I'd be like, oh, I'm not talking down to you. I'm just smarter than you. Yeah. That's what's happening here. So don't say I'm talking down to you. Don't right. play that game. You don't have to say that's where I'm being arrogant. Where I have to say I'm smarter than so, you. I'm not talking down so to you. So when I said it was authoritarian, I want to say it in a negative way. I'm saying that's pretty much what that is. When you're the authority in the area, you're the fucking authority. If you come into yeah, the an job authority. and I'm the I'm boss, not telling anyone you what don't to do. show up and tell the boss what I'm to do. I'm just asking for respect. Like, hey, yeah. why are you saying that to me? I know how to fucking make. Th it's like, well, I guess modern day it would be like stay in your lane. Like yeah. When I hear kids say stay in the lane, it's a lot easier for me to go like to say that now. Kids have made my arrogance easier. I'd be like, I would just say like, yeah, you should probably stay in your lane. I know what the fuck I'm doing here. Like, I got this. I got a license. Mm. Stay in your lane. That's how I would communicate to that. I would have to yell and go, who the fuck are you? I would not yeah. say that because kids have boiled down that, that, that slimy, who the fuck are you to talk to me? To stay in your lane, bro. So I'm good with that one. But it's the same thing, same concept. Just stay the fuck in your lane. Understand, yeah, I, I got a faster way, engine on this you track. describe it as arrogance, like, oh, if I know I can, I have it, I'm going to talk about it. You're I'm going to tell you I have fucking authority. sit your ass yeah, down. Yeah. That's because you are the fucking authority, and nobody can say shit. Oh, that's like, if you, like, for instance, we're talking people that do great things. Like a greatest whatever person. If you wrote the, the best book in the world, and your book is number one on the list right now, somebody show up with a little fucking some a notebook that they've been scribbling in, and they go... I am the best writer in the world. That's arrogance. That's arrogant. You can't just assume you're the best writer in the world, motherfucker, when my book is number one. That's arrogance. You see, your arrogance of you to show up and say your book is better than mine when we can look at the charts and see whose book is number one. Well, what that's I don't the way. I, but yeah, that's the way I was describing you it. Know, you know, technical definitions were written by some asshole anyway. I like how people interpret words. Yeah. So I go, how do you, what do you mean by arrogance? You know, I have to ask. I ask him, what do you mean by that word? Because well, I mean the definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me what you mean by the word. And they can spout the definition, and all of a sudden emotions come into it. And the word has life that is different than the definition. And so I like to hear that. And so arrogance can mean so many things in so many situations. And like you said, we're just basically, you know, like, I guess what you're saying is there are people who are, 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 are uh, ignorant and act like they know everything, and they're just fucking horrible. And that's truth. It's yeah. Like, oh, God. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, it's a plumber situation. Like, when I was a plumber... It was like, <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but should I say this? Yeah, I was talking to Carla last night, and I said, hey, 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 Becca, I'm going to tell you something. This is the moment where I got to tell you it costs more money. She's like, what? And I go, this is the moment I'm the plumber. I'm putting in a garbage disposal. You keep telling me about this fucking tile floor that you tell me is the number one tile in the world. You can never replace it. You've told me. I get it. I'm the plumber. I got to put the fucking garbage disposal in. If I hear about the tile anymore, I got to charge you more money. You got to leave the kitchen right now. I'm going to put the garbage disposal in. That's how this business works. Time is money. If I hear about the tile anymore, you're getting paid. You're getting charged. You. So, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I didn't know where you was going either, so I was waiting for you to finish that thought. Uh, in relation to the school, <laughs> this was all. This was all started with the school, you know, and the idea. You, I mean, you were like, okay, well, you don't, you, you couldn't see yourself as a teacher, and I said, well, it's kind of no way around it because you archive in this, and this is you teaching. Oh, I know, I do. Yeah. I, I can't see myself teaching, but yes, I am an educator. Yeah, yeah. see, I, yeah. and that's where I was like, well, we're all kind of in that boat because that's left hand path is the underground. We're underground educators, whether we like it or not. We have to. We, we we're. I don't we're gonna, think that's true. I think there's people. There's di there's different characters. I, well, let's talk about our, my friend Doug, my old friend Doug. He's a person who grabbed an education but doesn't share it. He uses it and weaponizes it. And I think when we see, when we look at pop culture today, people are like, why are these ignorant white people talking about virus, you know, talking about all this crazy shit? They're ignorant. And I'm not talking about the racial shit. I'm talking about when you see, like, Trump say, drink bleach or whatever he says. 
And they're like, yeah, drink bleach. Everyone should drink bleach. And you're like, what in the fuck is you? You're crazy. No, I know what they're doing. I come from that world. Let me tell you what they're doing. What the ignorant people are doing is, and I'm one of them, we're weaponizing ignorance like education's been weaponized against us. So I would say probably carry on with that and irritate, ir irritate educated people all you fucking want. Because it seems like when, they, when you see that stuff shared, like, yeah, everyone drink bleach. All of these educated people that never get educated, they, they never get irritated about anything. They got free reign at the bank. Credit cards always fucking work. Shit's going great. That's the only time you can shake them. Everyone, sh ignorance shakes them. <laughs> ignorance shakes the foundations. I'm just saying, like, you got it. what a weird society we have where education's been weaponized against people without it. Like, what even is education anymore? Well, that's like, what I'm saying. It's like COVID, education's like, like a gun shooting right. an elephant. We got we got COVID, and everybody was arguing about that shit, right? Oh, get the vaccine, get the vaccine, and then now. Now that everything calmed down, here come the doctors showing up. Oh, it seems like the people that didn't get the vaccine won't drop dead while they fucking working. You know? And that's, and there's these doctors, PhDs coming out saying, yeah, it seems like the fucking conspiracy theorists were right. So you mean to tell me that, that there was doctors that have educated, that went to the same school, that disagreed, and they, 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 they pretty no, no, much no, no. shifted the you got, idea. You got bad information to agree with your own propaganda. Most, most doctors agree that the, the vaccines... That wasn't what I said. What I said was, is there's doctors popping up now that are saying that, oh, we never agreed the whole time. So why weren't they given a voice from the because, beginning? Because it goes by percentage. That's why. And they're a small percentage that you can barely count. And that's a good thing in science to ignore the small percentage. But what we do in society is we normally... we agree with the small percentage of people's opinions on censorship or other things. It's like the small Christian conservative group, they'll call the TV station, three women, I'm with the church, so the TV, what, this is the old day, the TV station would take down the whatever it was that was controversial. And it was like, yeah, three people complained, who gives a fuck? Like, no, who gives a fuck? And you almost see that with artists, some, some artists will, 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 will get harassed for something they say on stage. And they won't apologize. They don't give a fuck. They just keep moving. And nothing happens to them in the long run. Doesn't matter. So I brought that up for a reason, though. What'd you bring up? So the the way they didn't give the voice to the doctors that disagreed with the pushing of, of, of vaccines really hard on everyone. Yeah, but it's just small. You know? Yeah. yeah okay. But I, I was saying that to say this, um, in a sense of how we would uh, uh, of the underground and be in that small little voice where it's like hey hey you know this religious stuff is retarded we're that small little group and they're going oh but this is dumb why would we listen to them you know no jesus is going to come back and save everybody he'll be here tomorrow why would you listen to them our we, opinions are different that. than science opinions are different than facts and so science is a factual kind of business where a lot of people study and then when a lot of people come up with an answer we decide to go with that answer it's a mathematic, and a, it, it, it's a lot different than opinions. So, so I'm not going to sit there. And, I, I'm agreeing with you. Like the small minorities of fucking doctors that pop up on the internet, and every fucking person, in, in, it, we, I want to say weaponized, but inflames those opinions. And it's like, yeah, it's three doctors. Who gives a fuck? Like I'm going to go with, the, like here's here's what I'm going to go with. A, I'm going to go with what most of medical science talks about. And B, I'm going to go with how rich people were fighting tooth and nail to get those vaccines and everything about it. Like, so when, when, you, when you look at how rich people are like, yeah, we want the vaccine. We want as many of them as we can get. I'm like, yeah, you know, I think rich people have a long life expectancy. And when you look at the people that don't agree with that kind of stuff, they have a real low life expectancy. I come from that world of paranoids. And people who think they could self-medicate or use herbs to do things that are better than science, and it's bullshit. There's a comp. You, I would say herbal and uh, pharmaceutical is a great combination. Europe does it. We don't allow that. But there's a pharmaceuticals work, and it's hilarious the motherfuckers who are against them because they don't have a problem smoking that fucking weed. They're all the same thing. But I'm just saying that my but but you can go get you know you go get drugs from a drug dealer. Well, not you, but a person will go get drugs from a drug dealer, consume those drugs, but go yeah I'm against the pharmaceutical industry. 
And it's like, that's like, how, what are you saying? It makes no sense. You put a list of things, you, you're eating all this garbage food, everything like in the world, and you're like, I'm against the pharmaceutical. And I'm like, yeah, okay. When I meet a shaman that's on the mountaintop, he's fucking eating mud and bark, and he's against the pharmaceutical industry, I'm like, cool with that guy. He's living the best life. He's like, yeah, I'm against it. I eat bark. Fuck everybody. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, I'm just saying. I can't like, with you at the I eat bark. No. Yeah, just go eat that's bark, how, motherfucker. That's You're like, how, go that's in the how woods. We're talking about the shamans. I respect shamans, but just. I so respect you know. shamans, too. I'm you just saying, saying like, the shop. Motherfucker, I know shamans, okay? I'm that guy talking. <laughs> well, don't call them. Don't be talking about them like that, dude. <laughs> I'm talking about them like that to their face. Eat bark. Motherfuckers do eat bark. I will talk to them that. I will tell them that to their face, and I have. That's why they love me. I will that's make that, fun of that's these motherfuckers. That good, that good bark that gives you the good trip. Whatever, you know, mother. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely I don't have a problem. So I, they motherfucking eat bark, and it's cool. Oh shit! You know, you know, I've eaten bark with them. Okay, I've eaten all this weird shit. It's like, <laughs> you, you know, well, rub that moss you under your ear. Listen, you know, you know, it's, you know it's what, five a.m. You know, what you know what motherfucking, you know, motherfucking heart worry does. I hope heart worry's watching. Heart, you, you better call heart worry. Listen to this. I hang out with Hardware. She's like, here, here, come here. I got, I got an earache. She stick a clove of garlic in my ear and tape it in there. A clove of garlic. She's going to cure it. I got a throat ache. Put a clove of garlic there and tape it onto your throat. And you're walking through the grocery store with a clove of garlic taped to your throat. Okay? Now, I did it as fun. I thought it was great. But now imagine a little Rose Blossom. That's Heart Warrior's granddaughter that she took care of. Rose Blossom going to the grocery store. Fucking two things of garlic in her ears, garlic taped to her throat, crying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I loved it. Rose Blossom, I hope you're watching. <laughs> oh, beautiful what the baby. fuck, dude? Oh, man. So, so, funny, so man. you know what I mean? I just, uh, hard work, well, you know, I'm okay with the garlic in my ear, but what, you know, I'm going to take some drops too. You know? <laughs> uh, I just think, uh, it's all the same thing. Herbs make the pharmaceuticals. So that's all the same thing. There ain't no fucking medicine besides herbs. Oh, I they, don't. They just take the herbs and grind it up, put them in, turn them into You ever take pills. LSD? Oh, yeah. Do you like it? Oh, yeah. That's not herbs. Yes, it is. It's it, comes from, it comes from mas- mushrooms. LSD is extracted from mushrooms. I mean, once it becomes synthetic, it's not herbs. It, all, it, it doesn't matter. There's no such thing as synthetic. How do you make synthetic? You know, that's a good one, dude. How do you make I've synthetic? Th- well, I have thought. I don't know. I'm not. I, listen, you're asking me. No, I'm just teasing listen, you. What I know, I don't know. Okay, so give me a fucking break. Even if I know it, I don't know it, and you know that. Yeah, for sure. And you, what you know, you don't know. So Man, how do you know straight. I don't know that? Get the fuck out of here! What the fuck are you saying? <laughs> but there, I don't think there is a such thing as synthetic. They just take. No, that's the an interesting thing. I've always shit. thought that, like, like what does plastic come out of thin air? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I get it's oil, but I'm like, when when what you just said definitely is one of my agnostic moments of Carl right. Sagan wonder, like, uh, what what's going on here? Right? <laughs> Minute. How did this happen? <laughs> it's synthetic. I don't know what's going on. But I, I like what you're saying. I just don't understand it technically. It's, like I the, mean, the, the formula. It, what's the basically, formula? Basically, it's this. Back in the day, wasn't no damn pills. We had to start with herbs. We st- we tried with tasting the trees, and the, some of them killed us. Oh, uh, And listen, then we figured out which ones didn't kill us. A and then we made them into pills. Hold on. And a, that's how we got here. A viewer dropped off. That's how I get more oh, to sign up. That, some more okay, viewers cool. now. You're rubbing the wrong nipple. Oh. It's lefty, lefty. Left hand pad. Uh, it looks like right because the camera's backwards. But I, I love it. I swear it. he's rubbing the left nipple. Well, this one's right. I don't know. This one's right and the one on the other. I don't know where I'm at. Let me, let me, let me. I'm loving this live stream, though. I really like this. I'm I think we hit fun. Some, some heavy shit tonight, dude. It really did. Hopefully you guys are learning something out there. I've been seeing that like button getting slammed, so slam it some more. Share it out. Make sure we get the shares and all that stuff going out, man. This is this is epic, dude. Oh, uh, Carla, if you're watching, I'm not cutting that shit down. <laughs> uh oh, what she messaged you? She, I, no, no, no. I love I love working with Carla because she's because she's very she understands what she wants and and she doesn't have a problem asking for it or saying no. I don't like that. I love working with people. You know, like oh man, working on the Witch's Sabbath or just doing this flyer. It was a fucking six hours. It was great, though. I love, don't give me, I really do like that. I like working with people that are really fanatical artists. Like, they need everything. I love it, because I'm like that. They'd be like, nah, I'm looking at the font. I don't like it. How about a little over? I'm like, oh, man, this is, if it were a customer, that'd be a nightmare. 
but it's not. We're collabing. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm good with it. And that's the lazy bone. The artist, she's like, no, it could be better. And I'm like, damn, you're right. So when, when it finally popped, she was right about everything she suggested. And of course she is. She's an elder. She's done this a million fucking times, you know. So of course she's, you know, I, that's why I follow. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm learning. So I really love working with Carla because she's, you know, needs, you know. And she's also cool, like a hippie. And that, that's something I think is lost with a lot of people. I don't understand, like, the LeVays are like hippies, goth hippies. They're really, like, super cool, mellow people. I think it was weird that we all met in the middle of a pandemic and we're like, hey, y'all hugging this shit. <laughs> we're all, like, hugging this shit. Oh, yeah, Carla, Car- Carla comes in. I'm like, oh, my God, it's cool, man. I'm like, hugging her and shit. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's so fucking weird, dude. Nobody cared. We didn't care. We were like, oh, look, we're alive. I'm willing to die for this. <laughs> you know, and that's, I'll tell you, you know, people might want, like, I don't give a fuck about Anton LaVey, but I do. And here's why. The name that you hear, I don't give a fuck about that. But there was a guy named Anton LaVey that treated me really cool. And when you're a poor person or you come from scrubs, and when I did, when he like, paid attention to me, I was doing zines. I was just fresh out of living in a car. You know, for someone like that to say, yeah, I, I, I'm not only, you know, you understand how rare it was to go to his place and how he he really understood who he was inviting over. He really did research. And you understood this from the legend of Anton LaVey when, when that was happening. People would talk about it. And I understood more and more as I got closer to San Francisco with the first copy of Might Is Right. I, deliver, I told him, when I publish this, I'm going to hand deliver the first copy to you. And I remember Blanche like, well, what, when can you come out when you're on vacation? When, when, no, I, I come out whenever I want. She goes, what? I go, yeah, I come out whenever I want. When the book's printed, the next day I'm driving out there. She goes, excellent. We'll make time for you. And I'm like, why'd you ask me all this other stuff? She goes, everyone else that comes to visit us is on vacation. So they got to work between their work schedule. We love you. You can do it anytime. You're, you're, you're rolling. Let's go. You know, like I have my own schedule. I'm doing my own life. <clears throat> And, um, you know, to be, that was all a joke to me. You know, it was like, I don't give a fuck about any of it. And that, you know, just going, you know, entering that guy's house and we talk about arrogance. Nothing of the sort. But whatever radio, big dick energy, whatever you want to call it, whatever radiated off, dude, was cool. It wasn't like pure power. It was just like, he was a cool dude, like a cool artist, like 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 a hipster, like a jazz guy, like anyone else that was cool. Like, that motherfucker's cool. At, at a million years old, LeVay walked in with the street. You know, like in Chicago, we have cool motherfuckers. You know an old, cool motherfucker because they got their own walk. Like, that's an original strut. That's his strut. Don't take that strut. You're going to get fucked up. Like, that's his shit. LeVay had that. Like, he carried, an, you know... And, and, it, and it was just, and so I remember leaving there and, and feeling like, wow, that was, that was a really important man that treated me so kind and knew everything about me. How did he even see me? How would someone like that see me? I was invisible to the world. I was doing zines and I'd be in clubs and watching everyone doing drugs and drinking. And I'm in the corner just like delivering these zines and everyone was reading them and loving them. But again, no one saw me. They only saw what I did. And I was like, one day I'm going to get one of those girls to like me. They're going to look at me. And it was like that moment with, you know, it was like he saw me. And that's just, that's what, that's that's a cool thing. And it's just not something that everyone, not everyone sees you, even if they're hanging out. He, he understood what was going on. And Anton, he was like classically trained. That's what I'm saying. He was an important person. He was like this really important, but he was really smart. It wasn't like he was, he wasn't playing me, dude. Like a lot of times, oh yeah, here, I'm going to sign the book. We got you. Yeah, we're going to take pictures. No, he wasn't a hot, he wasn't, he was there to listen. Everything was like, oh my God, what the fuck? And so that's what keeps me, you know, like thinking about, wow, this guy was really cool and what he created was really cool and it was it was for people, not profit necessarily. Like he, he even, you know, he, <laughs> you know, it was just cool. 
Yeah. It was cool to be seen by someone in a counterculture scene like that. But I grew up around all these people. I'd like all those people were cool when, when they're all piece of history. I mean, like John Sinclair or, or Bob Rudnick or Skip Williamson or Jay Lynch. Jay Lynch created the Garbage Pail Kids. I mean, these guys created what you know as comics. I'm, I'm talking to people, not, not superhero comics. These are the guys who decided to go against comic books and, and write real world stories, like with hookers or drugs, all the, all the, our world, street world. <clears throat> and so they really created a lot of what you have around you today. <clears throat> but all of them suffered or sacrificed to do that. And so it, it's weird to see people riding on their bikes past you with stickers on their bike and you're like, well, half those people bled for that. Went mentally ill for that. Lived in a state of terror for half their life. Mm. For art, for expression, for trying to be themselves, for trying to it's, it's experience that, life. It's the vow of poverty and pain. That's yeah, yeah, but, 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 you, but you get this riches of experience of life. Like, God, this is life. You know, my God. <sighs> yeah, anyway, I don't know. I come from a world where my family, my, my father had never had a vacation. So I remember the first time I had a little money, I went, I'm going to fucking California. That's how I met my ex. This is a funny story. I'm going to fucking go to California. I tell her, you want to go with me? We were only dating a couple weeks. She's like, sure, I'll go with you to California. I'm driving. I get there. I didn't have any money to get home. <laughs> I thought I had enough money. You know, I'm a total dope, dope, dumbass. So I'm like, I don't know. Eventually I sold, I, I, hustled, I got my money. <clears throat> you know, I got a bunch, big, big, <laughs> out of nowhere, I'm like, we had no money, almost like a big, big fat, you know, fat stack of cash. And, and my, 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 my partner, at that, she's looking at me like, yeah, okay. I like you, because <laughs> she's like at, at, at that same time she's looking to escape. She's like, no money, I gotta get home. Okay, I got a bus ticket, Mike. You know. Anyway, I don't know why I'm getting into these stories, but it's called tired. Twenty four hour. The sun will be cracking pretty soon. You know, if I'm if we I'm telling boring stories, sun. interrupt grandma's we could stories. Do our, we could do our sun salutation. So let's talk about this. We were talking a little bit about the third eye. I want to bring it up again. So. I asked you. Was that a grandpa story? No. You can tell me. Say, okay. You... I don't think so. All of this is grandpa's story. Okay, good. So check That's it out. Um, we were talking about when we were out and you were eating tacos. And I was like, hey, Shane, do you meditate? And you were like, yeah, recently you were getting into it or something. I, I said, I, I've always done some form of meditation. So when I understood and learned how to meditate, like as people do, I understood I had always done something like that, but nothing. Now I understand the breathing. I understand a lot more. It's a lot better for me. I do it. I do it in a practiced way. So I want to tell you some some stuff about meditation that most people don't know, um, and, and ways to make it more effective and, and help you heal because your body has a natural state that it can get to that will help you heal, and you can reach it through meditation. So when you get down to theta, that activates your natural your body's natural ability to heal. The fuck theta. Theta state. Is that from Star Wars? No, there's. It's a brainwave state. Fucking theta. We're talking brainwave. Star Wars. So it's a Star Wars planet, is what I'm saying. Is it? Theta. See, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's I don't, funny. It could be. I'm, I'm actually not a fucking Star Wars nerd. I just love lightsabers, and oh, I make, that's so. Fucking I'm only. Weird. I'm a Star Wars nerd. I was in the fan club, so when I hear something like that, I'm like, I'm just. I'm not saying it because you. I was. I had a fan club, Star Wars fan club. I'm a big fan of Star Wars. That's like me. So when you said that, it just sounded like. Yeah, right. (laughs) Right. When you said that, it just sounded like Star Wars. And I'm like, what the fuck? Oh yeah. But so, let me let me tell you this. So with meditation, there's this interesting thing. If you want it to be more effective, the best times to meditate are actually an hour. The the first hour after the sun rises and the hour before it sets. So if you don't pay attention, now I'm telling you why. It's because it's because of the light rays and how they interact with you, with your brain. Move along with that. Move along with that. Okay. Move along with that. You can go with my counselor over in the corner and talk that shit. I hear you, and my counselor says the same goddamn shit like uh, circadian rhythm and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, fuck you, and fuck you, and fuck everyone that says that, because my shit works fine. I am a night person. Like, no matter. Me too. When I try to get in that circadian rhythm shit. 
like with what you know, he's like, you think you should go to bed in the morning, all this kind of. I'll fuck all that. Well, I'm just saying when he when he's telling me all this, I'm like, I tried. I'm like, I'm just getting more irritated. Like, dude, I really just this is the way it is for me. So what what I'm talking about? I believe this thing is you got to get eight eight hours of sleep. I think is true. Okay, that yeah, but what I'm talking about is something totally different. Okay, tell me. We talking about getting your body into a state where it naturally can heal. This is uh, okay. medical okay. science. Thing. I got you. I got so you. early, that first hour after the sun rises, it first rises. It's the ray, the sunlight, so the the rays from the sunlight is not full at its full power yet. It's still weak, and that's the time where light can come in, and it's not too strong to overpower your third eye. So that's the time where you can clear all that blockage and your body can get into healing mode. Is this like um, when people go out and suntan and show their asshole? No, that's their, that's some other. You know shit. what I'm talking about? Yeah, I say like that. People shit. like I'm not I'm not sunbathing my asshole. It sounds you know? like that. No, this You're is sunbathing not your third eye. This is this is not. The what same. if I want to sunbathe my brown eye? This, this is not. The same. <laughs> oh this god. Is not the same. This is similar to what happens in a hospital where they create the healing environment for you and you can finally relax and your body starts. To You get what I'm saying? So technically, have you ever seen there's this plaque, and I don't know a lot of people don't know about this. There's this plaque in the, mu- the medical museum in in England that says that, that all the study of medicine is the study of the placebo effect. I've heard that so I, You know what? Uh, it's official. I'm drunk. <laughs> but I'm, t- I'm, I'm just. I, I, I'm, you get tired. Yeah, I am, and things are not functioning, and, and I'm older. Yo, so it's like I, I definitely I used to be able to roll two three days whatever it doesn't work if anymore. we need to run it back later with the in depth we can what's and the in depth we're just going into shit that's too too much you know uh, overload you well know? I'm good here I'm, a, I'm not gonna be able, it's not my thing um, so this is something maybe we take calls over I would love people to um, I, I would Chime love in. to I'd love to ch- to reapproach some of these subjects okay um, this afternoon and even this evening so we could have outsiders engaged because us hanging out and talking for this chunk of time is cool and getting to know each other I'm just saying I, I can only engage so much with some of the stuff you're talking about yeah. it's outside of my it's, I mean with, with a lot of this stuff and like um, like we're talking about getting your body to the point where it can heal and relax and stuff and the meditation it, I mean it's really got a lot to do with stress and anxiety they, they tell you right out any doctor tell you anxiety will fucking kill you stress can kill you Stress will oh, kill you. Oh, you want to know something about the therapy stuff? When I started going to therapy, okay, check this out. No. I, so I, I played that depression clip where I'm, I had depression, and you don't realize it until you go to therapy. Like, oh, that's depression. Really? I thought that was me. I thought that was just how I was. Oh, no. And, and, and then talking to the person, goes, oh, that's anxiety. Oh, those are anxiety attacks. What's the difference between that and a panic attack? You learn... And then they give you this pill for anxiety. And lo and behold, I'm like, that was anxiety? What, you just moved away from my life? Uh, wow, I, I can function. I can leave the house. I can walk around. I can communicate better. I can get things done. Anxiety is a killer. Absolutely. It is crippling. And it is probably... And I know there's a great person that communicates about addictions and he talks about it being the addictions are all trauma re- based yes. related yes and i think i think within that concept it's like what we're doing is trying to cover anxiety i used to smoke hella weed almost an ounce of fucking week or more and when i started taking anxiety pills i was like oh i don't really need to smoke weed anymore like this is exactly why i smoked weed so i can get out of the house then I was able to move to weed as a recreation. I smoke whenever I feel like I feel like it, or or if I'm really amped, I'm like, yeah, I want to smoke a little, lay down. I don't have that. I'm not puffing it so much because I take pharmaceuticals for anxiety, and they're great. I just make sure to always ask for non-addictive um, pills. You know, something that's not. I'm not going to get a hook in me. You know, from these people. And so, that's about all I do with the pharmaceuticals. Make sure they're not addictive. It's all good. I mean, uh, and it works. With with dealing with stress and anxiety, this is where the meditation stuff that I'm talking about comes in. 
If you can well, learn how to naturally no, get you, to that, a... That shit talking is not going to work for me because what happened was none of that shit worked until I got a pharmaceutical. So it's different for every person. Yeah, it is. And for me, it took that exact thing for me to be able to start working out, eating better, everything. Once they removed the anxiety from me, I still had depressions and all this other stuff, but that was the moment where I was like, oh, yeah, okay. And so that pharmaceutical led me to now... I'm going, I'm going, I'm being more physical, and that is taking care of my depression. My, you're right, but that was the training wheels I needed to get moving. Like, and it's like, now I've lost a bunch of weight, I'm losing. You've got to admit, kids. Oh, the light's bad in here, you know? Come on, let me see. I look better close, right? Lie to me. So. Do I, I look good for my age? Oh, yeah. I've seen worse. I've seen worse. I've seen worse. I've seen some people at worse. your age that look worse. like they were just ready to go. What do you mean worse? It, Who the fuck looks? The, shovel out the, There's the no tomb. worse about this. This is good. I've seen worse means you're good. Isn't it a worse? I'm part of the worst clan. This I've dude. seen worse. You get really pessimistic when you get sleepy. <laughs> oh no, I'm, I'm really tired. I'm getting. I'm just. You know, I just look at this, and it's hard to look at yourself all day. Maybe not for you. You're still looking like you have always. I'm. I, when you get older, you start looking different. Black like, don't crack. <laughs> Do I got you wrinkles? That one? Yes. Huh? <laughs> I don't have any wrinkles. All I'm saying is, you start seeing these things, and you're like, "What's going on with my face?" Oh yeah, it's drooping, getting older, whatever. So. We'll, we'll revisit some of this stuff later, man. Um, but I was just trying to say, like, you were saying that the pharmaceuticals made it possible for you to do that. Yes, and for me. The way that I And see then it, I was able to enter meditation and working out and other things. But those things would never work before that. Now, I would like to say, in regards to that, that you can't trade one addiction for another. One could be healthier, but they're still both addictions. So you can be addicted to depression, then you can get addicted to antidepressants, then you can get addicted. So the thing is, is, is if we want to, if we want to get towards healing, we have to learn how to yeah, deal with it, yeah, and gonna, it's not easy. I'm going to put that you know? something in check there. That I don't think you can get addicted to something that's healthy. You know, I I, I know people that are that distract. I don't think so. I, it, it, healthy things are good for you. Addictions are bad. It's a negative. So yes, you could spend your whole life reading books. And be addicted to book reading and an escapist. Like, you just want to read books because the world's outside. I don't see that as a bad thing because when you speak, to, when you ask that person something, they have a lot of answers. You know, it's not like a drug addict, they have nothing. So, for me, if I'm addicted to walking and working out, like I do now, like I'm like, oh, I've got to go for a walk today, it has to happen, or I, I feel bad. I am gaining years. I'm getting something from it. When I sit here and, and I am depressed, I am that addict. If I'm smoking weed all day and not doing that, I'm losing. So addictions to me are always in the minus or not unhealthy. So one, yes. of my, one of my idols is Bruce Lee. I love Bruce Lee. And one of, my, one one of, my, of the one of the things that uh, that I've seen said about him is that you know one of the things that led to his death was him overworking himself, working out too fucking much, and that killed him young. So. People say working out is a good thing right up until it kills you. But that's it, not true. It could be, it could overexert yourself. He had a problem with aspirin. And he took aspirin and that's what happened. It was a chemical problem. I'm a good, I'm a big Bruce Lee fan. Yeah. Big Bruce Lee fan. You know what I got to do when I was younger? I saw Chuck Norris in a Bruce Lee movie. Yeah, me too. Right. And then he wasn't a big deal then. He was just this guy that was in a Bruce Lee movie. He was a famous fighter, but he wasn't a movie star. He was not what he was. And so we're like... Oh, that fucking dude from the Bruce Lee movie, he's got a gym. And, you know, I read it. I, I used to get karate mag, kung fu magazines. I was a big, you know, Bruce Lee fan. I get kung fu magazines. And then there was an ad for Chuck Norris's, like, workout studio or some shit in L.A. So I'm telling my friends once, we're over there watching Bruce Lee's movie. I'm like, let's call him, prank him. And so we call the number. Hey, is, is Chuck in? One second. Hey, just Nord, you know. And we're like, Hello? Our prank call was that it was silence. We just listened to Chuck Norris. Then we like the next day we called back. Chuck, hey, who's this? We just listened to his voice. We never said anything, but there's my. 
pretty good. You call the game Chuck Norris the silent treatment. You didn't want to get kicked in the face. I think <laughs> I think his power, Chuck Norris's power came through the phone. He was like, you so, it was so you don't powerful. want me to reach my foot through the phone and kick you. We ass. felt his power, it silenced us. It was like <laughs> fucking Chuck Norris. You know, he PTSD, fight, flight, freeze. We froze. Or was it Roadhouse? <laughs> Roadhouse, he'll fucking yeah. kick your ass, dude. It's, it's, it's Chuck a Norris. Memory, I know, but oh, that's funny. That's funny. This dude's like dealt with everybody. Oh yeah, I was just hanging out with Chuck Norris. Fucking prank calling Chuck Norris. I, I have been fucking, around. I'm pretty proud know. of myself. It's, oh no, I'm just gonna pull up this this member from Behemoth and let him do this chat. Mm. I'm sitting here like, wait a minute, is that a member from Behemoth? I fucking love Behemoth. He's like, yeah, you know, just one of my buddies. And, and think about this, a lot of this I stuff. I worked at Guitar Center for three years. You know what we did for that three years? We talked about fucking Behemoth. Really? Yes. Ugh. Dude, I was like, it was me and Mayhem's one better. One, my boss better. was you like a Satanist. Ma'am? Yeah. Mayhem's way better. I love Mayhem. But Mayhem's my God. boss was a Satanist, and I was a Satanist, a black one. So we had a lot to talk about. First of all, he was like, how'd you go black Satanist? You know? <laughs> and, uh, how old then, was he? Who, my boss? Yeah. Uh, Trent was, I don't know, maybe in his 20s or 30s. Oh, interesting. But Trent was, uh, and I probably should say his name, I don't know. But anyway, Trent was fucking... Um, a Satanist too So dude He loved Behemoth And I was like Y'all listen to Behemoth too We're all like oh, uh, 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 You know Fucking Talking shit in the store And uh, it was funny Because dude I was like One of the only black people I'm driving through Chicago Bumping black metal You know And this is Late 90s So people are looking at me like I'm got that Black death metal Okay I remember watching Headbangers Ball As a teenager Just waiting religiously for Mrs. Juliana to come on Headbangers Ball. You know, so I go fucking beat off in the bathroom. After. <laughs> but, um, dude, I mean, that was my life. I never fit into any box that anyone ever wanted me to. And it was weird to be there with a manager that was, sat- that was Satanist and all these people looking at me like this and then me hanging out with him and talking about Behemoth and then to come here with you and you're like, yo, that's just my friends. And I'm like, dude, I feel well, like this the world that you were talking about sinking and crazy sinking. That's crazy sinking for me. I would I wouldn't even say like we're friends. It's just like when you're part of an art scene, that's the deal. Mm-hmm. So as far as Satanist goes, I see it as an art scene. And it's true. If I knock on Danzig's door when he comes to Chicago, he's gonna answer. Because because we're in the same art scene. It's not because I'm a big deal, but I I can be in certain areas. It it just depends on who I'm hanging out with. I'm a, you know nobody know, you know it's. Just, it's, I, I don't. I don't see the world like that. But whatever. This is the underground. I'm just my. I'm just me, and I don't really like being seen or treated differently than others. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. But it's sort of the only thing you get sometimes as an artist, as far as payment goes. So you know, as one artist told me, you know, when we get when artists, a lot of times we do work and we get paid in a meal. Some of them are like, well, you know, here's. So. The more you eat, the more you get paid, is what they say. So make sure, you know, let's go to this fine restaurant I can't afford, you know, extra order. Order order up. You fucking order shit. You still hungry? Hell yeah. I need one more thing. I'd like one of these dishes right here in a to-go box. Thank you, baby. (laughs) That's how you do it. I just realized that uh, all you can eat pasta means I need another bowl. (laughs) Yeah, right, 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 right. Fucking A, dude. Yo, we were talking about the struggle and the, like, crazy But, you know, all these people I've met, I I gotta let you know. Uh, there wasn't a lot of privilege that uh, there was. I get it. Don't. I, I'm not saying that, but in, within that world, I was living in a car, living in a car. I wasn't treated great, and people, a lot of people can understand when you're living in a car that they just see you and they're like, "Yeah, exclude this person from our lives." They just see it. Whatever you're wearing, you know that's. Just like in school, when I go to school, I had one pair of jeans. If I have a mustard stain on, I was fucked all week because people make fun of me. Same clothes. Ah, look at the mustard stain. Yeah, fuck off. But I don't know where I'm going with this now. I get to trigger out about the childhood mustard stain. Yay! Oh, I'm going, where's sorry. the whisk? I'm where's sorry, the you have to relive I'm that. I'm joking. Fuck <laughs> No, I, I forget where we, what we... Ah, fuck. It's, get, it's getting there. He's going down now. <laughs> uh, no, man, but we were talking about being an artist and the struggle, and, you know. Oh, I just said I got to meet all those people based on just perseverance or, like, that was it. I just never took no for an answer, and I, you know what, until I was, until I left Portland, I didn't know I was short. 
<laughs> and people are like, really? what? Yeah, I didn't. I'm not short. I'm. I guess I'm a regular size. Like I'm five eight, and it's like that's the border of short. Five seven, five. Six, all the, I don't go for that. But I guess I didn't. Know, I didn't know friends of mine that were taller were taller than me. I always saw people eye to eye, and then let's just put it this way: when I left, it was made clear that I, you know, all this stuff happened. But then I really started paying attention to tall men and all these things. And I started looking back on pictures of my past, and I was like, wow, these people were taller than me. That guy's almost a head taller than me. That, wow. And looking into it, and I just never knew. So when I walked into a situation, whatever my retard, you know, my, whatever my, my learning, however I think, I was homeless in a car, and I'm like, I want to do a zine. You know, I'm trying to do this. And I just went in, and I thought I was, I thought what they told me on TV and what you learn, like we all have these rights and we can just do what we want, you know, be the same as everyone else. I thought that was true. And for a while it was in the underground when you act like you belong. In the underground, you belong, you know. In art world, you belong. When you apply that thing too, when you're like, I'm like everyone else. In the art world, you, you take it in. But when, now try that in the bank. Try that anywhere else in the world and they're gonna let you know in some way you don't fit here. And people who get through those, those things are incredible to me. When a poor person's able to grab an education. You know what, some, my counselor, <laughs> I love this guy now, fucking hated him. We got, when we first gone, Stephen, we, were, we had some issues in the beginning, okay? We got through all that, but eventually, you know, we get now we get personal. Before it was like, hey, yeah, I need that what kind of music. Like, I mean, I'm here to talk. No, you know, it was like that. And so now it's like we relate on a lot of levels because he, he made it. He was a poor person. He came out of hard times. And at some point, he explained that to me, and it made hearing him better or different because he understood and I was just like when he told me that I was like and I understood because he told me the neighborhood he came from in Chicago and everything and I was like oh wow you made it out look at you look at fucking you wow congratulations that is such an accomplishment and I know how hard that is that's almost impossible to do what Stephen's doing and Stephen is now a doctor, or becoming a doctor and all that stuff. And that's just, it's good for poor people, because he can communicate to poor people. So with that said, yeah. this, this segment started with us talking about sort of trying to make the underground school, you know, of, of where we're keeping that history alive, I guess, uh, archiving it. Archiving that history is a better way of putting it, keeping it alive. And sort of showing people that the best thing that that you really can do if we want to try to change the, the broken fucking system, because we can't fix the broken system, right? So if we want to try to have change, the best thing we could do is is teach people how to be independent. Right. Teach them how to be fucking artists. Remember we were talking about that? And art is a lot of different things. It's not just painting. It's not just this. It's not art, oh, I think, is. Oh, oh, oh. we're going to get in that conversation, yeah. buddy. Oh, Art is not a lot of things to me. I'm pretty fucking strict on art. I don't say, here, you might be creative. I don't know if you're an artist. And you want to know something? I really know? Empirically? You don't get to identify as a fucking artist, and you don't get to call yourself an artist. Someone else calls you that. You don't get to say, I'm an artist, fuckface. I mean that. Get it? It's a painful fucking title. It's an awful title. I had people fucking thrust it on me for most of my life before I finally said it. It was awful, and it made me feel awful and queer. And I mean that in an odd way, not, not, is not a slur. It made me feel odd. I go, yeah, I'm not an artist, yo. Don't put me there. And, I, but I, 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 I am. I, everything that points to that. <laughs> everything points to that. But that was thrust upon me. And then I meet people like, yeah, I'm an artist. Yeah, no, you're not. You're actually not. You're not! You're a crafter. Artists have pain. And we show what's fucking going on around us 
to the point of creating a might is right special that lasts 20 years and it's like out of out of hand but that was actually what the fucking deal is like that's a history book baby that's what was going on around us that's not like what i created i didn't create hate get the fuck out of here artists that reports and I, I i'm a fucking motherfucking artists are generous that's what they are most motherfuckers creating art are fucking assholes when they call themselves artists because they're not generous they're doing it to sell something it's not about generosity artists give till it hurts we just give 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 here hear my music have you heard my music that's what you hear about fucking when you have a friend that's in a band they're irritating motherfuckers come on I, listen I to my, was that motherfucker right you're that's right probably <laughs> an artist might be an artist I was that motherfucker I was that motherfucker so much to where the other people in the band were calling me daily like, oh, you know, let's write more riffs. And and I was just like, please, leave me alone. Like, That's what I'm like, saying. Uh, why do I have to sleep with a guitar? It's like, oh, I don't Do you still yeah. play? No, it's under my bed. It's in my closet now. I gave up. It was too racist. I wanted to play metal, and I, there was no space for me. They what? were being super racist. I, I can see that. They I fired every single black person out of out of guitar center in sequence. Oh, man, that's I'm sorry, man. I, I was I thought about bands and just the culture of, of, of metal and stuff like that. And I I see a lot. I see that, but I, I also see change. You know, I, I have to. Anytime I get really down on the world or th see things, I would. Now this is years ago. Now we're on the ropes again. But I have an impeccable imagination. And growing up, this is something else I would see, youngins, is that and I'm living in my car in a Chevette. And you know, you, you live on the streets, so you get to see things that you don't hear on TV or see in the news or read in the papers. You, like you get to see, when you're on the streets, you see shit. You see the real fucking deal. And back in the day, before we had a gay neighborhood in Chicago that was officially designated, we had a gay pocket there and people would come in there and they would call fag bashers and they were proud of that and they would come in with ball bats and beat up faggots as this is what this is the words and this is what was happening then I'm going to report the news this is not me endorsing those words and so I watched that unfold and then you watch this wild scene happen where all of these faggots put on these purple pink triangles and shit and hit in the alleys, waited for the fag bashers and came out and beat the shit out of them. Fucking handed them their ass. Violently and vile. Like, like, you know, pissing on them and shit. Well, fucking, like, it was like, oh man, they're fucking going to town. Anyway, I don't know how this gets going, how the story got going. I don't know, but they got what they fucking deserve. That's what shit. <laughs> well, you know fucking what? Hey, dude. You know what? That, 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 this is something I talk about. Like, this is, that gay neighborhood, when, when I was, in the car there, those folks took me in. And and I'm ignorant, I'm thinking it's predatory. It's gonna be predatory, but you know, it was never. And then I started feeling insecure, like am I not sexy enough? <laughs> and what's going on? What's wrong with me? Why aren't they why touching aren't they me? Why are they trying to touch right, me? Right. I, I mean, I'm sure, I might be open to this. So I'm like, why? You know? <laughs> I'm broken. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I went from one thing to another. but. That's who put a hand up for me. Like that's who helped me out. That, you know that. That's what I when I see, Boys Town, what it was called then. That's what, what I see. They and I. They don't call it that no more. I, I don't. I don't know. I'm, I'm new here. I don't. I don't know. And I'm also. The, I've been. I've been. It was like I've been in prison for ten years. So people are like, how did you not know? Yeah, whatever. But I went. I was in Boys Town and doing the Witches Sabbath flyers. And the person was with me. I was telling her she's like. I've never been to this neighborhood. And I'm like, oh, it's Andersonville. This is the lesbian part of the gay neighborhood. And I'm like, see this restaurant here? I wonder if it's the same owner. It's Kopi Cafe. And she's asking, I'm telling her the stories. We're driving up Park. I'm like, I was homeless. And they used to go in there. And I used to go in there. I'm like, you know, I'm just kidding. I didn't, they knew, they knew, but I didn't know they knew at the time. And they're like, I came in there once and I was like, I didn't have enough money for what I was going to buy, like soup and sandwich and coffee or something. So I'm like, I'll just take the soup and gave him money. He's like, no, I'll take the sandwich. And I said, Donnie, I'm like, okay, cool. Just, I don't think, I don't, I don't think they're being kind. I just think this is the way the world works. And the guy comes over later. He's like, you know, I'm hanging out, and he's like, you know what? Anytime you want to have a sandwich or something, it's on me. Come on in. I'm like, okay, dude. I would go in there all the fucking time. Hey, dude, Jim said I can have a sandwich, and whatever. So cool. And I just thought that's how the world worked. I thought dude was just like this. He thought I was a cool guy. I'm, 
I'm an artist, I'm trying to make a zine, and people are feeding me. And going back to that cafe and seeing it so many years later, and the guy was there, and I walk in, I don't know if he recognizes me or not. I'm like, hey, can I hang this poster up? He goes, can you hang that poster up here? We're going to hang that poster up. And he takes down all these, look at that's a beautiful poster. Which is Sabbath? Oh, what? Puts it right up in the front, takes all these things down, treats it so great. And I'm looking at him, and I can tell he doesn't really know. But I know. It's a cool story, man. It was, it, it, when I left there, I was like, oh. You know, because I'm an ignorant kid, you just don't realize. Fucking naive kid, This right? person's feeding you, and you're know, just taking it for granted. Like, I don't, yeah, yeah. of course you're feeding me. I'm, I'm cool, I'm weird. I don't even know if I thought I was cool. I just, like, again, just was totally ignorant. And then you see how homeless people are treated as you grow, as an adult, and you see these atrocities, and you're like, oh, my God, that, wow, that's not really cool, is it? You know, it's weird when you become yeah. homeless because of Satanism. Oh. It's, that's the fucking Well, I wasn't hard. homeless because of Satanism. Let me tell you this. I'm homeless because of the class of person I come from. And here's something with the white thing. Well, I guess that's not part the of it, thing, With the white thing, when people see white, they do see that privilege. and they, So they don't expect the life I've had. Everyone in my family's been homeless, bro. My mom's been homeless in my lifetime, in my adult lifetime. Okay? Every single person in my family's been homeless. Okay? You want to know why I'm so angry and want to watch the planet burn? I got better stories than that. But having to survive that shit is not great. And it makes you really angry. I was telling you about when I was homeless, dude. You know, um, and it's hard to even say that. It really it's is. Humiliating. It's, it's like, it's, it's humiliating. It's not humiliating anymore, but it's, it's me being, what do they call it now? Vulnerable. Vulnerable, yeah. I'm going to put a papaya. I get, do we get more viewers when I do this? Yes, I think we do. <laughs> But I, uh, yeah, I'm being I, vulnerable. I'm open to you. I remember when I was homeless, and, you know, you don't know struggle until you're homeless. Woo! And, you know, you go into your friend's house waiting for them to leave you alone by their refrigerator so you can reach in there and eat anything you can grab. Anything. A cracker, a fucking piece of bologna, a cheese. That's, that's when you know you hit the bottom where you trying to act like you're still a civilized person but you're just waiting for somebody to walk out the room so you can go in there fucking I got a great room. weird fucked up story I had I want to kill this person or then you get someone giving you a handout and making it really clear here I want to feed you have you ever eaten out of a dumpster ah it's probably too much you ever see a piece of pizza on a table and just grab it some half eaten pizza and they want to ask you these things while they're feeding you. Because they're a sadistic asshole. Mm. And then this, then this thing comes into my head where I'm like, some of the most dangerous animals in the world are small. Just like me. And killing you would be too kind. But if I ever find out who you love, I'd like to cripple them and and that's where these angry thoughts start to form. Get what I'm saying? Because I'd never had that thought before that person did that. And before, I, I, you know, I may have ignorantly answered those questions had I not felt that sadistic vibe. I stood up and thought about stabbing my fork in the person. You know, all these things started happening. I don't know why, but those thoughts definitely started creeping, you know, like anger, Homicidal. Being game. hungry will make your ass angry. Oh, but but just that Shit. this person enjoying <laughs> it. No, this person enjoying my oh. pain. Oh, we. I don't even want to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 don't, I, don't, even, I don't want to trick you. I don't want to. I don't want to go there. I'm yeah. trying. Like, I mean, I guess we're gonna have to at some point. But these I are mean, stories that tie into the idea of might is right, dude. These are stories that tie into that concept. That person had the might. He had the food. Dominance and submission. I had to sit there. And deal with it. And it made me really fucking angry. Because I knew by every fucking model I was probably a better person than him in some form. You know, or I could compete or I could do the same thing. I shouldn't be here. 
So and why am I here and you're there? And then when you start figuring that shit out, that's the perversion of what we consider the idea of might. For me, when I understand what might is, it's a momentary thing. It's like if we arm wrestle and I win, I have this feeling of might. And it goes away pretty quick. That's all might is. It's this emotion that we try to manipulate into, like, you can always feel that. It's like an orgasm. Might is like an orgasm. It's like that. And it entraps us the same way an orgasm does. The little death. And we get entrapped in that might. You know, that feeling of needing that, that winning arm, arm wrestle. Boom. But it's like we get entrapped in the uh, serving the orgasm. Just I think that I think that the sex is a sacred thing in there. Can be. I think that there's a, it, there's a sacred thing in there. Not can always. Be. Yeah, but yes. yeah, but exactly. It can be, but it's not. It's not that way. Not it's not, not, not that for way. everybody. In our society, things are so perverse. And I'll tell you what. Really, I'll tell you one thing, kids. I'm joking, but. One thing that is really just so disturbing when I walk around, watch, watch the world is sex work and how acceptable it is. And it's how the oldest profession. Hold on, buddy. I'm not done talking. I get, I get it's the oldest profession. I, 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 live, I swim in that world. I understand it all. I understand how hard it is to be a sex worker, how it destroys your life. How you have to be an alcoholic to get through it. So tell me all the day long you want that it's the oldest profession. It kills people. It's awful. And they don't get paid enough even when they do get paid that much. So it's like, it's not the good thing. And But but I'm saying in our society, it's like, it's. I'm not saying that sex workers should be not treated properly. I think they are great people and they should be treated like human beings and have all the rights to do what they want with their pussy or their dick or their ass or anything they want. I don't, I'm not putting them down. What I'm saying is, capitalism has created a, it's such a fucking perverse system and society that that has grown into something where like, yeah, the grind is this, you know, and that's, when you said sex is sacred and that thing is sacred, you're right about that. There is an exchange that happens and when it's bought, it hurts the person. Almost always, and I've worked in that business on every end of it, and there's very few people who can make a, a, a living where they're investing, they buy the hot dog stand, they've got a, two apartments they're making money off of. Most of that money goes to drugs, alcohol, and, and dysfunction, and, 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 and all these things that come out of trauma-based problems. You know, suitcase pimps, all that kind of, and I don't know if that word's wrong, pimp, you know, I apologize. It's got to be healthy. Sex. Well, that's what I'm saying. In order for it to be sacred, it can't just be. Well, that's what I'm saying. And I'm yeah. talking about sex work in, in general and how yeah. I, I'm not putting them down. I I I get it. Like I understand. Uh, uh, often I understand the whole story of sex work. It's sort of a business that I've been in, so I get it. And I'm just saying I know the results of it. I know what the results is. I've worked in porn. Porn is awful, for the most part, because. You're just grinding people up. You have, you know, everyone there is family, though. I'm not putting anyone down. But you have to get low in order to survive. And not everyone, you know, when you're able to prick and choose when you go and get low, it's fun. You're like, yeah, I got to eat 10 asses again to fucking pay the rent. It's not fun. And it becomes degrading. It takes what the concept of soul or character it degrades people. It's, it's meant to degrade you. That's what you're getting paid for, to be degraded. And so capitalism is the problem. And, and, and when I see people like, you know, just like, it's, it, it's just such a weird, like in order, like I don't want people to be s selling themselves. We shouldn't have to do that. They should want to do that. And people have to do that. It's not right. And even, I mean, all jobs, fast food even. I'm just like, we shouldn't have to mm -hmm. give so much time like that. It's not, it doesn't make any sense. And I, I'm not saying sex it's work not is a fair fucking trade -off. better or worse than McDonald's. I'm just saying, in our society, 
can we just say that this is awful work and that I do it? Not that, you know, it's not cover it up, not pretend it's not, because we know it is. I know it is. I've worked with you. <laughs> I've held you when you cry after all that shit. When you talked about the corn stuck on your fucking finger, it was awful. It was a trauma. Now you can't eat corn. I get these stories, baby. I've been with you. You used to love corn. You know what I mean? It's an awful fucking job. So quit putting it up on fucking TikTok like it's something you want to sell your sister, you fucker. Sell them on revolution or art. I'm sorry, but and I, wanted, I, and I, I worship the queen. I, I worship the goddess. I love women. I'm not putting them down. Or, so I wanted to. Yeah, I ahead. wanted to talk about because I have friends, you know, quite a few that are in that field. So do I have family members. And, and and the thing is, is I see what you say. I see how they have mental health issues and all of this stuff. And then it'll be some days where they're just like, oh, you know, they put themselves on this pedestal like it's the greatest shit ever. And I'm like, but then next week you're gonna be all fucking ready to slit your wrist. You know. But on the hustle, on the hustle, Ron Jeremy said it great. Ron Jeremy said it great. Porn star Ron Jeremy. And he was a friend of mine for a minute. But Ron would say, you got the choice. You can make $200 and work 40 hours slicing deli meat. Or you can make $200 working four minutes sucking a dick. It's an easy choice, actually. It's just hard to get offered that because you got to have a perfect look. The job's hard to get, but it's an easy choice. And everyone's going to do it because the money's there. Everyone's going to suck that dick. Every poor person. You just have to pile up the money in front of them. They're going to suck that dick. That's the society we live in. That's the society that you love. I don't love it. And as a Satanist, I don't think that's the best. I don't see any freedom in that. I see it as, you know, I don't, you know, and I'm... I'm not even saying a job sucking toes for 40 hours is a bad thing. It's just, it doesn't, I, it's, there's something wrong about it. It doesn't make sense. And at least when I was younger, we all knew it was awful. We just all said it was awful and it sucks and we're going to go hustle these people. You know, we're going to hustle rich people and get the money we can and that was it. This is survival. Now it's like, y'all are giving classes or some shit. Like, it's like... What is it turning into? It's out of control. <laughs> you know, I don't... I don't it's, I, fucking I, it's just, it's just, we... The, the capitalist system, you know, and I know it's a... This redundant trope maybe at this point, but it has mm -hmm. to be until it's done. It is a really bad deal. And it is destroying... every single thing around us. If you don't like people, that's one thing, but it's destroying the planet, it's destroying the water, it's destroying everything. The planet part scares me. Well, yeah, me too. I mean, the planet part scares me. we're all one, like it's you like, say. fuck up your own no, life. But we're we all, no, it. we're all one, like you say. So, right. no, don't fuck up your own life, please. Please, I mean, please. But it, like you said. Reach for like, more, like reach for more, said. reach for more, reach for more. And I know reaching for more is you, is going for the dick for 200 bucks instead it. of the deli. You said it, you said it. You said it, 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 they they have the power. They're, they're, they fucking whatever. So can we? Are we gonna be able to do anything about it? Are we gonna be able to do anything about it? Short of fucking, you know, trying to educate the people that we can. You know, one of the things I thought of when we were doing this, when when it started to come together, and, and then it started to get heavy, with the might is right stuff. We're like, hey, dude, this is heavy. You know, you, you know, we start talking about that stuff. And I was like, oh. I hope Bobby does not pull out. Because so we have a moment here to add to something that the idea is to bring classes together. And all of the revolutionaries that I worked with when I was a 21 year old, the White Panthers, they went in to join the Black Panthers, and the Black Panthers said, Oh, we love it and all, but there's one problem you're white, you can't join us. And they took their tenants and carried on, they did took their rules and just put the white there. All those people, all of them when I was younger, said the equation to freedom wasn't Satanism. <laughs> it wasn't any of these stupid fucking things that we go around about. 
was just getting the class of the poor people to come like this. And I think if you want to look into a factual history, you would see that Martin Luther King was killed when he was going to do the poor man's march. Because that no longer existed a zero-one dynamic of black and white. He was doing that. And that's what all these old revolutionaries would point to me and say, that was the moment, see? This is a moment where you can see it's important. They, he was killed before that. It's vital that we do that. So when someone can pull off the poor man's march, like King was, that's gonna be a vital moment in our history. That's going to be a big fucking deal. And I'm telling you this from a lot of old sick hippies that are dead. They told me this, and it's that spirit from my mouth to your ears. I'm giving this to you. It's that spirit dude's talking about, okay? And maybe you know all this. Maybe it's stupid. I don't. I don't give a fuck what you think anyway. But let's get it. Let's get into some of the history. Since you said it, since you're talking about the spirit, let's go. Let's talk about some of it. So, with spirit and 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 the stuff that that happens randomly. Can we take a break before this? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Because I got. I'm, I'm on the coffee so much. I got to pee. What do we play? Do we have anything? Hop on a commercial. We'll jump back in. Okay. Let's see. What do I got? I'm just going to let this motherfucker... Oh, is this the whole show? You know, if this is... ...a show that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what's more, this art is washable. It's all part of conditioning. You know, conditioning is where it's at. That's what you have to do. So is that there's no such thing as artistic sellout? I think there is you know, artistic call style, it but I think it's, it goes with the territory. Okay. You know, in other words, uh, the only people that can be totally in control are people who are doing fine artwork, you know, and decide what they want. But even then, conditioning. You, you, get, you take it a little bit at a time rather than get hit over the head with it. You know, you have to make compromises because you have to deal with other people. Most big projects like movies and stuff like that you know, it's not a one-man job, you know. What do you mean by conditioning? Like, you're making a callus? Like, Well, in other learning? words, if you've been through something, if you're more familiar with something, it's easier to deal with it. What is art? You what make art. art. Yeah, you make art. You're an artist. Yeah, you make collages. Well, what I is mean, art? I make collages and assemblages because it's cheaper than going to a shrink. And so that that's a way of spending your time. I think it's a way of of of, of uh, dealing with the the world. In other words, you're 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 trying to express yourself with your peers and with the world. You're trying to create something for whatever your motivation is. Some people, beauty, the comedians, laughter. Uh, you know, uh, musicians. Until yeah, the young people. You know, their music is designed to irritate the parents. Art to me is something that is created from nothing and elevates you into a spiritual plane. That is art to me. Well, what is this band doing dabbling with these symbols or Nazi symbols or fascist symbols when they're claiming not to be the real deal? Well. Sometimes in art, unfortunate for some, we want to attack feelings. We want to make people think that art is also other emotions. It's not just spiritual. It can be very angry. And unfortunate for some, what you believe in, or unfortunately what your culture was put through, whichever it may be, uh, you're going to feel victimized at times again because some artists make choices that maybe to them are symbolic of something else. <laughs> uh, humanity in general has had many situations like that. Many different races many different cultures, many different religions, 
have had genocides, holocausts, whatever word you want to slap on it. Let's be fair. Everybody has been through this. When I say everybody, I mean, maybe that's the wrong word. Every culture, I, can, I mean, I can't sit here and give every freaking number, but it happens. It happens. It happens. Why, some may ask, well, why use, oh, you know, what these evil Germans brought to the world? Why use that? There was fascism you know, in Italy. And, you, know, and, you know, what's the deal? Why, 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 why do people celebrate the German one? I can't answer that. That's, that's an independent individualist thing that I'm not going to answer for, for everybody. I don't represent any movement. I'm literally not, I say literally, not part of any movement at all. I'm a Satanist by spirit. Many cultures have had these battles and these genocides and we, we grow up so desensitized because it was such a long time ago. The Inquisition, which persecuted, you know, is it even okay to say the word anymore? I mean, I don't know, you know. Uh, so that's, that, I have a problem with that too. There's this manipulation of, 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 of speech that, you know, uh, you can use the N-word, but you can't. Uh, you can say Jewish or Jew, but you can't. People haven't walked into my house. People don't see how I live. It's a very, very simple life. And the last thing anybody should think is that I'm cleaning anything up for any any sum of money or I love music, I love what I do. I don't regret anything I've done and I don't apologize for it. I never portrayed Inquisition literally lyrics, artwork, layout designs was never portrayed as a Nazi band. I'm making that clear. And I hope those that are outside of black metal, which I'm speaking for my black metal, I hope <coughs> some of you understand that this is not the only art or music that is going to pick on you. a show that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what's more, this art is washable. What's art? What is art? I don't know what art is. Art is fire. It's, it's uh, something you put over here. It's, it's uh, whatever, it, if, it's, if, it, if it squeezes the feeling out of you, if it gives you a roller coaster ride. But it depends. You can't. I hesitate. What art could have been, and it is for some. It's a way to wage war if you're relentless. And I secretly want to be relentless. I want to risk a a everything, or it doesn't mean shit. Like like. <laughs> cute, cute is the new stupid. What is art? You look at a Rothko or a Beekman, where he hung the Jews upside down. He painted upside down Jews, and that was controversial. It just gave you a whole other perspective. You have to look at the painting yourself. What is art? Is squeeze a little pink out? You got a teddy bear. What is art? Is well, that's funny. I made a fist, and these are boxing gloves. But, but, but who knows what, 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 what is art? What is a paint? What, what, what feels right in your hand? You know, the paintbrush, the microphone, uh, or, or what feels right in your butt? Paint, paint on your butt, push it against the wall, then maybe add a picture of your father on the left butt cheek. 
you know, like, well, maybe art's fun for some people. Nothing like hurling paint when it gets a wall, I like that. You, what is art should rest in the e e ether. And then you should say, whatever image comes to your mind, paint it or build it or, or, or anything. What, 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 do you, do you, do you, what is art? I want to say that's an insult. We, we, we can't say what, what it is, and you don't have to say what it is. You just have to do something. Well, you, you know? What is your art? It's an art when you just, people look at somebody making a pie and go, it's like, like, like an art to her. That's her art. Or what waging war, the art of war. War, war is an art. But art's the most important thing. That's why we can't even define it or, or not, nothing. Art, it should be flipped. We already, already all know what art is. So the thing that confuses me about the whole heaven hell thing, you've got like a, let's say, for example, a serial killer kills a bunch of people, goes to prison on his deathbed, he gets last rites, he, you know, during his time in prison he accepts Jesus or whatever, gets his last rites, and he goes to heaven. heaven. Mm -hmm. But then, let's say you've got a person who is maybe an atheist, or whatever, or a Buddhist, or what have you, and they don't believe necessarily in Jesus, but they've lived a pro you know, they've been good, they've never done anything wrong not, against yeah. the Bible, mm -hmm. they've lived a pure mm -hmm. life, but because they're not Christian, which one of them is going to heaven? Are they both going to heaven, or no? Right. You know? the, okay, <laughs> another one of my crazy analogies, okay? <laughs> This is how I have to think about it. I too, of course, say, how could that be fair? Of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I, like, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not stupid, you know. I like think to myself, like, how the heck is that fair, God? You know, but this is the only way I can see it as fair, okay? For me, as a, as my human thinking, I think, okay, if I had a, my son. I love my son. My son's my world, my everything to me. And my, my children, you know, like I tell them all the time, you're the only thing, my two children, the only thing on the face of the planet to me that are worth billions of dollars and would do anything priceless, okay? So if for some reason I had to, for some crazy reason, I had to sacrifice my son on my front lawn. Okay, and and I had to hang him on the front lawn, and it was so that other people could be forgiven for their sins, or so other people could live a better life, or all these things, you know. So he had to, for some reason, take the price, pay the price for everybody's bad, you know. And I think to myself, well, what if someone came walking by? And they come knocking on my door and they, they tell me, you know what, thank you so much that you did this, that your son, everything to you, you know, I'm not perfect, I've done this wrong, this wrong, this wrong, but the fact that you killed your son for me is awesome, you know, like that you would do this for me is awesome. I would most likely welcome him to my home. But if someone walked by and said, you know what, I lived a great life, I didn't do anything wrong, but I don't give a crap that your son died for me. I don't care. And can I come in? Honestly, I would be like, no. You know, no, you can't. And if they're like, well, I, I built wells in Africa and, and I did this and I did that and how about I come live with you? But I don't, honestly, I don't give a crap about your son. I don't give a crap about what he did or the fact that you did this and you went through the pain of, of of doing that to him. Personally, I would have a hard time allowing them in my home. Okay. I, th I think the difference between religion and spirit spirituality, for me, I think that religion is more focused. Like, for me, um, religion goes like you're Christian or you're Mormon or something like that. And I think spirituality is something that's a little bit more like uh, Oprah style, whatever you want to believe, you know, if you want to believe a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you can kind of go with a little bit of everything instead of just saying, well, I am Christian or I am that. So 
That's what I think the difference is. You're the same shit everywhere. Hi, I'm Dr. Same Shit Everywhere. Your, your shit's the same everywhere. You're the same shit everywhere. There's no individuality. Well, what, what does that word even mean? Individuality now only means individuality. It doesn't mean vibrancy, complexity, colors, joy, passion, sweetness. I taste nothing. I taste nothing. These pigs, you fucking house hunter yacht fucking pigs. When, where is it? Australia? That's where people look you right in the eye, like, like they're horses, like one, one eye look you right in the eye. And they know about politics and they didn't go to co college. They know about politics and they didn't go to college. So you're crying about uh, the, the expensive co college loans? Well, well, why don't you learn how to use a gun, like back and forth first, then take that to college. Take something down, down the, 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 the street. People are already mechanized. They're, 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 not, they're not even... You, you said something good. They're s systematic or s s something. They're being... Um, Socialized. Right. But, 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 and that's clearly... That's, that's the poison. But they're already mecha mechanized. It's like the fight's taken out of them before they're born or s s something. Like somebody's getting in some, some, somewhere. You piece of shit. Pieces of shit. America wants pieces of shit. Uh, America and, and Americans. When I say America, I mean I'm America. Um, ma 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 Americans say, "Well, that's what America wants." A piece of shit. Yeah, and I just say, 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 say that it too because my anger is I'm not putting my stuff out there. Uh, I'm not sitting home writing this. But that's bullshit. I ju ju judge myself. It comes out where and when it's supposed to come out. Like on this, right now, is better than me sitting home writing it any fucking day of the week. Like big windows. No, I, I, I mean it. Like big windows. You ever look out your window and get depressed just because of the window alone? So you're not the, I'm not the only one. Well, what is it? I want to know. Well, well, what, 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 what is it? Why should I look out my fucking window for the rest of my life and be de depressed? A a every day I can't look out my w w window. When I um, first moved out here 25 years ago, before I went back, at first I couldn't look out my w w w window. I couldn't go outside. I started to get de depressed. Th then, then, then I couldn't look out my window, so I closed the blinds. Then I couldn't look at my blinds, so I kept on the couch with my head down so I couldn't see the apartment. No, there's a zone you want to, there's a zone, right? The tunnel, tunnel of horse heads, the tunnel of a man alone. Maybe I'm not supposed to let go of my pain. Maybe I'm supposed to be in pain. Like a friend of mine says, he knows he'll always be sad. He just knows and he's fine with, with it now. Maybe I'm supposed to be in pain, right? Extremist, it's all or not, 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 nothing. Do you just leave? I want to know. Do, do I leave? Or do I hang in there and do fucking comedy? Zombies and Walking Dead. Why? Because all actors are the Walking Dead. Nobody has an opinion. F fucking chewing their own faces off. Fucking...
What I'm doing is putting together a podcast about art. It's important for artists to get together and talk about what they can do or what they aren't willing to do. They have their own views on what art is, what is artwork, what is craft, what is the importance of artwork. In a general way, I think it's important that people are, are, are inspired to look at things differently because as we look at things as they are in this static thing or this solid, it gets scary. It can be very scary. Philosophy, science, free thought, free speech acceptance, community, it's all, in art, artwork is real special. I'm gathering artists from all over Portland right now, and we're hoping to sort of get a community together to talk about art. What I'm doing and what other people are doing as far as a podcast, I, have, I haven't listened to too many art podcasts. I like to look at artwork, but I think I'm dealing with people that are, are marginalized. They're not, they don't have a voice. And if we start looking at things in a different way, we can come up with solutions that we need, not the same old, same old. That's the importance of an artist to me, I think. Do the Jews run the media? Whoa, we're gonna play that later. <laughs> I love that, do the Jews run the media? Now, I'm asking that question to my old friend, J.B. Ross, he was my lawyer. And J.B. Ross was an interesting guy. J.B. Ross, did he was my lawyer, and I didn't have to pay anything. J.B. Ross was just a guy who helped everyone. You know what J.B. Ross is famous for? Is he would help all the fucking scumbags of the world, the hookers, the sex workers, me, and he helped all the real deal underground artists. Again, I was one of them. But it was cool to see, like, Bo Diddley come into his office, or James Brown, or there's so many people in Chicago that are grandchildren of old blues artists, and all these blues artists got fucked. They never got any money. So what Jay did when he was older, when he was younger, he was like, I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to use with my law. I'm going to go after all these people, all these record companies. So Jay would go after all these record companies for dead people's stuff, and they're like, yeah, we don't have to, oh, you do have to pay these people. And they, I found, oh, well, you're not their family. He's like, happens to, I'm J.B. fucking Ross. I found their grandkids. That's what I do. I make sure that I'm going to get that money from you. 
You know, so Jay's like, Jay does the searches. He's like, goes, calls the grandkids. Would you guys like some money? Yes. I would like to get that for you. They're like, great. So we would, I would be in Jay's office all the time, and folks come in, and I'm like, no joke. Like, I don't think there was not one blues artist from wherever that era is from, and, and, you know, that did not come in that office. Like, he took care of all of it. That man. And I don't think he's ever gotten that much credit for it. We knew, you know. But he was just a solid fucking dude. And so I remember one time I was, like, talking to him. And I could talk, you could talk to Jay about anything. I was in his office. I'm like, but all these motherfuckers keep talking about the Jews owning the media. Tell me about this, Jay. And so he'd tell me all these really long stories about how that happens. He's like, well, you know, he would say, well, it's sort of true. We were selling cigars. They wouldn't let us in the... And he's talking about, it was just great, his stories, how he wove these stories. I wish I could repeat them to you. But he was just talking about how Jewish people started a lot of the entertainment industry. You know, they were, and, and I, he would, he'll explain it in that video at some point, I'll play it. But, but Jay was just cool. You could talk about anything. It was great. It was a great guy. I'd go to his house and hang out, and, and the guy had, this is what this motherfucker would do. He, he was such like, and he's like 17,000 pounds. Okay? I don't know how he lived so long. I don't know how a fucking guy lived so long. Fucking 17,000 pounds. I'm not kidding. And this motherfucker, he did, he did collage art. He cut up shit and make art out of it. Guess what he would cut up? Oh, here's a Shirley Temple autograph because his family was in entertainment. Like, so he'd just pull out a file and it's Shirley Temple's autograph, which runs a, a good, there's money to be made, like if I, or Bruce Lee, let's say, dead person's autograph, it's an investment. He's pulling them out of the file cabinet, cuts off Bruce Lee's fucking autograph, <laughs> sticks it in something, it's like, dude, that's worth money. He's like, eh. I like, you know, he, and it wasn't to waste money, I think it was almost a spite thing. It's like, yeah, I, I'm gonna spite the whole collectible thing. It was like, it's, it, it was like some sort of, there was an expression there because of his work, like he was sort of, I don't want to say anti-capitalism, but he was like going after the system. And same, cutting up these collectibles is to the right. system. <laughs> you know, the whole thing is like this. Jay was like this, but in a cool way. He was just like, yeah, I'm J.B. Ross. I just remember. And oh, he would teach me so much. He's like, I'm like, Jay, so I would do these publishing things. I'm like, here, I got this thing I want to do. This is what you got to do. You can't do it that way or you get sued. And so I, I, well, I want to call this guy a criminal. I, and they won't, they, you, you keep telling me it's illegal. He goes, you know how you fix that? And I go, how? He goes, you put a question mark after it. <laughs> is, he, he, is he a criminal? <laughs> That's the best advice I've ever heard. And I go like this. I go, Jay, do I have to actually say, is he a criminal? Can't I just put criminal, question mark, and exclamation point? And he goes, put the exclamation point first, the question mark last, then it's a question. It's a loud question. Criminal. Go for that, Shane. And I was like, thanks, Jay. So Jay would tell me all these ways of how, how to get, he's like, rules, I, they don't really exist. What rules are, what you look for in a rule is the hole in the rule. There's always a hole in the rule, or there's always a way to talk your way around the rule. That's what lawyers do, and that's what Jay would explain to me. He goes, the rules exist, but a good lawyer finds the hole, or the way to phrase it, which makes the law look silly. Jay was a cool guy. Jay was a cool guy. I mean, he defended me, and people hated that. You know, people hated that. Uh, David Spade, famous actor, sued my wife and, and our family for a million dollars. And it was great. So I'm like, I go to Jay, and Jay's like, Shane, why don't you take care of this? I go, how the fuck am I going to do it? He goes, what do you do? I go, I get headlines? He goes, right. I go, so I should send a press release out saying he's suing us? He goes, right. I didn't tell you to do that. You just said that. I go, okay. So we send the press release out. It gets headlines. All of a sudden, David Spade's calling us. No, please, back up. You know, grandmother, wife, you know, all this. You know, you, you phrase it like that, you know. And, <laughs> and David Spade's starting to back off. And Jay's like, oh, no, no. We're going to counter sue. So David Spade had to send some money to get Jay off his ass, because once he started to back off, Jay's like a boxer, right? Oh, you want to back out of this? No. You know, he knew once he was backing out, he had him for some harassment or whatever, Jay. 
intimidated money out of him for. That's funny. That's a great story, dude. Yeah, Jay was cool. Jay, th- th- so these are the people I grew up with and hung out with and respected. So that's that, those are these are the people who shaped my where I'm here today, where I'm able to do like say, hey, you know, I gotta fix this. It's the spirit of Jay. We we'll talk about spirit. It's those kind of people that came to me and loved me and helped me when I didn't realize that was cool that they were helping me. I thought I almost thought like that's just the way the world worked. You know, you just it's it's almost similar to the way that uh, like a songwriter might describe their influences and then how they like oh I can hear like you mentioned James Brown like oh I can I can hear James Brown in my song and I wasn't even trying to do that right it's that that's the spirit that's, that's what I'm that's saying the, yeah. like and Jay, Jay like I'm like I said I'm coming from this total white trash world I don't know nothing so this is just crazy exciting right, yeah. you know like. You know, be like, hey, Jay, and they're hugging them, and everyone's like, almost throwing money in there. Everyone's happy and playing music, and it was just great to hang out and watch Jay operate, and just every different person coming in out of there. That was my life. Like, and then go hang out with these hippies. Like, it was all different. Like, going anywhere else was like, you want to talk about addiction? Like, I'm addicted to the life. I'm addicted to the life. Like, it's like, I'll go get a regular gig. Yeah, fucking no. hang man. What the fuck? Where's the, where's the danger? Where's the coolness? Or, Where's the art? Where's the sax player? What's going on? You know, I need some some action. So de- define the life. You say you're you're addicted to the life. Define it. Define what you mean by the life. Oh, because the addiction's a strong thing, and I, I like to consider myself somebody that is, is skilled at dealing with it, because I was addicted, and I dealt with addictions. I've even beat one of the addictions okay, that a so, lot of people struggle with. Okay, so, Cigarettes is one of the worst. Most people can never get out of that. And, and earlier we talked about, I would say, addiction is um, unhealthy. There's not a healthy addiction. That's something else. In, in compulsion or something else. So I, I would say, like, often I'm addicted to life in an unhealthy way. Which means <laughs> entrepreneur artists rolling the dice, baby. All the money. All the rent money, all the bill money, every fucking dollar. Let's do this fucking event. Let's go. That's the life. Boom. Cops shut down the witch's Sabbath. The money goes like this. There's the life. Or the exact opposite. The money goes like this. You know, but it's just that excitement. Right there. The life is, is magic. The life is art. The life is creating something that's never been created. And then having assholes say, I was going to do that. I had that idea. I could have done that. <laughs> that's when you know you, that, right? yeah, that's <laughs> when you know you, you created magic. When you got all these fucking things going around you. Or talking shit about you. Like, oh, this guy's a turd. Or this guy's lazy. Or whatever the fuck. Anyone who's a hater... And Chicago's full of that shit. Fuck. It's always been a city where they only like underdogs. The minute you start to make it, they hate you there. The minute you show any kind of success, they fucking start hating you. And I just saw this great hip-hop artist. I don't know if he's great, but he explains he's like from Chicago. He's like, it's just the way it is. The anxiety there, all this kind of stuff. The minute you get something, you got to leave. I guess that is kind of a real thing with people that make it out here. It's kind of like when you make it, they, they hate you. you know? Yeah, ministry. It's a love-hate relationship. I was a friends with ministry. They had to leave the Chicago when they got big because people didn't, you know, people start turning their back on it, treat you rude. You, you know, it's a it's a Midwestern thing, and it's it's a really weird Chicago thing. I think that's a weird term to even use, making it. So, make it. What does that even mean? Oh, in Midwestern terms. That's what you do for a job. That's making it. <laughs> now that's you don't no get. Job. No, 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 yeah. Now you don't get. The, now you don't the, get the, the, get a real job. It. It's not. That's no a, job. You got two. You got two things in, in the Midwest. Get a real job. Or that's your job. That's no job. Yeah, those it. That's making it. That's your job. What the fuck? That's your job. You do that. You. You know. Then you get. It'll get better. You proud of that? 
Yeah, I man, really you, that. man, I, you really getting away with murder with that fucking shit. There's what you get when you make it, whichever, whatever that is. Which in artwork means when you make it in the art world, no matter what level, it's always like, I don't know how I'm gonna get paid tomorrow. Oh my fucking god, I'm gonna die. And all of a sudden, you're like, instead of it reverting to criminal violence, to steal shit or to do things like that to collect your money, you're like. And you create a sculpture and someone buys it. <laughs> yeah. Pan, the, the panic create. <laughs> right, right. It's like that, there's a magic. You're like, I got to eat. I got to figure this out. I got to make some sort of scam to uh, figure this out. I got to get someone to believe in me, to help me out. Patrons. Right. Someone to, like... Well, Fucking how, gigs booked. Oh, yeah. yeah and she, figure it out. Yeah. And she, okay, so like West Coast. I write. If I go into a restaurant... Almost anywhere on the West Coast, especially a cafe like a coffee shop. And I'm writing. Every fucking person in there and that works there will be like, shh. Doing important work. They won't, the, the mop, they won't mop the floor over there. They won't do a fucking thing. It's silent. Leave the artist, the great artist. They don't even know you. They'll be like, leave the great artist alone. They're making stuff. Don't. Would you like a cookie? They'll give you something. Chicago, I get back here, which is, this is what I'm used to. I've lived out on the West for over 10 years. Get home, go to the, oh, we don't have 24-hour coffee shops here. Oh, Chicago's a big city that's like a fucking Schomburg. Okay, we don't have anything here, really. It's open late night. What a drag. So I go to a Greasy Diner. Not a coffee shop, but Greasy Diners in Portland will do the same. They'll just move away when you start writing, doing your thing. What fucking happens in Chicago? Every fucking time, every fucking time, the motherfucking guy, he's all the way on the other end of the room. All the way over there. And he's starting to clean stuff. And he sees you take your pencil out and start writing. He looks over and sees you doing that. He's cleaning all the way in that corner. All of a sudden, he's right on top of you. Banging things around and cleaning right around you. I'm like, oh, you got to be near the energy. You're fucking ex sucking my energy. Like, it's like, and he's like banging things louder and louder and louder. And it happens repeatedly here. Like, it's not a fluke. It's like part of this character here. Just like I noticed in the Pacific Northwest and on the West Coast. They are to the extreme, the opposite. You know, yeah, I'm like, please don't cut. You know, it's not that big of a deal. But they're, cons they're considered of the artist in Chicago. If you're not in pain, working, and ditch digging, you're a pussy. I just, that's, that's deep for me. I'm sorry, that was a hard one. The way that you, the, it's that, Am the context. Hard? No, it's deep because of the stuff that I was telling you about. You know, mm. it gets personal because, you know, I deal with that a lot. You know, people be like, you know, just get a real, you gotta get a real job, you know, that, mm -hmm. that fucking sort of thing. Where it's like, you know, the the artist struggles, and you know, it's not always a fucking winning deal. Sometimes you win, sometimes you fucking lose, and you don't know where that fucking next sandwich is coming from, you know. And you panic, and you make something else, and then hopefully, you know, you get something that's great, you know. But you can't create something that's great if you don't create it. That's the truth, and you got to be willing to have a lot of failure and create a lot of garbage that just never sticks. And you could love, a lot of the stuff I love, absolutely love that I make, no one cares about it. They don't pay attention to it. And that's fine, you know, it's just the way it goes. Whatever it is, whatever it is, timing, presentation, eh. I don't know about, um, for me, with artwork, So one I think thing about the that, most frustrating thing about that. Oh, go ahead. One thing that I that I feel about art is I feel like art is magic. Well, it's it magic. is truly manifest. It depends. You know. Real art is. Real art is. I, I when you're making something out of nothing and you, you, you put all that vulnerability and it could be failure, it could be awful. Oh, I was trying to get to this point. Making artwork isn't a nice thing because not only the money aspect of it, but it's mental health issues. Like, oh, my door's shut. Why is it so hot in this fucking place? I'm burning up in this place. 
Oh, there's another human in here. I'm used to a certain. Yeah, blame it on me. There's a certain temperature. I'm not even I sweating. And normally, I'd be pouring sweat. I am not used to the Midwestern humidity anymore. Mm. I lived in a rainforest. Okay, Portland, and I lived out on the coast, so it rained 300 days a year. But it wasn't like this, and it wasn't like this. It was really humid there. It was beautiful. You know, you smelt the, the heat or whatever's going on here is it's just it's like, oh, God. So when you say, like, we're both saying the same thing, I, I think, at this point. We kind of understand the artwork. The art, like you were saying, you, you went on this tangent earlier. You were like, not everybody's an artist. And I agree with that. You know, uh, I think people are just taking it as like this. It's like they, they treat it like a title and a job. You know, it's like you got high. Oh, no, I'm the artist. That just means I have to make shit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like uh, there's no, uh, oh, there's no, uh, you know, first time hire artists. You know, wait, well, uh, the uh, starter pay. You can't start with the minimum wage artist. Well, you got to fail to be an artist. Uh, yeah, you, <laughs> you got to take the vow you poverty. You, the really big, do, you, you, do, you really do have to take the vow. I believe, you know, you have to want, need to make something so bad that you'll, you'll do anything to make it happen, which includes taking cold showers, losing shit, selling shit. You will do anything to manifest that zine or that sculpture. You will do any fucking thing. And I've been in situations where I'm like, oh, I'm so fucking close to done to this. Everything's closing in. The bills are closing. Just keep the lights on. Just keep the electric. <laughs> gotta get it done. Oh, we got it done. Lights go off. Everything goes off. We, we got it done. <laughs> and so for me, the... Those those moments are thrilling. That's the addiction of the life. That thrill, the 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 downer of that drug. Is the reality of making art like the the sculpture I showed earlier, like that's an emotional torture. It could be when you when you're triggered by your stuff when you're making artwork. I've done sculptures and walked away crying and I don't even know why, because it's that subconscious banging at something where I'm like. Oh, God, I can't do this anymore. And it's nothing. It's an abstract. It's basically anyone would look at it as a pile of shit. I mean, I've got some stuff in there I'm starting, but I don't even know where it's going. I follow this emotions. And then sometimes I get broken. I'm just like, I can't do it. And then I get depressed. And I'm, I'll be like down for a month in the middle of a sculpture. It'll drop me. It's a tr there's something triggered that I don't know. Like I can be depressed about a, a breakup. Like, oh, I don't, you know, whatever. Something bad happens. I, I can get triggered. When I make an artwork, sometimes it will take me down. And there's no insurance policy for that. There's no. <laughs> what do you do? And though that's the worst moment as an artist for me. Not when it, if a bill gets shut, if it, you know, whatever. That kind of stuff. I'm a poor person. Like middle class people are like. They would be ashamed of that. I'm like, yeah, this is what happens. At least I'm making artwork. Fuck you. You know? It's a hard life to live, dude. I mean, I don't think that... Um, That's right. Hard it's, life. It's, it's, it's hard. You know? I'd rather be dead early from this life than live a long life working for fucking other people. That's a hard one. That or, I, I shouldn't too. say working for other people. I should say doing something that doesn't work for me, having to do something, versus, oh, I got a cool gig, I enjoy it, you know, I'm good with this, this is cool, I'm comfortable, it's me, fits my life, my politics, my, my ideals, I, that's cool work, that's that's good, that's life giving, you know, giving, it's, it's feeding, you're, you're both getting feed, fed, pride, you know, all this good stuff, the rest of it, nonsense, like having to go to fucking, have to, have to, fuck off, we got so much fucking money and everything in this goddamn country, we shouldn't have to work, period. Bullshit. Where's universal income? Universal income. What an interesting concept that is. I don't like the idea of... I think people work too fucking much. That's me. Universal income should happen. I think that people work too fucking much. I think you people work so much now that they there's no space to enjoy life. How could... What, in five days? How? How? After five days of work, one day of rest... And one day to catch up on your errands, how do you have time to even understand your children? Like, I, and you, you just, you hit the, I wish I had a, that's the right there. 
I got four kids. And it, it's like, that's an insane amount. I mean, to, in order to really pay for four kids, you need a village. You know, you need a village. It's impossible. And so to, to spend that much time at work to, like, if I was to go punching clocks, I need, I'd need five jobs. I, I mean, all I should be doing is punching clocks until I'm dead. And I would be, I should just be working. And that's right. all I would be doing is work. You right. see what I'm saying? And Oh, I do. And it's a weird thing where art has afforded me something that no hourly job anywhere can give me. And that's time with my children. Oh, God. Isn't that the truth? I, you know, like I was talking about my, my ex situation, my, my ex, we were talking, we were making sandwiches, and I was talking like, man, we were together 24 7 for a good 10 years. And I know when that stopped, and I couldn't sustain it anymore, and all, we got run out of towns and all this weird shit, I was really hard with so many, like, I was devastated from it. Identity, all these reasons, but so many people were like, well, at least you had that. Probably never had that, and and we sacrificed. I don't know if we bought a different pair of clothing. Like we had the same, probably you know, a lot of the same T-shirts for ten years. You know, make the sound get all ratty. And so we 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 sacrificed. You know, we sacrificed a lot to be able to spin on our what we wanted to do, whatever that was. <laughs> and a lot of times it was just making fucking blueberry biscuits or some shit, you know? It was just like nothingness. Is that a thing? Blueberry biscuits? Well, I don't know what the fuck we make. I don't know what the fuck. I was joking. Dude. You know, I was thinking about, I was thinking about these little fucking, you know, when I go back to my memories, these things pop up. Jiffy boxes. You know the Jiffy box? Yeah, the cornbread, I've seen Or the blueberry bread. Yeah, they, they make just, all kinds of shit. Yeah, they, right. Well, that's what I mean. Oh, when yeah. we were first together, you don't know how to make nothing. Get a box of Jiffy box. <laughs> the wife would make that. We had that with a stick of butter in the morning. It was like this big marriage thing. Like, look at us. Blueberry Jiffy box. <laughs> we just made some bread and we're eating it with some butter. Look at us. <laughs> but we're adults. So that's yeah, what I'm saying. We're just, right. just hanging out there. But that's life. Yeah. That's the, those simple yeah. things are what is. And that's that's life. Yeah. That's like having time to enjoy that versus working so many hours that you've never. You're, you're, you know, like your children, or you will never, have, you very ha have so rare moments like that. You know, like, like the Jiffy Box. You just think, I just, when I see those, I just laugh. I think, oh, we, Jesus Christ, that's funny. But, but we have, those, what, those people are like, at least you have that. I've never had that. You know, yeah, you can look at it that way. At least I had it. But how about you look at it this way? I deserve more of it. And you deserve it, too. How about you look at that? Like, Wow, you had that? Why don't I have that? And how can I get that? Now, at least, you know, and I, that's what makes me so sad about that. Like, I don't know. There's just something fucked up about about what's happening, you know. And it's getting, I don't know. I can, I can complain so, like an old man. It's, so you mentioned something like, you, you mentioned a concept of uh, universal income. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Elaborate. I'm sitting well, here like, we okay, can talk about the idea like might is right, Satanism, libertarianism, all these right-wing ideas. And when I think about those things, I think about what an ignorant concept in this kind of society when there's so many ignorant people. So in order to have a libertarian society or a society where we have actual stratification, which is something that Anton LaVey speaks of, which I think is a great idea, social stratification, seek your level, like water. <clears throat> and so in order to have an, like a libertarian, greedy, a selfish society, well, you would have to even the playing field to make a reasonable, selfish society. And doing that, you would have to offer a universal income. You would have to offer socialism, health care, education, and let everyone run. Because we want the best when we have social stratification. So those who don't want to go to school, they're, maybe they're me. I got my universal income. I'm good. I got enough crayons to go. Some weed. Hit the road. I'm good. But I've got my human rights covered. My house, my health, you know, I've got my simple, my simple, I got, yeah, you got a bigger fridge, bro, you're going for it. You got a bigger place, you're going for it, dude, you got it. I'm going to stick here with the universal income because I want to make jiffy boxes, bro, you know, and enjoy sticks of butter and fucking hanging out and making artwork or whatever. 
So basically, the concept of universal income, does everybody get paid the same amount? or? I don't know how that works. I think universal incomes work. In Europe, I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, you have a, these educated folks to be able to explain it to you, but I think it works something like that. Like, I've heard in, in certain uh, countries, like in, in, in European countries, uh, that there's, there's one where you only have to work three days. Like, and, and, and if you wanted to work more, you could, but you don't have to because that universal income sort of covers the, it covers the rest of it, you know? And so in Chicago, they're testing a universal income thing right now for five years where they gave like a thousand people $500 a month extra. And we saw that during the pandemic when we had universal income, things were better for everyone. There was so many poor people that were like, I've never had it so good. Right, yeah. So that's how bad it is in this country. Right, and they're like, oh my gosh, finally, we can eat. <laughs> yeah, we got yeah. 1600 bucks, a day, right. and people were excited to get that much money. And now, look at the rising inflation, realty's going, you know, everything's going through the roof because they want that money back. It's like outrageous. We can't, you know, you can't get a leg up to, to, to earn generational wealth or anything. We're not going to talk about generational wealth. Let's just, I ain't even got the energy for that right now. We want to save that. Well, right, it's stupid. It, it's ridiculous in this world. I don't even have the energy to battle that one. Oh, look, the sun's up. I told you. We were close. So you were asking about this thing, and I always tell uh, all hey. my witch students to get this. Hey, can we smoke some weed real quick on camera, and then I'm going to pass out? I don't give a shit. Yeah, you got a joint? No, I mean, no. Will you? I want to roll, roll one? I, um... I, oh, no, I can smoke out of my sneaker talk if you want to. I, if you want to smoke something with me, you'd have to roll the joint. I don't know how really good. I'll, I'll roll You can roll them real quick. It'll take me hours. I if, don't see if how you're from Chicago and can't roll. You don't talk about you. <laughs> Maybe that means I got my, my, my people to roll them for me. My girl. I'll tell you who taught me to roll. My ex-partner. Let's see here. What can I play for you? Anything? I know. How about if I tease you with this? That's not it. I'm sorry. This is. That looks perfect. You look really great there. Showing necklace. Good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I can't see what you're seeing. Right. I'm, I'm letting you know. You, you, right now, you can see the Baphomet. Perfect. Right okay. there is perfect. So. Okay. That was a last minute decision. I wore this when I was with you. So, the thing that confuses me about the whole heaven hell thing. You've got like a, let's say, for example, a serial killer kills a bunch of people, goes to prison, on his deathbed he gets last rites, he, you know, during his time in prison he accepts Jesus or whatever, gets his last rites, and he goes to heaven. But then, let's say you've got a person who is maybe an atheist. Do the Jews run the media? Do, well, they, they, you know, cons, that's what we were talking about. That's considering the Considering that they're only 1% or 2% of the population, they have had, up till recently, an unusually high influence in the media because that was a door that was open to them. You know, in this United States, for example, what they were, knew well from Europe, the Rothschilds and all that banking, they weren't allowed to participate in the banking business in the United States. That was totally, uh, they were more or less blackballed from it. And uh, so when this new Nickelodeon thing started at the turn of the last century, uh, you know, it was considered a fad, you know, never last, nothing. And a lot of the Jews, you know, some of them were cigar makers, like Samuel Goldwyn was in the cigar business and this and that. They invested some money in it because they were allowed to, and um, it just grew and grew and grew. They happened to hit on the right thing, and so a lot of their people, you know, got into that business. It's just similar to the Greeks in restaurants, you know what I mean? They got into restaurants, and, you know, up until recently, most, many, many, you know, the majority of small restaurants were owned by people of Greek background, the Koreans in a dry cleaning place now, you know what I mean? Certain ethnic groups seem to gravitate towards certain businesses. Uh, the, while there's still a lot of people of Jewish background involved, 
And it certainly wasn't as bad as it was for uh, Walt Disney when he was there because he became a notorious anti-Semite and probably with a little bit of justification because he was like one of the only Christians in Hollywood in a position of studio owner, you know what I mean? And because Jews were denied admission to country clubs and stuff like that, you know, he didn't hang with them. You know, he was, you know, a, a different, rare differently. And uh, essentially, uh, the the concept was that uh, early Christianity, money lending, tax collecting, were forbidden for the uh, Christians. You know what I mean? It was just uh, totally inappropriate stuff. And the only group that was allowed to exist outside the Christians were the Jews. And they were deprived of being, you know, artisans. I mean, there was no, you know, in, until last 200 years, there were no Jewish artists because they couldn't do it. You know, they just, they weren't allowed. The only thing they were allowed to do for a thousand years was to be a tax collecting and money uh, lending, things like that. So you figure, you know, a thousand years of doing the same thing, people wind up getting to do it pretty well. So uh, the the Muslims especially, the, who were turned out by and large were kinder to the Jews than the Christians were, the Muslims would invite them into their countries to help pick up the economy. Of course, then they would, you know, get jealous and take all their stuff and kick them out, you know, but that we've been, we've been doing that for years. The Jews did have their influence. I mean, uh, you ha when you're when you're a victim of suffering and persecution and stuff like that, you need laughter in order to alleviate, you know, stop from going crazy. In the midst of the Holocaust, there was humor. You know, in the concentration camps, there was humor. I mean, it wasn't stand up or anything like that, but people still made jokes because it's the only way to keep your sanity sometimes. And um, when you're the victim of prejudice day in and day out, you know, it happens. Even look at the guy who, conservative, at least at that time he was known as a conservative, now by the Tea Party standards, probably a liberal, Goldwater, who was half Jewish, you know, told, told the joke about how he was asked to leave a country club swimming pool because they didn't allow Jews. And his response was, well, I'm only half Jewish, can I go into my waist? You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, if you if you want to read a good book, read Jews, God, and History, and it shows you the, you know, the uh, amazing part that the Greeks played in the Jewish religion, and ultimately in all religions, and how, uh, well, Western religions, and, uh, you know, what the Romans were all about. It's really not just about that, but... You heard the story about uh, Mr. Goldberg's visit with God, didn't you ever hear that one? No. Oh yeah, he was, uh, he was elected as a representative of the Jewish people on earth to have an audience with God. They sh they rush him in, they said, God is very busy, but he'll see you for a few minutes. He says, but please, you know, be quick. He says, no, I just have one question to ask him. And then he meets God and he says, God, I'm a representative of the Jewish people on earth. He says, and I have just one question for you. And God and he says, yes. He says, he says, is it true that we, the Jewish people, are the chosen people? And God says, you waste my time with that? Of course that's true. Everyone knows that. He says, well, then we do have one favor to ask. And God says, yes, what is it? And Mr. Goldberg says, could you please choose somebody else for a change? Uh. If you line up like 10 people here, you know, and, and... Wait, wait, wait. There we go. That was my good friend, Jay. Rest in peace, Jay. I love you. Another guy who helped me out uh, all the time when I was young as a lawyer. He just helped me out. I, did I tell the story on the camera, or did I tell it just to you? No, you just told it about Jay. Okay, yeah. good. Good. I'm smoking weed now. <laughs> and you know what? Why am I fucking explaining myself to you?
I'm 52 fucking years old. Do you know what I survived? I don't need to fucking explain myself. I know I'm, I'm a grumpy old man. Yeah, that's the way it goes. You there, Carla? <laughs> I survived the start. You're right, I survived. Um, anyway, Jay was a great man. A great man. Man, I love seeing him. I love videos. Fuck, is this great? So many generations of stories lost because we didn't have this power of Share this. It. Of this. Share it. Just, well, you know. Share it. Yeah, and you know, also get your elder stories down. Get them up there and put them on archive.org or something. I mean, when I filmed that with Jay, it was just off the cuff or something, but Jay's been gone for a long time and it fits this, man, it fits this story. Think about that. You know, it's like, it fits this whole, it just dropped in. I don't know. It's good to collect old people's stories. And I got to show this fucking balding head of mine. Jesus Christ. You know. Listen, it can look good. You know that Joe Biden is fucking bald. And you, you don't see, you don't really, it's because I got long hair. I'm He's a, your, my your prejudice against bald, long haired guys balding. Okay, I'm tired. Get the fuck out of here with this. What do I got? Uh oh. I'm looking for a hat because I'm not feeling insecure. Ah, uh, forget it. Yeah, fuck it. You don't need a hat. You're good. So I don't have the bald head, you know. It's just the one of the things. Like, I like how LeVay uh, decided to say it's, it was for religious reasons. This is the bald head club. What you mean? Well, I like it. <laughs> on wall per, on this date, on, uh, I'm going to shave my head to the moon, to the south. All this nonsense. It's like, mm. no, it was this. He saw oh. something. That he's like, oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, just shave it. It's shining. Fuck it. <laughs> Listen, my hair can... It, it, does, it doesn't look bad. Okay, it doesn't look good. Damn it. It's because I'm sweating. With Listen, hair. with the bow team in there, it fluffs out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What do they say? Uh, biotin. You take the biotin. That's what I mean. Biotin. The I'm biotin makes your hair grow. <laughs> the biotin. It works real good. I look, I'm proof of that. <laughs> I, got the, I got the biotin. The biotin. Oh, fucking biotin. You know, I'm going to play a movie. We talked about this road trip that I took. With, with my ex, uh, we made a movie and a book. It's up at archive.org called Suffering and Celebration of Life in America. I'm going to play that movie now. I think we're going to talk a little bit, but when we, we might have to take a nap. I mean, and that doesn't mean, Avi's going to be, I'm, I don't take a nap with Avi. I always make that clear. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I was like, we're going to take a nap. I just want to make it clear. You know, I don't want Avi's. I, listen, Avi's married. I don't want his wife to get up bed. She'd be like, what the fuck? He's taking naps for shit. I'm man. not Let's shy. Go. Go. But, you know, I don't want the wife to. Next thing you know, Avi's like, I got to leave. Why? Because the wife thinks we're taking a nap. Yeah. I got to make it clear. Okay. This, this whole thing's <laughs> called Sleepover with the Devil. We, we missed with the first the title. So let's go. But nah, man. You're good. You need to fix your hair, bro. You're just, you're just overly self-conscious. Good. That's what I need to hear. Um, oh, so this is the movie. And I want to. I think we'll play that in a bit. Maybe they, you think it's too early for Carla? What about what? what, what I think we should play it now. Hours, no, I think we should play it now. Because I think it's like three or four hours of Carla. And I think now's I a good time. I thought you said it was six. I don't know. Don't I, be I, cheating I, me on my... See, now I ain't going that. Okay, I got Carla. seven files... Some are 40 minutes, some are 30 minutes, some are 10 minutes. So we're going to say, I'm going to say four. You want to fucking see Jesus Christ? Yes, do it. No, don't. Just like, listen. Okay. Right, just show me. Show I'm going to play the movie and the Carla videos, and that's what we're going to do. Ah, uh, yeah, there we go. Swing. I don't even know how to do this, though, without fucking Get everything the goods out. in there. So you want to start? What, what are you, is anyone there? If you're there, you can pick. What do we play? Can we hear you? Can they say something? Yeah, can you say something? Can any of you say anything? So, not. I guess not. <laughs> up, up. What does it mean? New mentions. New mentions. New mentions. Okay. All right, well, what do you think? What do you think? What do you want to play? This is the text, if you want to see it. I think they're trying to type it in, but 
Just go ahead. Let's rock it with Where it. are they typing it in? See the red thing there? Yeah, that's it. No, those are the people. No, is it? Okay, yeah. No, fuck it. Five people in there. I, I heard it, though. 55, I mean. 55 people. 5,500 people in there. <laughs> 55,000. Yeah, so I heard it. I, yeah. I say we're going to start with the movie, and Carla's going to come after that. Okay? Yeah, let's do that. How long is the movie? Oh, a long. I don't know. It's a real movie length. Okay, well, let us rock and roll. It'll work. It'll be good. Let's rock and roll. I hope you enjoy this. I, 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 I'll tell you a little bit about this film. Um, it was edited on a laptop on a beach, Long Beach, Washington. It took years. I had a different edit, totally different edit that I liked much better. My partner did not like it. So this was a compromise edit. A collaboration. Not, but but my, I, I, it was a collaboration. The whole, this was a, to, be, to tell you, this was our first and only real collaboration. To give you any kind of history, anyone who cares. We worked together on a lot of items and they were not collaborations. They were my projects that we did. This had a lot of her input and heart and, and hard work into it. And, uh, you know, that, that's that. that I, and I don't say that to take away credit or be jerk. I just want the facts, just telling you the facts. I'm a little lost here. There it is, suffering. Yeah, so I'm just letting you know how it went. You know, that doesn't mean that it, uh, she didn't have her own projects. You know, she has plenty of her world. I don't. You know, fuck her until I get my shit back. Listen, it's a long start. I'm gonna, it was like a five minute black, okay? Just give me a second, you'll see. I smoked some weed, give me a break. Bite it, you scum. Bite it, you scum. Bite it, you scum. Bite it, you scum. Yeah, you want me to contribute, but all I've got are words for you. All you want is more and more. Gluttony, you pig, you whore. Bite it, you scum. Bite it, you scum. Bite it. Scum. Bite it, you scum. One day when the end is near, I'll be laughing at your fear. One day when there is no one, who'll be fucking up my fun? No man will, no way. Bite it, you scum. Bite it, you scum. Bite it, you scum. Flying a plane into another building is a little bit impractical. Nobody's got the balls to set off a dirty bomb in, a, in the Mall of America. So what do you do? You kidnap people and cut their heads off, videotape it, and put it up on YouTube. And that's that's the, the new form of protest, and that's going to get people talking. There's no more middle class. Either you have money or you don't have money. That's what I think. The middle, middle class is, doesn't exist anymore, which it did. You do have or you do not have. The have and the have not. So, that's what it's coming down to. That's what it is. What happened? Morals. 
things have changed. And, and things have changed for the worse. I used to be a trooper. And I remember how people were not afraid. Not everybody's afraid of everything. Money rules. Thieves control. The almighty dollar. We can either, like, behave like them, like the bad parts of this world, or we can spend all of our time trying to, like, fight against them, but either way we get caught up in the same dance. Or we just try to think about, like, life straight up and just be like, okay, this is real, we're right here. I didn't become real. I am real. I've always been real. Like, as a kid, I was real. This is a big problem in our lives. Like, people think, oh, kids... Well, you know, when you get things get, you have to get real at some point. Fuck that. You are real when you're five. You're real when you're seven and ten and twelve. You're real. You might be more real. I mean, there's nothing more real than a five-month-old kid who's just like, I'm shitting out my ass right now. Oh, I'm I'm just spit up. Yeah, I'm I'm tired. I'm hungry. Like, your realness right there. He's not wearing the cool hoodie, you know. He's just—he's just a kid. He's just—he's just real. And I think this idea that children are not real is nuts. But it's again like another aspect of our society that just, just keeps us always scrambling, trying to get caught up just to the, to just get back to zero. I'm a firm believer that, that, that this country, as, mu as many arms as we have in this country, everybody in this country should be trained to use a firearm and carry one with them at all times. Guess what? You would have no violent crime. You would at first. Then guess what? The, de the, 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 the you'd have you'd have a, a bunch of full cemeteries, but the motherfuckers that can't get along would get on. They'd be gone. There's still prejudice here, a lot, lot of prejudice here. It's it's not open prejudice, it's that slap you on your back with one hand and pick your pocket with the other. The police state is what I hate about it most here. The police state, it's just all set up as a police state. And everybody, they got people perfectly trained to go along with it. Can we search your car? Sure. <laughs> Can you take your shoes off? You want to get on a plane? Take your shoes off. Okay, great. You know, there. I, I feel the state of America is, uh, I don't know, commercial. It's commercial. It's something uh, that's cookie cut. Psh, psh, psh. Yeah, this is what you do. You, uh, you go to work every day, work a third of your life away, pay half your pay to the government, four out of every day. Four out of every day. You, uh, you get a wife of the same race or the same ethnic thing or the same, I mean, it's just cookie cut. This is what you do and this is what you don't do, yeah? And I, I just feel that it's very unoriginal, you know? A lot of it, I would just, but uh, yeah, I wish the devil. My devil comes from inside of me and people like me. Repressed and very angry at themselves uh, have also regardless created regardless of the culture uh, and situation. Think, for instance, like Van Gogh, who is not had just I making some knows great exactly great what his hang ups were, but to, look to, at to like way. actually cut off uh, your ear and mail it to your, 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 your uh, want to be girlfriend. <laughs> it's just. Are you saying repression is good for art? Not. I, I don't know if it's good for art. The first thing we do when we take a breath on this earth is scream out loud. That's what we're for, man. We're human beings, you know? Uh, so, no, of course, it's a natural right. The, the First Amendment says, Congress, you're forbidden from restricting the natural right of people to communicate among themselves, to assemble peaceably, to, uh, to be free. You know, that's just one, one small part of what it means to own yourself, to be a, a free human being. Is 
too much free speech, and that's going to sound crazy, but I'm sick of hate. You know, I'm sick of the fact that we can slander people, we can attack them, we can literally destroy lives with words, and I think it's damaging, and I, I don't think it's okay to um, step in and destroy someone's life with words, because words do hurt. I think it's more of a, an assumed freedom. But there, there's freedom of speech, of course. I mean, you know, I can say fuck the president and nobody's gonna attack me or anything right now, but put me in jail, but. So what? What are you gonna do, put me in prison? I've been in prison. Kill me? Bye, you know, I mean, what the fuck? I'm just a little grain of sand in the vastness of the universe. That's what I learned not acid. Live, die. It's just two parts of existence, you know? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think there's, uh, uh, I think the, the encumbrance there is there's not enough good speech. Um, and I think we're just overwhelmed by a lot of um, talking heads uh, that have particular agendas uh, that are in conflict with uh, each other for, for um, whatever they think is important. Uh, and I think there's just not enough sincere speech. And I think we need more of that. Short of calling, you know, yelling fire in a crowded theater, I think the trouble with America is there's not enough free speech. Uh, it's not the people that, we're, that are speaking is the problem, it's the people who aren't listening is the problem. It's the deafness of America. It isn't a speech problem, it's a hearing problem. Well, that's the old thing, isn't it, about crying fire in a crowded theater. Um, I think free speech functions when you get a truly free people. And a free person is only somebody who knows themselves well enough not to yell fire in a crowded uh, theater. So are there limits to free speech? Yes, of course there are. Um, but I think as a, a group of people become more responsible, socially responsible and personally responsible, they, um, they uh, are able to um, move speech into, in a sense, that which is unspoken. In other words, to explore the mystery. Uh, often mystics talk about the mystical experience as being ineffable. In other words, there are no words for it. But part of, I think, what a truly free person can do is they can start finding words for things that have never had words applied to them before, start to understand the nature of the trans transcendent reality and to express it into words. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's the, the big unknown. Of course, the uh, things that you can't answer easily are, are probably the most important things, like love and, and faith and whatever. But I think art is... Um, a way of presenting an aspect of, of life, because it doesn't come out of, of life, it's part of life, in a way that uh, one person can share an experience with another so totally that it's as intimate as uh, intimacy itself, it's, but it's beyond physicality. Uh, and I think it touches the, the spirit of soul of consciousness rather than um, comforting us like comfort food or... or, or uh... Um, doesn't mean this is art. Um, it looks good, it has aesthetic properties. Um, it matches the painting. You know, people say you should do art to match their couch. I created something I could fuck myself with that matched my painting. It happens. Um, Art is off. Art can be an escape from reality. It can be a reflection of reality. It can be part of the reality itself. It's it's the it's not the the producing of the art. It's the reasoning behind the production. Is the person doing this because they're trying to escape from something else? Is the person doing this because they are they have seen something and they're looking to contribute? Um, it's the same thing, you know, if we, if, if we make that comparison with somebody going online, it's the same thing. Why are they going online? Is there a productive reason for going online? Um, 
or is it escapism? Is it, uh, is it predatory? What, what's the reason for, for what they're doing? A uh, person uh, is obsessed with predation and because they want to uh, feel that way, they only see the reports of problems, even though the problems, you know, are less than 1% of what's out there. Um, there are people who are passionate about, uh, well, constraining others, about uh, making sure people can't do what they want to do. Uh, some of them are Puritans. But I think that uh, art shouldn't be elitist, it should be we should be surrounded by things that are beautiful and stunning and, and basically lift our consciousness to a higher degree to make us more aware of how wonderful life is, how wonderful we are, and the fact that we can only feel good when we're doing something good for other people and ourselves in an unselfish way. I think self-expression is mandatory and I guess you know, you'd call any kind of self-expression art. I think that's why kids are doing things like shooting at school and beating up other kids and fighting because they have no outlet for their emotions or, or things like that. And the teacher was up at the blackboard talking about color. And I was sitting in the back row, as usual, in the corner, the left-hand corner, of course. And she said, yellow is a bad color, and I went, why? And she wheeled around and pointed at me and said, watch him, he's an artist. And everybody turned and looked at me. And I thought, hmm, I'm an artist. I am, actually, yes, because I want to know why. Art is a creative individual that uh, suffers from a, uh, uh, a need to express themselves um, regardless of the culture situation that they find themselves in. People don't understand. Uh, they think because of our culture you have to paint or draw or make movies, videos, write scripts, whatever the fuck, to be creative. But um, artists, scientists, creative is not just making something. Creativity is looking at that stove over there every day and, and forcing yourself to look at it in a different way. Um, people go on autopilot with their lives. Their lives go by and they're like, is that it? I think that probably people who beat their children are angry at themselves, but we often hit those who are within arm's reach. And that's our families. People who beat their children are angry with themselves. And they're angry with themselves because they're not doing what they're supposed they want to do. I don't know what that is, so that's my that's what I suspect, you know. Um, so I would say music is an expression. I often I have often said that music is a form of communication that almost certainly predates language. So obviously it's been around forever and ever. I imagine that design and Visual art also predates language. I would imagine that people would put things, look at, you know, line things up, rocks or sticks or, you know, mm -hmm. it's just because it, it, they're translating. They're seeing something and they're able to recreate it. I mean, music artists are, are translators ultimately. Um, like you're making a, a movie right now and you said to me earlier, oh, you know, can I film? Because I like the idea of just filming without it being an interview because the conversation quite often is whatever. It goes into a different direction. Um, but it, what it really reveals is that you, what you're trying to capture, what you're trying to capture is your translation of what you see, what you think, what you hear. Cuckoo is, is a reference here that was on the blackboard. Uh, Cuckoo, uh, in French anyway, and you know, other languages, but most especially in French, means uh, insane. 
Uh, and the strange thing is that uh, in this in this morgue there were uh, diagrams on the blackboard of uh, I believe they're knee joints, but this looks like a fish. And I respond to what I'm doing. Uh, and this, when I took this photograph, there was an enormous amount of light uh, through this huge window of this old building, and the light uh, created this crazy shadow of a face. And all these, uh, some scratches, modifications, all these kinds of shapes, uh, I make because um, I make the print, and the finished photograph is uh, the basically the result of many, many months. Of, of, of planning and researching, uh, letter writing, email writing, to get permission to, to make what I do. I mean, ultimately, when I make music, like I'm hearing something out there in the world, and then when I play a guitar, I'm trying to say, here's what I'm hearing. Like I'm going to filter it and put it into a distilled version for you. Uh, if I'm an artist, like, you know, a photographer, like a photo is like, you know, psh, just take a picture. but if you start thinking about what makes a great photo, it's because a photographer sees the composition of something. A photographer sees it and is able to capture it, distill it, and say, here's what I saw. Here's what I saw. So there's that kind of pass-through aspect of it. It's translation. And I think that most people, or all people, there's something that they are like made to translate. But I think quite often, Again, because of the structure of our society, because of the idea that making money is the primary goal, that quite often that which they are built to translate, like that's what they are built to do, is suffocated by what they think they're supposed to be doing in terms of making money or making a living. But not all of my work sells because a lot of my work is about uh, references that um, uh, are harder to take. This is called Bad Student, and it was made in Europe. And um, what happened is that I found this incredible uh, uh, mannequin in a flea market uh, in a major city. Um, and from that I got this idea of putting a severed human head on, because it had no head. Uh, and so when I found this particular head in a morgue, I worked with um, a makeup artist. She also does uh, hairstyling, and she brought a wig, and the wig was very, very essential. And uh, it's about um, the quality of, of passion that very often is gone in education, especially in this country. Uh, I think we're, we're basically, we're a, a commercial corporate society now. We're not a society of individuals. We're a society of um, people who are not true entrepreneurs. They're, they're entrepreneurs in a very, very commercial vein. And um, so this image is about this kind of deadening of time that we just don't get it. And no matter what, what your political affiliation is, you know, I mean, anybody can, can understand that. You know, you take the politics out of the equation, you can definitely understand that. We have some problems. I think we could address in our democracy. Anybody can be president if you're this age. And then later I found out, oh, you got to have $3 million to pull it on the ballot. discourse in our public life today is very disappointing. Uh, people, the candidates are compelled by their sense of vulnerability. They say the wrong thing. They have to hold back and be very careful what they say. And they have to have something to say every day and have a quick answer to any problem. I would love to hear a candidate say, I don't know. But that would apparently be crippling. You can't, you can't admit you don't know. But that's ridiculous. There's a, um... uh, we have the best political system that money you can buy. If you don't believe me, buy your own politician and find out. Because they're all... The only thing a politician has to offer is jawbone. Does he keep his word? Have you ever met one that kept his damn word? They're all liars. 
They're all pigs feeding at the public trough, and guess what? We're paying for the fucking food. You know, once government, but once we figure out that we don't really need what they're doing for us all that much, they're in deep shit. Okay, next. When things that should work don't work, that's the work of all the governors. Um, or all these governors. And the idea behind that is that the government largely is acting on behalf of the corporations. So to keep things, to keep the power in the hands of those corporations, they will undermine things that could be nat just naturally could work out. You know, uh, the very first thing they teach you in political science, any government that does not perpetuate it, so that does not go after the people to, to convince them that they are, that they cannot function without government is doomed for failure. And that's true. And this is the idea of it, the idea that government will always trip things up because if it could just go smoothly, then they'd have nothing to do, you know, and there'd be no way to profit on it because people would just, yeah, okay, I'm going to grow some food. You want to buy the food? You want to trade me? You know, like these, I'm not talking about a utopian existence. I'm just talking about like reasonable, like why is there, everything have to be so hard? I mean, we're basically, it's, it, it's, 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 it's a question of what false Christian would you like to have running the country? They're all the same. Um, unless we get someone up there who's going to say, all right, as of tomorrow, we're going to slash the world population by two thirds. Uh, we're no longer going to use oil for energy. And uh, basically, we're going to force everyone to return to their countries of origin. Well, they say politics and religion, you should keep them apart. almost use politics as like their religious beliefs and, and their version of morality. Um, the, the hiding in religion, the using religion to justify behaviors that are archaic and primitive is uh, you know, so astonishing to me as to, it's mind boggling. Um, the, the right wing talk show people and their ideologues have bombarded America with what could really only be called fascist ideology. Uh, we've become a fascist corporate state, uh, and Americans continue to wrap themselves in the flag and go to church every Sunday in their segregated churches, uh, pretending like they're God's chosen people. And anytime you get an armed culture uh, uh, who have strong religious views and are, are militarily strong, I'd say to the rest of the world, watch out. Do you think we're in any kind of um, religious war right now in the United States? Absolutely. Some would call it a cultural war? Well, I would say there's probably both, but in terms of a religious war, um, I've seen that the fundamentalist Christians have found that if they pull together that they actually do have great political power and over the last 20 years or so have actually had an agenda to try to take over, as it were, certain political offices. So you know what, if if there was an atheist that believed many, many things that I believed in and was able to um, represent my country in a way that I was comfortable with, I'm going to go ahead and vote for him. And I would hope that an atheist would do the same. If there was a Christian that's, that did believed, you know, and, and had the same values, then why not vote for them? It's more on issues, I think. But I do think it's important to vote as a, as a religious person. But you have to, I mean, you have to make, you know, exceptions. Like, sure, I, I'd rather have someone who wasn't God-obsessed. But then again, I'd rather vote for a Christian who was, you know, more liberal than, a, than an atheist who was a fascist. You know, America has given me a great place to grow up and, and do what I do and, and you know, there are beautiful parts of America that are full, full, full of beautiful people. And, you know, what's best about America is probably its, its soul, the soul of a lot of its people. But um, we, uh, we're obviously a, uh, a melting pot, you know, nation. And so 
we are we are separating ourselves. You know, um, our our government is. They can tell you anything. They could they could shove everything at you. You know, um, I don't know. I suppose the worst part is is the government. You know, the soul and the destruction of soul. You know, the government. But like. I don't vote. I don't do anything to change it. So, like, that's why I. That's one of the reasons why I'm not a politically minded. You know, I'm not one of those people that can uh, really bitch about a whole lot. You know, I'm not. I'm not in that place to do it. So, uh, in a democracy, a person's vote is is their greatest responsibility. That's what people live for, die for, and uh, it's our chance. Um, to basically change uh, the government and be heard. And it's a precious thing. Anyone who doesn't vote is, for me, um, a very, very sad individual. I'm done voting. Voting's for suckers. Democracy is for losers. It is the god that failed. And it's no way to secure liberty, as we can all see, just by as soon as I feel someone I feel comfortable voting for is in office, I will. And so, I mean, this is that, that simple. Why do you vote? Do I vote? Uh, no. Pence. Why not? Well, I don't think any of the candidates interest me, and they all seem to be part of the same party, except they're sponsored by different people. It's this right that we have that lots of people around the world don't have, and it's good to use that. There's lots of people who uh, die actually fighting for the right to vote, so it's, it's uh, uncouth at best to not you know, walk down to the polling place and vote. The vote, the vote uh, is... Uh, um, America doesn't recognize, you know, they, 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 they almost sequester us out of the voting system. I mean, we can vote, but it, it, um, I don't Control people, you know, it doesn't mean anything to vote. I'll tell you one thing every Republican votes in every election. Republicans are about 24% of the population. But they win these things because they all vote. Nobody fools them into thinking their vote doesn't mean they vote. If all the people who felt like us voted, a Republican could never get enough. I, I think it's moral to vote in self defense uh, from your neighbors who are attempting to aggress against you. Um, I think it's immoral to vote to attempt to choose who should be your neighbor's ruler. It's political. Everything is political. See, that's the thing. Like, in this country, like, think about it like this. You have, like, two dominant political parties that people talk about, the Republicans and the Democrats. But ultimately, they are not the, the, the party that has been responsible for the American, like, what's happened in this country culturally. The apathetic party is, the, is that party. That's who has really dominated our politics. That's how really short-sighted, like small-minded people get into control of vastly powerful like instruments like the government, like the Republican. Only when, only when you've got a crisis, people tend to come together. Only when it's to the point of, how shall, how shall I say it, things have got to the point where there's a point of no return that people come together. Uh, it's, um, 
we're, we're, we're going to see we're going to see some times when and they're coming when it's coming back to them it's not going to be a Republican Democratic the Democrat Party it's going to be we we the people and right now the we the people is, we, we, we ignore it we are ignored It's a it's a Look, I'm a revolutionary because I can do all the things that I want to do. I can write the way I want to write. It is possible, it's really a revolution. But to say you are a revolution, and I have the courage to go out and speed of change is just silly. I mean, it's like I write about it. Revolution is always possible. I mean, it's a matter of people organizing and overthrowing the government. But there's no doing it without struggle and organization and effort and discipline. That's the noise of revolution. You just got to do it. You can't do it by having a TV program. You know, you can't have it by making a movie or something. You know, the revolution is people getting together and fighting the government. You know, head on. I already said it. it's not possible until we, until we, until we decide to work together. I don't see how you know. I, I think about all the like the anti-war protests and the and the um, demonstrations that I've been to, and I think about just how disheartening they are. At the end of the day, you look at a couple hundred kids all dressed in black with fucking ski masks on and Che shirts, throwing bricks through Starbucks windows. You know what I mean? Fuck, it's not a fucking revolution. It's a display. You know, it's, it's, it's a game that they almost prefer us to play. It's like the revolutions generally knock down the power structure, but they, they dissipate their energy in doing so. And then it sets up a power vacuum of sorts. It's like if you have a counter-revolution coming in and trying to bring in some ideas which are old and some ideas which are new. It's like, you, when the revolutionaries generally want to wipe the sleep, slate clean. Everyone's just so apathetic nowadays. I, I think there's an inherent problem with, with the violent overthrow of the government, because what you end up having is one group of thugs out, the next group of thugs in. And right. either way, the guys with the glasses and the books under their arms get shot first. So, really, I think it's the 20th century proved anything. It's that, you know, far-reaching political ideals don't work, so you can't identify yourself as a communist or an anarchist or a fascist. And beyond that, fucking, it doesn't all, you know, the whole, let, let's blow up the fucking White House and take things over it doesn't work. I don't think they have the idea that they could. I don't think that they even know what a revolution is. Or, I mean, what do they know? The closest thing they know to a revolution is buying something with Che Guevara's face on it to wear around their head or something. That's as close as they get, man. And the American Revolution. And that worked to a certain extent, given the times. But I think the most successful revolutions are like uh, the Gandhi sort of Indian revolutions, the, the peaceful re revolutions, where you just shut everything down. Gandhi may have personally been nonviolent. But Gandhi's revolution killed how many hundreds of thousands? Well, this is true. All right. This is true. So um, the person who says, go out, do this, okay, but doesn't do it themselves, may claim to be nonviolent, but is still responsible for the violence. Okay. Responsibility. federal government certainly doesn't have much respect for the, the Constitution as I believe it should be interpreted. I think if we actually followed the Constitution, you'd have a radical change in society for the better. The people wake up. They fucking wake up. They get pissed off. They get uncomfortable. They start to get that fucking feeling in their stomach of like, we've got to fucking do something. Things are desperate. You know? And like, overcome their fucking fears. There's this fucking comfortability of like, you know, I'm afraid, you know, the, the, 
I'm just gonna sit here because if I go out there and do something, I might get you know punished or I might get you know my finger wagged in my face or, or you know something like that. It's like. talk about confrontation with the government, then you're up against a legitimate enemy. And we've seen what they've done before, you know, to people like the Black Panther Party, Abby Hoffman, like there's just been a million different groups and individuals that have stood up against the government, either collectively or, or by themselves. And some of them end up fucking dead, you know, or just locked in a prison. And they make their lives hell. And so it's 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 a it's a force. It's a true force that a bunch of fucking little um, punk rock kids in San Francisco aren't going to be able to fight on their own just because there's a couple thousand people that want revolution and go to Hot Topic to buy their Fidel Castro wristband. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but it's just another it's another market that has opened up and become very popular and, and very saturated and it's uh, it's kind of depressing because it, it's, it has been marketed to our generation. Revolution, you know, as Chairman Mao says, is not a dinner party. <laughs> it's the struggle between one class and another for control of the social system. So, when you guys tried to... If you had a revolution here, you would have to throw out the capitalists. You'd have to assassinate the bankers. You'd have to line the Republicans up against the wall. It wouldn't be nothing nice. You put Carl Rhodes in on a pipe. <laughs> well, of course, it entirely depends on how you define revolution. Um, I think revolution was a way in which things were handled in the past. Um, and I'd like to think at this point that. We're not, we don't need revolutions, in, any way. in other words, we don't need to turn everything upside down and start again like the French Revolution. Or, you know. What we really need is an evolution from where we are at this particular point. So the, um, the stuff which we haven't found useful drops away, and what we, found, what we find useful we can apply to the making of a new world. So no, not revolution really, but evolution from where we are now. Uh, and hopefully, you know, each of us have learned in our own ways that you can't solve problems through violence, you know, and that by being mean to other people, you discovered that it's not a good life strategy. And, uh, you know, all, of the, all the things that one discovers in the course of a life of how to behave in a way that one can achieve the maximum, you know, without being screwed over by uh, anyone else. I've infiltrated many radical organizations and so forth, and I've infiltrated the Covenant Sword and Arm of the Lord. I've infiltrated, I, I wasn't an actual member, but I deal deals with the Bloods, the Crips, the Invisible Empire, the Knights of Klu Klux Klan, the Aryan Nation, the Hells Angels, the Banditos, the Oklahoma Outlaws, different organizations and so forth. And there are a lot of people that have agendas, but most of these people have an agenda, and the bottom line is usually the bottom line. Usually, they're into making money or getting ahead or getting what they want in the world more than they are about trying to overthrow the government and so forth. And the worst part, the capitalist system, the war mongers, television programs, the seamless blanket of oppression they put around the whole populace to wall them off. Capitalism. Uh, the term capitalism means too many different things. It's real hard to talk about. Uh, in one sense, capitalism is just about freedom of choice, and then people get together to form something called a government to uh, create some checks and balances. In that sense, the internet and capitalism are natural complements. However, to some people, capitalism means something different. And some of those definitions aren't as benign. 
but that's uh, it's just so hard to talk about because it means so many different things. Yeah, there's there's uh, definitely bad aspects. Capitalism is not perfect by any means. It's just uh, well better than using the state. You know, ultimately, although this is obviously an oversimplification, but you basically have two means of getting goods and services to people. There's prices, and then there's rationing. There's there's free market forces, and then there's central planning, and one works and the other doesn't. And you know. Uh, much as I complain about the richest people in America, uh, the, some of the poorest, most of the poorest people in America have a standard of living higher than the millionaires and even billionaires of four or five generations ago. So, uh, I don't know the actual definitions of these things. So I can't, I wouldn't say capitalism. Certainly I would say that in my lifetime, in my estimation, the way capitalism has been practiced in this culture, I would say it is a deeply diseased system. I don't know if it's a cancer or not. Cancer at the moment is apparently incurable. So I, if I was to pass it as cancer, then I might think, well, then it's hopeless. I tend to have, I'm pretty hopeful. Um, It, it just, it, yeah, well, I mean, with the, with the society of wealth and all that, I guess capitalism has caused a lot of problems with people that, I mean, it, the, the poor people are, are free to use that to any extent, but um, it seems like they still, the, the rich folks still end up with the power somehow using capitalism. Money always now, goes back to money, doesn't it? It seems like, it, yeah. How do you feel about capitalism? Uh, well, I, I think it's something that, at this point, you know, it it, it can be a, a, a vicious beast that can ruin the world, or it can be something that can be controlled. You know, I mean, it, to me, it seems likely that unchecked, you're going to basically have a sort of aristocratic robber baron society, just inherently. That's just what's going to happen. But if you have certain regulations and, and the people in control aren't the ones with all the money, then I, I don't think cap, I mean, capitalism is just a market, you know? That's all it is, it's just a right. market. So the idea itself, you know, markets and so forth, the, the, the trading of goods and services for money is not necessarily evil, it's just used in a, in a very evil, corrupt manner. I think drug dealing is a good uh, example of capitalism. You know, like the supply and demand theory I think I think that that works, and it's totally illegal. But some people have to make a living that way. You know? Well, then a neighborhood the was uh, for you. You, then it you, for me. you're a white man. <laughs> this man always better. Uh, uh, for that, from what I've heard, what I remember is that you go to count because I was with the church. We go to county jail like on the holidays and everything. All these black boys, hey, the white folks was doing them. I mean, they they in jail too, but eighty percent of them is black, and they're all young right now, just going, you know. I mean, they're from eighteen, you know, twenty six on along. Yeah, yeah, that's all we go to pray for them. And they're in jail, no, they're what is that? They what have they did? They ain't been to no schools. I mean, they they haven't did anything. He on the corner, he's selling drugs. But selling bad, drugs. Cause he, cause he See, but, it is, the point, but what it is, they, they have them to sell the, the pigment folks, they don't get them. The they don't get them. They get these little dudes on this, give them 10 or 12 dollars, give them a pair of Nike gym shoes, mm -hmm. and they take a chance on going to jail selling them drugs. That's what so, they do. So doing. it ain't a class war, it's a race war. It's right? a race it's war. It's definitely a race war. It's always going to be one here. See? Who controls the money? Who the white controls folks. the money controls everything. I don't, right. care what, I don't care how you put it or how you say it. He who controls the money controls everything. White so, folks control the money. So poor white folks got it better than poor black Hell folks. Hell yeah. They got, they, they got, they got they, much they, better. They got a little bit better chance. They though. have, they, they got, got I it mean, better. That, 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 not, that's not saying that, but they got a little bit better chance. Well, well a, a, a poor black, chance. a white person, another white person, well to do, they'll help them. But a poor black person, a, a middle class black person, they don't want to be bothered with them. They don't want to be bothered with their own folks. Get out of Dodge, let's go. <laughs> hey, they, they don't want, once they uh, accumulate what? their higher education, or they doing good, or they got a good job, they don't want to be bothered with other black folks, so they think they're 
gradually know? changed. It's, 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 like it's a slow process. It took us 200 years to get to this point. It makes it take another 100 years to get to the next point. It's slowly yeah, well, turn around, slowly, but gradually changing. That's it. It, it's not an overnight Ain't no process. Ain't no objection on y'all. That's you know, happen. just talking. Oh, it's we're still driven. The society in this country, especially, is driven to existence and in making a living. And I think that if uh, things were really um, capitalism is great. It works, but it has to work with compassion and putting people first and not profits first. And I think uh, hopefully someday that may happen here. There's only, yeah, but there's only one revolution I'm about. And that's what this is representing as a spiritual revolution. Not a revolution of people's minds and thinking and, and governments and all this. There's only one revolution, that's a spiritual revolution, and that's what I'm about. Sorry, John Tripper? I'm a warrior sage of the spirit. And that's the only change. Oh, no, um, I'm coming out. Any other kind of social change or governmental change, oh, yeah. you know, with that, that's nothing. But if there's a change of consciousness, if there's a raising of consciousness to the spiritual platform, that's the only thing. That's the revolution. God is not. It goes both out ways. When, when I first seen it, I thought it was more the evil. You know, you know, like you know, the God that sin is powerful. Is it destroys. For you. But then again, the church to reach you. So He's trying to love you. He's a human being. We're suing a relationship with you. I think religion in, in general uh, gives us a sense of values. Not that you necessarily have to be religious to have values, but those, those morals and those values came from somewhere. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, many of the, the religious beliefs that have been passed down, especially within our country. You know, one of the reasons that, that people came to this country was for religious freedom. and. I know there's a lot of flaws in, in that and, and, and some bad things happen with that. If someone uh, feels that they have to have a belief in a God so that they don't rob, break, kill, steal, and, and generally do evil things, then uh, I certainly wasn't to go right on believing in a God if, if that's the only basis for their moral code. If um, they, they think, and, and I've heard many people say, well, without a belief in God, you, people would just go out and, and murder each other. Well, I wouldn't, and uh, no other atheists I know would, and there are very few born-again atheists on death row. And if the person making this statement truly believes that, then I think that person, for our own safety's sake, should go right on believing in a God. Well, they say praying, I mean, even if you don't believe in the same God that everybody else does, they say that, that it can make you feel better and, and it can just fix your immune system and things like that. Thing. Yeah, I think it's yeah. just all positive thinking. Well, I, you know? I think praying is like a healthy... Uh, Meditation. Yeah, it, it, it's like a selfish act, but it's a healthy selfish act, as opposed to, like, you know, alcoholism, which is a <laughs> yeah. very unhealthy selfish act. But, uh, yeah, I mean... The whole, the whole God thing is like, all, when you look at the void that God fills, you know, the explanations people need, most of those explanations have already been more than satisfactorily answered by modern science. I think it's just people want something other than the void of existence, because they're not excited by their lives enough. They're not well, excited. It's, yeah, it scares people yeah, their, to their look lives, up at the sky and go, what, where, what are we doing here? Yeah, their lives have become so, they've become so disenchanted with it, and it's just so menial and tedious. and boring that they've got to think there's something else. I'm going to die and it's going to be this bitching ass heaven I'm in. Now I'm going to have this great life next time because this one sucks. So I think that's why they start reaching out like, oh yes, there's got to be an apple. Well, it, it because calms this them can't down. Because yeah. Yeah. If, if not, they would lose their minds right. trying to think of what's, uh, right. what's out there. Free will, the idea of free will, which they always tell me because I'm around a lot of born again Christians. That free will um, 
you know, God gives you the ultimate choice. He loves you so much he gives you the ultimate choice. I always say, it doesn't seem like a choice to me. It seems like a coercion, like a, like a carjacking. If, if I tell you, um, you can eat, you, okay, you've got a choice. You can love me or you can burn in hell for eternity. That doesn't seem like a choice to me. Christianity is kind of the root of all human suffering and failure in this world. I mean, the West is the way it is today because of Christianity. Everything that is, you want to get into current events, everything that's happening right now is because of Christianity, flat out. So burning churches and scaring the living shit out of Christians and reminding them that they don't have every last man, woman, and child in their clutches is pretty important. Is there a religious war going on in the United States? Some people call it um, the culture wars, but here at the museum we are engaging uh, the culture, not in a what we would call a battle, but maybe the more, oh, maybe generic term is engaging the culture to think seriously about biblical truths from Genesis uh, to Revelation, but you won't see us out there agitating for people to say, you've got to believe in the book of Genesis. It's, it's up to uh, their own volition. So it's more of a cultural war than a religious war. Yes, I, I don't even like the word culture war sometimes, but it's become such a part of our, our culture nowadays that yeah, I just, we just kind of use that as a fallback term. I do think that Christianity has become a culture in many ways and less a relationship or a lifestyle but a culture, you know, we have all these things that we say are acceptable. We have our own way of speaking. We have all these things. And I think anytime you have a culture, you're dividing. You're separating yourself from others and, and you're almost becoming elite, you know, and, and you're in the cool club. And I think that unfortunately through that, we have kind of created that, um, that, that thing by, by, you know. You know, there's two religions in the a lot of people think there's a thousand or two hundred or something. There's really two. There's what I would refer to as God's religion and there's man's religion. And they're quite easy to tell apart. The characteristic of man's religion is just obvious. Uh, even my dog understands man's religion. You do good, you get rewarded. You do bad, you get your lights punched out. That, that, that's the essence of human religion. Uh, you do good because you want to get rewards, and the more good you do, the more rewards you get. You do bad, then you cower because punishment is inevitable. You know, God's religion is so different from that, I don't think any human being would have ever thought of it. Hmm, well, God is not a big hairy man that lives in the heavens, although sometimes that might be an interesting proposition. However, I think God is more the higher self. If you look at it in Jungian terms, it would be your anime, the ego, trying to reach for the process of individuation. Uh, but uh, when we deal with social problems, uh, I think man has proven himself quite inept uh, at solving social problems, and uh, we seem to just dig the pit deeper with time. We've tried lots of things. We've tried eugenics to build a superior human being through selective breeding to come up with a master race. Hey, that all grew out of scientific knowledge. Uh, Sir Galton was what, the grandson or nephew of Charles Darwin, he was the father of eugenics. Uh, Germany used these concepts to uh, kill Jews and anyone else that they thought to represent an inferior race. Uh, this is knowledge which uh, is harmful and knowledge uh, completely unbridled by uh, God's word that just runs off on its own, I think just leads to dead ends. And that's why we do such a poor job with social, with social problems. Oh, there's been more people that's been horrendously tortured in the name of religion the traditions of man. We have done the most insane, heinous crimes. I mean, come on, think about it. In the name of religion, to burn somebody at a stake? Alive? Come on, man. In the name of Christ, Jesus. In the name of God. Because they were pronounced witches. I think the greatest... 
really. I know. think the greatest weapon the devil has against God is Christians. I think that he is able to use these mean people to distract them from him. And because I do believe in, in Satan. But, um, you know, the question I often ask myself is, it, is it, you know, however much I dislike Christianity as a, as a religious expression, it's probably a lot better than having people running wild. You know, it, it's a wrong, in other words, in a, in a, in a ladder. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't, didn't find the Russian experiment, the Soviet experiment, uh, it had any redeeming virtues that I could see. Whatsoever, apart from being able to beat people into making you know, stealing <laughs> hydrogen bomb secrets, <laughs> you know. I, I, so I don't think atheism as a as a social system works. Um, people do need to have to have something to believe in, but uh, and probably you know being probably pretty undisciplined animals on the whole, they need to be whipped, you know, until they can't stand it anymore. And then at some point, they start asking the deeper questions. And that's really when it starts. Suffering is actually, it seems to be an interesting way, but suffering does do a lot of good for people. You know, it develops compassion, and it develops a depth of understanding of self, and often leads to, you know, a transcendent experience of one sort or another. It can do. You know, I mean, First off, people always cite like Stalin because he outlawed religion, you know, and like so he's the most evil atheist of the 20th century, which is, I'm not talking about outlawing religion, I'm just saying skeptical inquiry, you know, instead of just saying, yeah, ghosts exist and the baby Jesus is out there, just say, why don't you just be a little more skeptical? I think skeptical thought is up there with critical thinking. You know, I'd say I would self-describe myself as a skeptic, and I think that's what I think would be healthier. Skeptics don't strap bombs themselves and blow up buildings. I'm frequently asked, when did I become an atheist? Well, in, in reflection, I was born an atheist. You were born an atheist. Everyone's born an atheist. A more correct question is, when did the God talk get bored into your dear little head? I've been asked uh, uh, how I know the Bible so well, and I say, because of 12 perfect years of Sunday school attendance. And say, well, why do you not believe in it? And I say, because of 12 perfect years of Sunday school attendance. Um. Yeah, there's a lot of people who don't believe in anything. You know, they believe in themselves. Like, for instance, I'm one of those people. You know, I'm not a pipe carrier. I don't go to Sundances. I don't go to Sweat Lodge, you know, every weekend. I don't go to NAC meetings. You know, I believe in myself. You know, so I was taught to take care of yourself, believe in yourself. And, you know, if you want things to happen, you just focus on what you want to do in your life and go do it. And everything else will fall in place. Spiritual. My spirituality comes, you know, from that hill, Satan. Milton's Paradise Lost, the tragic history of mankind, the tragic here at the protagonist. What's your religion? I'm Satanism. I'm not atheist. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, well, I don't even. I'm, I'm a, well, I, I worship the devil. And the devil meaning something that exists inside me that I want. So what's the difference, do you think, between religion and spirituality? Um, it depends on who you talk to. The word religion means a lot of things. Spirituality means a lot of things, too. Uh, me, I figure, I think it was Hillel who said, uh, the essence of Judaism is basically the notion that you should uh, love your neighbor and treat people like they want to be treated. That's the core of Judaism and a, a core value of pretty much any world religion. Okay, I, th I think the difference between religion and spirit spirituality, for me, I think that religion is more focused. Like for me, um, religion goes like you're Christian or you're Mormon or something like that. And I think spirituality is something that's a little bit more like uh, Oprah style, whatever you want to believe, you know, if you want to believe a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you can kind of go with a little bit of everything instead of just saying, well, I am Christian, or I am that, so. 
That's what I think the difference is. We're not, uh, you know, we're not going around talking about a god or god or gods that are human in form, have personalities, have all the you know the petty bullshit that goes along with uh, the decaying meat sacks that are, is humanity. Uh, it's more of recognizing that there is uh, a, a greater something, what that is, we don't necessarily know. I tend to call it a vibration. Uh, you can call it like uh, the collective unconscious or the Akashic record, but uh, there is something that is uh, beyond just this, this fucking flesh. Uh, you know, you go out to the desert, you go out to the forest, you look at the trees, you look at uh, the ocean crashing on the rocks, and there's definitely something out there. Um, you can call it holy, you can call it unholy, whatever you want, but it's uh, something spiritual. It's something that uh, we don't necessarily know and can't put a finger on it, but we understand that it's there. It's that same part of that is the same intrinsic fear that uh, humans have when they see you know, the skeletons, be it of an a animal or a person, you look at it and you have this uh, shiver that kind of goes up your spine. Uh, and t along those lines, it, just because we acknowledge an energy of the universe does not mean that we worship it. That does not mean that we put ourselves beneath it. We are one with it. We are a part of it. We are all involved in that same continuum. So are you a religious person? I've been through all these ideas in my head back and forth of, uh, of religion and, and is there a right religion for me and they, I, you know I grew up with in a Christian family and then my dad would come home and beat the kids and get drunk and stuff like that so uh, uh, yeah I've, I've, I've been torn between all that you know I've, I've read some stuff in the Bible and the Bible has there's some positive stuff in a few chapters of the Bible I mean it, there's just like there's some good stuff in the satanic literature or any other there, I, you know I pull pieces from different things to kind of make my own uh, you know ideas about all this stuff I think the Indians the American Indians had some really cool ideas the Buddhists have some really cool ideas about just peaceful living you know like, wow you know you start thinking and shit nah this can't be true right yeah, but then you start thinking like, you know, what if he did? You know, you, you, what if he died and you go to heaven? Man? What if you you die and you go to heaven? Fuck, man. I, mean, I thought this, I did. I thought it was all bullshit, man. You know, I still probably have an inkling of suspicion that it is, but but I had that doubt, man. I had that doubt. I've always kind of had that doubt. Like I always said, better be safe than sorry, right? But then they come out with, oh, you can't worship two gods, right? Like, wow, wow. You're just like. Uh, can I still look and do a line here and there? What? You know? And then I'm like, well, what is a sin? You know, it's like, a sin is denying yourself, right? Or is that a, a penance? Or is that a, a respect? Or are we supposed to whip ourselves? Or Because we whip ourselves to shit anyway. I don't know if you're like me, but we beat ourselves up. I mean, I, I fucking, am I good or am I bad? Am I good? I, I just, honestly, it's so much easier to be bad than try to be good. And... My bad's not that bad, but I'm probably like the most fucking, I think about Satan all the time, man. And I go, fuck, man, you know, I, I was like, yo, know, because I got shot. And I was like, fuck, man, I'm going to go to hell or what? I was like, I was waiting, and I didn't get that light at the end of the tunnel. You know, like, I got terror, you know? Why, did you feel like you were pet dying? I got terror. I just was terrified, like, I ain't going to front. Like at first I was like this, right? Then I did kind of get terror, but it was a weird terror. Like you're resigned, you know, whatever happens. I've come this far and it's not up to me from here, right? And you're like, I can't control things from here, right? Like if I have to burn a million years, or if I have to be good at, you know, feed the donkeys for Jesus's tracks or something, uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know what to expect if there is a heaven, right? Or what if I just die? Yeah, which is even, that's easy though, but it's like, it's hard to, hard to just want to die. I don't want to die, I want to live. Yeah. If you divorce yourselves from religion and you really look at how nature 
works is there really are no laws other than the laws of nature. And if you are really acting in accordance with your true nature, then, then that is your moral compass. It's when you kind of like go outside of your, your true nature that you're not being true to yourself, that you're doing things that are not natural for you, like, you know, Oh, I don't know, any number of like bizarre and weird things that a lot of religions require of you. Those aren't really true to an individual's natures, but a lot of times serve the organization rather than the spirit. And I think those are the wrong things. I think if people would just love I think, I think Christianity, in a nutshell, is this, to love God and to love people. And if we, would, if we would come back to that, and of course, you know, our tendency there is, we know that's true. Very, very few people would argue with that statement, love God, love people. You might find a few that argue with the love God part, but very few would argue with loving people, yet we don't do it. And again, that's that, that inner struggle there. If we would just give in to the love and love God and love people in every action that we do and everything that we say, then um, I think it would be a much better world. You didn't have to have a good life. It's all about having a good life. Because that's all we have is this life here and now. You know, some people believe in reincarnation. We come, you know, my father believed that there was a, uh, an energy, you know, and the body dies, but the spirit never goes on and either, you know, whether you be reborn or you come back, the energy just gets transformed into something else. So, those are some of the things that I think are good, you know. So either we're looking for something or somebody that knows more than we do, or we're hoping that somebody or something that knows more than we do will come along and save us. Or, in a more deeply occulted way, to find out the true meaning of life and, and why we're here and the purpose of it. Because it's certainly more than just getting up and going to work and having babies and dying. One doesn't have to be spiritual, I think, to get to that point. Realizing there must be something more to life <laughs> than what we're told. And once you start asking those questions, you start wanting to explore them through art as well, I think, whatever your art is. I don't really, I'm not that interested in other people's reaction to my art. I don't really go out of my way to exhibit. I really do it for my own benefit. Very selfish. The biggest prejudice in the world is not racial prejudice. It's not black against white or, or, or brown against white or yellow against white or against each other or whatever. It is fucking cultural prejudice. It is cultural prejudice. Um, it's just all one. Why? When you divide, you separate. When you put a label on it, you're, you're dividing yourself. You're not including all people. If you get people as individuals by themselves, they're marvelous people. Oh, the best thing about America is that, you know, we don't have a democracy and we're pretty, they say, quote unquote, you know, we're free, but, uh, you know, by certain guidelines. It seems though that when you get large groups of people combined together, they lose their humanity. It's really difficult to think of worse things about America. America is a great country. We have tremendous freedom here. You have the ability to be the uh, captain of your ship and the master of your fate. We have freedom in America. We have a country that our citizens are strong enough to go places and defend our freedom. I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> That's a long discussion, but we can start with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is actually the beginning of the discussion. <laughs> You're probably uh, too young to remember when we had a constitution and rule of law, but the Bill of Rights enumerates a, uh, and some important uh, human rights, like the freedom to associate, freedom of religion and speech. Those are pretty good. 
Are you too young to remember that as well? We're, the, we're one of the few countries in the fucking world that tries to legislate morality. I mean, come on, morality is what you learn at your grandma's knee. You learn you to treat people the way you want to be treated. And the best thing, black people, <laughs> African American culture, music, dance, poetry, you know, the, the creativeness of Americans. And the best thing is we're free. We don't have to wear things over our face to keep people from men from not seeing us. We don't have to be married to somebody that they pick for us. We can pick who we want to marry. We're free. We can go and come as we please. We just got to abide by the law. That's the best thing about it. Well, the best thing about America is, is the incredible feeling of potential that one can do anything. Coming from Europe, the feeling of, uh, of one can express oneself. Um, you know, if one's canny enough about it in exactly the way one wants to. I think the best thing about America is that you're free to follow your dreams. And I think the worst thing in America are people who tell you you can't follow your dreams. Well, I think definitely our freedom is the, the best thing best thing, I think, is the Second Amendment, and we have to keep it. It's a tricky thing. When I think of America, I think of the word God. It's like, uh, we need another word. Any society, when manners goes, the society goes. This country's quickly losing its fucking manners. You know? I don't know what changed everything. You wouldn't be dressed like that today if it wasn't for us. We were the original hippies. Weed's still illegal. Yeah, but we're still... I got some right here. You want to smoke one? Yes. I can smoke one right here. I would love that. illegal, you know I mean? That's a different world. It's their world. We can live in whatever world we want. We can do what we want. We can do what we want. I'm just one... I'm just one of billions of living beings on this earth. I mean, for all the issues that we are talking about and all the kind of like, you know, you're stressing about these things that, that you study this and I study this, we think about, it doesn't mean a fucking thing, ultimately. You know, like, I mean, right now, in this very moment, like this entire block could just explode. A crack could open up and drop us in and we'll be just eviscerated. And it won't mean a thing, really, to most of the people in this world. Just most of the people in the world. It won't mean a thing. It will have zero effect on the revolution of this earth. Like the earth will just continue to spin. <laughs>
Take it. Take it. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what That looks perfect. You look really great there. Showing necklace. Good. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, I can't see what you're seeing. Right. I'm I'm letting you know. You, right now you can see the baphomet. Perfect. Right there is perfect. So okay. That was a last minute decision. I wore this when I was with you. I in remember. Chicago. How could I forget? Okay. Well, you could, but no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're right. You I know, did have a coat on. How could I forget? A million ways. Slip, fall, you know, <laughs> disease, bug, earworm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you want to talk about Might is Right, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, look at you. Let's get on with the show. I've got stuff to do. I've got to get a on with the show. Get yes. on with the show. Let's go, baby. That's okay, what right. we're here for the show. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. So might is right. Yeah. I, I want to talk to you about your, your perspective. On, you know, you, you read your father's introduction that he did for me. And uh, we've talked a lot about some of the issues of um, like white supremacy and stuff like that being associated with your father, his, him personally and his philosophy and the church of Satan. And, and so, at this point in my life, I'm always like, I don't even understand how that happened because I, I uh, interpret the philosophy a, little, a lot different, you know. So, do you? Are you going to ask? Do I have a specific question? Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> well, I want to know. Okay, like sock it to me, Shane. Like, yeah, well, the question. I want to know. I want you to. Hmm, how can I form a question about that? It's just like. Well, you were okay when you were around when it started. Tell us the story about that. Tell you know what did you see? Was you grew up? You're, you're, you know, father. first of all, this is about people calling my father a fascist for one thing. Right, and that's what I was gonna say. You're your father. History, and I would say there's no way in reality that he'd be a fascist. First of all, fascist dictators are politicians. My father isn't a politician at all. Artist. But to be a fascist, you're taking away people's rights. To be a Satanist, when we started this with the magic circle and the beginnings of the Church of Satan, and I'm not a part of the Church of Satan now. I'm not a part of the new Church of Satan. So anything that I say is totally, I'm speaking for my father and my past. And my knowledge of my father from the time that I knew him. My father was 21 when I was born. And I was with him the last year of his life. I was with him throughout his life. And he always had a way of reaching me. I always had a way of reaching him. I could always go into our family home and he could always come to mine. So we were never out of touch unless I was in Europe or something. So I pretty much, I think that I can speak with authority on his values because he instilled them in me. And my father was not a white supremacist. My father was not a neo-Nazi. My father was not in alignment with any of those views. So I can say that emphatically. So, and that's very important that that be known. He did have, you know, people ask a lot about his associations with people like a Boyd Rice or people that do seem to be, yeah, no doubt, no, absolutely right wing into the fascistic part of that political ideal. So why would your father associate with people like that or people like me? Because people, people, people look at me like that. Often. Because they were the people, some of the names that you have mentioned, he didn't have anything to do with them in that aspect. He simply knew them as people who came around that were a part of the scene in San Francisco. So I don't think 
that he thought of them as being Nazis. I don't think that uh, it's actually been proven anything that they that they are. They say that they are not. Well, I remember as far as I... right, being right wing, my father was never a right wing person. He was a fry cook. That's one of my favorite stories, him being a fry cook, because that's where I relate to him, you know, as a very much a very working class artist. That's how I that's how I see it. See people have uh, so many views of that. Yeah. Uh, when my father met those guys like Boyd Rice, first off, Adam Parfrey was his publisher and they did a lot of things for sensationalism. I mean, they did, those other guys. My father didn't need to. The church had already been started in 1969. So these guys were sort of latecomers coming in the 80s and 90s. So it really wasn't a part of the original church. When I spoke to your father after I delivered, hand-delivered might is right to him. He would talk about, well, that's their, they're predisposed to have those opinions because of their politics. I don't agree with, you know, he, but he, he entertained all kinds of political or philosophical thought. That's how I saw it. And that's how I like to take in earlier in Satanism was like, I would, I would, I would study everything, serial killers. The, but that doesn't mean I want to be a serial killer, you know? So, uh, yeah, my father was not a fan of serial killers at all. As a matter of fact, this show that they put on the 8888 show, my father was not there, contrary to what has been said in a lot of media. He wasn't there. He didn't have anything to do with it. I am uh, I did not know that, but Zoom has me asking, they're asking me for money, Carla. So that's what just happened. There we are. I did not know that about anything. I don't even know about that 888 thing. And I don't really, for me, present day, I know there's a lot of people sculpting Satanism as uh, Nazi stuff. And I feel like they're the far left. They're very far left. And for some reason, they, they're, they're invested in this without like this uh, um, looking into the entirety of it. They just look into these little micro moments of a uh, who, I don't know who, who, who they might tie into your father. They tie me in. Okay. Because I did not, might is right. And I, I platformed some Nazis in there, but for me, it was just, you know, I was juxtaposing things. And I mean, you, you yourself asked me questions about some of my past and, and, you know, it's, it's hard, that kind of stuff to, you know, like going, through, I think kids should, should do the exact what I did and do things and make mistakes. But, but I grew to understand when I was educated enough, I understood those were ignorant things to say, you know, who knows, stuff like that. But how do you feel about that as far as Church of Satan? Or I mean, sat Satanism or your father, just he was looking into different philosophies. He, was, he would just entertain all thought. And isn't that sort of something, something to, to do with Satanism? Yeah, but there was never discrimination. It had to do with, Right. People being freedoms. It had to do with sexual freedoms as far as people being able to have a place to go if they were gay. They could come to our parties. If people wanted to do things, if they wanted to have uh, do things to their bodies, if they wanted to have things that are now quite stylish, but they were not in the 60s and 70s, they had a place where they could come and do them. There was a man named Raleigh Loomis, and he came and he hung himself on meat hooks on our kitchen door. And he went by another name, actually. Uh, I can't think of it offhand. Uh, but anyway, he, he had a place where he could come. He had to dress business-like to go to his work. He couldn't tell anyone about what he did. But later when the counterculture thing happened, he was quite a hero to so many of these people. But at the time, he could not show this to people. So he came to our house, and this is where he could feel accepted. So we were a place where people in San Francisco and people came from all over the world who were not accepted, who were hiding. And 
the, the world was very puritanical in those days. So he had a lot to do with changing society as far as pe opening people's minds and giving people a place where they could go and feel accepted. So it was the opposite of fascism. It was giving people rights, not taking them away. Right. He, he was able to state these great things so simply. And the, the, the thing that bothers me or gets me confused about it is it's really clear in, in some of his command, you know, not commandments, but the, the his, you know, this, ah, whatever the fuck they're called, sacrament, whatever. Yeah. We, oh, his name, oh, we he, only the hate Musafar. he was known as the Musafar. We only hate stupid people. So when I saw that, I was like, yeah, exactly. Like, that's good. Like, you know, there was a hate of stupid people. It was a good artistic way to use, you know, like, I don't know. I liked it. But that 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 was it, it made it real clear, like there wasn't a racial or prejudiced issue there. You no, know. there never was. I grew up in San Francisco and I think most of the people that I grew, grew up with, all of my old friends, they're they are not racists at all. So I think a lot of that has to do with what part of the country people grew up in, too. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. That's funny you say that. I was talking to someone out in the West Coast a while ago, and I told him I had a friend that had joined the Ku Klux Klan. And people at this coffee bar rent, like moved away from me. And I'm like, I didn't fucking join. What the hell? And the guy laughed. He goes, it makes perfect sense. He's from the Midwest. <laughs> but where, wasn't the Ku Klux Klan also a Christian organization? Right, right, right. But be, I've so looked... I've had, you know, I've had, I've, I've had, I've, what people say today, platform folks like that, but I'm looking to study them or understand that stuff. You know, it's, it's not, it's not about acceptance. And as an artist, that's sort of a job for me, you know, is to, that's what I, that's what I look into. Cause that's part of a culture I grew up around, you know, yeah. ignorant, white trash, low end culture. So that's what my family is. A lot of that, you know, so that's of course, what's going to come out in my artwork you know, <laughs> or studies, you know. Yeah. You know. My father's family were basically free thinkers. His parents didn't indoctrinate him with any kind of religious upbringing. And when I would stay with them, they said, oh, it's fine. You can celebrate Christmas. You can celebrate Hanukkah. You can open your presents any day you want because kids of other religions can. But I didn't have any actual religious training except for going to Sunday school with my friends. If I happened to spend the night and they were going, I didn't have anything against it. I was open to it. And my father didn't have any problem with that. My parents didn't. So it was no big deal. But I went and on my own, I questioned it. And, and that didn't go over real well uh, with the Sunday school teachers. So. I just wasn't very excited about that particular religion. And I tried a few of them. I, I found, I, I liked the Methodist best actually. Uh, my best friend went to Baptist Sunday school and, and uh, they had some pretty uh, outrageous views about things. And, but I did go to their, their school play and everything and just because my friend went, but but I wasn't into the religious aspect of it. I just went because my friend went. Yeah, well, I was- I have given talks at, at lots of different universities, but I, found, I have found the Methodists were the most open-minded. Really? Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? Well, I gave a, a, a talk at a, an all men's school when I was around 21 years old in South Carolina. And they were super, super nice. You know, wherever I've gone to give a talk, at least when uh, when I was younger, uh, in the 70s, 80s, they would have a, the football team come out to make a wall to protect me. And they would, make, they would get me to the hotel as soon as it was over, as fast as possible, get me out of town. That's incredible. That's great. But, but the Methodists were really nice. They were, they, as I said, they were the most open-minded. Then I got my father's record played on a Jesuit radio station. A good, <laughs> of mine, a good friend of mine, his name is Ron Quintana. And he had a radio show. It's still going on, I suppose. 
at KUSF. It's not KUSF now, it's another station. And uh, I gave him a copy of my father's recording on, and had him play it on Christmas Eve. And he uh, was not met by a lot of approval by the people from the uh, college, the Jesuit University, and they gave him a warning on that. But that was the first time that these counterculture people heard my father play music. They didn't know that he did that. So that kind of started the ball rolling on my father's musical career as we know it. He did play all around town and various venues when I was growing up, but, but as far as the recordings, that started right after my friend played them on his radio show because all these people found out about it. He said, oh, we didn't know that Aunt Tom LaVey played music. Uh, we didn't know we had a recording. <laughs> so then they all wanted to make a recording. But I was already in the midst of making a recording. I had him making a recording. So I had my little Sony recorder and we would sit there every night and we would sing and we would play songs. <laughs> but then somebody came along after this was played on KUSF and I guess they had a better deal, at least he thought at the time. So he went with them and did a recording for them. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what I'm like this with all recordings, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm just such a freak about capturing this when I document. Yeah. It. yeah, I did that last night, experimenting with it. And I was able to get all of everything that I did. I wound up erasing it. I just did some samples. I did it in another room and it was pretty dark. And so I figured I need to come up with another solution. But anyway, yeah, there were a few things I said, like I had forgotten, okay, Rolly Loomis was known as, because these things, you're asking me questions and I'm going back in history so far. So it's hard for me to just immediately come up with the names of who people are, or what they were doing. Certainly. Take, and that's why maybe you said it takes like the second time. Right, right. And that's fine. It, it's it, That's what happened. Because, like the thing about Boyd Rice. Boyd Rice was a dear friend of my, of my friend Jim Osborne, who was a fantastic underground cartoonist. And he did things like Felch Magazine, the, the same type of things that, Crumb did, and uh, he did, but he did the really most gory, obscene stuff. And uh, you talk about your friend, the guy that you worked with, like Diana. That. Yeah. And I was surprised that he was arrested because Jim Osborne did things that were far more inflammatory. But you know, you know how it is. It's this, these, this, it's this luck, this magic moment where you have this combination of things. And the timing is right where it all sparks, much like your father, you know, he had that everything. Yeah. So, yeah, those people, they were a part of the counterculture. And I guess my father was a part of the beginning of the flourishing of the counterculture. Uh, yeah. I always I always tell when people ask me about, you know, this stuff, I say I, I always considered the Church of Satan, an artistic group, like a group of artists, just like the Black Panthers and the Yippies all came out of the same moment where TV was just breaking and they saw it as like, oh, we're going to do some theater and we're going to get we're going to get ourselves on TV. We're artists and this is what we sort of do, just like I saw with the Internet. I, the Internet was breaking and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do something really crazy on the Internet and, and make something happen. And here we are on this 20th anniversary of this Might is Right radio show that's grown out of control. Yeah. I mean, it's like in it, this, this, uh, it, it's lasted 20 years and people study it now. And it's like, I'm trying to put a cap on that bottle. Oops. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are. So, so do we, do we, um, I, I'm going to ask again, where do you, where do you think this association with white supremacy or even being right wing conservative, you're like, even just, just like that attached to the churches or your, your father, Anton LeVay and Satanism, you know, how does. Well, my father has always been very tough on crime, specific yeah. crime. So against vandalism, when I had my 
Mercedes, it had one of those emblems on the front and people would steal them. So he rigged up a solution for me. They had these men's razors and they had these coils in them of a razor. So he said, well, you could take these parts and cut them and you could put this very thin razor on the emblem going around the perimeters of it. And when they go to, to pull up the, the emblem, they're going to, their fingers will be all bloody. So <laughs> that worked really well. I could keep one for three times as long. I, they were expensive at the time and they were equivalent to like a hundred dollars each. So you know, this was no laughing matter. So, you know, like you like to keep them for a while. Yeah. But he, yeah, he, he was very much against vandalism, theft, crimes against people, crimes against property. He, he, he was about, and I see that now, when I hear that, I, always, I think right away, he wants his boundaries respect or, or else. It was respect. all about respect, respecting respect, other people. Respect our they boundaries. Can, and that's modern. Yeah. Today, the kids are like, hey, I got boundaries, bro. Protect yeah. your energy. And I'm like, that's a LeVay thing. Protect your energy. That's what he's yeah, talking about, like, psychic vampires. Yeah, you be good to me, I'll be good to you. But as yeah. soon as you fuck up, well, hey, you know, fuck don't- around and find yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I, I, but also, as far as the might is right in the right wing, I think that happened after you published it. There was another, another uh, printing of it that came out by some other people, and they added their own Aryan- images to it it happened as i was publishing it a nazi gave me it and said this is our bible and then my ex-partner gave me those satanic bible and said this is a, you know she re i sold hundreds of them at the time and i skimmed through it she goes no really read it and i'm reading them at the same time and i'm like this is the same book the same this is the you know this is a lot of the same book and and she wouldn't believe it she's like no it couldn't be everyone rips off the way and i'm like no he he chumped he took a lot out of this thing so that's it was a study for me and it was going on, you know, like when I looked at it, like you said, that 888 thing and all that. So when I looked at it, I saw Nicholas Shrek. He was uh, he was the he was the they were the elders. That was to you. That was the elders of that era. But to right. me, they were the kids. Right. So to me, they were the elders. And so to me, I'm mocking them. I'm 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 reflecting that in my artwork. You know, I'm sort of making fun of them. People, people I didn't know who the fuck Boyd Rice was. People like say his name. I'm like. I don't know who he is and I don't give a fuck. And they're like, yeah. how could you say that? And I, how could you say that? You're with the church of Satan. I'm like, or what's, you know, I'm like, because I don't give a fuck about him. I don't care. I'm not, I mean, no offense. I don't know him. Why would I care? I don't like news music. He's, that's awful stuff. Whoever listens to it's mentally ill. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. No offense, crowd. If you listen to noise music and you buy stuff from me, I love you. No, I'm <laughs> no, I, I have played actually in a noise band Rubber really? Osa Met, which is like the pinnacle. It is one of the greatest noise bands on earth. I love What's it them. called? What was it called? Rubber Osa Met. I played oh. on one of their recordings. Oh my goodness. Oh, that would be a great release. We got to hear yeah. it. Yeah, it, it's, it's fun. I toured with them. We went to New Orleans. We went to Texas. I had a great time. That's cool. Yeah, That's we, did, so we did a cool. Church of Satan show. We played with uh, the, what are they called? The, uh, something, the, uh, gosh, somewhere I have an old flyer. Uh, there's a woman and she does an act where she does something unusual on stage. Uh, the Jenna Tortures. Right, we played, we I know Jenna. One, we played one night with the Jenna Tortures in New Orleans. I know Jen. Yeah, they're great. They played for me before. I love Jen. Yeah. Boy, that's such a great... You, I can't wait to we, read the book that you're going to put out someday. I, you have so many great stories about your life. You've lived a full one. And you grew up You grew up watching the Church of Satan created. Like, you knew... You're the only one... Like, I feel like you're the... I, I know. It's, I guess we're right. You're the only one standing that saw the birth of Satanism. Well, we would joke about it. My my half sister and I, she would say that it was like the la I'm like the last of the Mohicans. <laughs> really, it's true. Yeah. So what? Well, I, I I don't think that there 
Yeah, you can look at it two ways. In some ways, I look at it like I really don't think there are that many true Satanists because I, I am not a part of what was the, originally the, the Satanic or the, the uh, Church of Satan, even though I started it. And it was really sad for me to let it go because that had been my life. That had been what I stood for, for the majority of my life. I, I was the spokesperson for it. But I was mainly the spokesperson for my father, and that will never stop. I was his spokesperson in life, as I am in death. And I saw him at the beginning of it, before it started. I was with him when he died. I was with him after he died. I wanted to preserve his body to make sure that he made it to the other side without anybody bothering him. And I've been loyal ever since. Despite what people say, I never, never did anything that would be against that. And it's sad when I hear that it doesn't make a lot of sense because you were you're his little girl. I loved my father. He was the closest person in the world to me. And, you know, there are so many people that want him to be their father and they make people think that they are a part of our family. And they aren't. And there are people that are part of our family that weren't even, that really weren't around, that try to make it look like they really had a part of things when it's really only for their own selfish interest. And it has nothing to do with my father. And that really aggravates me, of course, because everything I did as far as for the Church of Satan, I did for that cause and for what I stood for and who my father was, what he stood for and what he was to me. And I read, I read horrible things about him and probably a lot of people can relate to this as far as their families. I, I read online that my father abused me. My father never abused me. I read online that my father wanted to be with the woman that he was with, who was the mother of his second child. And that is like the craziest thing on earth. I was with him until the time he died. I was with him for the last year of his life. And there was never any thought about anything like that. There was never any thought of him becoming a Christian, that all of that is just so absurd. But these people get millions of hits on the internet for it, and it's just total crap. We, we, you came up, and I don't know if you came up with this term, but it's, I've never heard it before. You, we, last night we were relating about it, go, say you said identity vampires. That's, that identity vampires, that's exactly what they are. It's, it's, it's an odd phenomena, but I have seen it. It's, it's happens to me and you, so but we years. relate. We both relate on that. And it's like, it is so insane because it's like, it's, it reminds me of Lord of the Rings when the guy has the ring and he's like, he doesn't really get it that it has power and everyone gets him around him. He's like, hey, give me the ring. Give me the ring. He's like, why do you want the ring? He didn't, no big deal. But everyone around him freaked out. And that's how I feel about that. And it's, you know, when you're the real deal, they all want to take it from you, but there's nothing. Well, it's really easy to come along, be a Johnny come lately. When they weren't there at the start, they didn't bear the brunt of it. They weren't the one with the threats. They weren't the ones that got put down by everybody. Right. I, they might have just because they would have been anyway. But in the case of my growing up, first of all, it was the Church of Satan. But before that, we had the lion. I grew up, uh, people were making fun of me, calling me the lion girl because we had the lion. And... And having the lion wasn't really the problem, but when my father started the Church of Satan, boy, then the neighbors really went wild and they wanted us to get rid right. of the lion. So there was a lot of controversy and a lot of people were very mean about it. And uh, I was treated very poorly by a lot of people. And it was not something that anybody would want to do. Somebody wouldn't go out of their way to be treated so horribly by people and to be persecuted like that. But now, well, in the last years, uh, since what we call the new Church of Satan, people come along and they all, they all take the name LaVey when it isn't their name in any way, shape or form, but they think, oh, that's cool. And people think that they're really a part of our family. 
and they aren't none of them are and the people that are a part of our family aren't doing that at all so there's no member of there's no one there's no one with the last name LeVay that is actually out there that is a warranted member of the LeVay family. My half sister's name is now Shrek and my half brother goes under another name and is sort of incognito. So there is no other family member and, and my half brother was around my father until he was four years old. So it isn't exactly like he was indoctrinated into this except by his mother which is something completely separate but as far as my father's upbringing my father was concerned because he felt that that little boy wasn't getting enough uh from him that he was getting it all from his mother and his mother's side of the family so what we have now is something completely different and i have had the first satanic church since 1999 and that I also have an anniversary coming up because I officially started that on Halloween of 1999. Mm. Well, I'm here to celebrate it with you. Um, I just, you, you, when you talk about the life that you lived, I, I re, I've been run out of towns from just, for just being a friend of your father's. I, I wasn't going around town in a dark cape, going around Hail Satan. I was just like, did an interview with the guys. Yeah, I, I was priest, you know, was in the, on the internet and I got run out of town to town. It's like outrageous how how that can be in this day and age. It is outrageous. Yeah. And I can't imagine, I have an excellent and impeccable imagination. And what you must have went through in all those early days, I because of what I went through must have been way easier. <laughs> you know, just, you know, is is incredible that you're still you're as strong, you know, standing tall and, and doing it, you're, you know. And, and that's why that's what bothers me a lot when I see a lot of people making money off this. I'm like, how are and I've said this so many times too. Like, how are the how are the Levees not getting any any play here? How aren't they on the TV shows? How aren't they getting any? You know what's going on here? This is like typical culture vulture shit. Like always. But we have. I mean, I I have to say, I, people in general, some people have been pretty rotten to me. I mean, even within the satanic community, because. They want everything to be about them, and I guess they have their they're making whatever they want. They're getting their pound of flesh. They're they're having their fun. They uh, were people that never had any notoriety before the Church of Satan, and once they get a taste of blood, they want more, and they would kill to not have their taste of blood. So yeah. to them, I am nothing. Uh, so they don't want people to know that I exist and they do their best to make that happen. But I must be a lion in the path, right? Well, I'm just talking about the idea, like the, the satanic temple, the thing I had involvement with, you know, help grow, how it got so, and I'm like, how did this not springboard into people looking for you, looking for the source? Like I, I like for me, it was a sort like I have to go and, and figure this stuff out. So, you know, here we are, here we are. We met by fluke. My Carla th threatening to have my legs broke. No, she didn't th do that, but she just said, you've taken down the LeVay photo or else. And I was like, okay. And then next thing I know, Carla's coming in for the witch's Sabbath. So well, I do own the rights to my father's image being his firstborn. And I do own rights to his books, his image. So yeah, I and, have and to you, abide by that. You and you alone, or you and their family, the, the estate. I should say, yeah, that the estate, yeah. and then no one else has rights to sell those photos. Everyone else is sort of blaspheming the estate. Well, we do our best, right, to to control that. Yeah, you know, and I hope that people will report things if they see them that we don't know. People can find me, Carla Levey, at firstsatanicchurch.com. That's right. So, or they can simply write to admin at firstsatanicchurch.com if they have something to report. Are, are, are we, are, am I, am I going to be able to come out to the uh, black Christmas that you're doing this year? Are you going to do it? What's going yeah, on? Yeah. And have a burrito. Huh? Yeah. We went out for burritos uh, last time and Carla was telling me the story about her father and, and, and burritos. And I was like, you know, this is so cool. Would you tell this? So, t so did your father go and pick up burritos for the family? Did he go? On the no, burrito? he never went. 
he didn't go out he didn't go out a lot to things he went out to dinner but that was about it he'd go out to the park or he'd take him for rides places but when he became pretty well known he he didn't go out a lot amongst people if he did go out he was in in front of the house or something and people would stop by and say hello and he was always very polite and kind to them and he'd give them a, a little talk and and everybody was happy. The neighbors liked him. Everybody got along. But uh, no, we would go to the we would go around the corner to the burrito place, Gordo's over on 24th and Clement Street. It was one of the first burrito places that opened in San Francisco, with just a little hole in the wall. And coincidentally, it was next to the original Bill's place. Bill's place was right, right there, actually, right next to there was a parking lot for the old colony, which was across the street. And my father, when I would be coming home from school, when I was a little girl, he'd be just waking up. It'd be three o'clock. We'd get out of school at 310 and he'd be having his hamburger at Bill's place. And then Bill's place later, I think they, the, the fry cook actually was Bill. And Bill then opened up a, a large restaurant, which is still there on the on the next block. It's still called Bill's Place. And he at one time had a hamburger with my father's name on it because my father was such a regular customer. Oh, that's great. So Gordo. Yeah, we got the burritos. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I went with you, but it wasn't the same Gordo's. It was another one. My father always liked having their burritos. We didn't eat them like all the time, but we had them once in a while. But you want to know how he liked his burrito and all yes. that. So, yeah, yeah, he he didn't like rice. He hated rice. <laughs> if he went to a Chinese restaurant, it would have to be fried rice. He liked fried rice. Um, and I know all these things because I cooked for him. And, and that would be another thing. He'd say, women just can't cook these days because I can make the <laughs> gravy. Because once once we got turkey, he had to have turkey on Thanksgiving, and I mean that was super important. And if we didn't have the turkey on Thanksgiving, and it wasn't a family thing, or if the family was, he went to his father's house once for Thanksgiving, and they didn't have turkey, and he was so disappointed. We had to go out after we had to search all of San Francisco for a turkey dinner for him. We need the ritual. Yeah, it, it was turkey important ritual. to him to have that turkey dinner on Thanksgiving. So one time I ordered turkey from one of those restaurants. It was one of those takeout places and they were known for having really good food, but, and they would give you sliced turkey and everything, but I, I got it. I picked it up. I ordered it. I brought it home and I was supposed to go to a friend's house actually to take part in their Thanksgiving as well. He opened it up and there was no gravy. God forbid Thanksgiving and no gravy. So <laughs> I went upstairs and I, 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 I had, this was the, like, I guess this was the last year of his life. And I was, I had, I had a little kitchen set up that I'd made up there and I had some butter and some flour and I, I made some gravy. I, what could I do? I could not go away and leave him with no gravy. I, this was the, no gravy on Thanksgiving. It was the end of the world. It's true. So, so I made him the gravy and he was so appreciative of the gravy and he'd always carry on it. But women these days, they just don't know how to cook. <laughs> so yeah, but, but back to the burrito, the burrito. Yeah, it was very specialized because he did not like the rice. He so he ordered extra beans, frijole, extra extra beans. So, yeah, they get the, not the refried, the holes, the whole beans. Um, it didn't matter so much what kind of beans, but he just did not want the rice. Got it. He wanted extra. extra. Go so give me two portions of beans, no rice, and he did not. He would not have onions. The onions were completely, you know, you, you do not have onions. Really? So when they chop up the salsa, he'd have to have a, a tomato chopped up just for him. So and and the and the um, avocado. So they'd have to go to the refrigerator and pull out a fresh avocado and a fresh tomato, and they'd have to chop all that up so that he could have that. But it was, they didn't know it was for him or anything. They'd do it for anybody. So that was really nice. So so that was his special order, and that double frijoli and uh, and so no, no onions, beef. no beef, no meat. He ate the meat. Oh, yeah. Okay, so beef. Yeah. Beef, double beans, tomatoes. Did he do hot sauce? Mild. Okay. Mild. He was not big on hot sauces, but he ate a little bit of it. Yeah. 
love that love that story <laughs> i don't know why i don't know why that's so weird but uh, but you know that as well as i do people always love the the slice of life from your your end of things you know from the from it's the kind of funny, huh? well i love you know i love the birthday photos you know the birthday yeah you win the cake and we always we did we always had cake ritual on but it's american ritual satanism the american religion there's a cake the american ritual it's just you know for me beautiful yeah and, and i had my shows the black xmas started because it we always had something to do on christmas because other people had something to do as i was talking way before about my grandparents and how they said well you can open presents they they well, I mean, we didn't have any elaborate gifts my grandparents were not wealthy people but they spent whatever they had to get us these little gifts and it was very sweet and they always had a Christmas tree and the gifts were all wrapped up and we would wait I, mean, I as a little kid you know how little kids are you'd be so excited when Christmas morning came to get your gifts and so I would have these gifts and it was we, we loved that of course but then when I got older and my father started the church we had always celebrated something and even if we didn't celebrate actually on christmas we would celebrate whenever the solstice was so so we started celebrating solstice so that was sort of a big deal to us but to me having always celebrated christmas as a kid well it was not quite as much fun to celebrate it on another day when other people you wanted to celebrate it the same day other people were celebrating it so we never so we we always celebrated the holidays but when i had when i started black xmas that was because we always had something and i would joke and say well it's like on seinfeld they would have festivus for the rest of us yeah 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 so we would have thing we would one year i had a dear friend of mine come and stay with my father and it was someone that he'd been interested in meeting. And so they had a really good time and it was something for him to do on Christmas while I went and visited with my other side of the family. So we always had something, there, there was always a, some kind of little party or something. So when I do the Black Xmas is so that people aren't alone on Christmas when they have, and they're, away from their families and it's pretty important to people and it's a time when they say that people often commit suicide because they are left alone on the holidays so it's a time if you don't have family to celebrate with it can be pretty depressing as well as the the climate and everything of the holidays i like the blasphemous nature of the black xmas that you throw well, just the mere fact of having it on Christmas is not easy. People don't want to work on Christmas. Even bands, you know, as much as they say, these heavy metal bands are like, well, we have to go have Christmas dinner with our family. So we have it late so that they can come after they've had their Christmas dinner with their family. So even though it's still Christmas, they say, oh, well, we're not Christians, but they still celebrate the holiday. So it's really, really hard to get a full band together. People make fun of me. They say, well, you really have to have some different band. You know, you can't just have the same band every year. Like, well, we do our best. We sometimes have one other band, a new band, a different band. But how many people, how do you get four or five people together that don't have to celebrate something with their family. It's damn near impossible. So we tend to have a lot of the same people play because, it, because that's their Christmas. It's what they do. And if they couldn't play, then they'd be really upset. And what do they do? What do we do? Bump them from the show? That wouldn't be very nice. So it's like they're a part of our family on that day. It means a lot to them. The people that come, it means a lot to them. So that's why that's why we continue to do it. So Christmas Day this year, San Francisco. That's where I'm going to be. Yeah. We'll okay. See. Yeah, and and and, and while Purgis, we're doing another Witches Sabbath. We're going to have a that's good time. another. That's a whole other deal. Yeah. 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 yeah I have done Walpurgis Nacht, and that goes. People seem to like that. I guess the Germanic thing with heavy metal. I mean, my shows are a little different from yours, but hey, I've had true. it with heavy metal, whereas you have it with new, more new bands. I, I like the young energy. That's the truth. 
Not that I, I like all energy. What am I saying? I just like, yeah, like I like things that I've never seen before. I'm like, what in the hell's going on here? What are these kids doing? So that's basically what I, I'm enjoying in the, those moments that you, you know, that's what it is. I'm just like, it's anything new. I love, I'm like, I don't yeah. love everything new, but I definitely like trying new things, you know, yeah. it's, you know, but I'd yeah. like to savor old things too. Like I like, I like them some things. I like, I have them all the time. Truffle salt on my potatoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Flannel sheets sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Carla, it was nice talking to you. I don't know, um, you know, we can, you, do you have anything else you want to talk about? So Luke? if we need, if we need to go over those questions or if you can interject and when you do your editing or I don't know how you want to do this unless you want to go back and t talk about, ask me a question again so I can get it right. Right now? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, the, the, we're Although we only have eight six minutes remaining right so i probably would just send you another link and we can go over you want to go over the white supremacist stuff again or anything like that yeah maybe we should because we didn't really say a heck of a lot um yeah I, but i did say that i think that a lot of that came after my father died when when the midas right that. book was published by some other people me yeah but you, you but you, but i i know and i don't it was republished I, after you published it yeah but the white right. supremacist stuff came before that and that's what i'm saying like scholastically like the studies they 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 bring it back to boyd rice they do say that 888 thing is like that's a big deal in that history of it and then my radio show though that's how they're putting these things in because i platformed white supremacists on there and i i said some awful things uh, ignorant things certainly but that does not make me, that does not make the whole of my work. I mean, I have 30 years of work and that's one static moment. It, it's not me, but it's well, you. There was a problem with that. There there were some early TV shows and that people did and my father was never pleased with them. And they would go ahead, they would do it on their own. It wasn't because it was a show that my father ever asked them to. So very often after that, he would ask me to go on a show because he wanted to counter that because that was not not in in what he wanted that wasn't his belief it was just what these people went ahead and did and i think sometimes they didn't even realize quite how it looked well what was his attraction to might is right might is right was blasphemous when he bought that book i was five years old we had just moved into california street the house was actually white when when we moved into it he painted it black with they didn't have black paint and my father was an artist so he did the best he could to track some, down some black paint there was no such thing so he found some at a surplus store like an army navy type surplus store and he used submarine paint wow so but it's odd too that the people that we bought the house from were black people and the house was originally they say that it belonged to mammy pleasant who was a madam. And that's why it had all, it was a speakeasy and there was prostitution in the house. And it had all these trap doors and it, it had ladders that went from the very bottom, the basement where there was a bar and went all the way up to the attic in the top, I guess, so people could go and escape. There was talk of also an underground uh, railroad at the time, but I don't know how far that went. Oh, wow. What a great history. But what was his attraction to it? Just that it was blasphemous? Because it, it, obviously, you know, because you published it, republished it. But I've studied it for 20 it, years. It, it, it's absurd. It's a rant. And for anyone that hasn't read it, which is most everyone, and I don't really recommend people going out and buying it because it is just that. It's 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 just a continuous rant for almost 200 pages, basically saying the same thing over and over again. And it's somebody who who really hated Christianity, hated Judaism, and they didn't. It wasn't anything against the people. It wasn't anti-Semitic. It wasn't. I didn't see anything that was against other races. It was just that it was against religion. 
And I don't, I really don't know why it started with people. I, I think that the people in the, in, when the Church of Satan changed in around the 80s, 90s, and when the counterculture took over, I think those people were looking for new ways of thought. They were looking for anything that was outrageous. They, anything, the serial killers, as you well know. Oh, yeah. All of it was something that was interesting to them. And a lot of them didn't really believe that, but they just had, to them, this was all something new. Whereas when I was living in Holland, they showed these things on television. They showed World War II all the time because they didn't want it to repeat. And I know in, in here, the History Channel, we used to always refer to it as the Hitler Channel because they'd have so much of it. But there was no, and most of these people, if you are to talk to them, they say that they are not Nazis. They are not in any way, neo-Nazis, most of them, they have girlfriends or wives that are Jewish. They have nothing against Jewish people. I think they see it as just they're, they are joking around. I think it's sort but of like course, your, your father you also- You can't joke to someone who's been in the Holocaust. You know, they're, it's right. not a joke. Right. And-, and, and I, oh, Go ahead, excuse me. And these people, of course, and for all very good reason, are offended by it. And the, of course, we don't want to see anything like that happen again. But unfortunately, it is happening again. We don't want history to repeat itself, but it can. And people have to really watch out for that. Well, that's true. That's true. Um... <clears throat> But of course, no, none of us think that it's good that serial killers are good. Well, for me, the, people... for, me well, for, for me as an artist, it's just just a study. So it's like there was a quote from, um, oh boy, it's great, right, Ursula Le Guin. And she talks about how a scientist can study this stuff and come up with something that could be awful. But say, it's just my job. This is what I do. But an artist can't hide. When we study stuff and we go, this is awful we have nowhere to hide. And I would really love that Ursula Gwynn idea because for me, I'm just studying things. I didn't take on any political fucking thing like that. Like I never, I don't have anything like that in my life. I didn't look at the church of Satan as racist when I got involved with it. I didn't see your father as a prejudiced person. I saw it as exactly like libertine freedoms, you know, free, you know, like the cool stuff like that. Um, accepting of people's oddness you know like that's you're odd you know all these cool neat eccentric and i like the idea that you can't nail a satanist to the wall like we could have all these these weird ideas that aren't going to fit into the left or the right or the center it's it's not going to fit we don't fit so i liked all that stuff because i don't i, I related to all i don't fit i don't have a one idea for every single thing i don't have one political solution for every fucking thing in the world you know so that's that's where I related to a lot of that freedom to think outside of all of those boxes that were given to my parents, Democrat, Republic, you know, just these. Uh, 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 uh. So, yeah. so I didn't have a problem for me. It's funny. My life, I went by impulse my whole life. I dropped out of school the day I could turn fuck the day I could. I went on life and I didn't want, I didn't want to take on any study that anyone wanted to give me. I asked, I just went out and interviewed thousands of people. I'm like, how do you do that? what's going on here? Tell me more. So I've lived my life impulsively, you know, to study life. And, and for some reason that is looked at as crazy or, or like I say, like I, uh, because I entertained, a, a, I studied Nazis or I would study serial killers. Somehow I'm, I would promote that. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art or is it just another fashion fan? And what, judo instructor yeah who who my old judo instructor who i discovered is now deceased but 
he said basically the same he would have to get me mad you know we get in there we'd get in our geese and we'd be standing there on the mats and we'd be doing our exercises and everything but i wouldn't really be into it that much until he would start chiding me and saying well you really don't look so good today or something or in some way you know insulting me or saying to get me really pissed off and then i'd fight i love that so and, and with interviews it is like that you have to really you know and i'm gonna i'm gonna please excuse me carla i'm not on my best game but tracking you down and getting you cornered at a special time doesn't it's not a, it, it, it's not doable no, so i, I know it has to be on whim. Like Carla calls, you ready to film? You got three minutes. Huh, I wake up, throw some water on my face. Let's go. <laughs> no, but I knew last night you'd probably fallen asleep or you were busy trying to get your stuff together. No, I, I'm just saying now, I'm, I, it's three in the morning here, but this is like, you know, I'm just saying, I excuse me if I'm not on my game, a little slow. It's just, that's the way it is. Yeah, well, I didn't have enough water to drink, but I, you know, we, we're doing the best we have to do when the moment hits. and. And we haven't been able to get it together till now, just with other things we've had to do. So, and well, with I've me just loving, getting my my Zoom together. I've been loving the part of, uh, that you interpret your your idea of might is right and explaining your father and how it it ties in a lot to all these things I've been telling people for like for like a, a while now. I kept when we landed on the beach after doing this project, I go, "There's something wrong with how we're playing with this book," you know. And and the people around me were encouraging me that way. And I'm like, no, I, you know, I, your father was like, Shane, this is pure dynamite you're putting on the streets, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, it doesn't make sense with the, what you, the, where, where, where my two friends that did the show on this, at least one of them wanted to go with the satanic temple and all that stuff. And so I'm just happy to hear you talk about the idea that your father wasn't a conservative necessarily. He was, he was, he was harsh with law and order but that didn't make him a conservative, you know. And that he was, was very nonpartisan. Like I a mean, Satanist would be, right? Like a Satanist would be. Because you have to study all aspects of every, you have to know, you have to observe. And you have, study is the most important thing. That's it. You can't it. take things at face value. Right, right. That's all I consider Satanism is like this constant thing of study, like wondrous. It's like for me, I get it's I'm an artist. I, I interpret Satanism through artwork. So it's all about wonder. And I don't know what's going on. You know, just being like a child. I love it. Yeah. It's all new to me at that point, you know. Yeah. And what is it? Art imitates life or Yeah, right, right. That's how I've all, you know, so I just I just love I love getting in that that moment, that mind, that whatever satanic mind, I, you know, whatever artist mind, like just going and wondering and reading and going down wormholes of education and 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 not stopping no matter what anyone you know just going like that's what i thought back in the day when we were doing serial killers and not you not, not but but the group the aesthetic terrorism art movement that i was a part of that was a large group of satanists no well, we all enjoyed that but in the 80s when was like, it the 80s the 90s right when? it was taboo it was taboo yeah, study because it was something that had never been brought before the public when i was a little girl i used to go to the bookstores of my father he was an avid reader he bought every book that that interested him. He spent so much time in the bookstores. And when I would come home from school, he would take me in the car and we would go downtown when he used to be able to park downtown, like right in front of the bookstore, like on Powell Street. And uh, he would go in and he would spend hours in there. And I would watch a little kid gonna do in a bookstore, you know, there are only so many books, but I did find some interesting ones, but, he would buy so many and he would bring them home and there'd be piles of books. He would read all of them. And as a little kid, I'd be interested. Of course, I'd be looking at them too. But I would also look at, they sold this one bookstore, Tro Harper's, they sold these cards of criminals. And they they were like their, uh, would, would you call them like their ID cards? But these were really ancient criminals. These were people that did holdups, bank robberies, whatever. Well, I remember. These, Mm -hmm. I remember the card set that were like uh, green, uh, collector cards. These like were like, like just on paper. Cards. You like, would like, buy them like a greeting card. Okay, they okay. They worked in sets. 
but they were so interesting because they'd have the the name, the age, the height, the weight, what crime the person had committed. But they were similar to like the old real estate cards because before they had multiple listing and and they I mean it was multiple listing in real estate, but they used to have these cards that all the realtors would get. And it would say that it'd have a photograph on the front of the house and on the back, it would have all the information about the house. That's exactly how these cards were about the criminals. And these were just fascinating to me as a little kid. So that is much of what I did when my father was in the bookstore looking at and buying all these books. And so that was just so interesting to me. And I think that's how it was. You know, when, when we all got older, we saw the like bubblegum cards, but they were of these convicted criminals. It was like, wow, this has never been done before. This is this is really interesting. Right. So it, it didn't mean that we agreed. We didn't it didn't mean that we thought people should be criminals. It didn't mean we thought people should be bank robbers. We were just fascinated because this was something that we didn't see. It wasn't a part of our lives, even though there are people that's what they do for a living. They're bank robbers or whatever. Yeah, but I, I also think we see we see something. We can see something humorous in a serial killer. We can laugh at Charles Manson because he's goopy or or Gacy in clown makeup. It is weird. So you you know. But with Charles Manson, that was another story because he wasn't actually even out killing people. And right. there are so many stories that I hear in uh, in these San Francisco papers saying, oh, that was the undermining of the Church of Satan. It was like the end because of Charles Manson. It's like, well, no, Charles Manson, not all that happened in L.A. anyway. These people were out on Hate Street and it had nothing to do with us. They were everywhere. And when the people that were a part of the Manson group came to our house, they were not yet a part of the Manson group. And I did meet one of them later, Bobby Boussole. And he was, when Kenneth Anger was moving some stuff when he lived at the Russian embassy, I believe, he was moving out of there and Bobby Boussole was helping him move and he had a van and Bobby Boussole uh, came up to me out in front of the house and he was this very handsome man and you could see why women were attracted to him. I, I was maybe 16 years old, but he was a good looking guy and he was very nice. And he was offering these gifts to me here, you know, Ken wanted you to have this. And so I, he, he was a wonderful guy just to talk to. He, and it turned out he was a musician and he was working on the film with Ken. But, you know, of course he's been in prison for a long time for one of the murders. But these were the people that were out in the streets. I'm not saying the streets were a safe place. Hate Street was not safe. I came across the, lots of situations that were pretty scary. And you had to really be careful in those days. So you know, all these people came to my father's Friday night groups. He gave talks on all kinds of subjects. And people from all over came. But there were a lot of celebrities that came. Uh, the people that were that later were involved in the mansion, they, they didn't even come to those particular things. It just so happened that one of them was in one of the photo shoots. And and so people take that and they say, oh, well, that was like the fall. Well, there was no fall. Things were going just the same as they were before. There was just an and my father stopped doing the Friday night things and having parties in the house because people were like monkeys and they were ruining things, sitting on things, breaking things. So, you know, why open your house to the public? So that became a thing of the past. But it had nothing to do with the Mansons. It had nothing to do with anything going on, other anything else in the city. Well, for me, I I, I have I, I spent a lot of my childhood at summer vacations at the family funeral home. So I have a morbid sense of humor. And I, my ex-father, my father-in-law was a fireman. He had a morbid sense of humor. So a lot of times, you, you know, we talk to cops or people, just you can laugh at things that not everyone's going to laugh at, you know? You yeah, I, I did. I, I think that a lot of people, until you actually face death it, right. with people in your own family and the sorrow and the grief that you feel, I think a lot of people are immune to that when they're young. As you get older, it happens to all of us. You lose people, you lose your pets, right. you lose people important to you. And then it's not so easy to- oh, God. So true. You know, th that's so funny. What you, what you, so, so true what you're saying. Someone asked me 
like a few years ago, what happened? Where did I change? What happened where I was like, I want the world to burn. I want everyone, you know, rival violence, kill everyone, burn the place down. And he's like, what happened? I go, well, that was childish. It was ignorance. Because the minute people, I- was, Young people don't understand death. Right, but the minute I, the internet opened me up to so much because all of a sudden I saw a live video stream of Palestinians being trapped under rubble and screaming and, and just whole- levels of screams and i was like i can't take this this is that's real violence that's really what i'm wishing no i'm not actually i don't wish that upon anyone so when i heard those blood curdling screams from a lot of people at once babe all this i was like oh yeah that's too real i don't i was you know and so that like you're saying i just grew out of the reality of that and i've seen people hurt and i've seen all that stuff so it's just like yeah the the, the, the fantasy is different than the reality yeah, kids don't really understand death, and it sort of protects them in a way. The very first person that I ever knew that died was Jane Mansfield. Really? She would come to our house when she was in town. When I would be taught, I was a teenager, so I was talking on the phone, of course, a lot. And my whole social life after school was talking on the phone. I had to be home after school to answer the phone calls about my father's talks and about the church and everything so i was the one manning the phones and i would Daddy's leave phone calls would come, i would talk to my friends sometimes and phone calls would come in and they'd always be person to person phone calls from jane mansfield this is jane mansfield calling and in person to person to antoine <laughs> and so she would be calling uh there were lots of people that would be calling for him but she was the one that mainly did these person-to-person -person phone calls, and it was always like an emergency call. If the line was busy, she would, in those days, if your line was busy, some people even had party lines back if this was a long time ago, you know, you guys wouldn't know about things like party lines, but she would interrupt. So this is an emergency call. And she'd be just somewhere with some prince or king in some foreign country having dinner Oh, you must talk to Antoine. You must meet him. Really? That's yeah. Crazy. Wow. So when you when you experienced that, did you did you? How old were you? I was a young teenager. And so you realized how violent it was and all that, and you you just understood the whole. I guess they ran photos of that in the papers. Is that what I remember? At least looking back. On well, I woke up one morning and I went downstairs and I saw sitting on our tombstone coffee table actually in our purple room there was this headline jane mansfield dead and i thought is this a, like one of those gag newspapers it was uh, it was shocking to me because she had just been in our home and she when she would come she she was very adoring of my father and she would say things to him like he said Oh, my my ex-wife, meaning my mother, people used to say that she was like a miniature Jane Mansfield. And she she said to him, well, why settle for a miniature if you can have the real thing? <laughs> and I, she was pretty funny. But she, there she was. She would leave her gowns at our house. She would leave suitcases full of beautiful beaded gowns and purses with makeup in them and everything. And it was so that when she came back the next time she'd have a, so she could come back so she could get them and use them or whatever. She'd come wow. for the film festivals. So when I read things there, people say, oh, it didn't really happen. Like this was just some sort of put on publicity thing. It's like, no, I was there. It really happened. And I know they made a movie called 66, 67, but of course nobody asked me to be in it. I heard somebody who did see it said that they had a little, um, what, like a talking head on a TV set in the background and that with me talking. But they mostly just talked to people saying, oh, well, what do you think about this? Do you think there was really something? But I was there. I was like the only living person still that was there. My half sister was there, but she was just a toddler. So she doesn't remember anything about it. But, but hey, I was there. I witnessed it. I heard her talk. And she was pretty enamored with my father to the point where it kind of upset other people. But she, yeah, she really adored him. And, and it was, 
it, it was pretty nice that when she came, all these little boys would come and stand out in front of our house, like hoping they'd get a glimpse of her. I don't think that ever happened though. And I don't know how they got word that she might be coming maybe on the news or something. Why do you think people insist on rewriting history like that? Like it's, it's similar to me, like we relate, uh, it's ironic how much we relate on so many, on these weird things, but it's so weird. Why do people, A, why do people, why do you think people feel to rewrite history? And this isn't a question, but it, isn't it good to be in, in a, this day, day and age where you can sit there and inje interject yourself in history and go, no, I was actually the history. These people don't fucking know. You know, that's, this is the cool part about that. But why do you think people feel that? Is it like a mental, like, what's going on there? I, I, well, obviously they have something to be gained by it. And they don't want the person that really was there really knows the truth because that completely destroys the reality that they want to make. Yeah, so they're for their own gain or whatever, you know, their, their own. It's always for their own gain. Because they want to say, act like they were there. These people that were in this movie, I heard that there was a woman even who now lived at Jane Mansfield's house who had a dog that had a haircut like a lion. And she said, oh, this is like Togar, the lion that we had. Like that meant something. That was a, an integral part of the movie. Like that's important. But that was amusing to people. It's just bizarre. They, you know, for me, you know that people would do documentaries like that and not try to get a hold of you and it, the same with myself i've been cut out of documentaries and here's what's frustrated about it some you know like this one i was like hey i don't care like honestly as an artist i don't care that i don't make the cut like but I, as the integrity of a story in the history that i was involved in i care that you don't contact the source and ask me questions like just hear the story and then decide to edit it like, yeah, we don't, that's boring, or we don't care about that. But they don't even contact the fucking source. Like me, like with this a cartoonist, I'm the only other guy in the room. It's just me and him. You'd think they would just ask me, what was your interpret? You know, like for the integrity of art, for the integrity of documenting history, just ask the fucking questions, then cut me out. They don't even knock on the door. That is bizarre. How frustrating. Well, they have their own agenda. And in my case, it's basically because I am no longer, since my father died, I was no longer with the Church of Satan because I was basically with my father and I wanted to do things the way that he wanted them. And they just wanted to do things online, do things, whatever it is that, that they wanted. They had their own thing. And my father was against the grotto system, but there were certain grottos that wanted to continue. So of course that was okay with him, but, the grotto system was giving some people more power than they should have. And they were using that power to tell people what they should read, how they should think. And my father was against that. I think when I, when I, when I look at these kind of idea, we are power struggles or people that want the ring in the, you know, the Lord of the Rings thing. I feel like they're like really insecure people or people like they want to steal accomplishments or, like you say, identity theft, or they're so insecure, they don't have the courage to strike out on their own and do figure out their identity or figure out what it is that they need to be courageous about. Well, they and, think they are. They think it belongs to them. A lot of the people- you? How could you? When, when Adam Parfrey published, uh, republished The Complete Witch as the Satanic Witch, those people from that era thought that they- we're bringing my father back. They had this opinion that without, without them, he was no one, that he was forgotten. But right. I, I remember, obviously, people were still buying the Satanic Bible. My father was still newsworthy. He, he was, was still known. Legend. He was a fucking living legend. It's like when you're a living legend, you're part of history. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. Yeah. But... To, in their minds, everything that they did was a part of accomplishing something else. So I think that's why they they then got the attitude that they did, that it, a, it sort of belonged to them. It's a real youthful attitude. I noticed that amongst younger, uh, younger people. I see that like, and I did it too. I, it just reminds me of what I used to do. I'm not saying I'm different than them, but I used to do the same thing to my elders, like, convince myself that I was the cool person in there, even though they were the teacher and I'm really absorbing the mentor I'm taking from the mentor. That's what the, 
protege does. They take. Yeah. Well, they co-opted and they all think they can do it better. So they try to rewrite the books. They have all done that. Michael Aquino, who split from my father, saying my father was selling degrees. My father never sold degrees. We did have a different system then. And people would pay money, like $20 to take a test. And they would prove what they had read in the Satanic Bible or my father's other books. And they would write a little ritual or something to prove basically they read the book and then they could have their degree along. But that wasn't really selling degrees. Whereas then Michael Aquino left on that prem, that was his premise. And then he started the, the Temple of Set, which I don't consider them to be Satanists, they're Setians. So there are so many other groups out there and they say, they, they, they sort of, the, the media will, sort of glom them all as Satanists, but they have different views. They're looking at things differently and they have their own ways of doing things. But I think most of those people are fans of Aunt Tom of A's, fans of my father's, but their philosophies are not exactly the same. But when I was growing up and when all of this started, there was only one Satanism. It was Satanism. It was what was in the Satanic Bible. And then now they have all kinds of other kind, types of Satanism. But when I have always done media in the past, when my father was alive, it was like, these other people, these are not Satanists. These are all basic Christ, other Christian sort of sects. Right. These are not, not what my father wrote as Satanists. These people have their own, their own religious views, but it is not following Satanism as in the Satanic Bible. So when there are these groups that have been in the media as far as being the anti-Semites and the Aryans, these are not Satanists. These are groups when we had the 600 Club, and I still have the 600 Club. If anybody goes to 600club.com, I still have 600 Club under myfirstsatanicchurch.com. But they had a hard time because these people would come on into the meeting rooms and they would have all kinds of stuff to say, but it wasn't in allegiance with our feelings and they would have to throw them off constantly. Uh, the Order of the Nine Angles, I believe, which I have said in interviews way back in the past, these are not Satanists. This has nothing to do with Satanism, but they've co-opted it. They've co-opted the symbolism. But they are not Satanists, as far as I'm concerned, as far as my philosophy goes. But as far as I'm concerned, none of these other groups are truly Satanists. Because now even the Church of Satan, they do not consider themselves the same as I have always thought, because Satanism has always been that not that you are are you do not believe in any God at all. We are how we describe it is differently. Nature is God. But if you believe in any God at all, then you are agnostic. So we really consider ourselves to be agnostics. Oh, that's great. You fucking said that. I say that all the time. People say, you say I, I say, I'm only a Satanist if you're a Christian, really. I'm an agnostic in the Carl Sagan sense of the world. Like, how yeah. the fuck do we even know what's going on in this universe? It's insane. It's yeah, crazy. and it changes with science, and and we are totally for whatever science says. And and talking about the Might Is Right book, that was all about Darwinism, and Darwinism was great for then, for 1910. But now science has come up with other things, and we know that Darwinism, as as how it was originally written, is not completely correct. So we have to go with that. Whatever science says, that's what we are for. And that's Satan. We are not atheists. If we were atheists, we wouldn't believe in anything. But I, I believe there, there really are, even though some people will, will differ with me, I really feel there are no atheists in foxholes. Because I think that it's just a natural self-preservation that people feel that maybe there's something that can save me when they come and the end is near and there might be some hope. You know, are, if there's we, anything out there that can save me. We are always looking for mama's hug. That's yeah. true. We're always looking for that hug to save us, to catch us from the fall. Yeah. 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 Boy, that's great what you just said. That's great. Oh boy. I'm sorry I'm taking it in. <laughs> it was great. 
Okay, I if you wanted to go back and say, because I, I am interested, you know, we were talking, and I don't know if you got that where I said the thing, and I didn't, I didn't want to be naming names as far as when, when we would do press, when, when the media, when TV stations would ask for somebody for various shows. There were people that went on shows on their own accord, and it was not because my father asked them to. And those are a lot of the people that went on saying that they were a part of my father's organization. And, and they were friends, but they were not really qualified to speak on behalf of, of the organization or my father, but they did anyway. And they made us look like Nazi sympathizers or, or Aryans, and we are, we're not anything like that. So my father would see that and he would not be pleased about it at all, even though these people thought for their own reasons, they thought that they were doing him a favor, that this was helping him, but my father didn't see it that way at all. So, so then I would go on shows after he would ask me to do show. I, I never did a show that he never asked me to do. And he'd often have some reason why he would want me to do it. And maybe sometime it was, it, it would be to make up for something that had been done in the past to quite try to qualify something and to show that that was not what we were all about I, I mean, at all. I love this because I'm right. I told people, I've been telling people and they argue with me. I, I, I know it, I know it. And it just comes down to, like I say, your father was like like a, a, a fry cook. So it's like, in, it's hard to go from that to a fucking hater. It, it really is from when, when you're working class like that. Do you remember anything from your childhood, like politically that triggered out your father? Like, you know, like I, I'm watching my old man or you, they're watching TV and something happens big in the news and they freak out. And, you know, you remember anything like that? Like any big news that happened in your life that you really your father was into? Was he into the news? Was he into politics? No, not, not really very much. As a matter of fact, he, he tried to keep away from it because he saw a lot of it as just being depressing and it didn't really matter you know what you thought because it really wasn't going to change things all that much he had his own way of changing things and that was as i have said his own way of changing things was in 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 the religious arena more than political and he really felt that history repeated itself but he he was of course adamant that it was important that history not repeat itself. So it was important that people learn all about history just so that they would know and recognize that. But there were other things. And, and I grew up feeling like sort of a, a Ralph Nader sort of person for the, the common people that I remember one time we were in the Safeway, the supermarket, and he was like, there was a, a glass jar of mashed potatoes and he said, hey, you like this stuff having to do with food. And he said, look at this jar of mashed potatoes. It says, this is five servings. He said, this does not serve five people. This is like five rat portions. Hey, we had a rat and the rat would come and sit in this big snake we had in the middle of the table. And we would serve him. We'd serve Orwell a rat portion. And it's <laughs> like, this is not for a family. This is wrong. They shouldn't say this because there could be some poor, poor family who buys this this bottle of, of mashed potatoes, like sort of like it wasn't Orida because that came in a box, but this was something else and it was in a bottle. And that is just wrong. They should not do that to people. So I think I always grew up with that, that thing where you have to be fair. You cannot, you can't tell people that this is something that it's not. Yeah, and I, I read somewhere else where your father defines what's stupid when he says, I hate, we hate stupid people. He defines it, and what we would say today is, because he gives dispensation for ignorant people. If you're ignorant, that's one thing, you can fix that. But when you're stupid, that's, that's and what, he's, what, I, what I interpret as willfully ignorant, like people who, yeah. who are just, well, they I know think, about Yeah, he said something like, well, ignorance was a crime. Right, no, it's stupidity. 
He says, yeah, ignorance yeah, is okay. stu- that's, I'm sorry. Yeah, stu- stupidity was a crime. And yeah. when I saw that dispensation for ignorance, I was like, exactly. Yeah. You have to have that in Satan. We have to go because we learn. So we're always ignorant yeah. of something. Of yeah, something. because anybody can be ignorant. But once you find out, well, then if you find out and you know, then that's stupidity. It's- that's how I feel about this when I'm doing here with the show. I'm trying to put the bottle on things because that was ignorance. And, and then as I see it growing so big, it's lasted 20 years. I'm like, that was fucking one day in my life. I don't live like that. And so it's like, yeah, you know, put the, I, I, I was ignorant back then. I want to tell people I've, 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 I've learned a lot in 20 fucking years. Let me tell you something, kids. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to have you on here explaining it as well. These are things that I stumbled upon on my own and I'm glad to hear it from the source. You know, a lot of this stuff, because I've been, uh, you know, you know, well, I've been panicked about how I see things moving and spreading and, and growing in, in a, direction that's not friendly to artists and as an artist i am uh i think that would be obvious i would not be for fascism or people controlling what i do i'm an artist and i always saw your father as an artist a really you know like you said he found a way to change things on his own he didn't listen to the news he just and don't we need to bring satanism back to taxing the churches don't we need to start yeah, that was another thing he was always against because he felt that religions are just like any other business. Right. Why they be taxed. He paid taxes. He always paid his taxes. Right. And, and that's why I say, like, if we're going to talk Satanism, let's talk about the one of the original goals that I've read about, which is like tax the church, tax the church. I think that could really catch on in a partisan way today. Like, you know, I really do. And that's that's a levee thing. Like so, it's like boom. Let's drop that down right now. People would buy that motherfucker. Yeah, and and everybody's aware of how much wealth the Catholic Church has. Yeah. So if if they were to sell even a fraction of that wealth, they could feed the entire world for. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I love about your dad too. Like he's like, yeah, religion's a racket. He says it. He tells people it's a racket. So how are you doing? I'm the Church of Satan and Satan. <laughs> yeah. I can love it. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no this. Uh, yeah, we're the satanic temple, and we're going to save you from abortion problems. There's none of that. There's yeah, and, and people have the misconception that satanic temple has anything to do with Satanism too. And, and people say, oh well, but that's just a a thing having to do with politics and law. But it's like, but no, they're not doing us any favors. It really has nothing to do with Satanism. They put up their flags, they put up their statue, but they make money off of that. And they put targets on us, as I see it. It's like, I don't need to be told I'm running this. Po- as a Satanist, we don't need, I don't need to be nailed to the wall. I, yeah. I like not being nailed to the wall. I fucking like that life. Don't nail me to the wall saying I'm this or that. Like, just let, let it be a mystery. That's what kills, kills it for me. Right. Yeah. Like, I, I like people to guess about what I'm doing. Not, oh, of course, this guy's this kind of, Fuck that. Well, most of them don't have any concept of what real Satanism is about. Oh, no. They think because it's, they all have, like, I think you, you've said it more than once. It's like they have the Christian concept of way Satanism. So, so Satanism is a, a reason to break the law. Satanism is a reason yeah. to not pay attention to the rules or the actual book or the authority of what this is. Well, I'll just, I'll call it jibbery jab. You know, they just, whatever. It's like, they, oh, they just apply, ah, whatever. Yeah, and that's something that we haven't really hit on is what exactly is Satanism? What is it about? We always talk about what it isn't about. So I think a lot of people don't really understand the concepts at all. They think that Satanism is the opposite of Christianity, that it means doing evil, that it means doing bad things, that it means doing illegal things. No, it's completely the opposite of that. For, for, for me, for me, how I would answer that is it's like impulsive learning. It's like, I want to know more. It's like child, it's like an artist. It's like this child, like, I want to know more. I want to do that. I want to eat that. And then you yeah. have this reason, you have balance. You're like, well, if I do eat that, I'm going to, it's going to go right to my thighs. You know, yeah. it's, that's all it is. It's, it's appreciating that impulse. Yeah. Well, Satan was used obviously by the Christian church by, it's always been you, Satan and the devil have always been names used for being whatever it is that's bad as a scapegoat. Not right. that people, oh, people are responsible for their wrongdoings, not some devil. It's you, you're responsible for yourself. If there is even, is too, there's not too many wrongdoings, but those are all created. Like all these wrongdoings are created. It's like that, impu- like I say, that's impulsive. Like your sexuality is impulsive. And then they say you have free will. 
free will to what repress my my impulse to be mm -hmm. have desire or joy mm -hmm. makes no sense to me yeah. that's where i fall out of it and then and it just is like something that is uh, a tool to go to into my subconscious deeply it's almost like i me see modern psychiatry because i go to get to go see a psychiatrist and a therapist i see that as very satanic like mm -hmm. how, how to understand what 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 you, you know control your mo moods oh that's science you have boundaries you know that's medicine right right exactly but it's these but they study the mind and so they're like the top they're, they're just constantly studying the mind mm -hmm. so you know <laughs> it's like a wild top tier of satanism to me psychiatry is like we're studying studying we're studying the mind and how it studies it's just great so I'm a big therapy fan. It's helped me out a lot. Well, it's good for some people. Yeah. It helps. It doesn't hurt. Don't it does not hurt. It does not hurt. It's bizarre, but but it's good for me. That's right. Yeah, I, I was thinking about an article that was written about my father that that really annoyed me. It was in Rolling Stone magazine. And they the writer spent all this time with me and my father. And then he wrote this article and he went down to Los Angeles and he met my half sister and she was referring to, she was very angry at my father and she was referring to him as her unfather. And, and he wrote basically all about that. He didn't write anything about my father really. He, I showed him that marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what... So, I... Sh okay. I showed this writer all kinds of documentation of things, all kinds of previous articles, and, and talked to him, I mean, on a daily basis. Well, this is from the Rolling Stone article. Yes, and, about. And, and what does he do? But he comes up with this article that doesn't talk about anything except, well, half of the article is how my sister hates my father. Now, of course, this was disturbing to me after having spent so much time with this writer. And... And I know having lived with my father, as I probably mentioned before, he was 21 years old when I was born. I had very young parents. A lot of kids were envious about this when I was growing up. But but my father would take me to the circus and people would, we'd go to the sort of backstage area and people would come up to him and they'd all be saying, hi, how you doing? And And they'd meet me. And they'd say, oh, she's taking piano lessons. And they would say, oh, well, you study, you practice real hard. And when you get, you know, bigger, maybe you can play like your daddy. And I was really, yeah, I, I was always admired my father's musical ability because he really was when it came, especially when it came to music, he was, uh, he was very gifted since he was very young. And I, the first instrument that he played was a harp when his mother took him into a music store. And he was born being able to play by ear and very talented like that. And uh, so I found out later from other musicians the thing that he the things that he could do, like he could transpose a song just by you, you he'd look at a song, he'd look at the music and even saying he didn't even know, or he'd be with a singer, a dancer, and helping them with their act or whatever. And he said, okay, well, then you need this in the key of whatever. And so he said, okay. And he said, let me think a minute. And he'd get it, and he'd play it. And then I thought, well, that is not something that people do easily. You know, this, this does not come naturally to the majority of musicians. So this was a very special talent that he had, you know, among many other. He could play many musical instruments, any musical instrument, even if he'd never played it before. And I just, you know, you've probably known people, maybe you're like that. It, there are people like that out there, but he was very, very special when it came to music. I am and, like that. I, actually, I could pretty much learn pretty much anything pretty quick, pretty fucking yeah. quick. But 
there were so many things that, that then they wrote and they said, oh, our fact checkers, they checked and this is not, that we didn't find this. Well, there's all kinds of things that fact checking doesn't have. I, I, I mean, they said, oh, things, and I don't know if it was specifically that, but I know there was the, th there have been stories about Rosemary's baby. Now, most of this is, now, Michael Aquino was, uh, I suppose he became my father's arch enemy because he did everything to write bad things about my father. He was in the military and their slogan was, and I got to know him quite well, was win with words. He was in army psyops. And he did everything that he could then when he left to put down my father in every way. And so the media got hold of all kinds of things from him. And so many things were complete, completely wrong. He sent in an article, the San Francisco Bay Guardian, and the man who was our publicist when our father died, he said he talked to them. He, oh, they'll write another article some other time, you know, the, on the truth. But of course, they never did. So that crap is still out there. I mean, it's just fact after fact that it's just plain wrong. So, See? and then they use these, then they, uh, other places, then online, they copy this and they say, Oh, well, our fact checkers, our fact checkers, what are their fact checkers? They're checking, checking other wrong facts. So this, of course, is very, you know, this is pretty disgusting to me, but I'm sure there are plenty of people that have been written about in the media that would probably be very sympathetic to what I'm talking about because they probably have had the same thing. Yeah, they, you know what? I think Satanists are held to a really high fucking standard in a Christian world with uh, in God we trust on our money. You, you presented to a media person, no matter how liberal or how atheist or how agnostic they are, you're right away someone that's lying to them and someone they can lie to. They don't normally lie, of course. They're very good. And, and, but they get a nice sadistic kick out of trying to fuck with at least this is my experience, you know, mm -hmm. so I have to be double, triple secret. I, I have to be on my guard on every, you know, just because of that public Satanist stuff. It's, it's yeah. any, whatever. Is, is there something that we need to go over? As I asked you before about the, we were talking about the thing specifically with Boyd Rice and I didn't want to name names, and you said I should, and I said something about, well, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck in reference to him. And we had our, well, a mutual friend who goes under the name of Bonnie Banks, who's an artist, and he's rather prolific now, but he wasn't as well known in, in the early days, but he was a good friend of Boyd's, and, and so was Jim Morton. And these were people that came to visit my father. And let's say we were talking about Boyd Rice and why did my father associate with these people? Right. And that he was just one of many people that my father visited with. And the other people were not in any way, you wouldn't associate them in any way with anti-Semitism or any, anything racial. Well, maybe the question is, or the idea is, why is it that a great deal of Satanists are attracted to what most people would consider dark or taboo subjects or, you know, extremes, <clears throat> such as like fashion, you know, like any, we're attracted to do these items, I'm not saying we're attracted to believing in them, but we're attracted. I think to all them. people are attracted to these things. And you're saying Satanists are held to a higher standard? Maybe that would be it. Maybe they're just picked out more if one does something wrong. What I saw with the aesthetic terrorism movement is, is this idea that you're going to fear us. And it was a lot of nerds that may have been picked on a lot in their life, like myself. And so you see a lot of people like that sporting a Baphomet to scare people away from them. And that's how I saw it when, when, it was, when I was observing it. But then when, I, when we started using it as a tool in art, 
it was to terrorizer. It was to scare people. And it was to scare the status quo and not just people surrounding us. But it was to scare the establishment, you know, much like the Black Panthers did with shotguns, you know, walking down the street. It was the same concept. Well, the symbolism has definitely been co-opted for many groups. Right. With Satanism, when we started doing that, when I look back on it, the difference between the hippies and the Black Panthers is that there was nothing attached to our anger. There was no political thing attached to our anger. It was just like hate or just like anger, you know, fear. But there wasn't this Black Panther, like there wasn't this cool, like we weren't going, we're going to make you afraid until you pay your taxes church there wasn't th anything there and it was this confusion are we greedy are we you know what is this are we violent and so it was that 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 fear uh became powerful in satanism and i think in your dad's day it was that fear was still pan it was still ooh, it's sexy it was still devilish but then it grew into this you know something razor sharp with Boyd Rice and and myself and other people, we had we had a different a different thing, and so I you know you know angry. Maybe that you know we were talking before about the beginnings of things, and I don't, when I started giving talks at universities, the the main reason why that happened was because of the Exorcist, and that's what really started Satanic Panic, and that was in the early seventies. When well, one of the first articles came out in Time magazine about Satanism, there were also articles about various Christian groups. Um, I guess that's when uh, born again Christians were becoming big in the news as well. For, for, so the the exorcist had people terrified. Right. People were believing that. And I went to all these college campuses uh, where people were really in fear of all these things, like that was really going to happen to them. Okay. So, I mean, that people think satanic panic didn't become, didn't start until later, but that's when it started. Well, we weaponized, I know when the satanic panic happened, it was, there was something going on there, but we weaponized that. We were like, okay, we're going to cause panic with Satanism. We're going to, you know. See, we, when, when, and we were trying to put an end to that. But we see, but see, that's why I, I see Satanism much as art. It's like an art movement. It's like water where it can't be. Def so we were a reflection of our time. It wasn't like, it was like, and I, this is how I explain, like hippies jumped me in. So I was friends with all these hippies, like John Sinclair, John Lennon wrote a song about them. These were all my mentors, but they kept talking about peace and love. And I would argue with them. I'm like, you have done nothing for us. We're fucking drowning in debt. We're fucking awful. All your riots sucked. We need worse riots. We need better riots. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you wanted peace and love. We want hate and violence. And that's exactly what summed up the aesthetic terrorism movement. We wanted change and peace and love wasn't doing it. It wasn't giving us dental insurance. It wasn't helping out with bills, you know, poverty. So that's how I saw this. You know, my father was a union member, he was working class. So I saw this as an extension of like Teamsters. Might is right was these Teamsters standing there with ball bats around the grocery store. You're not going to get your groceries until we get a raise. We drive the trucks. And, and so that's how I saw it because that's where I came from as a child. You know, I saw these, my father supporting unions and what was violence. Yeah. Well, we had already been through race wars in Berkeley and so much discrimination. And there were, uh, religion was, People were so puritanical in the 60s, having come out of the 50s, the 40s, World War II. Yeah, yeah, that was that was, and, and that, and I, you can see you, the young, the Gen Z you see now, they're very peaceful. They remind me of the hippies, and it's like our generation was that hate and violence. We we had all this stuff going and. The younger kids are like, it doesn't work that way. You need boundaries. You need self-care. You need to drink some water, bro. <laughs> yeah. Which I love all of this. I love self-care, yeah. you know, hydrate. But the bottom line is, and that's why we're here today, and that is to let people know that that my father and the organization that I have now, the First Satanic Church, we do not stand for any kind of anti-Semitism 
Satanism does not equal anti-Semitism. Satanism does not equal white supremacy. And those are the most important things that people have to know. Exactly. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. Um, have do any that is the most important thing, and that's why we are here today, you know. And you know, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm very happy about this, you know. I'm trying to uh, deal with, like I said, all the things I let out of a bottle. And, uh, yeah. And we're also against any kind of mass killings and violence. Yeah. Right. Right. Is it, it? That's why I I was said somewhere like it. Uh, violence or that kind of stuff might or hurting someone might be okay but it's a very personal thing someone walks in your house stuff like that and people take it out of context with satanism and think oh that means it's okay to hurt anyone no it's just like a per it has to have reason someone's aggressing they're gonna get fucked up maybe <laughs> yeah well that's there we go to the law of the jungle <laughs> yeah right yeah anything else what 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 is the what what else would be uh misunderstood about your father i'm sure lots of things it just you know you have to bring them to my attention well, just what, when the, what what just comes to your mind like just boom this something weird like you know i don't know if you got nothing well, else. Uh, there are there are some things the things that i have seen on the internet recently like saying that on his deathbed that he uh said that he would be a christian or something and that's completely insane my father didn't even have a deathbed you know he he just kind of had this attack and died and he had his whole life before that and there was never any talk about turning into a christian or any other religion his beliefs remained the same until he died and there was never anything that said that he was going to go back and be with the Zena's mother I and mean, that would be absurd because she would have done anything to kill him she basically is the reason why we lost the black house because she kept insisting on suing him and taking everything and our attorneys said that they had never seen a greedier woman in all their in all their practice of of law so and when he was in the hospital she was sending letters to the judges saying he was a hypochondriac when he was in the hospital dying. What is the deal with satanic dudes getting hooked up with these very toxic women? What are we, what are we, what's going on with us? Well, analyze I guess they me. weren't always analyze me, mommy, mommy, analyze me. <laughs> I, I don't think they were maybe always toxic. Not well, maybe they were. It, it, that's she was a home wrecker besides so you know i really shouldn't be standing up for her you know yeah i know your father said when he's looking over my my the person i brought with my ex my ex he's like so we all have the same kind of we, we basically have the same the same woman we all have you coop he named all of these people that visited and it was the same exact archetype of a satanic woman i guess blonde hair you know all this weird shit Probably because at the beginning, they are these sweet Gwendolyn types that seem so innocent, and so pure, and they could never, never do anything like this. And in this case, my father used to talk about this woman as being like in the movie Pretty Poison, where this, this, if any, it was with Tuesday Weld, and she was a really, really pretty girl. And she got her boyfriend to kill her parents for her <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> we, I, you know it's just because we fall for the 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 the, the feminine wiles is it is it you know this this well i'm a blonde now i used to be brunette my whole life but you know that's what life does to us at a certain point you know what's wild about <laughs> you you don't change you well don't. i do <laughs> Every, every, uh, you're just beautiful and young in all the photos. You don't oh, change. flattery, flattery. You don't change. No, I'm not. I'm <laughs> no, but yeah, I think most people would agree. Be like, oh, they'll look and go, what the hell's going on? Well, I guess I have to stay in pretty good shape if I'm going to continue to defend the devil, huh? 
Right. And, and, you know, let's face Someone it. has to do it. <laughs> and maybe you have a good, maybe we, you know, there's something going on here in the agnostic part of Satanism. Let's say someone's looking out for us. We've got a young look. I look very young for my age. Let's face it. Yes, you do. How's my hair? <laughs> yeah. What are you, 20? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I do look very young. I know. Anyway. Well, you still have hair. <sighs> it's leaving my body. It's, it's, and it has color. It does. It does. No, you're, it's you're leaving though. gray, but you've got a lot on your scalp. <laughs> Have I ever shown you? Let me, let me, hold on, Carl. I got something for you here. Wait till you see this. Oh, wait a minute. oh I have something, you know, that reminds me. Oh, I don't have it, but I have a I jar. I have more to say. Do you know what I, you know what I do, Carla? I save my hair in a jar. I have a huge jar of my hair from like 10 years. Oh, I had some from when I was a little kid. I had so much hair and they would have to thin it. You know, just to make it look like an ordinary person, regular person's hair, so it wasn't just totally out all over the place. But no, I have something to say. Right. I always have something to say. But I'm listening. But this is something that people don't really think about, and that is that my father started the shaven head look. You know, when he did it in 1966, the only two people that had shaven heads were Telly Savalas and Mr. Clean, and uh, and. Oh, there was one other actor, uh, Neil Brenner. But he had blonde hair and blue eyes. Really? And Telly Savalas was on a TV show and he had sucker, he'd lick on a sucker and he'd say, who loves you, baby? Do you remember that TV show? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But they were the only ones. But your dad and, had the book. And now the book there are all these sports stars and so many people that when they get to the point where they're having a little bit of a bald spot they just shave their whole head and then when they have the goatee well then they really got the levee look so yeah. he really started something with that and i remember i took him for a ride when when his health started failing and so i would just drive him we go out for rides out to the beach or whatever so I remember once we were driving we went down to the castro and it's mostly a gay area and there were all these guys and they had their bald heads and their goatees. And he looked at you so like they all look like me. And it's like, yeah, it's like, but that became a style. But when he did it, it was really shocking. When I got out of bed one morning, I was, you know, getting ready to go to school and I go and I look in, in my father's bedroom and I see him and he has no hair. And before this, he had this black curly hair. Everybody loved his hair. And then one day it's like gone. And not only is it gone, but the scalp looked kind of white because when people <laughs> shave their heads and it's not, you know, what have you done to yourself? Where'd your beautiful hair go? Well, this was the new look. And that's when he shaved his head and said, okay, and this is, you know, now I have the church of Satan. All right. <laughs> now I have the church of Satan. But I really miss your hair. You know, so, now I have now I have the Church of Satan. That's what I got. I had the shingle. Yeah. On my head. <laughs> yeah. So so that worked pretty well for him, and so then he got known for that look. But I, oh. and people forget about that now. So all these people, and I'm sure plenty of these Christian people going around with their bald heads and their goatees and they don't have a clue he started that look oh my goodness but they I, I, that's the Lovey family has had such an influence on american all globally but especially american culture it's incredible disney characters modeled after your father after his 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 time you know you can see it you can clearly see some of these characters you know with the there's a special i have a doll of one of them and it's just looks just like your father. I mean, I stood there with your father. It looks just like him. And it's a Disney character. So it's like you, the LeVays have had such an immense, I tell people all the time, you guys remind me of like goth hippies, people like they're fascist, all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, they're more like fucking hippies that just were in a dark shit. Like, yeah. like, and, and, and they're, they're just cool people. And the, someone will argue me. I go, you, you know how modest they are, how humble they are based on their influence. Like their influence is incredible yeah. in, in our culture. Yet they're just like, yeah, cool. Let's go get a burrito or whatever. What you know, you're cool people. That's it. Well, thank you. When I thank you, I, thank you I, for I was... being so generous and sharing and 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 trying to help humanity out and, and and giving so much of your time and life force into this concept. People don't really appreciate that because we understand how limited our fucking deals are. You know, 
And we give so much for this, and you do. So I pre thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we I think we all do whatever we can. Yeah, yeah. So you know, what can you do? I have fun. I have fun causing trouble, and I have fun doing this. It's better than punching. You know, doing just living life and buying things and participating in this nonsensical system. So what are you going to do as far as editing this? And I have so much in one room and so much in another room. And I have uh, no idea until I look at it. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna stop recording now. I'll stop. And well, I, we're not really saying much for this. Cool. Needing we'll to be recorded at this point. Well, at least as far as it, because our you know our whole thing was to be talking about might is right. Okay, I'm gonna edit it the way I like. I'm gonna look at things. I'm gonna I'm gonna look at it over. I think what I think is you've said most of it in this room. You've reset it all and better, not better, but different, but it's all been part. I'm going to have to look at it. I have to look at it and then I'll send you stuff. Cause what was that? You said you got me on a roll right before we got disconnected. Yeah, it was great. And you were like, Phew. so how I would use it is just different parts. Like I would play one part. I wouldn't put it all together maybe at this time for the, it's a live 24 hour broadcast. So I might play one chunk and say, you know, we'll play another one later. Just like you call back and leave it like that. Oh, just leave it in pieces. I see. So it doesn't have to be in the same room. If it's within a 24 hour thing, right? Exactly. So what else are you doing for the 24 hours? Well, I'm going to come out and talk about, you know, I, I, I'm going to give an actual apology. Like I'm going to say, you know, I, I apologize for that stuff. I was ignorant and I, I know better, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate that that's floating around like that. It was a day in my life. And I also would encourage everyone to make those mistakes as a young person. You should go out there and fucking do something and go, oh my God. And 10 years later, look back on it and also say, yeah, that was fucked up. But you should, I don't have a problem with what I did. You know, but I do have a problem with what I did, what I said, you know, I, but me trying it, that's what everyone should do. Mm -hmm. That's what I say. Yeah, well, it has caused you a lot of grief. Yes and no. I think I think a lot of my grief comes from my class issues and people seeing me as low-hanging fruit. And so often, because I'm a poor person, I was born in a trailer in Lubbock, Texas, that people, I'll be, and I'm a kind person, I'm a cool guy. So people will look at that like it's weak or something else and I have to smash them in the fucking jaw and then they leave me alone. But it's, you know, I'm, I, you know, I have to do something in, that's the only way they understand, you know, cause I'm trying to be reasonable and peaceful and cool. But yeah, it had, my life as an artist caused me trouble. It's not like Satanism caused me trouble. Anton LaVey caused me trouble. Might is right. Cause I got a whole, I put out the rape issue. I put on Mike Diane. I put out obscene shit. So so that I'm at odds with the system since I was born, I guess. This is just all I've always done. And so I'm, I'm living my best life, actually. And, and this is just what I was meant to do. You know, I don't feel like I made a mistake. You know, I feel like I live impulsively. And I, this is just what I do. And I feel lucky to be doing that because I think a lot of people that don't live impulsively become addicts or alcoholics or they have other issues. I don't have those issues. I have a cool life. I have a really cool life, actually. It, you know, especially people that were born in my family or, you know, total white trash, total mm -hmm. trash. And I feel bad for that. But a lot of people say, oh, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And I'd be like, I'm the first person in my family to willingly read books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> So I did good, you know, and, and, and I'm, I, I, I think life would cause me trouble. I think if I were working as a truck driver, I'd be a Teamster Union person. I'd be fighting. I'm a fighter. That's it. Heart Warrior Chosa, uh, a Native American, she studied under Isaac Bonowitz, taught Isaac Bonowitz a lot of what he carried forward into the pagan belief. She was one of my mentors as well. And she would say- Isaac Bonowitz tried to hit on me when I was a teenager. Oh God, underage? Yeah. I bet he's a fucking weirdo. He was a creep. Yeah, I had, I've been, I've talked to him, <laughs> but I, I studied under one of his teachers. Same as like, your father was cool. I, I got, so heart where I lived with. Yeah, you know, what, he, what is it? He actually, he got a degree from Berkeley and something. I don't remember that. 
I just know that I interviewed him once, but I know Heart Warrior would tell me, Shane, you're a real warrior. Like you're natural. You fight. That's what you do. There's not many white warriors like you. Like you just always fighting. Mm. And she's like, it's, it's just what you do. <laughs> so I, I, you know. The, yeah, there was something, you know, I, I never. My ignorance caused me grief, Carla. That's what causes me grief. My ignorance. Yeah. Well, everybody, I think. But there was something that I didn't mention in, in all the discussion that we did. It, there were a couple of things. It, it was about my father. I was just realizing that my father was not into drugs at all, never was. He was not an alcoholic. He wasn't a drinker. He might have one drink, maybe two drinks. Um, people would buy him drinks when he worked playing organ in the bar. But he really wasn't a drinker. I, I never saw him get drunk. And he didn't um, he didn't have vices. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. And and in the article in the Rolling Stone, the, the writer kind of put him down, like acting like, well, here's this man that professes living life to the fullest and and having fun and all of this, but he doesn't have any vices and i thought well that's kind of what kind of crap is that <laughs> because i was thinking about when i came to chicago and one of your friends drove me to your event chris was his name and we were talking about one of the things that can really like get you high is a good conversation and I thought that was really pathetic that the writer from Rolling Stone wrote that. That I mean, here was my father. He had a heart condition. He wasn't supposed to be drinking. He would have one drink with his dinner when he'd go out to to a restaurant, whatever. But he wasn't a drunk or anything. Does that mean he wasn't having fun? He wasn't enjoying his life. He loved playing his music. He loved doing art. He loved talking to his family, and he liked just going out and driving around and looking at the sights and going looking yeah. at the water at the beach or the park or whatever he loved reading he loved his, he loved writing these were the things that he enjoyed now what more can a person enjoy in life does a person have to be a drunk a drug addict what i don't understand what this reporter was talking about like because they're not living their life their best life your father was like that is a life is a vice fucking art making art is a vice like that is beautiful he played his fucking organ like you're saying he wrote mm -hmm. he read that's i'm addicted to that life <laughs> no doubt yeah he I loved would... playing music and he loved playing for people if somebody walked in the room he would know the kind of music that they oh. would love and what would move them that's and he true. would play that for them. And they'd be so surprised. He'd say, how do you know? That's like one of my favorite pieces are, of music. You are so funny. That is so true. That happened in my experience with your father. Yeah. And my partner was there. And he's like, where are you from? And she says, Calumet City. He goes, boy, do I got a song for you. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, uh -huh. like almost oh, started crying. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> That's he, what he, he, did. he was talking to me and he was yeah. saying some stuff and he could see that it was glazing over my eyes. He was talking about some shit that I didn't get. And he all of a sudden he snaps into it. He's like, I got an Elvis painting from Gacy from Marilyn mm -hmm. Manson. Like whatever white trash shit was going to touch me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was there when he gave it to him. I actually asked Marilyn Manson to sign it to my father. Did he? Yeah. Nice. That's cool. That's cool. You got so many cool stories. I can't wait. We don't know if it's a real John Wayne Gacy. See, I have to show it to you to be sure. Oh, please do. I will let you know right away. And even if it if could it could be were, a counterfeit. If it were, it'd be almost worth more money. Really? Because it's a counterfeit given to Anton LeVay from Marilyn Manson. So oh, the Marilyn Manson. Yeah. Right. So so it's a it's it's someone cheated Marilyn Fair, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't know. But I think I know who gave Marilyn the book, the 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 painting, and I know I they probably yeah. came for me ultimately. But it went to who's yeah. that guy? Uh, I, I forget the guy's Kenny, Kenny in Kenny in Florida. 
<laughs> oh, so you think maybe it was an authentic one? Yeah, because back in the day, back in that day, like I was getting so many Gacy paintings, they were only a couple hundred bucks a piece, 100, 200 bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, once his, his death day came up, people were like, thousands of dollars giving them to me like i'm meeting people in the back alley and they're like here's four thousand dollars for a casey paint i'm like i i made so much money that fucking year oh my goodness it's great oh that's another thing i you know you ask is there anything that we haven't talked about yet there are, yeah i did notice occasionally i see like there's some place that has a so-called museum of my father's stuff and i looked very carefully and i saw something that was supposedly from our house but it wasn't from our house. It was some vertebrae or something, and it was behind glass, and it had my father's signature on it. But my father never signed anything like that, so that was completely impossible. It was a complete fraud. They were sold something completely fraudulent. Oh. And really, nothing from our house has been sold because I've done the best I can to be the caretaker and custodian of just about everything from our house and everything of my father's. And nothing has left my hands. Anything that has was, uh, shouldn't have been. So anything that I don't have has been stolen or has been in some way taken. Stolen artifacts and, and the bootlegger, you know, most people know the boot, the guy, the person that's going around selling that stuff and anyone who's buying it knows it's fake. They're just participating in that fraud, you know, cause the rumor, you know, the people, the, there's, there's one source that sells the LeVay bootleg stuff. And uh, everyone in the know knows and anyone participating. And it's all bootleg. Yeah, and anyone participating knows so they're just as big of a dickhead as the person selling it usually. And there's, sometimes people do get grifted that are decent folks trying to just... Well, sometimes people have no way of knowing. Right, right. But most of the well, people... My father said that too. Um, and, and it's kind of ironic because... My father would always say, because I, I was always a pretty popular kid, and and I mean, not that I had all that many friends necessarily, but I, I was just generally, I guess, well-liked because I was a decent human being in school, you know, but people would come up to my father and go to rest. Oh, my, my daughter knows your daughter went to school with you. It's like, I went to school with everybody on the face of the earth to, you know, hear my father talk because everybody would come up to, I went to school with your daughter. But then I've talked to my half sister and I guess, well, she did go to a couple of other schools too. But my father, when they would say it, he always took it that there was me. And he would always say to everybody, everybody likes Carla. And if they don't, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> and, so, and because I listen, I'm a pretty nice person. I am fair. I'm just, I'm kind, whatever. Um, but That's after true. my father died, That's everybody true. hated me. What in school? But, what'd you say? After my father died, everybody turned, all these people turned on me and hated me. And, and all I did was like write a nice memorial about my father. Well, that's because you was turned on. You know, like, you know how better. How dare she write such a thing? You yeah, know, you know better. It's not about that. It's about grabbing pow power grabs. It's about making good, good reasons for, for, for fucking people over good, good, you know, having something to say about, you know, it's, it's garbage. They, no, there's no reason that people shouldn't be trying to, you know, I, you are a really decent person. You work with me and I'm not easy to work with. And so well, you, you threatened are, me to get this interview, huh? Uh, no, that's true. Threat. It took a lot of threats. That's like... It's true. But Carla takes threats by, you know, you know who I am. Threats go two ways. Now you want me to have someone knock on the door? I said, no, no LeVay friends knock on my door, please. So Carla goes, okay, calm down. Yeah. <laughs> threats get met with threats. Threats get, no, th threats get met with war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so no, you're um, really you are really cool and 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 so it's yeah anyway i just but, think it's, we talked about this it's the real person the real deal always gets fucking robbed but this is the deal this is what i before i i said that because i'm not trying to say oh yeah well i'm you know such a great person i'm just saying that's what my father said and so when people say that i think back to him saying that and i think well what is wrong with these people i haven't done anything to them yeah, and your daddy's little girl. You're like, and, like yeah, how and how can they put me down so much when all I did and people my whole life have put me down actually for being oh she's so loyal to her father even when I was a little kid. Yeah, I but, thought, that's an you know, and I apologize. I remember. I don't know if I I know about I I I I believed. I know when when that first started happening, um, 
because I was I was the last person your father made a, a priest and, and so Blanche and all of them would reach out and, and it was like war against all of the vase or, you know, like they are not evolved. Don't talk to them. They're not associated. This is ours. You know, they have nothing to do with it. They walk through all this kind of stuff. And so 20 years later, you find out how awfully wrong that is and how awfully unjust that was and and hanging out with Carla going, wow, not only is it unjust to Carla, it is unjust to any Satanist in the world because Carla has a lot of great information that she wants to share, just like her father shared. And for some reason, no one wants to let that happen or wants to stop the flow of information is probably an anti-Satanist. Anyone who stops the flow of education and information is anti-Satanist to me. Yeah. me. Well, my father used to say, well, you're either for me or you're against me. Yeah, that's right. So I don't know how people can be against his own daughter that was there from the very start. I was there before we moved into California Street. I was there as we moved into California Street. I loved that house. I did everything to save it. And I mean, at my own expense, really. And then I was the last one to leave that house and turn in the keys. Well, I'll tell you, you know, you, we talk about threats. And when you came to me, it was almost threatening. Like, you know, take down this and I'm, I'm getting ready to fight. And, but the thing that comes into my mind, I don't give automatic respect based on a fucking name or anything. But I think, wow, this is Anton's, this is, this is Anton's little girl. Like, and that means that she sat there and watched him from the, his knee, looked up and watched him and grew up and watched every movie made and studied him. He's that little, she's the little daughter. She's the first daughter. She watched every single thing he fucking did. That's what, that's what they do. So I'm like. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what. Hello. Yeah, well, we just got cut off when I was saying, you're, you know, I, I just had this ultimately great respect uh, based on your daddy's little girl. So how could you not be really in tune with your old man? Like, that's just, you know, but that's where we left it. You were talking about Rasputin. But, um, you told me to remind you about a story about, let me see, Maria Rasputin. Yeah, that we have a chair that was sent to my father from an antique dealer in Los Angeles. I know and, the chair. And reportedly, they were. this was verified by Maria Rasputin herself that it had been in the palace. And my father, after that, he always said, well, Carla, you're going to be the one, just like Maria Rasputin. When I'm gone, you're going to be the one that's going to know if this was really in the house. And so... I mean, obviously it's true because I was there before, during, and after. So if anything was ever in the house, I certainly knew about it. And nothing should have been taken from the house. If it was, I would know about it. And anything that has been surreptitiously taken since, I know about that too. So I, I just wanted it to be known that anything that anybody should find that if they've been told it's something from our house. It probably isn't. And if it is, it would have a certificate of authenticity coming from me. Right. And so much like the Warhol state, you have to get things authenticated from Carla or you get nothing. It's worth dirt. Yeah, everything has a number. Everything is verified. And you have the den of iniquity. That's right. Yeah. You know, that's amazing. That's amazing to hear. It's great to hear that it's, it's, it's survived and it's, it's waiting for the, the big reveal. Don't, don't yeah. worry. Picard's yeah, I've done my best to preserve everything that I can. Carla's got no help from anybody. I mean, nobody in the family, nobody else in the estate, everybody else just walked away. I'm, I'm working on it right now, but, but you've got a lot of secret, uh, got a lot of secret plans played for the next handful of years. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. So I, I do have the people here that have helped, but they're not family members. Yeah, well. You know, you, you would hope that your family would stick together <laughs> in a time of need and crisis. I would hope, I wish wishes worked. You're right. I wish hope worked. I would, I hope all that and I wish all that it doesn't, fuck, geez. I got no one in my family. I mean, a little sister's fine, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> it's unfortunate. Well, Carl, I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, you know, the Rasputin chair. I got a story about your that Rasputin chair. Do you? 
Well, I've got a problem. If I go to museums and stuff, a lot of times I'll be like, that's a Picasso. That's a mural. And people are like, you can't touch the artwork. And then, you know, the guards will come up, don't the alarms will go off. This is me. Go into the, your father's front room there and sit down. <laughs> He's like, Blanche's like, you know, don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. And your dad comes in. That pipe was Alistair Crowley's pipe. And I go, and he looks over like, what in the fuck? Like disturbed. Why would you touch that? It's I. And then right, he goes, "That's Rasputin's chair." Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever, you know. <laughs> That's all I got for you, Carl. Yeah. But he would give me these books like he gave me a book called "My Father, Mister Mercedes." What is that about? <laughs> Well, it was about the man who invented the Mercedes Benz and, you know, oh. okay, well, this is, you know, like me, like, you know, my father did this and here are these other people whose fathers were, you know, something of note. And so, as I said, it was basically because I would be the one in charge of everything who would know, who could tell everyone what the truth was. And so that's what really aggravates me because it was made really obvious to everybody. And then after he's gone, that's like, oh, uh, well, fuck that. You know, we don't give a shit about that anymore. She wasn't here. She doesn't know anything. Never here, you know. It's funny how people respond to a logo and a, and a brand, a brand name, like the Church of Satan and this logo. That's where, it, you know, it, it's same with the, the Satanic Temple garbage. It's like they respond to this logo and this name. That's it. And it's funny because when we set it up, they had these these idiots I was helping out with. They have all these. I'm like, the logos are going to fail. Everything's failing here. Your failures. You keep calling people minions. No Satanist is going to join and be called a minion. They have all these things. Like, this is you need you need this kind of logo. The minute I jump and do that stuff, people jump through the hoops based on the fucking logo, based on the fucking logo. Once that logo changed, everything was off the. You know. Yeah, and logos do change. The right. Kentucky Fried Chicken is now KFC. You know, I mean, it's wild the, how the that... world goes on. And right, no one cares about Colonel Sanders. They care about that impulsive trigger of that logo. Yeah. It's yeah. incredible how words are so hard for us to grasp, but not symbols. Symbols, yeah. the cross. Oh, you. Oh, oh, you know. So, it's a shame that that happened in your case as well. You know, like that logo and that brand name impressed people enough where they were like, yeah, this is official, where the idea wasn't where did the nucleus of this idea come from? And where did this the people that surround this person that was being created and they're watching this happen? Who was caring? Who was taking that in? Mm -hmm. You know, so do you remember anything like when you're raised, like what's the earliest memory you have? Did you, you have to take you for walks around the park or to the, you know, you know, I don't know. Yeah what what you remember what was a joyous activity maybe or do you have anything that you remember you know, my father would take me to the museum and the aquarium when I was very young he took a photograph of me at the aquarium and it was taken outdoors it, like there was a once you walked in there was an outdoor area before you went into another building and he took a photograph of me out there and it was the it was I get maybe he sent it into the newspaper for like photo of the week and it won. So it was in the newspaper of me standing of me next to a statue. But there were a lot of things like that. But we used to go to the park a lot, a lot. We used to, I mean, Winston, we'd be driving through the park from my grandparents were on one side of the park and, and, my house my father was on the other side of the park i we all lived on the same side for a while but then my grandparents moved to the other side of the park so there was a lot of driving through the park and so but we would go when i was a little girl we would go with my mother and sometimes she would want to sit out and just sit out in front of the museum or in the park someplace and sit in the sun and my father and i would go into the museum so he taught me a lot about art and 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 then we'd see interesting things outside the museum as well, you know, just in in walking the museum, we'd see odd cars and things and you know whatever would strike his fancy and and we'd have some nice talks and so I I get I have very fond memories of being with my father as a child. We did do things like that together. 
That's really neat. How do you think, would you, do you think you're, well, did he like to be idolized? I, I don't know if he really noticed it that much. I, 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 it, it sort of bothered me when we went to, I didn't like going to restaurants. I'd get so sick I couldn't eat because people would be staring at him. And that, that lasted throughout, I mean, until I was about 20, 21 years old. And I'd start going with friends and I would have to really psych myself out to be able to sit in a restaurant and eat a meal and not get butterflies in my stomach and feel like everybody was watching. Mm. But no, it never bothered him. But it wasn't on, on that large of a scale where it would really in, in, um, interact with his life all that much. Mater D's would always be nice to him and everything. So I, I'm not saying he'd get any preferential treatment necessarily, but I mean, he was a nice person and, and the, the waiters usually liked him, the Mater D's, and they'd give him a nice table. Well, he's a very charming man. Well, he was. You know, that's, for me, I, I also see that as part of uh, Satanism or whatever, you know, the charm, the kindness, the mm -hmm. warm outreach for, mm -hmm. to get what you want, you know, to, to serve, you know, to, to trade off, you know, there's this, so, you know, I like Yeah, that. well, I'll so say you be nice to me, I'll, I'll be nice to you, and right. everybody gets along. Yeah, right, 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 right. And, uh, you know, yeah, that anyway it's it's um i can't wait till you get online more often i'm really happy that you're starting to reach out and i think a lot of these young satanists could really use your inform the information that you have that has been withheld from us well if there's any way i can help that's really cool. Because I, I don't like the directions that I've seen things going in. It's antithetical to everything that I started, everything that I stood for, everything that my father stood for. And but it, it did take a big part of my life in being a representative of it. And I hate to see it all just be destroyed by what's out there now. And it is. You're right. It's being watered down. And I'm really happy that this is happening. This is a, a good thing. And I, I think your father would say, Let's, what was the quote of the first hundred years of a religion is bumpy. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, I feel like this is a, a, a good moment for that philosophy, you stepping out and explaining some things that make perfect sense to me, a person who studied it for a couple decades, you know, and found that a lot of the stuff that I was, you know, early on looking at this stuff, it didn't never seem to fit the idea of liberty, libertine or freedom or individual, you know, stuff like that. Control is, I don't like it. Yeah. Well, we talked about a lot. There's a lot that we haven't talked about, but in time. Right. You know, I can't wait. I can't wait to, I can't wait. That's all I'm saying. I'm really happy about this and look forward to uh, the Black Christmas in San Francisco. Well, I hope that I've been able to help you with your 24 hours of informing people or reaching them in some way oh carly you've been nothing but a big help i really appreciate your time i hope you know that you know i appreciate you coming out to chicago and helping out and uh yeah i mean i'm i'm, I'm very lucky I, I you know i'm grateful absolutely you know i'm here to help as well so anything i can do Okay, well, thank you, Shane. Thank you. All right, I'm going to stop recording and we can, let me stop. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fad? And what? Seconds left. No, it's still nine minutes. So, so for, for as, as far as the Boyd stuff goes. Just stick your finger on record. Might as I well. Did. I did. So okay. for, as far as the Boyd stuff goes, when we're talking about that, we, I just hit record real quick. We were talking off the camera. So the idea with that, for me, over the last decade, we've seen what we took, did as artwork grow into something that's being taken in the wrong, in a serious 
militaristic or political way. And for me, that doesn't fit anything to do with Satanism. I'm not into being stuck to what we've discussed this. So when Boyd Rice doesn't come out and say, hey, 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 yeah, I use those images. I Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I, I, it's my art. And I don't need to explain it, but I don't mm -hmm. agree. When he doesn't come out and say, I don't agree with fascism or I don't agree with these things, it makes you just as guilty, especially yeah. in the, the climate we're in today. That means all I can I know for me, if I'm sitting silent, that means I'm looking for power. Yeah. That means I'm looking for people to come to me so I can direct them. Oh, it's going to yeah. be a fascist state. They like me. They love me as a fascist. Good. So that's how I see that for me. And he has started his own church. Right. For me coming out and talking about this stuff doesn't benefit my pocketbook necessarily. I'm yeah. going against what looks to be a popular wave that's happening. Yeah. I, I, it would be a lot easier for me just to go along with that stuff yeah. and collect money. I stopped selling Might Is Right. I was like, this is yeah. it's against my being. It's against my, my all everything I do as a person, my artist, everything I've ever done. So it wipes away my life if I yeah. participate in that. It, it makes my whole 50 years of existence a fraud. Fuck that. I'd rather fight than have a life of sham. Yeah. So that's how I feel he, about it. He did write a lot of things making my father sound very right wing, and they were not things that my father said. They were his illusions of what he thought my father said, or his memories in some distorted memories of what my father said to him, but they were not the realities of, of my father's thoughts because when I read some of these things, I, I was really surprised because I thought this is not how my father talked. So 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 why would he why would boy i guess he's doing that to gain power or gain something why would he you know that's so weird take someone's words and twist them around you tell well, because all those guys basically like the sensationalism is it just ego is it just their, their it their, was their... like the shock jock thing right it's I attention see. grabbing i see and that's what I grew up around. The, the original shock jock was Steve Dolly came out of Chicago and did the disco. So, so I watched yeah. that. I, was like, I loved it. I was like, yeah, this is the way to do it, which was what I was doing on the 20, 20 years ago on the radio show. That's what I, exactly what I was doing. Shock jocking. You yeah. know, there was no, it was very uh, nihilistic. Well, yeah. And they'd say, if everything was all, you know, hippies and love, then they'd say, oh, well, we hate everyone. You know, we're all about hate. Right, right. That that was sort of, but I see that going on between generations, though. I saw the millennials be anti what we were about, and then you see Gen Z be anti what the millennials about. So it's just, it's just the pendulum swinging, you know. And and so, I yeah, I don't, I don't, I I I don't go, I don't know if it's about power though. I feel like it's a perverse ego. It's like this 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 weird ego. Like I just want to make this about me or my credit or. Yeah. It's like I can top that. Well, I'll just say this thing in the opposite, and everybody will listen to me. Then it's like they need to double down or triple down. Yeah, everything. Correct. Yeah, I got to be right. What I did back then was right, and I'm going to prove yeah. it by turning Levey's words yeah. around to prove me right. Instead of just yeah. like like I'm saying, like, yeah, I was ignorant back then. It's not easy to say for me. You know, I'm ignorant back then, and especially Satanist broadcasting to Satanist. Hi, <laughs> I was ignorant back then. It's it, that there, there's a hard ego to get beyond mm -hmm. this. This, this thing I want yeah. so to say that and say, you know, I've, I've, I've learned a lesson from this. Yeah. Is a hard These thing. These guys also make up their own realities because they think it sounds better. They just like the story better. Doesn't mean it's the truth. So it just it fits some sort of romantic male narrative. Just for fun. They just think it just sounds better. I just, you know, I like that story best. Even if it's not the true story, it's their story. It's and their favorite story. <laughs> their favorite story <laughs> they're like fishermen they have to have their fishing story is that it they're, they caught the big one yeah yeah oh god so the boyd rice book you i remember you telling me he, he used the satanic i didn't he call it the new satanic bible or something like that i don't know not quite but we don't even want to go there okay Let's not even talk about that okay I just say just forget yeah. that don't even don't I'm go near it. that you know it's like the michael aquino michael aquino wrote a everybody's got their new satanic bible their new new testament of my father or whatever but it isn't it just plain isn't 
So please, people, do not be confused. Do not think that any of these things have anything to do with the Satanic Bible. Do not think that they're a recreation or a betterment or, you know, a, the newer, the newer, better version, because there isn't one. People don't even understand the original one. So please, buy the original Satanic Bible, buy the Satanic Rituals, buy the Complete Witch or Satanic Witch, whatever it's called. Um, and those books will tell you what my father was really thinking. Not these other people's books telling you what my father was really thinking or how it should really be or their incarnation of it, because that's all it is, is their version of the truth of their, their philosophy. And if you really wanna know, if you care more what their philosophy was than what the original one was, then for all means, go for it but it is not the satanic Bible. They're not my father's words. My father did not, did not appreciate these people's uh, thing that they did and never did. And these people were not my father's close associates. And, and maybe they were for a period of time, but obviously they've all turned against them and their books are pretty boring. So That's don't be confused. And, and I, I don't even, I don't recommend for people to even buy Midas Right because I think any of the highlights are in the Satanic Bible as far as philosophy. They are, you're right about that. He cleaned it up and took all the, he took the, the, the bitter, bitterness out of it and, and, and took, took what was seemed to be undeni empirical truths. Yeah, like, and a lot has changed since 1910. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So. It really doesn't relate to anything in in the even our more close past is when the book was written in 1969. I think that it stands for all time. It is the original and a lot of people don't even have a copy of the Satanic Bible. Well, I'm looking forward to you communicating more online with people and telling them what the deal is versus what the you know, this is great. This is great comes exactly from the source who saw the birth of satanism and satanism has gotten at least the word satanism has gotten pretty big hasn't it <laughs> i suppose so it's just the word i get it it's not you're like this is not real satanism but it but it has hasn't it it's 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 pretty big well the word has changed a lot yeah yeah well i have fun with it <laughs> Okay, so what are you going to do for your 24 hours? What am I going to do? Yeah, your 24 I'm, hours of what I'm is it called? Some artwork with Avi. We're going to hang out. We're going to talk about stuff. We're going to have some artists in. They're going to come in and make artwork with us. You know, talk about Satanism, uh, might is right, all this kind of crazy, you know, like the, the, the stuff I've understood and learned, you know, uh, uh, the lessons I've learned from that, I would say. Um, we're just gonna have fun fuck around not take it too serious you know i the the original one was fun we just set up and went and had fun so i just want to and fun. when was that 20 years ago on september 11th 2003 oh. Oh. So, so this whole year the 20th anniversary year since this show has lasted and become so big and such a controversy i'm going to spend this whole year breaking down might is right with with intellectuals that that have read it and like can take it apart and and, and understand it how it's flawed as far as today like you're saying from 1910 today they'll pull it apart scientifically so by the end by september 9th 2023 money's rights pretty much going to be pulled apart and done and in, and in, in shambles that's what i'm going to be doing this year and where will this be the world wide web everywhere at the link but where yeah. in particular on well, twitter where <laughs> YouTube. Where? I'm gonna start. I'm gonna do it on YouTube. YouTube. Shane Bug. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art, or is it just another fashion fad? And what? There you are. Okay. Here we are back again. Yeah. So I'm gonna put it on YouTube, and then I know there's a group of young kids. And I say young. They're like 20, 18 even 16 they're studying satanism in a in a satanism study group on discord 
and they're going to grab the stream and stream it there. Mm. And so <laughs> there you go. And, but it's important for me to get this down and stream it like that. And then it's the stream is uh, fun and hype. And it's, it's about me. Um, I, I created that idea that has lasted for 20 years, but somehow everyone else controls the narrative. Um, it's mine. So I'm going to take back the narrative of my creation and what, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to let this be weaponized any longer. It's, it's my shit. And I'm going to explain what the fuck it is, what happened then. And my 20 years of study. So I'm, I'm deal, you know, I'm just taking care of the problem. Mm. It's my, my child and I got to deal with it. And the people that did it with me, you know, they want to take credit for these things or our stuff, but they don't have the courage to step out in front of these problems. They just run and say, oh, like a lot of Satanists be like, they don't want to be not, they don't want to be committal, just like Boyd Rice. Maybe he's not a fascist, but he doesn't want to say that. He doesn't want to say, I, I'm totally against that. He just wants to keep playing this, this fucking game. And it's like, oh, that was the 80s, bro. We did that already. Now we you have to define what we're about. It's, it's, it, this is the time, <laughs> you know, the, that, that served its purpose back then. All that art, what we did, I think, I, I don't, it served a purpose somewhere. I don't know. I can't, I'm not a historian, but it stuck to a lot of people that means something, you know, it, it, and so I don't know what it means and I don't really care. I just do what I do, <laughs> you know, I wish, and I hope, I guess, I know I, I, I've been influential in a lot of ways and it's hard for me to see that stuff. I don't like to, I really don't like to um, see myself as a public figure or anything like that. But I hope that the influence that I had prior, I can have that same kind of influence with what I'm coming forward with today. If that makes sense to tell younger angry people about my mistake or how I thought with the with things, maybe that sticks to someone. Mm -hmm. like so this. when you say 24 hours, what does that mean? We will stay awake for 24 hours pretty much. Are you going to? Since I'm recording, yes, of course. Would I lie? But are you you said what, that what we will do is we will have 24 hours of original programming i will stay up for most of it because i'm a spaz but i'm grampy now so grampy's gonna definitely gonna have to take a nap so i'm gonna put on like a handful of programming you know two or four hours of programming something like that and take a nap six hours i've got a lot of original programming that i can play on here and talk about people that'll call in. There's a lot of people that are interested. So I would bet you from 6 p.m. till midnight, six hours straight, we'll just take calls. People will just call in and ask questions and that's what we'll do. And where will they be calling? There's a link I can, yeah, they don't call, I guess. I'm sorry, I, I'm talking from the 80s. They will be, I send a link and they just click the link and I'll, especially if they have Chrome, uh, you know, Mac and Chrome, it just pops up and then you, you, you're in a green room and I see you there and it says, Hey, Carl is calling in and I just click the button and then your, your video, your, your, what app is that? I'm using an app, a streaming app called eCam mm. and it's really easy for Mac. It's, it's something you, you would end up using if you streamed, um, you know, did classes, streaming classes, did a Twitch channel. Uh, I think, I think Twitch might not, I mean, when we talk today, I think, I don't know if TikTok's going to be your friend because it's so short and, and everything we talk about is not really can't, it's, it's hard to, if we summarize it in a bumper sticker statement, it just becomes the title of a fucking stupid movie called Hail Satan. Yeah. Don't so, you get a choice like one minute, five minutes or 10 minutes, something like not that? Not much. I think you'd be better on a long form, like streaming on YouTube, doing a half hour, 50, you know, just having no time limit, just going, yeah, I want to tell this story. And that's that. You shouldn't YouTube be YouTube gives you a time limit. Otherwise you have to call them and- YouTube gives extra. you 12 hours, 12 hours. No, I mean, after like 10 minutes or something, if you want to go, at least it used to be, that you had to call a number or do something to get extra time. If you wanted everything on one. 
I don't think so. Well, okay. I know what I've, oh God, now I'm freaking out. I got to go look and read this stuff again. I read recently just for this streaming, you know, I'm counting on 12 hour breaks. Like it, you can stream for only 12 hours and then it cuts you off. That's mm -hmm. what I've read for, for what I'm doing some, tomorrow, today, tonight. Okay. But that's streaming. What happens after? It goes up on YouTube archives. It just stays. But there. it's not as one 24 hour segment. Right. Mine isn't right. My, you, I'm just talking about if you used YouTube, I'm going to use YouTube. And when I, when it hits the 10 hour mark, I'll have an alarm set here. So I'll be like, Hey, I'm going to, I'll sign back in in a second. I'm going to sign out, let that, that archive sign back in and I'll stay on for another 10 hours. Yeah. I have a YouTube channel, satanic church. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, so I would say yeah. use Ecamm and start streaming on there, you know, and, and you can have people come in and talk and chat and do that stuff. I think that's a great idea to build an audience. And then yeah, we, I didn't know that you could do that. Yeah. Ecamm's great. Hmm. I'll fucking, you know, tomorrow I'll send you the link. And if you feel like calling in live, that would be really neat. You know, you could just pop on and see how it works. But it's not calling. It's basically what we're doing now. Yes. I, I'm sorry. I keep. So is it, how is it different from Zoom? Well, it's better. It, it just it, stays there. It, it is made for streaming. Zoom isn't. Zoom's made for meetings. So the picture quality is better, but it also, you are a DJ. Okay. So I can talk to you. It lets you set up your rack, your, 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 your show. So right now I have a show and, and, oh shit. I wonder if I could show it to you somehow here. I don't know, but I have a show right now. Maybe I can fuck. I think I fucking can. Get the fuck out of here. This shit is so fucking cool. I'm going to try it. I'm opening up Ecamm. Let's see what happens here. I'm going to share the screen. Can you see that? No. Okay, forget it. Doesn't work. Okay, here we are. But anyway, so it lets you set up that. And I can also hit a button and, and, a, and a thing will come across the thing and say my name or my website name. I have audio drops. I can add audio. I can hit, you know, it has all these things and it's real easy. And mm -hmm. so the interview thing is just these five, it's made for like Mac people. I'm a Mac person. So it's got the big photos. And so you hit the one with the two heads, click, and it's the interview mm -hmm. tab. And all I got to do is turn that on. And if I turn that on and you're calling me, I'll be able to take it. But if you've been on this for for let's say an hour and then you get to a part and if somebody just watches on YouTube, is there going to be any way that they can tune into a certain part of it and not have to watch for 24 hours to get to a certain part? No, not during the stream. No. You mean, so, but you're talking about what you, you, what we have just done is going to be up is it's going to be a 21, 24 hour segment. No, it's going to probably be three segments of like, that'll add 24 hours. Okay. So it'll be, yes, it'll be, the concept is one 24 hour segment, but what we just did those files and anything that's really decent, I'll clip out and use, I'll put up on YouTube on their own. Like, like Danny does with, with reality check TV. Mm -hmm. I'll put up there. I'll be like, Oh, this is the uh, interview with Carl Ove, part one, part two, part three, part four. If, if we leave them, if the integrity of this recording is just leave them in chunks, don't edit them together and weird shit like that. Then I would just leave them up in the, if there's six parts, it would just say part one, part two, part three, part four, part five. And I would just put them up like that. And all of my videos, all of this shit, I always put on archive.org. So all of my videos, so any interviews I do, like if the, at the least, I would put the audio up from all of our stuff. Because I want people to be able to study it in the future. I don't do this for just myself. It's not, I, <laughs> I collect information to share with other people. You know, I'm a documentarian, an artist. You know, so I'm here to share this. I like that. So it's just going to be up basically on YouTube. Well, no. Yeah, for me, it's going to be up on YouTube and archive.org. And that's probably all I'll use it for. That, that is all I'll put up. And then it will be disseminated just like this other show was. This 20, this 20, this 20 year old show is everywhere. It's all over. I can't control it. Really? It's out, of, it's out of control. Yeah. What is it called? Might is right. 24 hour show. I don't know. Might is right. Special. And who did you have talking on that? 
Peter Gilmore ended it. He got the last spot. So he got to have the final word. So I gave the Church of Satan the final word. Ultimately. Tom Metzger, white supremacist. George Eric Hawthorne, when he changed his name to George Birdie and, and turned away from uh, white supremacy. So we had a Nazi and then a reformed Nazi. Put them both together. That's what I did. Juxtaposed them. In front of the Nazi, I had Eric or, or Eugene Robinson, a gentleman uh, that interviewed your father a long time ago. And so he came in and talked and he went to Stanford. He was a real, he's a real smart journalist guy. So he was in there. That's all I can remember. That was a big deal. I don't, I don't know. I don't really, I don't really have a memory for it. I haven't looked back on it in 20 years. Everyone, everyone else will tell you. There's a whole, it's been transcribed. All the words are typed out of it. Every guest, every minute, all the times, every single fucking sentence and time of this mm. show. People have pulled it apart that much. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's it's considered one of the, the, the pop, what, and I don't say this, this isn't for me. It's the most famous or most infamous satanic broadcast ever. And mm. that's what everyone says. I don't say that. I, I just see here a name came up. I don't have my own name on my account here. Right. Do you see that? Minsats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but is that going to come up on everything that you put up? I don't think so. I didn't see it before now. I haven't looked at the recordings yet. But it could have been up the whole time. Oh, my God. What happened? <laughs> I'm Carlos with that. That marries art with fashion. But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what that marries art with fashion? But is it really art? Or is it just another fashion fan? And what There you go. I love that he saw something in me. And I never could understand what it was. It wasn't until... Well, the, it might have had something to do with the thousand dollars you paid him. <laughs> Fanatics, they're going to be watching. I, I, I have something to say. It's important. It's a 25th... 20, you know, I'm going to do this. Right. You know, it's, it was... It saves on YouTube. Ultimately, though, you know... I'm going to save these chunks best I can. And like I said, anything that's really great, I'll get segmented out and, and shared. I, I, but how many people are going to be able to listen for eight hours at a time? Um, there's uh, a couple dozen kids on that server that have all signed up to sit there 24 hours and do it. And they're all talking about the coffee they're going to get and the jugs of coffee and everything they're going to do. So they're going to get what? coffee they're like you got to get plenty of coffee and they're all talking about the coffee the powder packets like you got to put that in the drink just drink you know and they're they're like 18 you know like college kids and they're all going to get high on caffeine and you got me <laughs> but it's good hype it gets people to you know like if you're just doing a stream it's why because I, I'm, I'm taking over the narrative first of all you know he's had control of this thing and i didn't know what was going on like I was in a trying to save my family, you know. I was involved in real life love affairs. I didn't realize this got big, and then when I got to Chicago, I was out of my mind. Like I had a lot of issues, so I had to mm -hmm. go to intense therapy for two years. And the first year, I was going four times a week, four times a fucking week. That's how bad I was. So I have my mind back. Now. I can destroy them. Okay. Just but is he going to be listening for 24 hours? Oh, I would imagine him, his lawyers, the Satanic Temple, some of them will be. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Him and him and my wife, they'll definitely be listening. <laughs> See, the, the people that hate us. That's fine. Please. See, the people who like us, the people who love us, they don't give a damn. They're not going to listen. They can hear us anytime. <laughs> right, 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 right. And that's the how people that hate us that are going to be watching. Exactly. <laughs> that's how Howard Stern made it. Like, <laughs> your haters are tuning in for more time than the people who like you. Yeah. Yeah, so 
I, we're going to have quite a few people turn in, and it's a great combination, Carla, because there's these young kids that are attracted to Satanic Temple. Well, there's a lot of people who hate Satanists. There's more yeah. people who hate them and love them. So they're going to be all the other religious fanatics they're going to be watching. Yeah, I'm worried about, yeah, so I, I wonder, I worry about hackers and people trying to take down the stream. I'm used to, you know, I've been doing this forever, so I'm used to all those weirdo attacks. But it's for but the content to me is compelling. I'm I'm concerned about the content, my legacy. Like I care about the quality of my work. Okay, I fucking care. So I'm thinking about that 24 hour show. I haven't even listened to it in 20 years. When I started looking back on it three weeks ago, I was uh, embarrassed, and and I I don't get that way too. But I don't. Look <laughs> 20 it. years, I'll be dead. <laughs> well, no, no, we're gonna keep you alive for at least 30, 40 more years. What do you like? Stuff me. Whether you like it or not, you're gonna be like, I but I ate it. I just wanted, you know, my I father wanted to used to say he wanted to be stuffed. I'll i I'll, I'll stuff you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant when he was dead. <laughs> not when he was alive. Who? My father. <laughs> he wanted to be dead, huh? He I wanted to be stuffed, stuffed when he was dead. That's funny. Too bad. Yeah, you know, and sit him at the kitchen table and you know, eat dinner with him every night. Stuff like a <laughs> taxidermy. Oh, I fucking love that. I fucking love that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I really I love your father. I love that he saw something in me, and I never could understand what it was. It wasn't until well, the, it might have had something to do with a thousand dollars you paid him. <laughs> you yeah, know, but, but but that was for the interest. That helps <laughs> increase yeah. the palm a little bit. That's something that's certainly but but i've done that a lot in my life and no one treated me like he did okay that was a lot of money for those days but but he but you're telling me that he sold me a priesthood i don't think so well he didn't like that was that was michael aquino's art thing that right. my father didn't sell right he didn't that's what i'm saying so he much he, of anything i enjoyed his company he took me seriously and he was an established artist. He was a person, an established artist that took a very young person seriously. Old artists don't do that. They don't fucking do that much. He was cool. They block the gates. They're gatekeepers. They block the ladder from young fucking people that are going to take their throne. I'm usurping you, motherfucker. I'm coming here to take everything. He welcomed them. Okay? As an artist. And he was cool. Like, he was cool and talking like a human being. Like, he, like that was cool. You know, and so that doesn't happen. It was like I said, it was like I was hanging out with hippies. I've hung out, I've been at the dead shows, I've hung out with hippies, I know who they are. That's what it was like. It was just like cool, cool, bro. You know, so you know, I love a lot of people that helped me out. All those, all those old hippies John Sinclair, Skip Williamson, Jay Lynch, the guy who started Garbage Pail Kids. Bob Rudnick, these White Panthers, these all these people. I I remember them coming and telling me about Fred Hampton getting shot by cops, and I was like, "You're fucking dumb hippies. You don't know what you're talking. No cops are going to do that. You're crazy hippies." They come and present all this evidence, all this kind of stuff, bringing all these people saw it. By the end of the day, I'm crying. Oh my God, this is awful news. How could you do this to me? It was great. <laughs> you know, because all these people just kept. Sticking with me, trying to educate me, and pulling me along to you know what yeah. I was interested in. You know they didn't. Will you take it off record for a second? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot it wasn't. That marries art with fashion, but is it really art, or is it just another fashion fad? And what? That marries art. Wait, what the hell's going on with this camera? Oh, there it is. <laughs> All right, hey. Oh, yeah, I'm holding this. It's an award. I couldn't hear the fucking audio. Yeah, how dare you people expect me to fucking... I'm at this age, you expect me to step 24 fucking hours? Avi, what are you doing, dude? Get coffee. What do you mean? What's up? What's the word? Go back, go back to sleep. <laughs> What's up? What's up? Man, I'm trying to... It's weird. I'm sitting up here, I'm like, I just keep hearing Carla talking in my mind. Oh, that's what's the most... She's in my head. 
that, why does she make it so much fucking sense? <laughs> hey, that last video, I wasn't even supposed to air. You see, she's a sadist. Those questions that she's asking me, she doesn't need the fucking answers. She knows everything. She's a so what colors your fuck socks? What are you doing tomorrow? You gonna eat that? What's gonna happen? You gonna put spice on it? She asked me a million questions, and so I go, ah! That's what she does. <laughs> It's brilliant, though. It's brilliant. You can't, um, it's, I love how raw this footage is. You know, well, <laughs> I like I couldn't figure it out, but now look how incredible this is. Well, see, now the <laughs> teachers have it raw. See, I'm no longer balding. They do. Oh, my hey, God. Hey, you're having it in your home. It's not good. I got some comfort. Oh, good. Um, yeah, this is great footage. This is great stuff. Well, you leave, because it was a, it's a live stream. I'm not going to edit, like, TV. I left all this stuff. Good, though. <laughs> the fuck are you looking at? So, how are you? I'm sorry, man. I'm clapping. Oh, I didn't mean to clap. Either. <laughs> That's so funny. I, I'm dude. getting out of this. I, I know I'm just waking up, so this is a transition. I'm trying, I'm trying to get real, but it's not happening. How are you? I'm, I'm doing good. We're alive. We're, we're kicking. How do we know? Mm -hmm. Oh, I like this. Oh, yeah. Someone, <laughs> someone, I remember someone's like, how do we know it's real? These, these idiots... I'm trying to. They were idiots. Fuck that. They were totally idiots. So they're hanging out at my birthday party. They say, what do we know it's real? How do we know? I go, the fuck are you talking about? They're like, keep going. How do we know we're here? What's real? I go, the end of the knife is real. You're going to find out. Like, that's how we know we're real. Like, if I pick up this knife, do we, do you know I'm real? And they're like, and I'm like, well, if I'm not real, the knife's not real, can I poke you? And they're like, oh, yeah, I stopped the game. I'm like, well, now we know it's real, right? At least we know the end of this knife is real. Right. If I'm not and you're not, we know this is and we're not going to fuck with it. Even now you became real. Now we know that this knife can cut grass and your ass. <laughs> it's, it's like some of those philosophical statements that are fucking dangerous, but all of life is just a dream within a dream. And, okay. It's just a dream within a dream. It's all right. Just keep dreaming. If you, if you can afford the liquor. <laughs> keep dreaming. If you, can afford the, if you can afford a drink, you're, <laughs> and, uh, all day long, you're right. You are right. Yes, I'm drunk. <laughs> dream <laughs> within a dream. Fucking A, dude. I mean, it's so, there is real. The realism has to be in there. It can't all be fucking fair. So. Listen, sitting down, you don't get the best look. It's just not the best. You know that I'm trying to adjust the camera. That 24 hour show, a radio show, that people, whatever, uh, we stood the whole time. So for about 22 hours, we're standing. Yeah. That's, like a, that's like a horrible fucking factory job. I lost so much weight again. I could, you know what? I had so much weight on me. I was walking like this. I had so much weight on top of this. Sit up again. It's weird. You must have seen it. So this is Avi, Reverend Avi, from, uh, Demon I don't know, yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. a professional, professional hustler, professional, well, I'm a professional hustler, well, uh, you, you, you guys stay, you're, you're pro, as, you, a, as an artist, you don't eat if you don't yeah, but you, you're, you're a pro, what you do, man, you know, you do, you do, um, let's say, like, well, you, I would say we all, we, a lot of us, uh, uh, man, uh, make magic happen, when you do it professionally, you play with fire, you know, you know all the tricks, the, the tricks that, that could, you could put on a business card and say, hey, let me come to your party and perform magic. You know, <laughs> I, I, magic me, is my life, dude. I get it. Yeah. Magic is my life. For me, it's like... I get hired on political campaigns yeah. to destroy the world. That's what happens for me. So my magic is a little something different. I think it's all magic, a political campaign. So that means somebody has worked bad magic. And you know what I'm saying? It's behind trouble. the scenes, like... <laughs> I'm like, they're fucking, like, I'm not a Republican. I don't know. I'm a, very, I'm a Bernie Sanders fan. Well, let me tell you a great piece of marketing that these fucking rednecks did. This guy in Texas starts running whatever, you know, running people up here on the bus that are coming into Texas. He's still in Chicago, but he's sending five buses a day up there. The mayor of Chicago's now like, hey, Chicagoans, let's all donate money to help out. Because he's like, you can send them all here. He's like, okay. Now he's like, how do you like how we feel? And I'm not, I don't agree with this top politics. I think, I don't agree with borders, okay? So I'm not with this conversation. Don't think that I'm scared. I'm, what do they call it? Uh, dog whistling or whatever? Mm -hmm. That's not fucking happening. What I'm saying is, that, that little, that hillbilly magic, I was like, oh, wow, you've been a political moment. He hit, 
he, he was about to lose that governorship of Texas. This trick, that small little trick, could get him to win. And I'm, I'm, I'm after a school full of children are slaughtered. That little trick. I'm just saying, like, I saw that was like, oh, that's sort of what I, that's the magic I would do. Like, yeah, dude, this is what you need to do. Fuck up the system. So whoever advised him of that, just start sending the buses up there to keep him coming. That is a great trick. I'm, I'm not saying it, I like you, the guy, but you got to sit when, when someone does one, he's got something. To, am I wrong about that marketing? No. For, his, for people in Texas, for his voters? Yeah. They're all yeah. going to be like, oh, we love this. Yeah, it's weird because you're like, oh, Avi knows all the tricks. But it's interesting to think about that. That's where all of this comes from. Black magic, all this shit is really about, it's about that trick, you know. That trick of, uh, you know, figuring out how to to make a way for you to not have to conform. If you down, if you, if it's something that you hate, how you break out of that controlling system, you need some kind of fucking trick. Well, that comes with the will, I think. I think, you know, there's this, that, mm-hmm. when we're talking about might is right, people confuse that. Like I said, might, it's like an orgasm. It's just this moment, and then, like, people try to use it as a, this word to trigger people out to think you can have an orgasm constantly throughout the day, or might. But you're talking about, what we say now, you're, we're, we're talking about the will. And that, I think, is an infinite research, it, it, a finite research as well, of the will. I think you can run out of will at some point. I know I have. <laughs> you know, like I was talking earlier about coming to Chicago, I was totally out of will. And I've never been. But <clears throat> in my younger day, people would be like, keep going. No, yeah. my younger day, people would be like, you are the will. Holy shit, dude. Because I'm, cause I'm, whatever, I'm, I have a learning disability and say, I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm like, I'm a goofball. There'd be an eight foot person following, like, yeah, let's fight, dude. Or I won't back down, and I shouldn't do that. Like, I'd be killed. I'm not saying I'm not talking. It's just bad decisions. But it's this will. You know, I can. It's important. For I, I survived said. homelessness. I survived a lot of shit. So let me, so, let me reiterate what you said. You said that, because this was powerful. You said will is finite, and people don't think about it like that. It really is something like the video game where you have that that bar. You have your fucking, you can only run for so long, and when that motherfucker get empty, that's your willpower gone. You, you ain't running no more. You got to wait. You're over encumbered. You got to wait until you got more energy to run. So willpower is something that's finite. You know, you have to well, you have to find the will to continue. So sometimes you have to is. recharge it. There, that's what I was you got to recharge it's it. Not fight. If there's a recharge. Like, I was out of will. But something happened where I was like, able to bring it back, which was like, like it's, uh, whatever, I, I took out a lot, I, I, I'm, I'm just doing it, and um, <laughs> my psychiatrist was like, you know, if something should be studied, it's how you survive, how, how you're resilient, because, like, most people that I know, they are going through it's not going to work, more than it's not, so she's like, it's incredible that you are, you know, and I want to tell you something, I got a couple votes from TST members, saying they're sorry and, and they're nice notes. I'm going to tell you to know, know something. That group is not, that guy is not a good guy. That person, you sign warfare tactics against me and my partner. Okay? Uh, a lot of this stuff is hard to present evidence to you right now, but if you wanted to do your own research, you could simply go to Astoria, Oregon, and ask around for Long Beach Peninsula, ask around, small town where you can get a lot of information on the bug because we went insane. And so they know us. And <laughs> let's just say, like, if you look into the process church history, and you look into the behind the scenes of what they did to Timothy Wiley and his wife, the side warfare they did with him, until his wife devolved into nothing. And Timothy was never the same. Why don't you look into that? And then why don't you, at some point, you're going to see this evidence presented. Not for me, but someone else. And that's what, what we're going to see. That's what kind of cop suckers in Boston, Massachusetts, the tour guy. The guy who's going to look for the Chamber of Fucking Commerce in, in, in Boston, Salem, Massachusetts. That's where the fucking Satan will be. If enough evidence is given to me that all of that stuff points back to you. And you were working with those OTO people. It always sounds crazy to a lot of you fucking idiots that don't have a clue as to what's going on here. This shit really fucking goes up. I'm going to fucking make sure that I see 
your love will be paid. You got it. I'm going to make sure you see it. So, I'm going to leave that there. I think that one thing that's critical, you know, with all of this, you know, we talk about, like, will be a fine on it. And, you know, um, having a good recharge to be able to carry on, man. When you really, like, with all the stuff you've shown so far, you really get a sense of, like, damn, you know, this is, you know, it's not fucking like what we're It's not all fucking sunshine and rainbows. Like, you were in the gutter. You were me? in the grind. Yeah, dude. More than once. It's like you were in the grind for so once. fucking long that people can't really fathom how long you struggled. You know, you can tell somebody, oh, yeah, I've been homeless. But they can't imagine the years of it. They can't imagine the day. Well, I've you know, they been, can't imagine the real struggle. Yeah, know? I've been through struggle. My, I, well, you know, it's sort of funny, but I like I sort of look for it. I think it's my gift. Like I look, I I fight back, and I'm I'm not gonna fucking take it. I'm not gonna fucking take it ever. I took it enough as a child. I took it enough as a child. Come at me, and I'm gonna give it back. And that's that. And I'm gonna try to hurt you if you're trying to hurt me. That's the that's wow. Well, that's it, right there. Yeah. I'm just letting you know. One cheek, I'm going to smack the other one. You know? yeah, and, and, and the stuff that I just said, you know, there's a lot to that. And I, I get that it's it's, a, it's very entertaining to some of you. Um, I have survived so much, but I will tell you, psychological torture is not something that you want to ever go through. For me, I've only had my mind, and I used to have a really great mind. It's coming back a little bit. It's all I've ever had. And I used to talk to those people about, man, I really protect my guy's helmets. I can't lose this. I can lose my legs. I lose this. I'm and so to have lost that for a moment of my life <clears throat> is probably the worst experience I've ever had. And that's Comparing, you know, child abuse, you know, stuff survival. Like that. It's a per- comparing pretty awful things. So that's the kind of person, and that, that's why when I put this stuff out and say this is a politician, this is a person. This, look at look at when I lay out this stuff in this whole stream. This is what me and my partner went on to do after that mighty right special, and this is what the other person went on to do. They didn't do anything creative. They went and both um, understanding how to use the mind, how to understand how to use other people's mind, and to be a politician. He's not an artist. He's not a safe person. And I say that not in envy, not in competition. I don't want a fucking church. I don't give a fuck about that. Okay? I say that because, and I put this out there as a historic moment, because at some point in the future, you're going to be able to start putting these stories together, just like any other fucking cult. Okay? Just like them all. They have, like, this doesn't happen at one time. Helen Morris, a psychiatrist that I interviewed 25 years ago, would say, once you start doing this stuff, once you start being a serial killer, but once you start doing these kind of things, it's addictive. It does become addictive. You, you don't, whatever's going on chemically, you're like, the reason Gacy had to keep going was because of the thrill he got out of it. There's open <laughs> Whatever. So, right. so that's why cults have these massive amounts. And... I know, you're like, yeah, it couldn't be this, it couldn't be that, it couldn't be that until it is. I've been in these situations, I feel you, like, I feel you. I've been, I have a cult like mine, like, I used to defend Peter Gilmore. <laughs> what a dickhead that guy is. You know, yeah, and that was just because of the brand, like I talked to Carla about. The Church of Satan, oh yeah, don't, you know, that guy's an idiot. Peter's not a, uh, a criminal. And Peter doesn't have a serial killer kind of man. I just don't agree with him. He's a very smart person. We understand Satan because we interpret it well that, that he won't be For his version. Yeah, for his version. Right. He's, he's, he's well studied. He's, he, he, he's like that, but I just don't agree with him. The other person, on the other hand, is a criminal. So he's a criminal thing, he's a medical sexual thing. <clears throat> and uh, you might as well move on to the state panic, clear state panic. So other people, I would. You got a bunch of time to call in and harass me right now. These are people that weaponize this little chunk of N word, a little chunk of J word, and flying around the internet. And, uh, I don't know if you notice, but it's not going to hurt you that much. Who are you? Why would you do that? 
makes it, it, it's very confusing to me of the queer culture that I understand. I don't know too many people that are actually in the queer culture. Like, I mean actual gay people, not using it for, like, what I imagine the queer satanic people are doing is using these terms to suck them in, but they're probably not queer or satanic. That's what I was trying to get at earlier. So queer people... With the doobie and his women's rights. But, 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 but queer people, hold on, the culture of queer people, they're not going to weaponize the to any to win anything. They're just going to be like, yeah, it's hurtful. Don't work with shame. Why? That's what they're going to do. Like, that's that. That's what the culture I understand is the culture that saved me. I swam in that culture. I understand it a little bit. I. That's where it's a confusing thing. But y'all are excited by the, look at this trauma that's playing out without considering how that hurts, who it hurts, who it hurts, and who does it drive traffic to? What kind of traffic? Who's going to say, shit, don't worry about that? You know, who's going to pat me on the back and say, that don't matter? Who's going to come at me and say, you got problems, I want to talk to you? Who? What do you think would do that? And how does that attract, how does that hurt a satanic organization? Who really does it? Who really does it? There's a breed of safety that doesn't do that. What's really great about this damn stream is we got the generation. We were kind of hit, hit that this earlier, you know, but we got the generation. Yeah, that's what now, I, it's now, purposeful. Now there's no big gap. You can't go, oh, this is Hey Bible that was published forever ago. Let me just say what I want to say about yeah. it. We, we, we finished that. And that's, I woke, that's over. Okay. And when I woke up from what I was seeing in Portland and everything, and I was starting to leave everything I love, this has been years in the work before that. Like, I was trying to get this, you know, like, I think we talked we talk about it. I landed on that beach. I'm like, we did something wrong. Did we talk about all this last night? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, but did you we were at the restaurant. No, we were at the restaurant. I'm all over the place. But, but we should try to put this in some sort of linear thing so it makes sense within this program. I, 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 I think we're doing a pretty good job. I'm right? just waking up. I haven't had, is there an opera? Is anyone bringing pet? No, I can't take food. Thank you. Anymore. The pancakes are not that close. Yeah. Awful. I need uh-huh. a proto high protein. That's what I do now. I do pro I mean, lose weight. I got to invite over the first guest. Someone bring breakfast. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm worried about taking food from outside. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Me too. I'd yeah. be like that too. It's weird being a Satanist when you realize that, you know, or just, you know, you have so many people that don't like you. And you go out and you go somewhere and you're like, damn, I wonder if they're going to put something in my food. Oh, God, I remember yeah. when you explained that to me and I have to sit there and go, damn it. How's I this? never thought about How's that. This? How's this? How's this? How's this? In Baltimore, there's a couple times I almost murdered people. Like, like literally, was going to kill them, and I was happy about it. And one was in Baltimore. And we went out to eat. I was sitting there, and Doug's across the table from me. And we're on some tour. I don't know what the fucking stupid thing was. Uh, true Crime World Minds Tour. Something I'm dragging these people along with me. And I get to the end of my dish, and on the bottom of the plate is hair. Like they pulled it out of a brush. Not a hair. A pile of hair. So, I, back in the day, I had a rage in me that maybe I would pick up a chair and start smashing the whole place, or trying to hurt someone with a bottle, like beat them in the head with it. And I'm sorry, I, and I'm not proud of this, okay? But this is where the mentality, this is what's going on. I see this. I look up, and Doug's like, what's going on? And he said, they're looking to play, and they see. And they run out of the fucking place. They run. They both get run because I'm like, oh. you know what I'm going at? I'm looking at the guy, and the guy's like, he goes against the wall. I'm like, the fuck? where is the fucking motherfucker? And the oh, guy's smash, like, right. Yeah, he grabs the phone, and I literally pull the fucking phone thing out of the wall. I'm like, you know the motherfucker called who did this? And Doug's like, Shane, you should come out here, leave the place. And I'm like, going to start, you know, he's like, we don't have money for bail. You know, we'll. Uh, you know, I'm like, ah! So, yeah, it had stuff like that happen. And then, in Portland, a lot of shit was left in the And I'm just dealing with this person. And for the year, for this time, I don't like to put this together. I don't know, but speak up and speak this to the mic. I, 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 I am, I am. <laughs> I, I just have to think about it. If, if this person was, well, let's say, on the margins. And I'm trying to be kind to this person. I of that. And from what I understand, I was given a tomorrow with people. By these people. This was directed by, uh, this was all weaponized, this is part of that side of warfare that's happening. And the reason to do that isn't to not, not, not necessarily degrade you, but 
harder reason to dose your food with shit and stuff like that, toxins, is because it eats away at your stomach bacteria, which causes mental illness issues. And it exacerbates that. And that's part of the tactic. So that kind of side of the world. A lot of people don't know about this, but that actually has a long history. It goes all yeah. the way back into dark magic. Right, that's right. Well, I guess, but I, I understand that. That's what, that yeah, they, you can look into it a million ways. You yeah. can look into the history of it. You can look into it across this church. These are things that have happened throughout this occult working. And, and what happens is, and what this is, is basically like Lord of the Rings. Someone has a ring. I was given a ring by Anton LaVey that's much like the goofballs in that movie. I didn't even know what the fuck it is. Air. Everyone wants the ring, and they get around you, and they start to, hey, precious, the ring, the ring. And you, you sort of notice this, but you don't, because you're giving the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, I learned to stop giving others the benefit of the doubt and give myself the benefit of the doubt. And when I have the doubt, I'm like, wow, see ya. And so that's what starts happening. And then this stuff happens, because they think they can take this power from you. And these people are insane. And I don't know if you think that you can grab power from someone out there with the Satanism, or you can use Satanism to obtain power. There's no such thing. Power is an illusion, and power you'll ever have control of the law. When you start to climb power, when you start to think of climbing power, you're succumbing to an illusion. You see the power of building. You think that that person is kind of high right. You're up there in this building. You're, these are all illusions you're falling to. And, and they're used as well, you know. And Gucci stuff, all that kind of stuff, all these, all these friends, images, uh, those things are, are illusions of power, but they don't really exist. And until you can, you know, that's most Satanists that I see today are that. They're chained, they're, 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 the, they're the people that we want to take advantage of the state. They want to be Gucci so, with Satan. Uh, you yeah. know, for the inside, tip, tip for y'all. You know, these are the people, when you see them, those are the people you want to sell your satanic garments. If you're an actual Satanist, you know, yeah, oh, oh, you're, you're looking at clients, yo, you see Gucci's power, you see his power symbols. I love you, you're my customer, baby. You're my walking $20 bill, walking $100 bill, and I want to sell you satanic shit. But they're probably not Satanist, they've been here for about six years. Six years, at the most. And then they, they transition out and it's weird to think that some people, you just need to give them a trinket, and then they'll be fine. You know, they, they, won't, they won't ruin the real, you know, culture. Just give them a trinket, and those people will shut up. You know, it's weird to think about that. Some people come in, and well, they want to they, they well, start redefining this stuff, and then you give them a trinket, and they shut up. But they're like, oh, thank you. You know, now I feel powerful. I'm going to go grab a little, well, I'm going to grab something real quick. And not my dick. <laughs> He's lying. He's also going to get that. But yeah, you know, it's, this is so great. I'm going to say this again. The way that we have closed that gap that sort of exists within, you know, generational Check this out, bro. Stuff, you know, Check this so out. Important. Check this out, bro. Anton LeBay gave me this. That told him. See this? Where is it? See this? And so when I was doing the Club Saint movie, it's a porno. I had the son. in the film, right? Look at some of You gotta hate him. And there's this one woman on the set, and she does her scene, and, and she's freaked. She's a Catholic. And so I'm like, you know, yeah, you know, make yourself a tampon, kiss me, but all these, you know, whatever, it's funny, okay? And so she was in one of these TV shows, too, where it's like uh, intervention TV shows. I saw it three years later. Her boyfriend was an MMA, an MMA fighter, and he's really big. And they used to enjoy crystal meth. Okay? And I guess, okay, so this guy comes into the set of Club Satan. Who? 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 Where is he? Who's running the set? Give me Cassandra! And so we're like, yeah, Cassandra, get the fuck out. When you do porn, you can't, you don't, you usually don't let... It's hard okay. to say. But, well, you just, I, you don't let the girl do this. And that's the truth. That's how it works. You don't let them have the fun. You don't let them do this. And that's how porn is, and that's just the way it is. That's the business. So... It's not like I'm going to take the phone. It's just like, yeah, you can't. They're going to listen. And so, it's just the way it is. It's not the best way. I, I don't participate in the worst thing. All, every, all, all industry has off. My point is this. Cassandra had a fucking phone. She calls a boyfriend because she speaks out about Satan. 
the boyfriend shows up and he's freaking out. And I'm there with people, like, all these people are with me. One guy's like, knows how to fucking karate, you know, does fighting karate and shit. And he comes in, he's like, where's I'm standing? I'm like, he's like, who's this? I'm like, yeah, it's me. Comes over, he's like, oh. and he's looking down at the bathroom man on my neck, and he's looking up my eyes, he looks down, and he looks up, he's like, let's go! And he grabs her and leaves. But he kept looking at that thing like, I don't know why, it's like, I thought maybe he was a fan at first, and, and then he's leaving, I'm like, why the fuck were you all motherfuckers behind me? Why was I in front? You're bigger than me. You know, I'm, I'm standing there again, facing off with this guy, he'll murder me. Like, it's like, why, why would you, like, it's like a little small dog facing off with a big dog. It's like, it's like, there I am. And then, when he leaves, Matt Zane's like, oh, fuck, Matt Zane, that's who I was working with. He's like, oh, dude, you don't know. I'm like, what? He's like, he's been, for the last three weeks, he's been showing up at sets breaking people's backs. For what? He's like, there's three people from three sets with broken backs. He just snaps them over their fucking leg. I'm like, huh? And I'm like, he's like, yeah. And I'm like, you knew that? And I'm like, yeah, that's why I was standing behind you. But this fucking thing scared him away. I saw it with my own twice. So these trinkets really do work. Like, I experienced it with my own life. I was there and I watched it. And I was like, can't believe that big fucking dude. Like that, that guy could have broken all every he could have beat the shit out of every motherfucker on that set and laid us in a pile. And what well, he was a god. Like he's like, you know, just he could have did whatever he fucking wanted. Macho, macho man. And we're talking right is right here. We're talking this concept of like he could have destroyed everything, walked out of him no problem. And this that that so it's because all is the mind. The, the minute you defeated his mind, he was like, "Nope, I'm defeated." And he ain't going into the fight. He ain't gonna start a fight. You know, you're gonna lose. And he must have been a good old church boy and went to church that Sunday oh. and then showed up, and the devil was there. It was funny. <laughs> it was funny to do. It. I'm like, I'm like, okay, getting run out of town for the time of town for you, I'm like, finally, in Florida, I feel. Wait, 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 work church boy and work for Florida. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Right, well, that's what it is. That's it. That's exactly it. So I'm fine. I'm like, okay, I'm in the porn world. And I'm like, I'm going to be fine with the Satan thing. No. As a matter of fact, the satanic porn, this is all against the respect motherfuckers wouldn't do the porn. They're Christian, like you say, that's against my values. I'm like, you're the anal queen of the year. It's like, you're the anal queen. You're the anal fucking queen. And you're not, no, she's like, I can't do it. You know, okay. Okay, the anal queen is a... You know, for God. I'm, 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 I'm liking that video. Can I, you know, that's a good fetish. Too funny, dude. But, oh, but, yeah. but, so that was, that's what happened in Florida. And then, so, so, oh, God. So Satan, this guy, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. The devil. I'll tell you one other story for this song. So this guy's dressed, we have him dressed as Satan. He's got the red makeup on the horn. And they're filming behind the scenes. There's a guy up here filming. And he's catching the scene. And so Satan's, okay. Now, I made a great porno. And there's a 10-minute acid eating scene, full 10 minutes. Everyone in porn is like, why would you do that to anyone? We only need two minutes of acid eating. I'm like, dude, we're going to go full, just go. Just go. All, just as much acid eating in that moment. So that's what we do, because it's a satanic movie, right? We're going to eat Satan's ass for a long time. Not me, but Paris. Well, a Paris Gables. <laughs> so, so, so Satan goes like this. Satan comes in, in full makeup. He's like, Shane, Shane, come on, i got to talk to you. Walking around the bathroom, and this big ritual thing, we're walking around. It's like, Shane, 10 minutes to ask you, you know, that's my scene, I'm getting paid. Can we, can we, Because the girls aren't going to do nothing. If, that's, if, that, if it's just 10 minutes to ask you, that's, that's it. You can go. If it's, if that's just the way it is, mechanical. He's like, can we just throw that in there? I was like, and Paris is like, you know, she'll do anything I, I want. She'll, she's like, yeah, anything for you, Shane. I'm, I'm like, Oh, well, the deal has been you got to ejaculate on the bus to Jesus, the space. You get the blowjob. And, so, and Satan looks at me, dressed in full makeup. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, the, the prop that we have over the bus to Jesus' face, I want you on his face. <laughs> and he's like, Shane, you've gone too far. He's dressed as Satan. He's dressed as Satan. He's dressed as Satan. Okay? So he looks at me and says, Shane, you're going too far. Well, Oh, it's the greatest moment. Did you get that on camera? Please tell me you got that motherfucker. He's like, no, I didn't. I'm like, oh, God, what are you doing? He walks away. He's saying, what's going on? Keep off. So, <laughs> but I tell you, when you do not get that video. <laughs> and a motherfucker on the set heard that. Listening to me, because I heard that. Getting ready for the gangbang scene. And he's like, I will do that. I will do that. I will.
sole nut on Jesus' face. And so I'm like, okay, you're my guy. I'm, I'm clapping. I'm so sorry. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn. I'm, I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn. Dominic, go. And Dominic does. And so it makes it in the film. And AVN calls the place. She's like, what is wrong with the, the King Award Show? Gives, like, they're like, we're just going to give you the worst porn award ever, like the most blasphemous. So we got, or we were in a, like, they created an event, the most blasphemous, some shit like that. They were just, they felt, they felt that scene alone made it one of the most disgusting photos ever. Which, like, silly, because, you know, I don't know, I, 300 person angle gangbang, I think, beats it. But. That's funny, dude. That's funny. There's your breakfast story. There's your breakfast. There's your fucking breakfast. Yeah. Oh, dude. Oh, man. I don't know if it's happening. But my porn, but again, my porn was pro woman. It was actually really is was was pro. When it was a the company I worked for in in context, it was called Extreme Associates, and they invented things like slap porn. Slap the shit out of someone as you fuck to them, stuff like that. Like they, they're very violent, angry phone. People love it. Okay, and, and Rob, like I saw this art because of this. The person running it, Rob Black. Believe it or not, you can't just jump into this business. So, <laughs> Rob Black's father's Rob Zakari, the Zakari group. <laughs> the Zakari group, like the realtors. <laughs> the Zakari group. The Zakari group. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, Zakari. <laughs> I don't even know how to talk about this. That's so fucking funny, dude. Yeah. If you so, Rob Black is this young man grown up in the porn business. So, he's a child, and he grew up in the business, in the life. And so, he's making porn that's awful. Like, so I feel like it's art. Like, he's expressing himself like he hates what his father does for a living. He hates being involved. This is what dad, you know, I got, my dad owns 72 porn stores across the East Coast. And I got to manage them, and I hate this. So he started making all this really fucked up porn, like tie a woman to the chair, throw her in the pool, and watch her drown. And that would fuck her. Like, really? No, it, no, that's what... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh my God. So you think might is right special with that? When you get into the world of porn, and there's fetishes. Woo, baby. That stuff goes. And then you're talking about, like, when you're sitting in the room talking about how to plan these things, I'm not even going to talk about it. I can't say it, because... <laughs> <laughs> it's not streaming bad enough. No, it's not bad. But it, 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 it's funny. It's trauma-filled to say, and I might start trauma-chuckling, and you'd be like, this guy proves that. I don't. I don't, uh, you know, anyway. So I saw Zakari, Rob Black, doing this, like, almost like, I'm going to make porn that's awful, and I'm going to make, you know, and he made porn that got him run eventually, because he's so hard. But, but he didn't make porn for people who weren't buying it. He's a lot of it. He's a lot of it. So there's a whole world that people appreciate that. that I, honestly, I'm starting to feel like the more somebody tries to pretend that they're righteous, the fucking little stuff they are in the inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The more they, the more they white robe and, and shit they put on. And and, judgmental. You know, the more fucking disgusting they are in the inside. You know? Being hardcore judgmental is a weird fucking thing. And when I got friendships with people that are real judgmental, I just like, when do you get away? You're paying attention to everyone else. You serve everyone else. When do you serve yourself? I don't give a fuck with they do. And so I had a libertarian friend, Scott Horton. Big, big deal in the libertarians it's on the news all the time. Big fucking deal. And all of a sudden, I see Scott get to be an old bitch. You heard me, Scott, you old bitch. You fucking thrown out, bitch. You debate everyone else in the fucking world and talk shit about debate, and you won't touch me because I'll take you. But this old bitch, and I love Scott, you know, so I can talk to my friends like, you know, this is how it goes. I do have a respect for Scott. He's a libertarian guy. I'm okay, I listen to the talk. And then one day on his Twitter, start talking about trans stuff and trans children. And you know where is it now when you get who this person is. I thought libertarians didn't they care about themselves or freedom liberties. What the fuck are you in someone else's business for? Oh, because this is something to do with your prejudice you want to push on someone else. You can't avert your eyes and let these trans teens and, sh and people go about their business and deal with professionals and, you know, counseling and medical care and what, what goes on with that. You're going to get involved as a politician. You're not going to let the science, medical field deal with this issue. 
What an asshole. What a fucking asshole. Because that breaks any kind of libertarian philosophy I know of. How about you? That I don't right. agree. I can't argue that. So it was like, oh, okay, old man, you just showed your, you showed your colors right there. You show, I got you now. You know, and I, I, I was uh, offended by that. You know, it was like, at one time, he, he, Scott carried this importance because he carried on this political philosophy in a righteous, real way. You know. And when that happened recently, it made me relate to this, because this is in the moment that I'm thinking about this Might is Right show. Actually looking back and reading the text, and going, wow, what did you do there? And that sort of, in that moment, that's what reminded me, well, I was young then, I was an old man, like, this is the same thing Scott's doing. I'm applying things to my philosophy that don't make sense, but there's something, you know, like, there's a political element being applied to this philosophy that doesn't make, doesn't, you know, we were playing with politics that were pushing these things and one of us went off and used it, but it doesn't make any sense if you say it in politics that makes sense you know, it makes sense if in your life but it doesn't make sense within the philosophy so and what I've seen throughout my life is generations take words and, and they change them to something else, which is cool like we create words too blog, podcast, we create words too hipsters change to something else, the derogatory to the positive and the relevant. And now we're taking on Satanism and making it basically like Christianity. And, and, and then when I say we, all of us, when we talk about the Satanic stuff, even like this, I'm feeding into it now. We're playing zero one with Christians because of dumb messages. He knows exactly what he did. He turns Satanism into a Christian bullshit thing. And your fights are always like this Christian garbage. Your judgments are Christian garbage. Okay? And I don't mind being, I'm, I'm an activist myself. I am not a Satanist. And I don't apply the word Satanist to my activism. I just apply myself as a human being. And I'm ready to fight. <clears throat> and I'm ready to join people in the streets for more. And there it is. You said the secret sauce right there. Because it's really just, it's activism that he's doing. And he, he's putting Satanism on top of it. And that's what sucks people into the field. That's what makes them want to go, oh, this is Tag Temple. Oh, this, this seems like something that's really doing something for people, but it's not. It's just this fucking own agenda involved in, in trying to get people involved in it. Yeah, well, I want to keep calling you Hurley now. I, you, I've, I've been calling you Avi forever now. While we're getting in front of these cameras, we all are more complicated I'm, than our names. I'm calling you Hurley now. I'm like, why am I doing that? You know, Avi. I, well, I, it's weird because I've switched that now that it's a bit that we're here. I'm like, Hurley. I'm like, oh, Reverend Avi. What the fuck? In the magic world, they call me Reverend Avi. In the real world, they call me Hurley. So. You can call me by both names. I'm going to go, I don't have to go slow. I, I'm, I'm, okay, so, Avi wrote the TSD at one point. And they ignored it. So when you look at the face of the TSD and you see white people, you have one evidence right here that someone said, hey, I'd like to be a, I'd like to help out. I got, I got a mind. I can participate. I got, it seemed like they were caring about activists. And yeah. I cared about that. But beyond that, yeah. I'm talking to Hurley, when, uh, Avi, when Avi gets going, I'm like, I don't even know what the fuck you're talking about. What the fuck is that? Like, he's got a whole other twist on what's going on here. So I'm interested. In, like, I'm like, let's just stop talking so I can pay attention. Because it's not the same. I can talk to a lot of things. I'm like, yeah, I know the story. I got that. Yeah, okay. And I said, oh, boom, my health safe. You know, <laughs> that's the way it is. Yeah. So those are the people you sell shit to. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> um, and, and and so when I I don't say that just because this is a person of color that contacted the school. It's a person who has something to add to the conversation. When I hear her, I'm, and so and I'm looking forward to talking to her more about that during this hot this, this stream. But that sort of tells you something about that kind of stuff. And I think if, if you're a person that's in that group, you should be a skeptic, actually. I know you guys talked about it, but you have to be one with yourself and with your friends. That's what skeptics do. They, 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 the skeptic is usually 100% They don't just use the word. I'm a satanic skeptic. Hail Satan! <laughs> I believe you, brother. I love you. What should I do for you? Real yeah. Satan. That's the kind of psychotic shit that's going on right fucking now. <laughs> and I got to fucking deal with Twitter. Like, you ruined my Twitter experience because all of a sudden the satanic shit, I'm like, what the fuck is a satanic fake name? What the fuck?
fuck is a satanic thing? And they try to explain it to me. I'm like, oh, that's that pussy fucking Doug running backwards, trying to fucking make a goddamn excuse for why he used a fake name and why he's getting called out. So he's like, oh, it's a, it's not me hiding. It's not lack of courage. It's called a satanic name. Everyone knows that. No. No, no one knows that. I would ask Carla, she said, what the fuck is a satanic name? It's an indigenous tradition that he's picked up. And that doesn't matter. Yeah, it just doesn't, yeah, I it's, it's just like, I know what he's, why he did it. Yeah, you, you, yeah, help him out. That's why he needed you. He could have used you. And what, how do I do this? I need a fake name. What's a good reason for it? You're yeah. like, indigenous. Boom, boom, boom. And you could have gave me an answer where it would have made sense. <laughs> but he <laughs> made his current lack of courage. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not. He didn't like me because I was just some black dude. He didn't bother responding to my fucking email. Well, now look at us. We're, we're fucking doing this whole thing. Doug, I wonder what you're thinking well, right now. Well, we can, here, you're from Chicago, <laughs> so we can sum up certain neighborhoods here. Right? You can say, well, those motherfuckers over there, this yeah, yeah. goes in Chicago. Mm-hmm. So in Detroit, if you're from Detroit, what happens if you know someone that's a white person in an upper middle class suburb? Usually in Detroit, they would say, oh, they're probably racist Because Detroit segregation isn't as pretty as Chicago segregation. It's not like that. Detroit segregation is buildings on fire or not. Or it was 20 years ago when I was there. Was easy. Doogie had a disdain for, for that. And... I can understand that coming from an uneducated, ignorant perspective. And, because I've had those kind of fears and, and ignorance. What's going on with this? There's no reason you've never seen it before. That doesn't really have an excuse. He's a very educated person. He's read a million books. He works at books for us. And it's not really an ignorant excuse. So when he's seeing the situation, he un- understands about economic despair, he understands about disadvantages, he understands about privilege. These are things he understood when he did the radio show and when I was yapping out. I didn't, I didn't really have a clue. Like a lot. I did, and I don't, you know, it's one of those things. I'm not, I'm not saying I, I'm not saying I, I, I don't, I didn't, I'm not taking accountability for the shit. I'm just saying it's different. <clears throat> and so, you know. He's done their homework on manipulation. That's the damn Well, thing. but he's also coming out of an area that's probably got some bias, and he's, he's got a, he, he uses his education to confirm his bias. You know, he, he uses his studies to make, to, to reinforce his bias. And that's where, when you're talking about prejudice, when prejudice is able to be weaponized, it's not able to be weaponized by ignorant people who have a flag on their truck. When prejudice is weaponized, it's weaponized by the weak people, really smart people. If you're a poor person and you're following the satanic temple, you're a fool. I know this. I know the person. I know what we would think of you. Just like I'm saying, you're a person that sells shit. You get fucking who you are. You know how little you have as far as knowledge. And you want to make sure to take advantage of that. That's the game you have to you know, me selling me soda pop up in Minnesota when I started a soda company. That was me doing that. I wanted to, you know, take advantage of it. That was probably, I, I didn't like doing soda pop. I, I, don't, I don't like crazy But, you know, the satanic the, the, the temple if it exists in any kind of real way. They would only exist for upper middle class white people. That's what it's for. It's for high degree people to, to use as some sort of sexual stimulation for their depression. It's Christian based. It's going to be based, you know, it's going to excite and impress people, rich people, people that go to college, more costumes. It's for them. If you're in there without an education and you think you can win that fight, you're wrong. But you're going to find out the things you can get too close. Mm. And that's just me warning. I can give a fuck about the you know? I, I care about everything, but you in particular, the one that's going to make that decision, is that it's going to help you get hurt. Because you've been warned. 
<laughs> and it's obvious. If you did your study like a sacred school, you see these dots connect that I'm talking about and other people have. And when you just impulsively fight back about the satanic temple or anything, that's a call. You should look into what I'm saying. Like, It's there. You should and think about what's being said, there. And, and there's people putting this together, and at some point you're going to see this. It's there, and then um, you got the members running out of there telling you about it. Yeah. I ran across a few of them. They come out of there telling me about the shit. I'm like, I don't really fuck about it. And then you got someone yeah. like Anton LeVay going, how can I free humanity to act, not be so repressed? How can I stimulate this fucking place to make, like, 